Hey guys, it's Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. It's the start of spring 2023 semester, and if you're anything like me, you have goals for everything you want to accomplish, but you never feel like you have enough time. On this episode of the Pre-Vet Podcast, we're joined by UFCVM alum, Dr. Fisher, to talk about time management skills. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and I could not be more excited about my guest today, the Dr. Corey Fisher, class of 2021. Corey, I'm a big fan. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Alex, and I'm a big fan of the show. This season, we are going to have uh, odd-numbered episodes will be veterinary professionals, and even-numbered episodes are going to be non-vets, Ooh. which I think is so cool because we can learn so much from other disciplines. Yeah. So we're going to have little haves and haves, and it's going to be really, really neat. Um, well, we're really excited to have you on the show. So for this season, season six, can't believe we're doing another one. We're going to focus exclusively on the VEMCAST, what some might say are soft skills, but I think that is completely inappropriate way to call it. These are the people skills that are needed. They are listed on the letters of rec for your VEMCAST application. So pre-vet students, what happens is when you ask someone to write a recommendation letter, so let's say I ask Dr. Fisher. So Dr. Fisher, um, I love working with you in emergency and critical care. I've worked with you for more than a year now. I'm applying to vet school. Do you feel comfortable writing me a strong letter of recommendation? Yes, Alex Avellino, I would be honored to write you a very strong letter recommendation. That's the response you're looking for. That's exactly the response (laughs) you're looking for. Right, somebody who's enthusiastic, who's pumped to do it. And then what will happen is uh, Dr. Fisher would get this email notification from VEMCAS saying that Alex Avellino has requested you write a letter, uh, you know, please fill out this form. And this form has anywhere between 15 to 20 soft or people skills. And then Dr. Fisher would have to fill out on a scale of excellent to poor, how he thinks I am in different qualities. But we're here for (laughs) you to talk about a very specific um, soft skill, people skill, and that is, do you want to tell them what it is? Uh, Sure, yeah. I mean, if you weren't going to get into it, I was going to because we're on a time crunch. Oh my God, I love Corey. And the skill is time management. You're so good, yes. We are on a time crunch. We're talking about time management. I do want them to hear just a little bit about you when you know where you went to undergrad kind of a a background what you're doing now so why don't you give them a time crunch style time Uh, management who is dr corey fisher okay um so i am a graduate from uf undergrad and uf veterinary school go gators Um, wait what was your major uh i did the biology professional okay um and did some like animal science like tracking got some veterinary experience um through that and then Really loved that school here. Went on to do a rotating internship at Colorado State University. What Uh, are they? The Rams? They're the Rams. Go Rams? Yes, go Rams. Did you, you did research at the vet school. Did you say that out loud when you were an undergrad? I did not. I think you should say that. I mean, you kind of made yourself a name for yourself at the vet school before you got there. That's true. That could be helpful. Yeah. Um, I I would. uh, I just want to also point out to the listeners, I think Dr. Fisher is one of the most humble people I know. So it's probably, uh, is it hard for me, for you to like brag on yourself right now um i mean oh my god wait i forgot to say he's the first one to ever have 4.0 at uf oh this is gonna be such an eclectic it's intro so all over the uh. place all right so we were talking about you did some research while you were an undergrad got exposed yeah. to vet med now went to csu to do your internship yeah. now wait it was a specialty internship um or n- small animal small rotating, animal rotating. Okay. yeah why did you want to do the internship yeah so um <laughs> this has been like the big debate i've been having for like the last two years of um, really being interested in specialty medicine, wanting to advance my training, but not necessarily knowing what specialty I wanted to go into. Um, and I think that's tough because uh, there's a big push uh, from academia to do internships. But I think if you aren't going to specialize um, and you can get good mentorship in private practice, it doesn't necessarily make sense to do it financially um, and for personal life reasons. Um, so it was tough to go into an internship without a clear goal for residency in mind, but I kind of wanted to keep that door open because I thought, you know, even if I go out and do ER practice or general practice, I'm still really interested in specialty medicine. And now uh, about a um, year and a half later, um, I'm enjoying my time as an ER veterinarian, but I have decided to go back into specialty practice. Let's go. <laughs> I think it's so it's so ironic or fate, serendipitous, that we are talking about time management. 
literally this morning at like 7 a.m., I texted Dr. Fisher being like, do you want to be the season opener of the podcast? He said, sure. And then I, I said, hell yeah. He said, let's can we, can we, go. Can, can we say that? I think hell yeah feels fine. Okay. It's a, it's, while it is pre-professional, it, okay. it's, you know, you know how vet med is. Yeah. So we're loosey goosey. Yeah, yeah. Hell seems okay. Okay. I, yeah. I think it's okay. I listened to the one about slang earlier. I like that one with Antonio. I'm so embarrassed by that one. I've learned so much new really? slang. So I texted Dr. Fisher saying, do you want to come on the podcast? He said, yes. And I said, how could I convince you to come to Gainesville? Because you're in Jacksonville. And oh my God, miracle of miracles. He was driving up to Gainesville today. You know, that's spooky. It is. It is. Yeah. And this yeah. week is Friday the 13th. Wow. Just so much is happening. Okay. So you kept the door open to do the internship, didn't really know what you wanted to do, have been in practice, in traditional ER practice for yeah. a half year, six yes, months? Yes, six months. And then you really just had the tingling to go back into academia. Yes. Yeah. I would say um, specifically the tingling for <laughs> yeah. uh, critical care medicine and then also to go back in academia um, because I do like that research piece. I'm missing teaching. Um, and missing being at a big hospital with a, a bunch of like-minded people mm. who are just as passionate about it as I am. So, mm, mm, yeah. Mm. Go Gators. Yeah, go Gators. <laughs> so today we're talking about time management. Yeah. I thought you would be a great guest for this because I, first of all, again, you know, to achieve such high grades in such a rigorous curriculum, to me, must mean you had strong time management skills. I know you were also really invested in your personal health and fitness, made time to go to the gym, and made time for your friends. Is that all accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you're painting it in a very glowing light. But yeah, I mean, I was. those were the goals. You did all those things? Yeah. Did you not yeah. do all those things? I did. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah, did. Yeah. So I – and you and I have talked about this a little bit yeah. on Instagram. So if you all want to go even deeper with Dr. Fisher, you can listen to Ooh. Where Are They Now? Deep Dive. Deep Dive. Yeah. I think that was in June of 2021. So now yeah. we're a year and a half later. But time management, I want to hear more about your tips. I have lightning round questions for you later, but what – how did undergrad and vet school look for you with your time management? How did you get there? Yeah, um, I think from even in, in high school, I started to like practice time management. Um, I think <laughs> this is also listening to some of the other podcasts talking about the difference between vet school and undergrad and high school, where a lot of students didn't have to do a lot of studying um, mm -hmm. in undergrad and high school, but mm -hmm. then had to start to learn how to do that in vet school. And that's really where the time management piece comes in. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, I felt like I had to study from high school on. Um, so good thing. Yeah, good yeah, thing. Yeah, um, like I, I, you know, have come to think of myself as a smart person through um, what I've been able to achieve academic-wise. But I also know I don't pick things up right away. I need to see it two or three times, and so um, I've kind of developed a system for myself uh, that I had already started using in undergrad, and then I think kind of. Uh, really optimized in vet school, which is sometimes, or when I can, read the notes beforehand, then go into the lecture already knowing what I don't know or what's going to be the harder topics for me, um, paying attention extra hard on, on those slides, getting to ask the professor questions about that that same day in class or right after class, and then going home one more time and um, taking some more notes. And then when it's time for the exam, all I have to do is kind of review those notes I took. Um, but um, by kind of getting ahead of it that way, uh, I felt like uh, I never really got behind my classes. And it definitely takes a lot of time to do all that, but it's just a formula um, that I would write down in my calendar. And that's the other big thing is I would have a calendar of, you know, you're going to do this lecture this day, this lecture this day. And I'd cross those off um, before the end of every day. And that's kind of a, a big thing, too. I think having that mindset of if I'm going to write something down, I'm going to get it done. Oh, my God, I have chills. You know what I want to call this? You just said it was your formula. Have you ever called it the core four? <laughs> like, Corey, the would core I, four? And I you have like, a strong core from I feel like out. I would need, like, four things. You do, though, because you review it beforehand. Okay. You go to class. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Because I remember from our Instagram talk, okay. you review beforehand, you go to lecture, you review the lecture, like, that day or whatever, and then you review the notes before the test. That's, That's the core, core four. four. That's it right there. Core four, oh. patent pending, yep, don't steal exactly. it. Exactly. Okay, and like you said, it takes time. So it takes time and planning. Do you think part of it is to even make time management work, you have to have a goal in mind? Yeah, that that is actually something I wrote down on my phone on the way over here. Yeah. Um, I think not only do you um, have to, well, I guess the first step would be you have to be goal-oriented about it. Mm. Um, you have to really 
want to achieve whatever it is that you're going to achieve. Um, otherwise, I think you're going to make excuses for it. So, like, you have to be motivated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you have to have a plan in order to do it. That's realistic. Um, I think what I've learned is that um, tasks often take longer than what we think. Oh. Yeah. Can you give an example? Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> oh, wait. When yes. This, this is morning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I woke up, I don't know, maybe around like 738. Respectable um, time. Yeah. Yeah. Got a text from um, Alex yeah. saying, hey, do you want to be the first on the podcast? And I was like, oh, yeah, hell. Let's go. <laughs> um, that's not what people say. Oh, yeah, hell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hell. Cut that. Cut that. <laughs> I, I like it. So, yeah, I was excited to get down here, but I did have the task of um, building a new uh, bed frame sure. for my apartment. Sure. Um, and I didn't think it would take that long. How long did you think it would take? I thought it would maybe take, like... <sighs> I want everyone, while like, Dr. F is thinking about this, how long do you think putting together a bed frame would take? And and tell me yeah, how long you thought. I, I guess I thought it would take, like... Is it from Ikea? Because if it's and, from Ikea, it's taken three days. Yeah, I thought it would take like an hour and a half. An which, hour and a half, okay. Which I think, it, yeah, just shows that it was very naive of me to think that. Okay, um, okay. But, um, I mean, it ended up taking like three hours. Yeah. Um, which isn't bad. Not bad. Do you, is this your first time putting together a bed frame? No. Oh. Yeah, but it was a new bed frame to me. Like it wasn't it was like there was a bed frame I had for like three years that I had taken apart a couple mm-hmm. times. Like I knew that. Oh, interesting. And then this so one I was experience. like, I have had experience, but this one I was like, wait, this is not I my. I don't know this. This bed. is not my bed frame. <laughs> this bed is not mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was it was taking apart, moving it uh, from one apartment to another, yeah. and then rebuilding it. So yeah. a whole kit and caboodle of activity. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then finding an Allen wrench, which like I have fifteen. I probably I, have one in my pocket right I now. I know. <sighs> They're so handy. (laughs) They're so so handy. Okay. Yeah. So so you assumed it would take a shorter amount of time. And what we've learned is we should probably allot more time than we thought. Yeah. And like kind of would you say for the pre-vets, if it's a task that you're going to have a lot, like so for example, if you want to get to the gym at a certain time in the morning, time yourself at how long it takes you to get ready so then you know what time you can make to the gym. Like are we saying practice some tasks and – and get some times down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's super helpful, especially when you're getting ready to go on clinics and things like that. And oh, your time yo, is clinics, really yes. crunched. Yeah. So um, knowing how long you need to work out yeah. to like make meals, to do laundry, those yeah. kinds of things. Um, and for me, I do prefer to be goal oriented because I, I could, I know that there's some people who will t- approach tasks as, well, I'm going to work on this for an hour. Mm. Um, mm. And if that was my approach this morning, I would have half a bed frame, you know? <laughs> so true. And that And that, that's, I guess, also an approach um, for studying, which works for some people. Totally, um, right. But it just didn't work for me to be like, oh, I'm going to study for an hour, and then I'm like, I'm only halfway through this lecture. So you said, I'm getting through this lecture. Exactly. However long even, it takes. Even if it takes longer, yes. So how did then, how did you deal with, because that to me means some of other priorities might have had to get pushed yeah. back yeah. or... So if you said, I'm going to get through this lecture yeah. and someone said, let's go out tonight, yeah. you know, how did you deal with that FOMO that you might have had? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's um, I guess everyone has like a different level of how much they uh, kind of prioritize um, social life mm. and doing other things mm-hmm. and their hobbies. Um, for me, if I could go out um once or twice a week, that was enough. Yeah. And I also felt better if I kind of put that off towards the weekend. Sure. So um, it became easy for me to say, no, I'm not going to do that on a Wednesday night. I'm going to finish studying or whatever, doing whatever task I needed to accomplish. Right. And then when I got to go out on Friday night, it felt that much better. So true. So true. Yeah. So delayed gratification, I think, is a big part of time management, too. Oh, good for you, Corey. Yeah. You obviously utilize time management in undergrad and vet school. How does time management, does it look the same or different now that you're a practicing veterinarian? Yeah. um, I guess it's probably going to be applicable to a lot of busy general practice veterinarians, but especially for ER veterinarians, um, I think it's just all about being as efficient as possible. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. Please talk about this because, you know, in clinics, you've probably seen the person to your right or to your left who takes forever for paperwork. And mm-hmm. then, you know, it's it's one thing to be diligent, but you don't want to be stuck there all day. So, yeah. Talk about efficiency. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the big things that has helped me with efficiency is having all of my discharge templates and even treatment templates for certain diseases on Google Drive. Oh, my God. Um, you're such a killer. <laughs> so it would be. 
uh, super helpful when I used to have that all like a Microsoft document, but then that was hard to transfer over to different computers. Sometimes I'll do relief shifts and they don't have uh, Microsoft Word or I had to get out a flash drive. So having it all on Google Drive, it's accessible everywhere. And I can just copy and paste in these long discharges about telling an owner their first time um, their dog had a seizure, how to handle that Brilliant. and those kinds of things. Brilliant. So that helps a lot. Yes. Um, and I got that from a podcast about efficiency. Um, there was a Vet Girl podcast about it. Um, Vet Girl's good. Vet Girl's Vet really Girl great. on the run, yeah. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was super helpful. Um, and then I think for a lot of uh, new vets, it's doing that quick but thorough physical exam. Right. I have learned that <laughs> everything goes better um, – if I only have to touch my patients once in the ER. So okay. if I do like a really thorough physical exam and know exactly what I want to do diagnostic wise and then let my nurses handle the rest, um, then we're running much more smoothly. And not that's not to say that I'm not going to reassess that patient, be looking at that patient throughout the sure, night. Of course. But I want to do all the things I need to when the patient's out in front of me with the nurse and then tell them, OK, here's everything else we're going to do. And then I can go do paperwork or call the owner yeah. and then they can just run ship with that. And they're not having to call me back or I'm having to call them back. Actually, can you bring that pet out again? I didn't do a rectal. I'm trying to be as efficient as possible right. so we can keep moving. Okay, so I love this idea of do it right the first time, do it well, yeah. be efficient. How long does it take you to do a physical exam? Mm, I would say for most patients, less than a minute. Whoa! Uh, I, in my mind, yeah. it was 15 minutes, but I don't know yeah. why. Well, I will say in the ER, your exam is a little bit yeah, you different. Yeah, got to be quick. It's, it's not a little a GP. bit. Yeah, it's yeah. a little bit abbreviated. Like I am not going to be doing a thorough ear exam. I'm not necessarily looking at every dog's fundus. Um, What's a fun- retina. What's a retina? Fundus? Looking at the retina. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, uh, it's you know it's looking at their mouth and saying, okay, there's a modern amount of dental disease, but I'm not tackling that today. I'm not, you know, because noting. we're worried about what they came in for. Yeah. I, I'm like assessing, um, you know, heart, respiratory, yeah. neurologic health immediately, like primary survey and sure. then, um, doing a, a quick palpation, everything else, that makes uh, sense. plus minus a rectal kind of, but yeah. How are you showing time management? Yeah. Is it when you got the 4.0 in vet school? <sighs> I'm just so proud of that. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say, yeah, I had a a goal to um, achieve really high uh, grades in vet school. And um, like we said, I kind of had a formula. uh, Core four. Core four, yeah. Was part of that because you didn't know what you wanted to do afterwards and you wanted to set yourself up for success? Or is it because A's were just part of your identity? Um, I get a little bit of both, uh, but I think – primarily that I want to set myself up for success. Um, Same thing with the internship. Even though uh, I didn't know exactly what I want to specialize in, I knew I kind of had this passion to specialize. And uh, I wanted to give myself every opportunity um, to go where I want to go. Smart. Yeah. 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 Sometimes the goal, folks, is not knowing what the goal is. (laughs) But just saying, like, I don't know what I want to do, but let me set myself up for success in as many ways as possible. Yeah. Um, But also, uh, on my drive over here, as I was thinking about this, for the listeners, if you're questioning your own time management skills, just because you have a bad day or really mess up something with time management doesn't mean you're bad at it. It's going to happen. If you don't have great time management skills now, you don't have to keep that. You can work to change it. Exactly. Because I I know so many people who, especially like in the ER, will be like, oh, I'm going to be here late. Like, I'm just always slow at writing my records. I have terrible time management skills. I'm like, but you don't, that's not something that's built into you. It doesn't have to be that way. It's not a predisposition. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, So I definitely think everyone can learn it. Okay. Um, So you think this is growth mindset. Yeah. People can change their time management skills. Oh, definitely. Because we all kind of have to get better at it, I think. Uh, during vet school. Well, we sure do. And, and the we just keep moving, moving, going. Yeah. So then can you tell me how can they improve? What are some things that they can do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, I think we already touched on the first one, which is just having that goal oriented mindset. Because okay. if you don't want to, um, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, then you're not going to have that motivation to, to get out and do it even mm-hmm. when it's hard. Um, and then another part of the mindset is just valuing your time always. So when you're even on the weekend, if um, I don't know, like you're doing something that's just not fulfilling, mm, um, mm. then ask yourself, what could you be doing? Right. Um, like being on TikTok too long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just knowing that there's always not that you always need to be doing something. You can definitely have mindful relaxation. Absolutely. That's huge. But um, if you feel like you're wasting your time, then ask yourself, how can you use that better? Yep. Um because I think that 
yeah, I don't know, time is just so valuable. So you yeah. should always be doing something that is either working towards a goal or gives you joy. So Ooh, ooh, yeah. I yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then tell me, is there someone else around you who has great time management skills who, are, who is doing something that you're not currently doing that you think is like a great method? Yeah, I'm, I think a lot of people um, – do use their phones more than me for time management. Oh, um, okay. So like, as we were saying, I have that calendar, like a handwritten calendar. Oh, it's a paper calendar. It's a paper. I like to have like a, a something that I could scratch off a list. Okay. You know, yeah. like that's like <laughs> the reward for me is like. Sure, a little endorphin boost. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be uh, handwritten. But um, I know a lot of people use their phone to okay. give them reminders yeah. um, to have – the way they can set up their calendars now, it can have like flight information, sure. meeting times. Yes. It can be so efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that um, I wish I did more of, but I just don't think that works for me okay. as much. Sure. Um, and so that's something that I think is another good strategy. I do. Yeah. I agree. And then I want to know from you, like, so where do you think maybe pre-vets or undergrads are missing the time management piece and maybe encourage them like why it's so important as a vet? Yeah. Um, probably a common theme that I saw a lot of my peers and myself deal with in undergrad is um, not realizing how much uh, you could be doing right now towards working towards that goal. Mm. So you've got all these things you have to check off. Sure. Small animal, large animal research. Yes, yes. And um, it's so overwhelming. Um, but trying to chip away at two or three of those goals at a time is totally doable. Yes, it um, is. And there's no reason to push it off. Um, I think as an undergraduate, vet school felt very far away to me mm. up until senior year, mm. but it's really not. So having that mindset that you're getting ready to be a veterinary student or right. even thinking of yourself you know, as ready to go to vet school is going to um, – help you look at your time now as, okay, well, what am I doing to get prepared? Uh, Kind of like when you're in your senior year of vet school and you're on clinics, you need to be thinking about, well, I'm going to be the veterinarian very, very soon. (laughs) Um, So always not, not to say you shouldn't live in the present, but always think about what that next step is and how you're going to prepare yourself. You can do both. And exactly. Tell me how much time flies. How fast did vet school fly? Oh, crazy. <laughs> it's crazy that I'm sitting here with you right now. No, I want to start crying. Yeah. Because yeah, you're, yeah. you're a full-fledged veterinarian. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It yeah. freaks me out. What's something they can do now, one month from now, and one year from now to help their time management skills? So let's start with, like, what's something they could do today or tomorrow? Yeah, I would say just writing down one goal per day that you don't necessarily have to do, Mm -hmm. um, but that you would want to do. And it can be professional or personal. Sure. Um, And just getting used to doing that. Yeah. And preferably something that if you didn't write it down, you wouldn't necessarily get done or not guaranteed. Totally, totally. Yeah. So it's getting used to goal setting and then also evaluating how long does it take me to do said thing. Yeah. What I like about that, too, is if it's something they normally wouldn't have done without writing it down, one, you're going to get that boost of, oh, my gosh, I got this done. But yeah. also it didn't take me as long as you probably thought it is unless it's a new bed. Unless it's a new bed. Then it might yeah. take a little Those bit longer. Take Block time. three hours for yeah. that. Yeah. OK, what is something that they should be focused on over the next month, a little bit longer? Yeah. Um. So for that one, I would say... Um, honestly, I think it kind of goes into changing the mindset of the goal. So, you know, that's like a daily goal. So maybe that's going for a walk we were talking about earlier yeah. or maybe studying a chapter. Um, but for a month, you can take on a bigger goal. Okay, so totally. that could be something like, let's say um, you want to start doing pull-ups in the gym. Like Ugh, you can map yes. out how, you know. Um, what you need to practice in order to get there if you're starting with dead hangs or something yeah. like that from a workout perspective. Or maybe you're studying for Navly and you want to get X amount of questions done. Um, that would be, you know, unachievable in a day. Um, right. So mapping that out. Yes. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't know. I think those are kind of a little bit more fun when, Perfect. when it's a little bit of a longer goal, going back to that delayed gratification, because it's something that seems almost – unachievable, yeah. but then you break it down. I will yeah. say as someone who once wanted to do pull-ups, 
I could do them in a month, oh, but I had nice. I had to do them every day. Yeah. Every day I had to yeah, go yeah. to the pull and bar yeah. and just hold it. And then by the end, I'm like, oh, it just takes the repetition. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, so for time management a year from now, what are we thinking yeah. about? That one, I kind of had a hard time giving like a concrete example, but yeah. I think for that one, that would be a change in habits. Um, Ooh. cause that, that takes a lot, right? Yeah. That takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what habits every listener would necessarily want to mm-hmm, change mm-hmm. but for example if your study habits aren't where you want them to be okay give um, yourself a year not give, a day yeah, or a month exactly I it's gonna take that. a long time you yeah. know what that makes me think of dr f it makes me think of i think in a job and in relationships you kind of have to give it a full year yeah. to experience that opportunity in all seasons Oof. so you need to know what's a busy season look like what is this person <laughs> like in the winter time you don't know unless you give it that full year and i like that for the habit because you might nail down and i think this is true in vet school you might nail down a study habit in a month and then your courses all change and you have to relearn that study habit yeah so going through a full year of the courses might really help solidify what works exactly yeah you can build your own formula core four we should i i actually had uh two more um pieces that I wanted to share. Um, So I think uh, another one for time management is knowing your circadian rhythm. Oh my Uh, God. Thank you. Please talk about it. It's not a joke. (laughs) Yeah. So um, I think we traditionally think of like time management of like, you got to get up super early and you have to do all these things. And that is me. I am an early morning person for sure. But I know there's a lot of people who get their best work done at night. It's so true. It's like, it's not a fake thing. Yeah. So knowing yourself and and realizing that, you know, if you're a night person, you're not going to accomplish all your tasks at five in the morning. No. Um, You're going to get them all done later and that's okay. Um, But you can set aside that time to do that. Um, So I don't know. I just, I think if you have that approach. Yes. Know yourself. Exactly. Know when you're most productive. We're going to end the show. Do you, can you guess what I'm about to say? Okay. How are we? How are, do you think we're gonna end the show? Oh, uh, I think I know. What? <sighs> can we still do that? What is it? Wait, I don't know. What are you gonna say? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were gonna do a uh, bad British accent. That's exactly what I was talking about, mate. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. So, um, to end the show, Doctor Fisher, we always try to ask the the guest. Oh, this is coming oh, out of Australia. Yeah. <laughs> um, a piece of advice, which I think you've given them great advice. But these are students who want to be where you're sitting today. They really want to get to the place, whether it's valedictorian or not, but they want to be veterinarians. What's your biggest piece of advice for them? All right. (laughs) Well, I guess what I say is if you are really passionate about going into veterinary medicine, um, then you have to treat it just like what we've been talking about, a goal that's you know, going to seem insurmountable uh, from the start, but you got to break it down into those pieces. You got to check them off the list, and if you stay dedicated, then you're going to get there. Um, so, just just keep it up. Just keep calm and vet med on. Keep it up, mate. That's right. Well, I want to thank Dr. Fisher <laughs> for coming on the podcast today. Um, lifelong listener, longtime fan. There we go. Um, really glad you could be our season opener. Super, super happy to provide you all with some guidance about these people soft skills from the VEMCAST application from both veterinarians and non-veterinarians. So thank you so much for being on the show and for your time management skills and the fact that you made time to do this. Anything else you want to tell <laughs> No, no, no. I just wanted to interrupt you. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. What? <laughs> What's the whisper voice? Like the podcast voice. You I mean like, like when people are on a podcast? Yeah, and they're just like talking a little bit smoother than normal. Because they're being fake? Maybe. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's the room. It's the vibe. Let me hear your regular voice. Well, now, now I don't know. What that feels regular. right. Yeah, that feels a little right. regular. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's Carissa, the UFCVM communication intern and pre-vet student. Knowing how to set a precedent of showing up and putting in the hours is an important way to get opportunities and to build a network. Today, Alex is joined by her very own sister, Katie White, an early childhood research coordinator to discuss reliability. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school.
Welcome back to the Prevet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and I am so excited to bring you another uh, episode in season six where we will be going over the VEMCAS Letters of Rec qualities, the soft skills, the people skills that we're looking for in each of our applicants. As you know, even numbered episodes are going to have a non veterinary professional. And I couldn't be more excited about my guest today. Um, guess what, listeners? It's my sister, Katie White. Katie, welcome to the podcast. Hello. <laughs> Kate, is this your first podcast? Yes. I'm excited to have you here. I'm also excited that we've determined that, you know, potentially you have a speaker voice and we'll I'll get to hear that for the first time today. Mm-hmm. It's my training voice. Yep. Yeah. We have our guests tell us a little bit about themselves. Mm-hmm. Tell us where you went to undergrad mm-hmm. and what your current position is. Um, I went to undergrad here at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Yes. And I am currently um, a research coordinator at the College of Education. Mm -hmm. At the College of Education, we're really excited to have you back working um, at UF. I think it'd be fun for the listener, since we are of relation, to maybe talk about our relationship a little bit. And, you know, we used to work at Baby Gator together. Mm -hmm. We have an early childhood education background. Yes. I think it's going to be really interesting for us to talk about how early childhood and veterinary medicine relate to each other. Mm. And Kate, why don't you tell them which quality on the VEMCAS application you're here to talk about? Reliability. Reliability. So reliability is one of those 16 to 20 qualities you can find on any given year on the VEMCAS application. Kate's making a face. You didn't know there was 20 qualities on there. I did not know. It is wild how intense that letter of rec form is. Mm. Reliability is on there. I asked you to be our reliability guest because one, you're the most reliable person I know. So sweet. Uh, I thought it would be fun to hear from a non-vet on this one because any profession and any human does need to have some level of reliability. You've been quite reliable for me in our lives, and mm-hmm. I think you're going to be a great guest um, to talk about it. And I knew that reliably you would do it, even though you were hesitant. Yes, I um, I feel daring, mm-hmm. but also a little nervous. Kate, can you kind of talk them through your hesitancy? Because I also think when I originally asked you to be on the podcast, you did not jump on the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You were hesitant. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, uh, the second that you were thinking about it, it made sense too, because that also to me means someone who is reliable also thinks about their their plate, like what their plate looks like, their bandwidth, their workload, if it's something they even want to do. That Don't you think that relates to being reliable, like knowing what you want to do and what you're capable of? I do. I do. And I am someone who usually thinks about something before I do it. And sometimes it's not always uh, realistic. Okay. Wait, do you have an example of that? Well, I just think that there are certain things where you might not want to just like wait and like think about it. Because like there are moments in time where like you do have to be a little quick with your response. So my hesitancy when you asked me was that I don't feel like I am a expert at reliability. So I do feel like I've had a lot of experience and there's always room for growth. So I'm going to share my personal experience and how I am continuing to exercise this muscle, Mm -hmm. as you would say. Yep. And so when thinking about reliability, we're really thinking about being able to be relied upon. Sure. Right? Sure. And thinking about that, it's... Something like you would want to have, and it takes time and build like trust over time and confidence over time. Mm. So after several experiences, you know, being able to be confident that I'm going to get the same result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what I expect. And that could be both positive or negative. So someone can be reliable that they're always on time. Yeah. Or Or (laughs) we can rely on them to always not be on time. I love this concept, and I think it's not talked about enough that... Like it, with people who are inconsistent, they're con- they could be consistently inconsistent. Mm-hmm. They actually are being consistent because they're following that same pattern. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is we have to kind of recognize in maybe ourselves and others that sometimes they're going to be reliable to not be reliable. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And we know who those people are in our lives. You can think about them right now. I'm sure, sure there's can, a name coming to And you. you might be the person. If you can't think of anyone, it's you. You might be. And yeah. that's Okay. Why is it okay, Kate? Because we can always grow. And just because something is current 
the situation, that doesn't mean it right. can't change. Okay, I do love that, right? And I think that's what this season is about. Some folks have a foundation of some of these qualities already, and they're just going to be increasing that quality. And some folks are starting from square zero or negative, negative one, and they're going to be uh, moving forward. So you think this is a learned skill? Yes, I think it's a learned skill. I think that it might come easier to some, yeah. just like certain skills and talents do. Sure. But I definitely think that it's not a, it's never going to happen, I can never be it kind of situation. Now, let's talk about you mm-hmm. and your childhood. Mm. So do we think that because of growing up with siblings mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you had to be, you were relied on mm-hmm. because of that, mm-hmm. do you think you were born reliable or you had to become reliable for your situation? Mm. So I think that as the eldest, Mm -hmm. that there is some responsibilities that are given to the eldest child. And so I feel like I learned to be reliable and there were certain situations where I wasn't, I didn't have the option to not be reliable. Ooh. Oh, that's a good point too, that sometimes you don't have the choice you have. Well, what happened if someone, if you weren't reliable in that moment? Something not great. It just wouldn't get done. It wouldn't have gotten done. So sometimes you you have a choice and sometimes you don't. Mm-hmm. And if you don't do it, there's going to be a consequence mm-hmm. and that thing might not happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're saying this muscle can be grown. Mm-hmm. Some folks already have a talent for it. Some folks learn it. Um, I think it's ironic that we're talking about reliability and you – are in the research field Mm -hmm. and one has to have reliability. Can you talk about how that kind of relates to research? Like what what do we say reliability is in the research field? Well, I I think it depends on each particular project, task, research, study. And for me, uh, reliability has played into two different roles. And so one is to be a reliable like coder and observer. And so that's a little bit more specific. So all of our veterinarian researchers out there, um, or you might not be in the research field, but you may be participating in a research study in the future. So in order to be reliable, it's that I have the same successful result over time. And so as an observer in classrooms or using particular tools that I've been trained in, we have to every year take a reliability test. And we do have time to where if we don't get it right the first time, you have another option. So there's usually like a few of those tries. So it's not like if I don't get it one time, I will never get it. So that's what's really great about reliability is that you have time to practice. And then as I am continuing to do it, then I become like a reliable coder. That's deep. Which means we all have the same like lens and we're looking at it in a particular way for the research that's called to. Which is important because if we're all looking at it from different views, then it really can't, we we don't know if the results are accurate or not. You have to be coming at it from the same way. And it's really used to inform our decision making and what type of treatments or what type of services we're going to provide in the future in that particular field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other type, because that's more of reliability in the sense of like a noun, like I'm being a reliable coder, reliable observer. There's also the reliability in the sense of like the adjective. So that's kind of more about what am I doing every day? that others are beginning to trust that I will or will not do. Mm, mm. And so we talked about uh, the role that we have both had as a teacher. Mm-hmm. I've also had a role and so have you as a trainer and a coach and a supervisor. And all of that is to say that reliability, those who I was supervising, those who I was coaching, those who I was training, they relied on me to give them the advice, the experience that I have, the education, all of the information that I have from research, from trainings, from books, and really giving them what is best for their classroom, for their children, for their particular situation, and to be able to provide them with several different tools that they can use. And so knowing that whenever I come in to the classroom or whenever I'm training them, they'll know that I will provide them with some sort of like useful, supportive 
information and services so they can have a more enjoyable, easy, and effective time in the classroom. Yeah. Okay. So they relied on you to give them what they needed Mm -hmm. from wherever they were at. Like you scaffolded for Mm -hmm. each person. Okay. This person's kind of in this situation, they need this book or they need this piece of advice or they need a break from like working with this kiddo for right now. Mm -hmm. Now, but I feel like you're also hinting at they rely on you to be who you are. So they come to learn your qualities, your characteristics, who you are as a leader, and they can trust that when they see you at any given moment, they're going to get Katie. And and what I'm getting at here is I feel like sometimes folks haven't learned themselves yet, and you, you just really never know what you're going to get with that person. Maybe they're a bit of a loose cannon. Maybe there's some mood swings going on. They're a bit all over the place. Do you think it's important as a leader, as a future veterinarian, that folks can rely on the quality of your character as well? Yes, I do think that's very important. And thank you for saying all those, you know, kind things about myself. (laughs) Something that I really think is important and that the listener to be able to think about during this podcast and during throughout their day is a question that I constantly ask myself. And it's what do I want to be known for? Mm. How do I want Mm. people to feel when they think about me or when they're around me? And after I am gone, like, how do they feel about me and my presence, which is exactly what you were just talking about knowing that they can rely on me to be who I am, to be as supportive as I possibly can be, knowing that I do make mistakes, but being able to own those mistakes and um, be as real as I possibly can Mm. and present in that moment. Reliable. Mm. I think when we, when I originally see reliability on this VEMCAST form, my immediate thought is, okay, they show up on time, but I think we're getting even deeper into No, it's that I can depend on this person. I trust this person. I know who they are. I'm, I know who I'm getting when I'm with this person. And those are qualities that are built, like you mentioned, over time. Also with self-reflection, figuring out who we are, asking ourselves that why statement, like, who am I? What do I want to know, be known for? Why am I here? What is my purpose? All of that. If you can be exuding those qualities around professionals, they're going to have a much easier time marking you as excellent for reliable. So, Katie, my question to you is, how are we building these muscles? Like, how are we getting to our why? How are how are you becoming more reliable on a day to day basis? So I think. How students can build their reliability muscles and something to think about is to first acknowledge where it's really working already. Okay. For you. Okay. So being able to look throughout the day at the times where I am being reliable, for example, I'm sure most of our listeners are already practicing reliability because they might have a child of their own. They might have a pet. Oh, big! I mean, maybe on the nose, (laughs) on the little fluffy nose there. Yeah. Uh, Plants even. So I don't have a child or or an animal pet, um, but I do have plants. Yep. And so they are relying on us for uh, definitely needs. Yeah. Survival needs. Yeah. So there's already some places where you're probably being reliable. Okay. I like this. So kind of starting off with that gold star, like I'm already doing it in some areas. Yes. Brushing our teeth every day. Getting out of bed. Your teeth are thanking you. Exercise. (laughs) So the next thing to think about is once I know what's really working well in an area that is I find I'm feeling comfortable in, would be to think about an area that I would want to focus on or enhance. Mm. Mm. And so there might be another area where I'm not as reliable or as uh, trustworthy worthy consistent Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and so thinking about that in small little efforts Mm. is I think something very helpful and to be very realistic Mm. about the area that I want to like focus on Mm -hmm. and what are these again small consistent efforts that I can do because when I think about something too big yes then I get overwhelmed Are we looking at this? Are we writing some things down? Are we setting some smart goals? What are we, how are we putting it into practical everyday use? So uh, it's interesting that you said smart goals because that was actually going to be one of my suggestions. Classic. Yes. So it's almost like we've lived together before. (laughs) I think it's really important to have realistic goals and commitments 
And I think that what I would want to do first, or at least try to do first, is become reliable within myself and to myself. And I think that if I can't get there yet, which is understandable, I would want to think about someone else who I'd want to be reliable for. So I had a mentor and she really taught me that sometimes I need to do things for other people before I can learn to do it for myself. And and that's okay. So like I can love someone else enough to be able to try to set those goals, to be reliable, to be dependable, to show up for them, even if I can't do it for myself by myself. So once I learn how to be able to do it for someone else, that kind of creates a habit. And then I can have more confidence in being able to start to do things and be more dependable for myself and for my own set of goals. Because it might be easier to do it with someone else for someone else first before I do it for myself. Did Audrey teach you that? Mm -hmm. I feel like I did not get that lesson from her. And I like that because I feel like the general narrative is like, you can't do for others unless you do for yourself and always put your oxygen mask on first. But what you're saying is if we can't do that yet because of our own either baggage issues, whatever, we're not reliable to ourselves, but we're more reliable for someone else, getting those habits in place could help us for ourselves. Right. So I might not have enough energy drive to like make dinner for myself to be reliable to like give my body nutrients and what it needs, but I might cook a meal for my best friend. Dang. Or my significant other. Sure, sure. And so it's kind of thinking about that and being able to start there. Okay. Um, if I can't start within myself first. And if I can start with, my first, with myself first, then that's great. Uh, another thing that you're hinting at is one of my favorite personality quizzes, which is the Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. I've had you take this. Remind me again. Yeah, you're an upholder, as am I, but yeah. I also think you're a questioner but okay mm-hmm. so there are four mm-hmm. tendencies we're we'll probably gonna t- we're probably gonna talk about this a lot this season on the podcast but they're upholder obliger questioner and rebel upholders can meet outer and inex- outer and inner expectations equally so what you're saying about being able to make a meal for yourself but also a friend mm-hmm. obligers meet outer expectations but not inner expectations so i think that's what you're talking about with the folks who can't do for themselves yet so for somebody who wants to start going to the gym it would be better to have accountability partner to go with because you might not go by yourself but you'll go with someone else yes questioners are folks who meet inner expectations and not outer expectations they're very much asking why why should i why do i need to do this and if you want a questioner to do something you need to give them research reasons, the whole backlog, and then they will do it. So for example, one of my vet students who's going to be on this uh, season of the podcast, I told her she should start going to the gym earlier. And she's like, there's no way that's happening. And I knew she was a questioner. And so I told her, here's why you should do that. And I told her, one, you get it out of the way in the morning. Two, you're going to get your water and your steps in. So you're going to start your day off right. Three, I'll drive you. So now she uh, won't have to worry about gas. So you have to know each person. And then finally, for the fourth uh, tendency is the rebel. They're not meeting any expectations. They n- might know something is really good for them, but because of their personality, they kind of have that like defiant? defiant. They're defiant. And it sounds bad, but rebels can actually be really like fabulous citizens. And the way to get a rebel to do something is it has to be a part of their identity. So if you want someone to be reliable and they're a rebel, they need to identify with being reliable. But what I hear you saying is knowing ourselves and our tendencies can really help us to build that reliability muscle. Right. And then it becomes more of a habit. So like if I start, whether it's in within myself or if I'm starting with someone else to build this reliability, it's now something that I learn to do over time. And I read a quote recently from a book called The Power of Habit. Mm. Have you read that book? No, but it sounds right up my alley. It's a really good book, Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do and How to Change It by Charles Duhigg. And uh, the quote that he uses in there is habits, scientists say, emerge because the brain is constantly looking for ways to save effort. A hundred percent. So if we're making these habits, because we can have good or bad habits, as we know. Yes. So if we're creating these habits and we're doing these over time, then that's when it will transfer throughout all areas of my life. Yeah, because, I mean, decision fatigue is real. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't have habits in place and every time I'm brought with a choice Mm -hmm. and I have to keep choosing and choosing and choosing, it gets exhausting. A habit means I don't choose. I do that thing. So if you listeners are deciding I'm going to be reliable... 
And if reliability to you means showing up on time somewhere or following through with a commitment, you don't decide. When it comes on your plate, you're like, I, I know that this is a habit that I keep. I'm reliable and I'm going to do it. And what's great is that when I'm setting these goals, I don't need to only think of just reliability in mind. Like I can be thinking of many different things sure. that these goals will be able to accomplish. And so when we're thinking of SMART, it's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Let's do Do you have an example ready to go for this? I do. Oh, wow. I mean, I should have known that because you are reliable. Thank you so much. Sorry. When we're thinking of specific, it's what will be accomplished, what actions will you take. So it has to be something specific. Mm-hmm. So if it's, I'm going to be reliable. It's not specific. It's not specific. It's not specific. So I want to pay more attention in my meetings. Is this real for you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Specifically being more focused. And so the action that I'm going to take is when I'm in a meeting, Sometimes I get distracted because when something is said, I might, ooh, that reminds me, I want to check my email. Or, ooh, that reminds me, I want to do this. Or, ooh, I have this question and it's not the right time. Mm. So the action I'm going to take is to write the thought. Brilliant. Love down it. on like a sticky A brain note, dump. You know? Mm-hmm. Measurable. What data will measure the goal? When we're thinking about that, how much, how well, yeah. how often. Okay. So I would like to aim for, let's just say I have three meetings. Mm. In a day. Yep. So I would try to do out of all of my meetings, at least really be focusing and thinking about this for maybe two out of my three meetings. So you're saying that in two out of three meetings, when you have a thought, you're writing it down. Yes. Okay. Achievable. Is the goal doable? Do I have the necessary skills and resources? You have sticky notes and pens. I have sticky notes and pens. (laughs) That's it. It's right there. Now, what wouldn't be probably doable is like, oh, I'll just remember this. Hell no. That doesn't work for me. Maybe for others. Maybe. But not for me. What I like about having the sticky notes as well is it's a if you have those sticky notes in front of you, it's a reminder too. It's something visual. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then relevant. Does this goal align with broader goals? Why is the result important? Yeah, why do we care if we're paying attention in a meeting? That's um, really Great that you asked me that because I want to be able to be more present during these conversations so I can focus on the tasks that may be assigned to me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Questions that might be asked. Right. Next steps. Sure. If I have any questions about a particular project, you know, we're all hearing and learning about a lot of different things. So students in class or Uh, students that are going through particular trainings and all the kinds of things you guys do to prepare them. Yeah. That way I can focus on what's actually happening. So when it's over, I don't have to be like, wait, what was that? What was that meeting about? And what did I just forget that I was going to remind myself to do? And what am I going to have to do? Right. And if I don't remember what I have to do, then I can't be reliable because I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. That's full circle. (laughs) Finally, is time bound. So what time frame for accomplishing these goals? Now, are you saying is your ultimate goal like I will be a focused lady in these meetings? Like how will you know it's done? Is it or is it never done? Well, I it probably is never going to necessarily be done. I mm-hmm. think it's going to be more of like a habit. Sure. And so my end goal would be that I would focus on the meetings that are in that are happening. Okay. And so therefore I will be able to be an active participant okay. in these discussions and again have influence and say in next steps and what's best practice for our next task or project at hand. So for your time piece, is it going to be for this semester? The next, you're going to try it for a few weeks? A few weeks. Yeah. Okay. So that what I'm hearing is if it's a habit forming smart goal, which is something that we're probably never going to stop doing, the time piece is just, I'm going to give myself some time to form this habit. Yes. You definitely want to give yourself at least a specific number in the beginning, whether it's a few days, a few weeks, a few hours, a few months or something. So that way you can actually like think about it. Because if I say, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, then that's kind of overwhelming. And there's at no point will you review if I've done it or totally. not. Totally. Yeah. You have, to, you have to be able to review. You have to be able to review and to be able to modify if it's not working or if it is working and you want to go a little deeper. Right. We've been talking about the the great parts about being reliable and why we would want someone to be reliable. It helps us help others. It helps ourselves. We get to form habits. People can trust us. Can we talk about the opposite side of the coin? Can people be too reliable? Let's talk boundaries and when to say no. What are your thoughts on this? 
Well, um, mm, too reliable. So I think I'm going to approach this question as possible uh, gaps, misunderstandings. Yeah, yeah, yes, mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm, for that folks mm-hmm. might have, sure. Yeah, there's two. Um, one is... I just want to remind you that you were like, I'm not an expert on reliability. But everyone, she's got her MacBook out here. She has notes. And I do want to say, I just want to go back to that comment that you made. Who would be an expert in reliability? Like, it's not a, it's a, it's a people skill. We can, can we be an expert in it? I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's just from personal experience that I used to just like give all this advice because like I know all these things and it's like oh you came in with that mm -hmm. and this is a different situation something that we say in our family folks is it could be the same behavior but a different motivation correct you were not coming on here all all cocky like a big rooster hen no saying I'm an expert in reliability but Mm -hmm. it maybe had felt similar Mm -hmm. because I was asking you Mm -hmm. can you come on and give some advice to my pre-vet students Mm -hmm. that's interesting I think um that's just a random life lesson that we can go ahead and drop uh, in the booth right now for you folks. Sometimes we might be resistant to do something if in the past we've had either a bad experience with it or we uh, maybe didn't treat ourselves very well with that experience. And that keeps us stuck and not able to move forward in something that could be really good for us. So again, to, to sum that up, in the past, Katie, maybe in, maybe in high school, Katie uh, gave a lot of advice out to friends and people would come to her and that became, and I don't want to speak for you, so please correct me on any of this, but that maybe became part of her identity and she was like the mom of the group and that was where she got a lot of pride potentially. And then as we get older, we realize we didn't know anything. We were given out advice, but we didn't know it. So then if I'm going to ask her now in her 30s to come give advice, there might be a little roadblock like a uh-oh or an oops or oh, I don't want to do this. This wasn't good before. But it's a completely different situation. Couldn't have said it better myself. Okay. So talk about the gaps in knowledge with reliability. So the first thing is I do not need to do it all. And I don't need to always say yes. Amen. So I think that when we think of being reliable and dependable, it's like. Well, I'm just, I just know right now some students are panicking. There's, I, I can hear the anxiety of people saying, I do need to say yes. So I want you to say that. Can you say that statement again? That you don't always have to sit, do it all and you don't always have to say yes. Say it again for them. You don't always have to do it all and you don't always have to say yes. And I think what's really important to think about this is burnout. Mm, compassion fatigue in the vet med field. Absolutely. Two big hot button issues of this happens where they feel like they can't say no. Yeah. And that's also feeling a little maybe trapped since Mm. I can't say no. Mm. And what I found really helpful as a former always saying yes and still have to check myself. Sure. Is if I'm always saying yes and then I have a lot of tasks, a lot of other things at hand, I'm not giving my full 100 percent at that thing that I'm saying yes to. Right. And I really want to give my 100 percent in everything that I do. You have to decide what kind of professional, what kind of person you want to be. If you want to always say yes, you're not doing 100%. You're not giving your best every single time. So then you have to be okay with sometimes saying no. Right. And so then at that point, I will actually be able to do the things that I say I will do. Super well. Mm -hmm. Right. And become reliable. Right. And so that's what we would say to those folks, that we have to have boundaries. And it takes time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. I've heard from so many students by the time they become seniors in undergrad where they've learned to say no and to understand how big their plate is and what they want to put on it. And maybe in the beginning, because of excitement, which we might say is actually anxiety Mm. of trying to get everything done, Mm -hmm. they say yes to everything, thinking that will make them look more fabulous on the application or more fabulous to peers or professors or to family members or to themselves. And then they realize, I can't do it all. And then they push too hard and we get that burnout. It's not sustainable. It surely is not. And that's something that definitely takes time and experience to know what my personal caseload is. Because what I'm able to do might be more or less than what someone else can do. And we really can't compare Mm -hmm. anyone's plate because we don't know what's going on behind the scene. So the second thing is that I do not have to be perfect every Mm. time. Mm -mm. So when we're thinking about being trustworthy, dependable, reliable... I might think I need to be on all the time. I need to be perfect all the time. And that's not what reliability is about. 
it's being able to admit that I don't know all the answers and that I don't always know what to do. And then in that piece, then I'm able to actually learn and grow and gain that skill or knowledge that I might be lacking in at that time. So really thinking about if a veterinarian, right? I want to be relied upon as the one who provides the best comprehensive care okay. for my clients. Sure. That doesn't mean that I won't make a mistake or I might not know something. Right. I can then be able to learn from it, research about it, get back to the person. Right. So that way I don't need to come back from something that I said that might not have been the best possible solution or advice at the time. But if I admit like, you know what? I'm not really sure right now. I'm going to research this, get back to you when it's possible. And that way I'm able to be relied upon as a source that is honest mm. because I'm being able to admit that I don't necessarily know all the things all the time. And we'll follow through mm -hmm. and follow up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's how you build trust. Uh, Katie, you know, potentially you might end up having a student in your lab someday who wants to go to vet school. That could happen. You never know. And they might ask you to write a letter of recommendation for them. When you are, when, if you were to look at the form and it had the reliability piece and you could score them on a scale of excellent to poor, what kinds of interactions, experiences, uh, it, you know, conversations with this person would you be using to rate someone on reliability? Help the students understand how a professional might look at this scale. I think the first thing and the biggest thing that I was thinking of when you were asking me this question is, can I depend on them over time? Am I able to trust them and depend on them to show up? Mm. And being able to rely on not only their performance, but really, as you were saying earlier, their like characteristics of, of who they are and being able to think about how many times they said they were going to do something and actually did it. I think the biggest piece there is time. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm going to be evaluating how many times did they say where they were going to do something and actually do it, that can't happen in a day or a week or maybe even a month. And so this is really good to point out. Students, if you want someone to be able to score you on your reliability, you have to spend at least, how, how long, Kate, would you say you have to know someone to know if they're reliable or not? Oh, I would say you would need like at least six months. I, I was thinking like a semester. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because if I if I meet someone and, I, and they shadow me for a day, I have no I, I would I would have to check the not observe because I don't know if they're reliable. Potentially, maybe I could grasp that from some email communications that I've had from that person and how fast they respond to me and how polite and professional they are. Or maybe I could talk to other people who know that person and see what kind of reputation that person has. But reliability is something that cannot be scored without time and a relationship that's built. I also think. I would be prepared to say to that person that I'm asking for that recommendation for to be able to give examples of when I was reliable. You would give them to the professional? If the professional like asks. Because sometimes when we're writing a letter of recommendation mm -hmm. or something like that, we might write it first sure. and be able to give it right. to them yes. so that they can either agree, yeah. <laughs> make their modifications. But being able to have my own examples in the back of my head of when mm. I was reliable, I think is really important. But that's why we want to be specific and not say yes to everything mm. unless we can actually do it. Because I really do think it's about, did I do right. what I said right. I was going to do? I, in our, you know, with the vet students, sometimes I say they over promise and they under deliver. I've said that multiple times over the years, and that is not what y'all want to go for. You really want to commit to the things you can stick with. And like Katie's mentioned, mistakes can happen. So if you do have to leave a position, back out of something, you want to do it in the most professional way possible. You want to see if maybe you can find somebody who can take your spot. You want to find ways that that won't happen again. But that does la make a lasting impression on somebody. So you really need to be careful. It's a lot wiser to not say yes to everything. Versus saying yes and then having to back out. It's a bad look.
Uh, Katie, we always ask our guests to give a piece of advice to or encouragement for students who are really trying to tackle a large goal to get their dream to have the profession they want. What advice would you give anyone who's trying to to get something, to get that goal? I would really say, I'm sure people have heard this often, but I really believe that everything happens for a reason. And so whether something is working in that particular time, that means it's supposed to be working at that particular time. If it doesn't work at that time, then it's not meant to be. And that's something else even greater than I wasn't anticipating would happen. And so I did not think I was going to be in my early child care field that I am now. And so I am really grateful of all of the events that happened that I wasn't expecting and wasn't anticipating. Mm. And so I think really thinking about what I've experienced and being able to see the beauty and the things that I've learned and knowing that those harder times, because it is difficult what all the students are doing. You're doing a lot of work. There's a lot of things you're thinking about. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made. And so knowing that I am really doing the best that I can and it's going to be okay the way that it turns out because it's going to make me a better person and it's going to grow me with all of these experiences and these challenges that I might possibly have. And make you more reliable. Amen. Well, I want to thank my sister Katie White for being on the episode today and talking to us about reliability. It was really fun to talk to somebody who's not in the vet field, but literally gave just as valuable advice as someone who is in the field. And I really appreciate that, especially because this podcast, this season is all about the letters of rec. And there are more than just veterinarians writing your letters of recommendation, folks, coaches, professors, Um, managers, employers, these are folks who are going to be writing these letters. So I'm really, really grateful to have professionals outside of the vet field come on and talk about their experience with these soft people skills and give you all advice on how to improve those muscles. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Did you have something else you were going to say? It's truly been a pleasure. (laughs) Remember that time that I came home and I'm like, I'm basically a veterinarian? I, I do. Remember, and, and you did and not agree. Still sometimes happens. Yeah. Well, at this point, I think I have an honorary DVM, but that's fine. Welcome back. I'm Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Working in veterinary medicine does not limit you to a species, lifestyle, or a nine to five schedule. So listen in to hear about vet med and how to answer VEMCAST related questions from the assistant dean of admissions and success, Dr. Ashley Allen. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and I am so excited to continue season six with veterinarians and non-veterinary professionals to help you all understand the people skills from the VEMCAST letters of recommendation. And today, I have a veterinarian who I actually work right across the hall with, Dr. Ashley Allen. Dr. Allen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. This is my first podcast. And I'm really excited that you're going to talk to the students about understanding the veterinary profession. Students, I don't know if you know this, but on your letters of rec, folks have to check on a scale of excellent to poor about how much you understand the profession. Now, if you're having somebody who is not a veterinarian, they're probably going to check that box as not observed. But veterinarians are going to be able to check that box. So Dr. Allen, I think you're a perfect guest to talk about understanding the profession because you are living in it. Can you tell us a little bit about your education? Where did you get your undergrad? Where did you go to vet school, post vet school life and what you're doing now? Sure, Alex. Uh, So I'm Ashley Allen. I'm currently the Assistant Dean of Admissions and Student Success at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, That's a new role for me. So I've been a clinical veterinarian for 12 years now. I went to veterinary school at Mississippi State University. I did my undergrad here at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Yeah, exactly. And I graduated in 2010 with no clear plan for what I was going to do in life. I had tracked large animal for a long portion of time and decided I wanted to do small animal kind of towards the end of my professional career or curriculum, I suppose, because it was really just the start of my career. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then I did an internship at the University of Florida, mostly to get more clinical experience because I felt I lacked a little bit of the small animal experience. Is it because you had been tracking large animal that you felt like you wanted to do the internship? Yeah, I mean, we weren't like we didn't actually track at Mississippi State and like some veterinary institutions do. But my background was in large animal. So I had worked at a small animal clinic and that was my only experience really in small animal other than what I did in vet school. So it was more probably like a confidence thing, just wanting to get some clinical experience under my belt before I went out into the world. And then I fell in love with emergency and critical care. So that changed my path forever. And I applied for residencies and I ended up doing part of my residency at Auburn University. And then I finished up my residency at the University of Florida. Still at the end of that, I needed to study for boards, become a criticalist. And I just really liked UF. I mean, go Gators. Why wouldn't you? It's the best. We love it here. It is. It's fantastic. So I stayed on as a clinical lecturer uh, trying to figure out the next path. And I've been here for 12 years now. I want to point out that this is a get having Dr. Allen on the show because you are essentially in charge of admissions. So I think the listeners are going to be really excited to hear what you have to say. Now, as a reminder, folks, our admissions process does work off of an admissions committee, but Dr. Allen is really behind the scenes and up front. Well, let's dive in. Yeah. The BEMCAS application is essentially admissions committee members sussing out if a student understands the profession. They're looking for that through their essays, the letters of rec, the experience section. You know, does this student get it? So when we say understanding the veterinary profession, what comes to mind for you? Like, how do you know if a student gets it? I mean, that's a really hard thing, Alex. Yeah, it is. On paper, it is It is super hard. So where does a lot of that information come from? It comes from your letters of reference. Okay. So I think um, how other people perceive you uh, is very important. And what they write about you is very important because most of that is going to come across a little bit of it in your essays, for sure. So I would um, keep that in mind when you're writing your essays for any institution that you're applying for is we will constantly be thinking, does this person have a grasp for what it means to be a veterinarian? Yeah. And then the other part of that largely comes from your references. Sure. Do you think sometimes it's almost more being able to see how they don't understand the profession? Because sometimes when I'm reading an essay, I'm like, ooh, that comment makes me think like you don't get it. Is that almost a way to figure it out too? Maybe some of the things they might say or hint at? Yeah, I think... um, yeah, I, I think it can go both ways. Yeah. I think that there are some things in applications that make me question whether or not they understand it or just understand what they wrote and how that's perceived by somebody who is in the profession. Right. right? So you want to be very careful about what you write in these essays and you don't want to throw people under the bus no. in essays. Like you are actually not a veterinarian yet and you haven't been through that experience. Mm-hmm. So I would caution people to be very cognizant about writing derogatory things about veterinarian, specifically in essays. Yes. And I would recommend, too, using a lot of I statements. So maybe instead of making sweeping, broad generalizations, if you want to make a comment about an experience you did have in a clinic, Mm -hmm. I would make it very specific to you without using anyone's name or the clinic name, but maybe saying, through an experience that I've had, my goal in the profession is to do something a little bit different. Instead of saying, you know, all veterinarians are in it for the money. Like I've seen that essay and that was like terrifying. Yes. Yeah. So making it more about you. Yeah. What are your goals in this profession? And I mean, there is no need or purpose in throwing anybody under the bus. No. I I mean, I just don't think that that's uh, ever needed in this in this process. But what, what do you maybe you've seen some issues, some challenges, and maybe you have a different idea and take on it. So let that shine, Sure, that you are an innovative thinker and you recognize these issues and this is how you like want to proceed within the profession and make things better without um, bringing anybody else down in the process. Yes. What I hear Dr. Allen saying is come with a solution. So if there's been something that you didn't love, instead of complaining about it in an essay or even complaining about it to a supervisor who might write a letter for you, come with a solution about, hey, I noticed blank. How about we try this? That would be a a mature move. Fantastic, Alex. Yes, I 100% agree. Be a problem solver. Don't be a complainer. So Dr. Atlin, let's talk about when we talk about understanding the profession, are there any like key tenants or things that they should know that maybe this is a pre-vet student who's just getting started? Maybe they switched over from the human medicine side. Mm -hmm. When we think understanding the profession, what do they need to know? I mean, I don't think that you need 
the profession is so large. It is. It's a hard topic. It is a hard topic because because I don't the profession is so varied. Yeah. That you might understand one aspect of the profession mm. really, really mm-hmm. well, right? Like if your entire pre-vet life has been working in small animal GP, like you probably have a pretty good handle on that. Totally. And that's not bad. You know, I, I, I don't think that's bad, but I think having a broader perspective um, and just appreciating and knowing that there is more than just that one sector is in, is important. Yeah. Um, so I, like I would have experience in one area and good experience, mm-hmm. right? Because you want letters and to write a letter, you need to know somebody. Sure. Um, but I would, the things that you do outside of maybe that one area or like maybe of a job or whatever, like do it in something completely different. Yeah. Like when I was applying, I worked for a small animal GP. I was an assistant manager of a Western store. Oh, cute. Um, and then I also, I spent like one or two days a month riding with a large animal vet and it it, just to just to get a different perspective yeah because you might be asked a question about something in an interview people want to know that you know more than just one one area a large animal person might review your packet they want to know that they you get it yeah would we say that for those students who really understand the field in one area, let's say they live in a city mm-hmm. and they, they don't have access to large animal vets or, or someone in a rural community, mm-hmm. are there things that they could do on their own time, maybe take a class, listen to a podcast, watch some, some videos that could help them understand the profession as a whole and then they could write about it? Would you think that's legitimate if you're reviewing a packet? I'm an avid podcaster, so I don't um, – I, what I listen to is not really pre-vet material, sure. so I'm not sure what the market looks like on – Pretty on, much just us. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a – there's a My Veterinary Life through the AVMA is another good one. Yeah. Um, I think the things that you can do on your own to put yourself in a stronger position to answer questions in, sure. a, in an interview setting – is to really know the issues in the profession. And a great place to start, like I'm a huge fan of organized veterinary medicine, um, and I always have been, and a great place to start is literally like spend an hour, just a month, dabbling on the AVMA website. Yeah, There are so many resources on there that you can find. One of my previous residents has a blog and a podcast on emergency and critical care. Right. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff you can find online, but to me, there's nothing as valuable as experience. I think something that y'all need to be thinking about is students are making it happen. There are students who are coming in with large animal, small animal, research, extracurriculars, and they're going to be in your applicant pool. So maybe finding out how they did it, maybe looking into opportunities outside of your state. If you can do a summer internship somewhere, I understand that finances and accessibility is definitely something to consider. So maybe getting a scholarship for that. But you are competing against folks who are coming with that application pretty stacked. Yes. Who understand the profession. Um, On our podcast, you know, we talk about the importance of understanding one health. We talk about food safety. We talk about um, small animal, large animal. So listen to the podcast so you can get exposed to more parts of the profession. But Dr. Allen's right. You really do need to get that hands-on experience with a veterinarian. Yeah. Dr. Allen. Yes. Let's go from macro, right, talking about globally how they can understand the profession, to micro and your experience. Okay. Will you tell me some moments of maybe you really felt like you understood the profession or maybe you didn't? Like what were some aha moments? Yeah, I I have, a, I think, a lot of answers to that question, and it depends on which phase of life I was in. So, oh, deep, deep. Like, in undergrad, I worked um, locally for a small animal veterinarian, and I think that that experience was very valuable to be able to be client-facing and really understand both sides, the veterinary side and then the client side. Mm-hmm. I started as a receptionist, and I think that it was super valuable to my ability to communicate with people, yeah, and especially clients. I'm very empathetic to clients, for sure. Um, and I think the, the, the thing that opened my eyes, though, was I had a friend who was a first-year vet student, and she invited me to go on a trip to Hawaii with me, and I was like, why wouldn't I? Uh, and it was for the AVMA conference. So I registered as a guest. I wish it was still there. Yeah, I know. It was great. Uh, so Hawaii was great, but it was also like it opened my eyes to what veterinary medicine okay. was beyond my small experience yes. in uh, one practice. Sure. Um, so I was registered as a guest, so I got to attend a lot of things with her. And I I mean, I just really opened my eyes um, to the research that went on, like the CE topics, like the 
paths that you could go down. Right. Um, so, and that was before I ever started vet school. So there's a tip right there. Like if you have a friend or if you work for a veterinarian and they're going to a conference, you can register as a guest, um, with somebody who is registered as a veterinarian. Yeah. Um, and some, every conference is different about what you can and can't go to as a registered guest. Mm. So like maybe look into those things. But if you get one of those opportunities, even if it's locally, sure. right, every local place has some type of governing body for veterinarians. So Great we, tip. Yeah, yeah. So like go tag along and just like get a different perspective. So that was my, my pre-vet life. And then um, as a veterinarian, like... I think, emer- I mean, I'm biased, right? Because I've been living my life in emergency yeah. medicine. Yeah. Uh, but I think that over time, I think what's really opened my eyes and like given me just this huge view of the profession is it takes a team. There is no I in the process mm. of veterinary medicine. Mm-hmm. And so like that team might be you, a client and your technician and your receptionist. That team might be you and 42 other doctors in a ton of technicians and veterinary students, yeah. right? But there are so many people involved um, that you really need to be able to integrate within a team, work with a team, and have social skills. So you really believe it, this is a people profession. This is a people profession. Yes. Right? And I hear that some, you know, I mean, maybe when I was one of those people back then. I didn't, And I don't know. I can't put myself 15 years ago. Maybe I was one of those people that would have answered, like, I like pe- pets better than people. Right. Who knows? But that is that is not what veterinary medicine is. No. It is a people career. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Ooh, yeah. yes, yes. Love that. Okay. Now, you on the way over here, you were telling me that you learned about um, maybe deciding that maybe horses weren't for you, which I find ironic since you were were tracking like you did an animal science degree and maybe we're, we're thinking about large animal will you tell us that story yeah yeah so and and to clarify there like the equine world and large animal are very different actually so, so like, true yeah. so true so I, true i grew up on a cow calf ranch uh, okay and so like cows were my thing yeah um, yeah growing up so and i thought i was going to be a dairy vet at one time because i just love dairy medicine but anyways here i am small animal criticalist uh 12 years later but i i didn't understand a lot of the I was on my equine rotation, and I really did not have any appreciation for the business mm-hmm. side of mm-hmm. a lot of things that go on in veterinary medicine. And that is true across small animal, large animal, uh, exotics. Like, every part has some, except for maybe, I mean, it all, never mind. It all has some business aspect to it, right? Because people have to pay for the care that their pets are receiving. Right. Um, but I really didn't understand the equine industry at all until I was taking care of a mare um, that had a disease that basically affected potassium in her muscles and stuff. And the conversation, and I was, I just sat there listening to clinicians talking to clients and like the person, it wasn't actually the owner of the horse. It was the person that like brings the horse in and stuff and just like talking through the insurance part of um, the equine world yeah, uh, was, was very new and eye opening to me about whether or not they wanted to pursue treatment or not versus the insurance policy on the horse. Um, so that opened my eyes to something completely new that I had never been exposed sure. to and uh, gave me a new appreciation for equine medicine and that it wasn't my thing. <laughs> there, there's so many like layers and levels to that and hearing that one example can make us as listeners start to think about what else do we not understand about the the piece of vet med that we are really interested in Mm -hmm. and the fact that for some folks their animals are family members pets for others they're more about production Mm -hmm. Uh, there are folks who you know own cows and and they're not going to take them to the vet if they get sick because that animal is really there to produce something and if it doesn't you know that animal is no longer needed Uh, so it's really important for you all to understand maybe your values Mm -hmm. as a pre-vet and as a veteran veterinary student as a veterinarian what things are important to you? You might be a horse person who mm-hmm. loves horses, but go into small animal GP because mm-hmm. you might not want to do the equine part of medicine. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot. That's a very like existential moment I think to have of, of realizing like wow, there's a lot going on here that is behind the scenes. Yeah, and that I think that happens to you over and over and over again in the profession, and you just you you I you never stop learning. Like I'm a I'm a growth mindset type person. Oh, like, we I love growth mindset. Never want to not be learning. And I and I think that that's just a good way to look at life. Um, and another, like, just another example of, I was just, like, kind of blown away again, was I was uh, involved in SAVMA, so, mm-hmm. like, the student AVMA. And I went, I got an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and do some lobbying for the veterinary profession. Neat, so that neat. was just another, It's there's so many different things that you can do 
in the profession yes. that I've been exposed to. And, then, and even this, this new role that I'm in now, like I would have never thought yeah. five years ago, 10 years ago, that I would be in almost mostly an administrative role with a still my clinical role because I love uh, taking care of patients. But I, yeah, there's so many different ways to go, honestly. Oh, it can be overwhelming. It sure can. And sure. taking your time, mm-hmm. taking in bite-sized chunks, enjoying whatever stage you're in, not knowing where you're going to get to, might help you enjoy the journey a little bit more. Yeah. Dr. Allen, mm-hmm. let's say that a pre-vet student was working in ECC with you, mm-hmm. and they say, Dr. Allen, you know I'm applying to vet school this cycle. Will you please write me a letter of recommendation? Mm-hmm. And you get to the section about understanding the veterinary profession for that student. What kinds of interactions would you have had to have with that student to give that student an excellent on their letter? Ooh, that's a really good question. And the vi- the listeners want to know the okay. answer. Okay. So, all right. So the first thing is, is I need to know who you are. Right. So you, like, again, social skills are very important. You can't volunteer at a place and hide in the corner because you're nervous to talk to people and expect somebody to be able to write you a good letter. Um, you need to put yourself out there a little bit. Um, so that the person that you're going to ask, and I would, this is what I always appreciate from people is if, if you have this like chunk of four weeks or two weeks that you are going to be volunteering for something, tell me on day one, Hey, look, Alan, I want to go to vet school and like, I want to form a relationship with you. And I'm hoping by the end of this four weeks, you would be willing to write me a strong letter of recommendation. So I think that step one, um, because then I automatically like, have you on my list and I'm going to be paying a lot. I'm going to be paying attention. Yeah. Right? Uh, a lot more at least. Right. Than, because you, there's a lot of things to oversee and manage in any practice, clinic, emergency setting. And so if I if I know that that's your goal, then I'm going to be more aware. Mm-hmm. And then the as far as like understanding the profession, I mean, what it comes down to to me is communication skills, work ethic, empathy. You know, like I don't want to if I don't want to see people complaining and bashing clients yeah, uh, or technicians or other people that are part of the team like that already like doesn't really have anything to do with like the medicine part of the profession right. but it has everything to do with what it requires to integrate within our, the profession and handle the job and, and enjoy it long term exactly exactly so I think let them, somebody know up front that that's your goal mm. show up on time put yourself out there communicate look for those experiences mm-hmm. like there's usually so many things going on that unless you advocate for yourself a little bit, you could get lost in the weeds of everybody just like focusing on what they need to get done and forgetting that you're there. Right. You know? So you need to like be in it and, and form relationships with people. Honestly, the idea of going up to a vet on day one, that takes guts. It and I, I'm glad you told them to do that mm-hmm. because I think that gives them permission to try it, to to see. And I, it'll work for them. Like if you do a good job, that person, as long as it's you know available in their schedule and time, like I'm sure they're going to be happy to do that for somebody. Veterinarians do want to support y'all, but they can't do it if you're not asking. You have to ask. Yeah. You ha- you need to put it on somebody's radar. And, on it, and it also shows me that you can have that conversation. Yeah. You know, nobody's – like I can't imagine anybody saying no to that. I, I just can't. And oh, maybe yeah. it, it's possible and maybe some people would say that. Maybe they're going to be on vacation for sure. a week and a half when you're there and they're sure. just like, I can't be that person. But let me help you find somebody that Exactly. Can. And that's what right. you all should follow up with. If you do get the no, follow up with. And if, you know, Dr. Allen, if you're not available, who should I ask next? Who would you recommend that I ask? Exactly. I would like to hear from you since you are now a a huge part of the admissions process. You've sat on the admissions committee for many, many moons. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about just how you approach a packet? I think students feel better when they understand a little bit more about the admissions process. It can seem very maybe like vague or gray or or they just don't know how it goes. So as an admissions committee member, will you just tell them like how you look at a packet? Yeah. um, So I, I usually look for somebody that is very well-rounded. So, and what tells me that somebody is very well-rounded is a a lot of times it's partially what you write in your essays, right? So make sure, oh, this is another great tip. And I just had a follow-up with a a applicant from this cycle and told her the exact same thing. But we veterinarians care. Like we want to help you. uh, And, and I don't, maybe some people out there don't have the time, the capacity or whatever, and hopefully they'll be honest and say no to you. But 
ask the veterinarians you're working with to read your personal statement. Mm -hmm. Like, I know it's personal and it's supposed to be you, but, like, I think getting their feedback on a personal statement can really help uh, fine-tune some things that could be taken. Because remember, the people on most committees that are reviewing your packet are veterinarians. Right. And so um, I think it would be wise to to get some feedback but uh so your your essays to some extent for sure and then there's in in our and i think it's like this for all vimkis and i think most people use the or sorry web admit um platform sure so web admit is the website part of vemcas thank you yeah they they so when you all open up vemcas you fill it out and it looks like really pretty and it's very pdf and then when we look at it from our end on the office side. It's very, it's called web admit. It's very HTML basic mm-hmm. in your face text. Exactly. Yes. And, and at the very bottom, and I usually scroll to the bottom of somebody's application first. Um, there's uh, a category, they're like little tabs that I'm looking at. And those little tabs say animal experience, work experience, volunteering, extracurricular. Research and veterinary. Please. Thank you. Yep, there are six sections. Exactly. And I just open each one of those tabs. Me too. And that's my starting place because it gives me some idea of how well-rounded is this person? Mm -hmm. Like, do they have things outside of the profession that they're involved in? Because I think you need to have things outside of the profession that you're involved in. Uh, Do they volunteer their time anywhere? Do they have any experience? Before I then go back and I read all of their essays and Mm -hmm. everything like that. So, and I think that, I think that there's a, a little bit of a hack here that I can I can see why some people lump maybe they had a job right or maybe they had three jobs but they were all in veterinary medicine mm-hmm. and they put all of those under animal experiences I would say to spread stuff out a little bit because I can look at it I can click on this little thing and it'll tell me whether or not you got paid or not mm-hmm. um, so I know that it's a job versus not based on looking at the application but I think I would if you have had jobs and you have had other experiences with animals, like you went on did an internship or you went on some, you know, one of those trips to do uh, conservation medicine or like those types of things, I would spread it out. So I would put the things you weren't paid for under animal experiences. I would put things that you were paid for under jobs or employment or whatever the tab title is. And then I would anything under extracurricular. Like I, I've talked to people now and they to do like post packet review type situations and just trying to help uh, give a little feedback. Mm -hmm. And they have stuff that they just didn't put there because they didn't think it was relevant. Every time. And it's relevant. It's relevant. I want to see that you have some capacity for room outside of the profession to engage, right? Because you're going to do that for, I mean, forever in in the veterinary profession, you know? And so that skill set in advance, I mean, that's one of the ways that we assess that out and look at it. Um, so I start at that bottom tab, then I'll go back up and I'll read the essays, and then I open every letter of recommendation yes. in one web page. So like I have your packet open, I have already looked at the experiences, I've read your essays, and then I have every letter of recommendation open, and I read every single one of them. Um, and so I think make sure that you have people that know you um, that that write your letters. I just want to say that you and I look at packets exactly the same. Oh, really? Yep. <laughs> and it's... It's good for them to know because I think when a student is filling out the application, they're doing it in a way where I think they feel like it kind of comes out. Because if you print your application, it can be a 40 to 60 page document. And maybe students are thinking like, oh, they're going to look at it in this way. And each person really does look at the packet differently. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us do look at the packet from like an efficiency standpoint of let's open all the letters at once. We can kind of compare. Let's look at the experiences, see what's missing. Uh, So it's great for y'all to know that. My advice is always, if Vemcast is asking for it, you should probably do it. So if they're asking for research, even though it's not required, I would do it because we're going to see that it's missing. It's not there. percent Yes. Yes. So that's a reminder for everyone to listen to season four of the show when we go through the entire Vemcast application to help you understand how to strategize those sections better. Dr. Allen, when when Dr. Allen was working as a receptionist at that clinic, she could have put the receptionist work under employment. And then once she got in the back, that can go under animal experience, vet experience. You, I really agree that you should separate experiences if it's applicable. If you are in the, let's say, pre-vet club and you're currently in the treasurer position, but you're going to become the president 
I would make those two separate lines. I would too. When people do treasurer, comma, president, I'm like, that looks like you're doing both at the same time. But really, you had a promotion. Mm -hmm. You went for a new position. Mm -hmm. So separate those things out. Same if you change roles in a in a practice. Yeah. So like I was a receptionist for a year and a half and mm-hmm. then I became like runner technician. Those so like separate those experiences out. Yes. And I like I, I know that life is different for everybody and there are only twenty four hours in a day. And I and I so look at some of these applications and see how much people do, but I think there is really truly something to be said about paid employment. Um I agreed. A, a two week shadowing experience is not the same as like being immersed, being paid, mm-hmm. being part of a team and um, so I would I would highlight your employment experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Put your hands on something. Exactly. You mentioned extracurriculars and, and having things outside of the profession. Do you mind just telling them who you are outside of being a veterinarian? Because you're doing a lot. And I think it's great for them to understand that we really do want folks who have outside activities, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I have no problem with that. Uh, so I'm... Uh, Mostly a mom, you know, and that's probably one of my proudest accomplishments. Uh, so I have three kids. I have a two-year-old, I have a five-year-old, and I have a six-year-old. Uh-huh. <laughs> Those are fun yeah. ages, uh-huh. all to have at one time. Yeah, and there's different seasons of life, right? So you'll have different <laughs> parts of you depending on which season of life you're in. So, like, I'm in the mom season of life for yeah. sure. Um, but I also, the things that keep me sane and... Um, the managing everything is I am a runner. So yeah. I, I ran the Key West Half Marathon on Monday. And yeah, it was you did. awesome. And I pushed my two year old daughter in it. And it was oh, great. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that part. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. We That's... pushed her across the finish line. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I am, I'm a runner. I like gardening. I oh, yeah. Always... You have a ton of plants in your office. I do. Mm-hmm. It's like a little rainforest. But in it's there. beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Those are probably like momming, gardening, runner, yeah. running. Those are my predominant ones at this moment in time. But I think that, again, like depending on where you are in the phase of life, like I love to fish. Huh. Mm-hmm. I've always had a, a service side of me, you know, so I that's why I always like go for these roles where I can give back. Sure. In sure. Various ways. And yeah, I think I hang out with my grandpa. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. grandpa what? Yeah. Gr- gr- uh, grandpa Jack. Grandpa Jack. We yeah. love grandpa Jack. Yeah, we love him. Um, I think sometimes students get so focused on the profession that they're just go, go, go animals and they forget to engage in the activities they loved their whole life. Mm -hmm. And if you're sitting there right now and you're thinking, Alex, no, I've only ever loved animals and that's it. I would love for you to go find a hobby. Yes. Maybe exercise that we can all be doing a little bit better. Maybe you want to start to learn to cook a little bit more. Um, Spending time with friends. That's a hobby. Something to talk about. It's a hobby and it's important. Like like, you need to have a social Mm -hmm. de-stressed part of your life right. in this profession. Absolutely. Uh, for sure. And it's actually well documented in a lot of well-being formats and the AVMA puts out a uh, they do like a well-being summit and it's one of the top 5 things um to help your own like personal well-being is exercise and friends. I'm glad you gave research because I know and I don't do this enough on the show. I'm just like, go do it. And I don't give a reason. So I'm glad you actually gave a reason. Yeah, if I could remember all six off the top of my head, I would tell you. But well-being and friends are the two that I related with most. Mm. Uh, Or sorry, exercise and friends. And I try to combine them. So like my ECC world, we like to go for running trips, you know. So you all can feel like if you're feeling overwhelmed, combine a few of these things into one activity. And Google the AVMA top six uh, life factors that can affect your well-being in the profession. Yeah, specifically on the Well-Being Summit. It's a little PDF that'll pop up. Anybody has access to it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talking about understanding the profession, let's let's figure out some tips for them for what they could do today to understand the profession a little bit better. I mean, to be honest, listening to the show, I think it's something that they're doing right now to help understand the profession. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that they can build their muscles to understand the profession further that folks will feel comfortable and confident checking that excellent box for them on the letter of rec? Mm -hmm. I think to check that excellent box on a letter of rec, you need a relationship with that person. So if you do not have a paid job in Mm -hmm. veterinary medicine, I mean, we are begging people to work in veterinary medicine, right? We have a sign that says we're hiring. Yeah. I mean, get get a job. And get I mean, a job. Even, even and you have to market yourself a little bit because maybe they're looking for somebody that can work thirty hours a week. And totally. You only have ten hours a week right. in your life, but that that like be getting those types of paid positions yes. revolves around you being brave enough to go talk to somebody. Sure. These are my goals. This is what I want to do. I have great work ethics. I really want this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And, and put yourself out there a little bit. All they can do is say no. Right. right. And I want y'all to identify the problem. Because we're asking you to form a relationship. 
And you have to ask yourself, why haven't I formed the relationship yet? Is it because I'm shy and I haven't spoken to somebody? Is it because I don't have the hours to go and work a job? Okay, let's rework our class schedule. Is it because I don't have a car and so I can't get to a location? Is it because maybe I've just I've never really had those people skills, so I need to go watch some LinkedIn learning trainings to figure out how to make better eye contact, how to talk to somebody? Mm -hmm. So identify the problem with why you haven't built those relationships yet. Damn, that's good advice. That is great. That is good advice. Great advice. That's good advice. So, what advice do you have uh, for them, Dr. Allen? So, our audience is mostly pre-veterinary students from all stages of life. Could Mm -hmm. be, could be fifteen, could be forty-five. We also have some DVM students who like to listen. So, what do they need to hear from Dr. Ashley Allen for big life advice? Big life advice. Yeah. So, big life advice is to doing hard things makes you a better person so you need to like reach the edge of your comfort zone and push past it in life to get to where you to really grow and i think that there are so many things that you can learn right now via podcast youtube i mean you name it you can learn anything right now yes um sitting behind your computer screen not that i advocate for that because you need to have social skills and be able to talk to people but you could form a little group of people maybe you guys are all trying to get into vet school together and like share resources um about what you've learned and the things that you've you know found valuable online and stuff like that and there's your social aspect but you can but still have that time where you are sitting behind a screen you know and just learning more about the profession in general yes so yeah you can tie those two together yeah form yourself a little social group of people with shared interests and build a community around it and then share resources with each other um other big life advice things i'm a huge advocate and probably alex probably knows this although i'm not sure she does but financial literacy to me is very important. Oh, it wakes me up in the morning. <laughs> yes. So I think um, have a plan. You don't have to. I would like enjoy the journey. Like vet school was one. Of, they were four of the best years of my life. And I didn't know anybody when I moved to Starkville, Mississippi, except for my roommate, who was a UF undergrad student as well. Oh, fun. And I and just enjoy it and and put yourself out there to talk to people, build relationships. Don't get so funneled down into grades, 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 grades. Grades are important. You have to pass. You have to pass to become a veterinarian. But you also, I don't want you to miss the beauty of the experiences you mm-hmm. have by putting yourself out there with people um, and having that growth mindset of just learning something new that maybe has nothing to do with veterinary medicine, but I guarantee you will help you at some point in your life. With a budget. With a budget. Do it with a budget. Do it with a budget. If you do want to know, uh, learn a little bit more about financial literacy, our ebook on financial literacy is in our pre-vet toolkit online. Love it. Google it. It'll pop right up. There's some also great resources in that book for you to continue your education on financial literacy. Listeners, you wouldn't know this because she's being such a wonderful, quiet intern, but Carissa is in the booth with us. Carissa, I'm just going to turn this towards you. Um, real quick, Carissa, how are you feeling after listening to this podcast? Do you feel like you understand the profession more? What do you want to tell the folks who are listening at home? No, I definitely love it. I've had a great time listening. I've learned a lot for sure. Um, there's a lot of different aspects and I've heard a lot of great tips today. Dr. Allen, thanks so much for being in the booth today. Thank you for inviting me. This was great. I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. It's a vibe. I love being here. It's a vibe. This is a vibe. It's a vibe. And what is the vibe? Or it just is a vibe. It is a vibe. Thank you, Carissa. Yeah. I really need you guys to give back to me at some point and teach me the lingo things as I have three small humans. What did you take that from that when she said this is a vibe? Like, what what did you get from that? Like, what did that mean to you? Uh, it's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's cool. It's good, right? It's a good thing. Yeah, it's cool. It's not bad. Okay. Yeah. Mm, It's Mm -hmm. a vibe. Mm-hmm. I need to learn this this new language. We'll get there. For sure. We'll get there. Mm-hmm. Hey there, it's Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Connecting with people and sharing the desire of your clients for the betterment of their pets can build stronger client relations. Our guest, Katie Heisen, is here to share how she has developed a strong sense of empathy and connection to others. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today is an even-numbered episode, which means we have someone who is not in the veterinary field joining us on this podcast to talk about the people skills found on the VEMCAST 
letters of recommendation form. And today I have Katie Heisen, who is a friend of mine from the College of Journalism. Katie, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Tell them what you do. Like, what is your job? <laughs> My title is Report for America Corps member <laughs> at WUFT News. I report on equity issues. And reporting, that means I'm talking to all different kinds of people every single day. I'm producing those stories for our website and for radio. So you are the perfect person to come on here to talk to them about empathy. So empathy is one of those 16 to 20 qualities that these students are getting ranked on. on a, yeah, so it's wild. So I'll tell you how it goes down. So there's these skills like interpersonal communications, reaction to criticism, emotional stability, empathy, and then professionals have to rank these students on a scale of excellent to poor, on like their empathy. I had no idea. It is. Well, yeah. And vet med is such a competitive program to get into. So I think the application process is really trying to find the best candidates who are going to have to be the best veterinarians. Do you have a pet? I wish my landlord won't let me. <laughs> so have you, maybe you've experienced though, when you go to like the doctor, the hairdresser, mm -hmm. someone who's a professional and they have to have these people skills. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people think veterinarians, they're working with animals, but a client right. is bringing in that animal. And so the vet has to be empathetic towards the client. So the fact that you are working with folks on equity issues, mm -hmm. to me, makes you a great person to talk <laughs> about empathy with. Um, tell them how you even got into your position, because it's a little bit unique and they've maybe never even heard of a reporter who's specifically looking for these kinds of issues in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a very odd career background. Um, but the reason I went back to school and went into journalism was to specifically to tell stories that belong to people that I didn't see centered in media. So you might hear them talked about, but you rarely see them speaking for themselves. Um, and so I didn't even know the word for that was journalism. I kept saying I want to tell true stories. <laughs> so I got very lucky in getting lured into the NPR newsroom. And because those were the kind of stories I was already focusing on, when an opportunity came along with a grant to report specifically on equity, it was a natural fit. Did something happen like in your childhood that drew you to storytelling? Like what made you want to tell true stories? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yes, I always love stories. And I think part of that was just coping through a difficult childhood. Stories were a great escape. Um, and then as I went out into the world, like I just – I was always bad at my job because the thing I wanted to be doing was listening to other people's stories. Mm. So whatever my job was, was not getting done. And I was just asking all these questions. That's funny. And, yeah. And wanting to tell other people's stories. And so I didn't realize you could have a job doing that. Yeah. I know that sounds crazy, but people where I'm from were not journalists. <laughs> and it just wasn't on my radar at all. And so now getting to do this every day for my job is like such a treat. Yeah, like you found your why. Oh, I'd, I'd do it for free, but do not tell my <laughs> boss. I definitely want the paycheck. You're definitely, I think, speaking to these students because it sounds like you really have a passion for this work and these types of folks. And these students have a passion for animals and clients. So this is just a great fit and a great matchup. We're talking about empathy. Now, what is your definition of empathy? Do, is it a word that you think about often? Is it part of who you are? Like, what is your, like, relationship with empathy? I don't dig into it in the way that, like, Brene Brown. Gosh, I love, I, not. I love Brene Brown. <laughs> so I'm not, like, I'm not super analytical about it. If I were defining it on the fly right now, I would say it's the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand that if you were in the same set of circumstances and had the same set of life experiences, being able to understand how you might have made the same decisions or you might feel the same way they're feeling about something. Oh, I love that because I think, especially in vet med, a lot of ethical things can come up where let's say a client walks in the door and they want you to they only have $500, mm -hmm. but as the veterinarian, you want them to spend maybe like 3000 to give them that gold standard of care. Mm -hmm. And so being able to put yourself in their shoes and say, okay, how, how would I be if I only had $500? Right. Or if they maybe don't understand the science and the medicine behind it and ask yourself, well, who was I before I understood the science and mm -hmm. the medicine? So I love this idea of how would I feel if I were in their exact circumstances? Mm -hmm. 
And do we agree that you don't have to have gone through that experience to be empathetic to somebody? No, I almost think the muscle of empathy is the ability to do that when you haven't been. Mm. And I actually think I can find it harder to practice good empathy when my experiences are similar to the person. Yes. Because it can make you project too much. Yes. And you start over identifying where you're like, oh, they must feel the same way I do. Yes. Because I went through the same thing. Mm-hmm. And then you're no longer listening well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I actually think it's it's um you have to be extra careful mm. when you have similar experiences. To, to not make assumptions. Uh, it's a great point because I think sometimes students might feel like really heavy imposter syndrome if they're like, I haven't experienced this, so now maybe I can't relate to them. And that's mm. not true. You mm. have the skills and the critical thinking to put yourself in their shoes. And it really can mm-hmm. almost be an obstacle if you've gone through it. I know for me, um, I've torn you know both ACLs. So whenever I meet someone who's torn their ACL, I try really hard not to assume they went through the same thing that I did because that drives me nuts when people come up to me on the street like oh I've been there I've done it too and I'm like shh you don't know what it's like because you're not me (laughs) so I I really I really hear you is there something that comes to mind for you where you're like I've gone through something and somebody else maybe has gone through the same situation but I it's helpful when they haven't like something like that Mm. yeah I mean (laughs) Not to get too deep into it. I've just, I've been through a lot of dysfunction. And I think, especially like differences between dysfunctional families, like people assume everyone's dysfunction is the same or that what works with your family would work for my family. And those, those kind of assumptions are not helpful at all. And sometimes you're like, I just need you to listen. Yes. Yeah. Just Don't listen. Don't give me advice. Yes. I found that with some friends who have like recently discovered therapy and they're like, oh, wait, I have all of these tips for you now. And I'm like, mm, hold on. Each person <laughs> is different. And like, I, I'm so happy that you found this skill. But let's all, let's uh, let's just listen to each other for a second, because I think they want to fix it. Right. To me, that's a big thing with empathy. It's not trying to fix the other person. Absolutely. It is listening. So I think um, when we're talking about equity in your position, mm-hmm. would we say you're mostly working with vulnerable populations, folks who don't have their voice heard? Yeah, I would almost say I would phrase it as people who the systems of power are not built to serve. Um, and so they're, it's an uneven playing field and th- that can look so many different ways. Yeah. So in your experience, when you first started out as a reporter, do you feel like you had all of your empathy skills ready to go or you really learned those over time and how did you learn them? It's definitely a learning curve. And what's funny is reporting has really reshaped the way I think about empathy. When I started, I thought of myself as a very empathetic person. Like I would have described that as my strength, but there's – there. Reporting taught me that I was good at being empathetic towards people I was already inclined to be empathetic towards, and it revealed all these groups of people that I, like, tensed up around, that I was combative, that I already felt like um, I was coming at them from an opposing angle. Um, So I can tell you a story. Please. Okay. I'll I'll tell you the story that made me radically rethink how I think about empathy. I was out um, reporting in a homeless tent camp and this man starts taunting me. He was like, you're scared. And I said, I'm not scared. And we got into a very childish back and forth where he's like, you are, you're scared. And I go, I'm not scared. And we're going back and forth like children on a playground. Finally, I walk up to him face to face and I say, I'm not scared. I am here to listen. I want to understand your stories. And this man that was being all tough a second ago teared up and he starts to tell me his story. And as he's telling me his story, he's pointing to the shelter. Now these folks were living in tents outside the shelter and he wanted people to understand that everyone was saying they couldn't camp there anymore. They have to go inside the shelter. And he said, but I was incarcerated there. Like from the time I was 16, I spent most of my life incarcerated. Um, and so I don't want to go back inside that fence. It was a, it was a prison that had been turned into a shelter. 
And he's like, I don't want to go back inside there. And he was also explaining how now, you know, spending most of his life incarcerated, he feels like he didn't learn how to function in society. And and he mentions that he was incarcerated because he had committed sexual assault. That Those were his charges. Now, m- this was the second story I ever reported. <laughs> And I felt myself when he say that tense up. That's some. That's an issue that's affected me directly. It affects most women I know, men I know as well. And so I, I tensed up. And my impulse was to not want to listen to the rest of what he had to say. Um, I wanted to be angry. I wanted to end the conversation. I wanted to walk away. But because I was there as a reporter, it forced me to stop, set aside what I was feeling in that moment, not view him only through the lens of that thing he had done, and to to continue to listen to what he was saying. And so I kept asking questions, kept listening, and he started to cry. And at the end, he said, you are the first person who has ever listened to my story. And I, it changed the way I think about empathy because it made me realize that it's something you don't need to agree with a person on what they're saying. You don't need to condone something they've done. Um, You're not making a judgment on whether they're a good or bad person. Empathy is something you can practice with anyone and it only makes you better. It makes you more capable. And for me, it's made me a stronger person as I navigate the world. And it also makes your interactions more productive no matter who the person is. So you, the conversation will be better. You will get more out of it if you practice empathy. And I say that not, I'm not telling people they have to, right? Empathy is not an obligation. And especially when you've been hurt by someone or it's not a fruitful, sometimes empathy is not helpful (laughs) in certain, in the context of certain relationships. And so I'm not telling people they have to, but I am saying for me, even someone being so hurt by um, people similar to this man, that interaction was good for me. Well, there's a lot to unpack. (laughs) because it's a such a good story and so many layers to unpack of how to kind of approach empathy, the importance of empathy, but you also said sometimes empathy is not appropriate. So what I hear Okay, so what I hear you saying is you're in this situation, you meet this man, you're curious about the story, right? We're just interested. And then we find out like wait a second, like something in our in us goes up in our guard of like wait I, this is a this is an activator for me. Mm-hmm. Typically, I don't want to listen, but mm-hmm. for your situation, you're on the job and you're like, I'm I'm gonna listen. I'm I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm working. I'm working. So I think we should first recognize students is the key piece to empathy is listening. Mm-hmm. And when you're listening to your clients, something might come up in a in a conversation that could mm-hmm. be on your radar of like, uh oh, like an uh oh moment. I don't want to be here. Yeah. And you can choose in that Mm -hmm. moment, is it appropriate to keep listening or to move forward? Mm -hmm. You're going to be doing this on the job. So probably a lot of times you will keep listening to this Mm -hmm. client. And then you, what I hear Katie saying is those feelings and those emotions came up and you kind of said like, I'm going to put those on the back burner for now Mm -hmm. so I can stay present in this conversation. And I bet you went back later and looked at that and how it made you feel. Mm -hmm. So in the moment, stayed professional, kept those listening ears on, Mm -hmm. and then ended up learning something Mm -hmm. about this man and his story. And it sounds like it really helped you grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I love that even though those emotions came up, you stuck with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that will happen a lot because especially in vet med, there's a lot of emotionally charged conversations. Mm -hmm. And a client might come in angry in the beginning and, and we might have a an assumption of who that person is like, oh, this is just an angry client. But then the more they talk and the more we listen, we might find out like, uh oh, like they've had a really hard day or this pet has been with them their whole life. And how the man said that there was a reason he didn't want to go back in that shelter. He had a really good reason because it was his prison. So staying curious with that empathy, 
But also I like this point of like, if you're in a, maybe like a toxic relationship, you don't right. need to be empathetic to exactly. that person. Yes, yes. <laughs> you can move on. <laughs> right. So uh, if it, it, for, for the purpose of this podcast, if you have a client who is abusive towards you, we often say like, it's okay to fire clients if you need yeah. to. <laughs> and so maybe go so far with the empathy, but if you know this isn't going anywhere and this isn't a productive relationship for your mm-hmm. business, it might be time to move on. It might not be the right moment to be empathetic with that person. That's a damn good example of building (laughs) empathy muscles. Okay, so then after that story, do you keep that story with you? Like, do you think about him when you're dealing with, like, maybe a difficult, um, like, reporting situation? Yeah, I think about him every now and then. But what it did is it it set the ball rolling for me to – grow in empathy with each reporting experience I have. And I'll tell you, I have never once, (laughs) when I, reporting has revealed to me how many assumptions I make every day about situations, (laughs) about people. And the thing about reporting is that you don't get to hold on to those assumptions. The process of reporting forces you to talk to people you are different from to ask some questions and because there's this whole process of objectivity of fact checking you're challenging your assumptions and guess what no are they often wrong they're wrong no every time i hate that i've never been right or even no. when you're on the right track it's never a complete picture it's either incomplete or it's flat out wrong i've re- learned how stupid i am uh, in, the lo- I in a loving yeah. I, I, I hear you like you stupid <laughs> meaning you just didn't know stupid Stup- meaning You've just been making assumptions left and right. Oh, my God. I hate and this. I hate yeah, this. Yeah, and you thought you were so you were so sure of yourself. And reporting has really made me much slower to judge. And people, I think people often think of empathy in terms of, um, oh, yeah, I can have empathy for, they'll think of these marginalized groups. Mm-hmm. My challenge with empathy is actually I have to work on empathy towards people with a lot of power or a lot of wealth. That's where I tend to make the most wrong assumptions often. And so I think that the other thing for people to consider is um, to be slower to pat themselves on the back of, like, I'm empathetic. Mm. Okay, well, set aside who you're good at being empathetic with. Who do you find it really hard to be empathetic with? Oh, my God, Katie. (laughs) And work on that. You're right. It's like whatever comes easy to us and maybe naturally to us Mm -hmm. is not what's making us better professionals. It's going in the the growth. It's not the growth. It's going in the opposite direction. This season, we've been talking a lot about fixed versus growth mindset. Mm. And so I could see for a lot of folks, maybe it would be easier to be empathetic towards the folks who maybe it it is naturally like they're the underdogs. Right. It's a little exactly. bit more natural to be empathetic towards them. But when you say like folks in positions of power, my thought is like, yeah, why do I need to be empathetic right. towards them? <laughs> but their stories often maybe aren't told appropriately. Mm-hmm. We have assumptions about them. We see maybe folks with like a lot of money who are in these positions of power and we don't really know what they're dealing with, their mm-hmm. dysfunction, their backstory and having to set aside. It sounds like you're, what I hear you saying is like you're setting aside ego. Yes. Yes. Ego, assumptions. Oh, I hate this. My need to be right. I hate this. <laughs> and, and it doesn't mean that you're not still holding someone accountable. Absolutely. It does not mean you're not still setting boundaries. Yeah, right. Like, don't get me wrong. If you're in a position of power and I'm reporting and you've done some shady-ish. Yeah. I'm going to report it. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. But from a fair and just, like, justice standpoint. And complete. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm still going to flex that muscle of putting myself in your shoes and trying to understand everything that led up to this. Mm. Um, And the story is always better for it because it's it's truer. It's Mm. truer to life. And you can tell when you read a true story, it rings truer. And part of that is that nuance that you, and that three- Three dimensionality, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you only get when you stay curious, mm. when you work past your assumptions. Oh boy, does it sound like what I'm hearing you say is to have empathy? You also have to have a lot of self awareness. You yes. have to know what your pain points are. You have mm-hmm. to maybe know your biases. Mm-hmm. You have to know what kinds of things bother you, irritate you that you get excited for because you might be more attracted to those things and you might be leaving other people out, other yes. options out. How are we building our self-awareness then with empathy? Yeah, a lot of 
introspection. I also, um, I think a good way to like test these things in more of a lab setting before you're unleashing yourself on real people in the world is to just read a lot of fiction oh. or to to consume a lot of media by people who are from a different life experience or perspective than you. Yeah. And like think about how these things are hitting you and mm -hmm. why certain things interest you more than others and yeah. That's a really good piece of advice is to maybe list out some of your identities and then go and seek fiction or media from someone who comes from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. different identities. Do you have maybe like, is are there any stories or media that stand out to you that have helped you? Hmm. Hmm. I'd, I'd have to sit and really, I'd have to sit and think about it, but I'm a, I'm a huge reader and I've been reading from a very young age. And I think that, you know, I grew up in a, a, a small rural town. There were a lot of things around me that could have influenced me to to be racist, to mm -hmm. have um, to be bigoted in various different ways. Sure. And I think reading kept my mind soft and inclined towards empathy in a way maybe it wouldn't have. Wow. Otherwise, and so I just. I would just tell people, like, and it doesn't have to be reading. If you're not a reader, sure. if you want to watch a TV show or whatever, but to constantly immerse yourself in other people's experiences mm. until you lose that thing in your head mm -hmm. that says, my experience is is it is right is the dominant experience. Yeah, sure. Like immerse yourself so much until you move through the world understanding mm -hmm. you are one tiny piece. So tiny. And and everyone you pass is coming through life with a different filter than you. Staying super open-minded. I, I also heard something the other day. My sister read a book, and she's like, instead of approaching somebody like, what's wrong with them? Mm -hmm. Saying like, what happened to them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes it's nothing bad. It's just like how someone was raised and, and asking yourself like, because if I'm saying, what's wrong with you? That's me. I'm on the defense. But like what happened here? What happened to you? Who are you? That's much more curious, fascinated. Yeah. Wow. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> we're going to church. We're, today. Going, we're at church. We have arrived. OK. <laughs> I think it is really helpful because even in the classroom, I see DVM students see folks with different opinions than them. So let's take like vegans versus meat eaters. Mm -hmm. Very strong beliefs and mm -hmm. values in either one of those areas. And maybe empathy is I can listen, I can stay calm, I can have a conversation with this person, I don't have to agree with them. Mm -hmm. But I can I can be in the moment present with them and still respect them. And sometimes we don't see that. Sometimes mm -hmm. folks are like, I'm not even talking to them, I don't want to, I'm not interested, we're too different. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have issues like long term mm. if we're say we t we're too different. So what are some things they can think about to stay in those maybe difficult conversations for them when they're with someone who has such a different viewpoint than them, but to still be able to stay calm and curious? Yeah, here's the thing. You're not going to get anything out of it if all you do is focus on your side of it and reiterating things <laughs> that you already know and believe, right. you're going to walk away from that conversation feeling like you just wasted 10 minutes arguing with someone and you haven't changed or learned or grown in any mm -hmm. way. You're only going to gain, like our time in, on this earth is short. It is. It's valuable. If you're going to spend 10 minutes getting into it with someone, at least you want to get something out of that. And the best way to do that is to stay curious and try to learn something new about that person or about just an idea you hadn't considered before. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily change your viewpoint or meet them halfway. We don't need to, to compromise every time. No. But at least leave with more understanding than you started the conversation with so you get your time's worth out of that interaction. I almost see it like a game. Like let's <laughs> approach each conversation with, we all have someone, I'll say challenging that we are around, that we work with in our family, in our friend group. 
And maybe if we look at it like, ooh, mm-hmm. I'm about to approach this person. What am I going to get out of this? Totally. That, I think, will be really helpful for those of you who are, like, competitive, like me. And, <laughs> and you don't want to feel like you wasted your time. So it can be, like, how can I – and even maybe what you get out of it is, like, wow, I stayed really mature in that moment. I made mm-hmm. really good eye contact. I did <laughs> active listening. I It made me value my friends and family even more. Mm-hmm. But just asking, what can I get out of this to where we can both walk away feeling – productive instead of like defeated Mm -hmm. and the the best exercise and this was this is was really hard for me before I started reporting is to try an exercise where you just decide the next person that you talk to especially if it's someone very different than you see how long you can go only asking them questions unless they ask you a question back and just pre- say, just tell yourself, I'm only going to speak if they ask me a question. I'm just going to keep asking them questions about what they're saying. It will change the kinds of conversations you have. And it it really forces that empathy growth. Because it's not about you anymore. It's about them. Mm-hmm. Is that part of it? Like just making – because I know I think – I see in the classroom, I see students like raising their hand while their professor is still talking. Yeah. And I'm like, they are no longer listening. They're right. thinking about what they need to say next. And I think that happens a lot in conversations too. We're not, I'll use I terms, sometimes I'm not present and I want to get to my next point. But if we're like, no, I'm going to stay in this conversation and I'm just going to ask them questions about themselves. I have to be listening mm-hmm. because my next question has to be about what they just said. Mm-hmm. So it really becomes about the other person. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. It's yeah, and it's it also totally changes the nature of the interaction. I think people are really guarded when they feel like they're trying to fight for you to understand them or hear them and they yes. don't they don't okay. trust you to Absolute. be listening. Right. And so yes. asking those questions like it just softens the conversation. And I find usually they're more open back. Uh, to be curious about you back because you they feel respected and heard so they're not they no longer feel the need to like keep driving at it Mm -hmm. they feel heard so now they're open to listening back you're playing the long game when you do that yeah you might not see results immediately but you are planting the seed of I care about you I'm listening to you I value your time and your energy and that person probably eventually will come back around Mm -hmm. and that trust will have been built Mm -hmm. on your end. Oh, Katie, it's good advice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're married. Yes. (laughs) Do you find, talk about in a relationship, like a a closer relationship, Uh what does empathy look like there? Because I am not married, but I've heard that, you know, we can uh, be maybe the harshest with the ones we love the most and the ones who we have unconditional love for. So how does empathy look in a a strong relationship? Mm -hmm. It really helps with conflict. Like you're entering these difficult conversations or when you're having a disagreement with the objective, not of I'm going to win or I need us to agree on my side by the end of it. You enter into conversations with my primary purpose right now is to understand where this person is coming from and why. Oh, God. And and the thing that the new thing I've been working on that is really challenging for me, especially from how I grew up, I don't like when people express anger, which I'm sure happens in vet med a lot. Yeah. Anger or emotions where I can feel attacked by that. Right. I'm learning to actually anger people's emotions contain a lot of information Mm. and you're going to miss the information if you feel threatened by it. Mm -hmm. And so I try to now to be curious and say, wow, (laughs) in this case, my husband, this was really upsetting to him. Right. So why does this matter so much to him? What about it makes this significant? What am I not already seeing? Yes. Um, and I think that's something that people can practice, too, in the office yeah, with clients. Absolutely. With friends. So, Katie, it's hard, right? <laughs> yeah. Don't you think it's hard? And it's and we're never going to stop learning how to do it. And the only way we're going to get better is to practice it. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking resources for mm-hmm. these pre-veterinary students, you mentioned just practicing the, we'll, we'll say, the game of asking questions, like mm-hmm. asking that person more and more questions about them. We talked about reading and consuming mm-hmm. media. Mm-hmm. Are there other resources for them to, like, learn more about empathy, to practice mm-hmm. empathy? What would we say? 
I would say the number one thing is to to assess what your day-to-day life looks like, especially in your free time. Who are you spending it with? Where are you spending it? Can you at least move in the direction of spending more time in pockets of the community you're not normally in, around types of people you're not normally around, and think about intentionally displacing yourself in that way. I think that's a great first step. I think optimistically, I think most human beings are naturally wired for empathy. We just need to give to put ourselves in situations that require us to flex it. And so that means getting out of our comfort zone and our bubbles that we're spending all our time in. Like we tend to go to the same handful of places and be around the same handful of people. So just think like, where can I go that's new to me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, because if our circle looks like us, sounds like us, has similar experiences, it's gonna be trickier to practice empathy because it it could be easy to practice empathy towards ourself and some and folks who are like us. So mm-hmm. we we have to get intentional, like you said, like intentionally setting aside time. And, and I'm going to call this an empathy adventure. Yeah. <laughs> and then everyone who is very into to do lists and goals, maybe once a month, you're like, and grab some pre vet students, go with each other, and say, let's go on an empathy adventure. Mm-hmm. I think a, an easy way to maybe do this would be volunteering. Mm-hmm. Go and volunteer in the community. I mean, if you are in Gainesville, there's so many volunteer opportunities. There's lots that you can do to get exposed to others. I also think like colonialism is real. So if you find an organization you love, maybe sticking with that organization Mm -hmm. and not doing like a one-off, I dropped in, I helped, and I never Mm -hmm. go back. Mm -hmm. So if you find a community or in an area that is different than yours, that you really find a like a connection to, maybe stick with that mm-hmm. one as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love this. And I would even recommend go a step farther and see if you can. Um, ironically, I feel like sometimes the volunteering role can prevent prevent us from meeting people on an even level that lets us mm. uh, get that deep sure, with them. Sure. And so um, not <laughs> obviously please go volunteer. Right, right. But also like take a step farther and see if you can – also cultivate relationships with people outside of that role where you're learning and receiving from them Mm -hmm. um, can really help. Okay. And what I hear you saying is potentially volunteering does put someone almost in like, I don't want to say a position of power, but kind of like you're giving back to help someone who's in need. And we want to make it an even playing field, like Mm -hmm. sitting down with somebody and both of you sharing and and getting back from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the power imbalance there already sets it up where your conversations can't be what they would be no. outside of it. I, I, used to, um, I used to assist workers in the sex industry, mm-hmm. um, and, so, and there was a, a program where if they wanted to leave the industry, then they could go through this program, they'd have shelter, support, um, you know, job training, all this kind of stuff. But the... <laughs> Every time we had volunteers come out from the outside to, like, bring in meals or things like that, they assumed I was one of the women in the oh, program. Heavens. Yeah. And so – but it was good because I experienced what it feels like. To be talked to. Yes. And people do not realize how weird they're being. Interesting. Like, the way they're looking at you. Yep. And, it, and honestly, I think – it's probably hitting on that difference between sympathy and empathy. Totally. Like a pity yes. moment. Like, yes. oh, hi, how are you doing? Instead yes. of meeting you like a real human. Yes. And I've never been spoken to or interacted with that way mm. in my life. Mm. And so, yeah, just realizing also my privilege of not moving through the world, having people look at me this way totally. or talk to me this way. Yes. So, and I'm, I'm, I don't want the message at all to be volunteering is bad. Don't volunteer. No, no, no. no that's what not what I we're taking away. What I am saying is also yes. seek ways to be in these spaces where you take yourself out of that position of right, power. Right. And, and you'll find, I think you'll find a lot of richness to those relationships. What I really like that you said about the interaction you had when you were assisting the sex workers was it was a good thing that you were spoken to like that because you got to experience it. I don't know how it felt in that moment, right? You said it was like awkward and oh, like you've never been spoken to that way. But I think if students, if we can start taking the challenging moments and saying like, okay, this is hard right now, but in a week or a month or a year, I'm going to look back on this and, and I'm glad this happened to me. Mm-hmm. 
And there are always going to be lots of people in the world that you are not going to see eye to eye with. No. And the better you get at navigating those people, which nothing works better than empathy, honestly, to make those interactions better and yeah. more productive. And so the savvier you get at that, the the better time you will have in this short life. It, is, <laughs> it really is true. It really isn't about, it's not about winning. It's not about making them see my point of view. It's understanding where they're at because literally, and you're right about storytelling, hearing other stories. I've experienced this myself. The second someone shares a story of an experience I haven't had, but they have had, makes me so much more aware of mm-hmm. what they're going through, what others might be going through, how I've behaved. So hearing from folks who you disagree with it's just going to help you have a better relationship with them and make your life, it's going to make your time and your life a lot better and more, and like you said, more rich and less frustrating. Amen. <laughs> Church concludes. God. Yes. Amen. Katie, we always ask our guests to give our listeners one piece of advice. So these are students who are preparing for a pretty not only a rigorous curriculum, but a very intense application process. You've applied to grad school. You've gone through grad school. But do you? what advice do you have that you think would really help somebody who's in this time where they're, they're searching, they're trying to get that dream? Like you're in your dream, it sounds like right now. Like you found that position where you really find your value. What advice do they need to hear from you? Mm-hmm. Shoot your shot. <laughs> if, if you want something... This changed my life when I realized you ask for whatever you want. The worst thing that can happen is that you get told no, you're no farther back than you were. If you see something and you think I'm not qualified for it, apply anyway. If you have an idea but it doesn't exist yet but you want it, ask people who can maybe make that happen. Um, Ask, ask, ask. And I would say be really introspective about what exactly you want Say yes to everything that moves you in that direction. Say no to everything that doesn't. And it's impossible not to build momentum. Yes. If your goal is vet school and an opportunity comes your way and you ask yourself, does this move me towards that goal or not? And if it does, say yes. And if it doesn't, say no. Unless it's something you really want to do. (laughs) Katie, this has been such a valuable conversation. I'm so happy that you found time to do this with us and that you really have lived an empathetic life, I think. (laughs) Um, So thank you for your time and helping us feel more empathetic, have actual tools to get more empathetic and understand the value of empathy. It was fun. Thank you. I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. Should I have my mic pointed like yours is? Do you this know can help I, because then the plosion. Would, like I was the, literally, I was just thinking, I'm like, is she doing that because of the peas? It is. Do you think this is better? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I'll cut this out. Hi, everyone. Carissa here, the UFCVM communication intern and pre-vet student. Learning how to compartmentalize and grow your brain is essential in weed out classes in undergrad, as well as the rigorous coursework during vet school. Today, Dr. Robert Ossiboff, a pathologist of all trades, is going to shine a light on honing one's intellectual ability. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today I'm really excited to talk to a clinical associate professor at the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine about intellectual ability. Dr. Ossiboff, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So let's first start before we dive into intellectual ability. Can you tell me undergrad, vet school, in, internships, residencies, what's your academic path look like? Uh, so it's a very long path. Okay. Um, I did my undergrad at Loyola University of Chicago. I did a combined DVM and PhD program at Cornell University. How long did that take? Uh, Seven years. Wow. So then I stayed on at Cornell University for two additional years as an anatomic pathology resident. Then I did one year at the Wildlife Conservation Society or Bronx Zoo in New York City as a senior anatomic pathology resident. One year at the Bronx Zoo Wildlife Conservation Society as a molecular pathology fellow. 
two years back at Cornell University as a wildlife pathology postdoctoral associate. And then I did one year um, at the University of Illinois Zoological Pathology Program in Chicago as a clinical assistant professor and started at UF five years ago um, to start a new service for the pathology of aquatic species, amphibians, and reptiles. First of all, props to being concise <laughs> with that resume. I've never heard someone able to list it so well. It's a little to me, you've done a lot, it sounds like you've done a yes. lot, kind of maybe mostly up in the north, kind of all over the place up there. For someone who has a position like you have now, do you think they need to do that many types of experiences? Is that traditional? It really entirely depends on what you want to do with your life. For me, there is not a day that goes by that I don't use every bit of my training. So Great. I loved it, but it was a very long road, um, but it really enabled me to do what I really want. If I'm five years old, I come up to you on the street and I say, what, what's your job? What would you tell a five-year-old? Uh, that I'm a reptile veterinarian. I help sick lizards, snakes, and turtles. And, but are they ever alive or are they all dead? <laughs> so I am a pathologist, so most of what I deal with is dead. Um, but pathology is really important in the idea of herd medicine, which is when you have a large group of animals. And most often when we're talking about frogs or snakes, or, it's a population of animals, whether they're wild or captive. So while I may be looking at one dead animal, I am helping all of the other animals that are alive. Um, and I have a lot of background with amphibian uh, medicine in particular. Um, so very rarely I have helped our zoo medicine service with some amphibian patients. Sure. And when you're looking at the animals that have passed away, are you looking at tissues, the full animal, or does it depend? It depends. I'd like to do all of it. Okay. That gives the best story, but sometimes it's just tissues. Yeah, wow. Okay, so you mentioned to me uh, on the way over here that you don't really love Florida weather. No. But you're here because why? So University of Florida has a very rich history as it relates to reptile medicine disease. Um, and the state of Florida is really a focal point for um, reptile and amphibian disease, emerging diseases, invasive species. And that is all the stuff that I find the most interesting. So that's what brought me to Florida. What reptiles get you up in the morning? Which ones are you like, this is why I'm here. This is what I live for. I, they're all of them. Literally. But it, it is. Yeah. I mean, I get to see so many cool things. It, it, it's amazing. Coolest thing you've ever seen? Komodo dragon. But one that's on your bucket list that you're dying to see? Tuatara. Is that a word? Is that one word? <laughs> so, yeah, Tuatara is, um, there are five groups of reptiles, and everyone knows the big four. The snakes and the lizards is one group. Um, the crocodilians are another group. And then the turtles and the tortoises are a big, another group. And then you have, um, if you kind of group the snakes and the lizards together, I guess that makes four technically. Um, you've got the tuataras, which are native to New Zealand. There's really only one species, but their own separate group of reptiles. Well, I'm gonna pray that you get to see one in your <laughs> lifetime. We are not here to talk about pathology and animals, although who knows, it might come up. We're here to talk about the intellectual ability section on the letters of rec for VEMCAS. My first question to you, have you written a letter for a pre-vet student to go to vet school yet? Yes. Do you recall the form that makes you fill out all of the scale of intellectual ability, ethics, judgment, interpersonal communications? Do you remember this form? I do not remember the form. Okay, so the form is on VEMCAS and you have to rank a student from excellent to poor on all these qualities, one of which is intellectual ability. I wanted to have you on to talk about it because you are a favorite professor of our students. So. Why don't you tell our guests what courses you teach at UF? Um, so the course that I interact most closely with our veterinary students with is general pathology. And so that is a course that um, the vet students have in the fall of their second year. Um, but I interact with vet students at different times in their training. I interact with vet students in um, the first, actually usually on the first and second day of vet school, I teach connective tissue histology mm. in the intro to histology course. Yeah. Histology can be a little boring. Um, and then other times during the first year, I will teach the histology of different organ systems. So I do 
the cardiovascular system, the musculoskeletal system, the digestive system, uh, and then a lot with the students in GenPath in their second year. I also teach uh, a number of lectures in our reptile medicine and surgery course that usually is third year students taking it. Um, and then depending on the interests of the students, I also will interact with students in their fourth year when they're on clinics um, to spend some time doing reptile and fish and amphibian histology. So you're seeing them at mm -hmm. every stage of the game in vet med. Would you say that you identify with being a professor and like loving teaching the students? Is that part of who you are and, and like what likes, lights you up? Yeah. I So, you know, it's um, I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy teaching the stuff that I love, um, which is the reptile medicine stuff. Uh, and then there's the boring stuff, <laughs> which is um, general pathology is really uh, it's boring in many ways, but it's tough for the students to get through. And I love teaching it because I can help them translate and understand all of the facts into what is going to make them better clinicians. And that's why I'm glad I asked you to talk about intellectual ability. Okay, I'm really glad that I was spot on for this episode. Okay, so I guess my first question to you is, if you were writing a letter for a pre-vet student to help them get to vet school, and you saw that you had to rank them on a scale of excellent to poor in intellectual ability, what would that mean to you as a reviewer? What kinds of things are you looking for for a successful veterinary school candidate when it comes to their intellectual ability? I think the, um, the key word that I would relate to that is synthesis. And so students need to be able to take information from different places and put it together into one thought. So if you think about a lot as an undergraduate um, and you start a new course, your, at least for me, one of my biggest concerns was, is the final cumulative, right? <laughs> you know, do I have to remember everything yeah. from the entire semester yeah. to then finish the class? And, that, and then if you were lucky, you found out, no, it's not cumulative. You have three separate exams. And no, in your head, you're like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. I don't need to, I just need to remember things for this one month period of time. And then it can go out the other sure. part of my mind. Yeah. In any sort, once you get to advanced training in your education, whether that be a master's degree, a PhD, or especially professional schools like vet school, you can't do that anymore. You have to be able to retain the information you've learned in class A and then apply it with things you've learned in class B and class C mm. to then get the answer you're going to need for your patients. And so while not every student who wants to go to vet school can do all of that from the very beginning, you can see that they're able to start connecting dots. And when you can connect dots, you know that that student has great potential as a clinician. Wow. Okay. So what I'm hearing you say is in undergrad, if you're able to prove to a professor, a, a PI, an employer that you're able to take big concepts, remember them, and then apply them to other concepts in your job, in your coursework, that's a good indicator that you're gonna have the intellectual ability you need to be successful in vet school. Absolutely. All right, now is there some examples of things that you think could, let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a veterinarian and I'm interacting with that student who's serving as my vet tech, what, do we have any examples of things that they could be doing as a vet tech to show their intellectual ability? Because these folks might not be seeing these students in the classroom. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I spent, you know, as most veterinary students do, I worked three years as a vet tech before starting vet school. Mm -hmm. And um, something I think you can easily do to show that intellectual ability is start to build that internal library of the cases that you've interacted with. So if you have a dog that's come in and it has you know, a presentation of renal disease, ask the veterinarian that you're working with, how does this case relate to the dog we saw two weeks ago? What is different about this? What, you know, how is the treatment going to be different? How are the, the, the tests different? It's little things like that that show that you are not just trying to get through the day, you are really learning and compiling that information and taking that information to make you um, a better veterinary technician and, and then hopefully someday a better veterinarian. I could not have said that better. <laughs> Let's talk grades. Okay. Do you think grades are 
equivalent or give um, indication to someone's intellectual ability, or can there sometimes be a like um, a di- like a strong difference between the GPA and someone's ability and their intellectual capabilities? It's a big gray area, right? So I absolutely think that you can have incredible intellectual ability and not perform great in a lot of courses that make you memorize material and regurgitate information back, totally. right? I, you know, some of the smartest people I know never did any degree of advanced education. They have incredible intellectual ability. They, you know, some mechanics do this. Plumbers do this. Car- they're using that part of their brain all the time. The challenge with any sort of professional training, and particularly for veterinary medicine, we have to teach you so much that you need to be able to recall information and then do the synthesis part of intellectual ability. So I wish I could say grades don't matter. But in the grand scheme of things, they do matter a little bit. Um, I wish... Um, we could get rid of grades in vet school. I think that I could teach our veterinary students so much better if they weren't stressing about the question I'm going to ask them on the exam. Ooh, that's a drop the mic moment. Oh my gosh, I I get what you're saying because they really do stress. They're like, I have to get this A because I want an internship, I want a residency, or they've identified with being smart. And in this country, being smart means A's. And so you're right. That's a huge burden for them. And they probably would learn more if it was pass fail. Okay. So what I heard you say, a 4.0 does not necessarily indicate intellectual ability. We need to be able to synthesize our information. We need to take what we have learned in January and be able to remember it for our cases in May. It just makes a good veterinarian. For you personally, how do you hone your intellectual ability muscles? Is there anything that you do to stay like intellectually well? Um, I am addicted to work. Oh dear. Um, so uh, I, I love what I do. Um, and so I told you, I, I ran through that litany of things that I did to prepare me for my career, right? So I am a virologist, I am a molecular diagnostician, I am a pathologist, and I'm a veterinarian. Yeah. Um, so every case I approach, I'm doing that all the time. I'm thinking, well, what viruses may be present? How do I test for those viruses? What samples should I ask the veterinarian for? I do all of these things. So luckily for me, it is, for me, it's a part of my every single day. Yeah. It also carries over though sometimes into not work time. I'm horrible watching TV because all I ever do is analyze the plot of TV shows and look for things that don't make sense. Like, oh no! Yeah, I keep it to myself. That's I'm not be miserable. <laughs> okay, do you have an example of a TV show where you've recently done that? There's so yes, actually. I mean, it's almost every TV show. But I started watching. There is a series on Hulu that is based off of a short story by Stephen King. Um, about a guy that is able to go back to the 1960s through a portal in a restaurant, and he's trying Wait, to... Wait, I love that book. Don't give it away. Are you going to ruin the show for me? I haven't me? finished it yet. I don't know how it ends. I'm only, like, on episode three. Okay. All right, so great, I... It's a great book, by the way. We're talking about 11 63 Yes. Yeah. Okay, what's the show called? 11 63 I can't believe I... <laughs> All right, so go ahead. So you, what is it? Because it's, like, time travel? You have an issue with it? And no, I... Well, the thing is, is that if you say you're going to b- go back to 1963 yep. or 1960 in the case of when sure. he goes back. Yeah, he needs to. Well, he, we won't tell. We won't tell <laughs> we won't you give why. give it away. But okay. Um, everything you show me on that television screen needs to be needs correct. to be from 1960. It should uh-huh. not have come out in 1964. It should not have come out in 1967. Oh. And so I, I, I can't help myself from analyzing things that way. And. Has that been your whole life? Like as a kiddo, were you like that? Or did that become learned over time? Like, do you think some people just have an analytical brain? Like, when did that start? I think that people who are analytical are always like that. Mm -hmm. Um, It has gotten much worse in my age because, again, my work side of my brain has taken over so much of things is that that's how it's hard to shut that part of my brain off. Are you analyzing how things are going in this podcast right now? I, there's no time when I am not analyzing <laughs> everything. Okay. So now let me ask you this. If we're in agreement that some folks are analytical and that's who they are, and then you have some folks who maybe are not naturally like that, 
what kind of tips are we giving those people to get better about their analytical abilities and those intellectual abilities? What can they be doing if they don't really identify with, with being in that way? Yeah, I think, again, it's it's just like any exercise. You need to start to practice and train your brain. Um, and I was trying to think of things that people could do um, you know, just on the daily if they're not that type of person. So one thing I thought of, you know, for people that are not analytical, but they are into sports, yeah. right? When when you're playing sports, when you're playing a game of sport, uh, of either football or basketball or baseball, you're watching it on television, you're, you're not just living in the moment when you're playing sports. You are analyzing the defense, looking at, you know, for the football, then what's the defense schema, schema? What plays are they running? What is the offense running? What for baseball? What is the pitcher going to, you're, you're thinking about all those things. So if you're sports minded, you easily can tap into that. Okay. If you're not sports minded, then even if you're more artistic, which I wish I was, and I'm not, um, literature is a great way to go about. I mean, we, we talked about, you know, 11, 20, 63, I think that's it. Yes, you yes, know, yes. Um, when you read a book, a lot of times you can start to think, what is the plot of the book? Sure. Where is this going? Sure. Start to pull the little information that you get, you know, get from places. If you're into, you know, sculpture or art, that first stroke that you put on the, the, the canvas or the first part that you make with the clay is nowhere near what the final product is going to mm -hmm. be. Think about it step by step. How are you going to get from point A to point B to give you what you really want? And if you don't, if you're just a complete couch potato, <laughs> then just watch, you know, crime drama type stuff. There's a, there was and a- And like try to guess who done yeah, it? Who done it. There's a really funny show, or I thought it was funny, on, uh, I think it was also, no, it was on Netflix. It was called Murderville. Have you seen Murder? Right? I sure have. Yeah, so it was fine. It, did it you was see, okay. Did you see the Who Killed Santa episode? Yeah, I, I could turn it off. I got. I, got, uh, I, got I enjoyed bored, it. But for, uh, okay. okay, but tell them well, why they should watch it. It's uh, you know it's they it's a TV show where they bring in a couple celebrities. The celebrities have no idea of the plot whatsoever, and they present a crime to them, mm. and they drop little hints of what of who may have done it, and you need to follow the story and identify who. Did it. So totally. again, it's 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 collection and synthesis of data to get to an endpoint. Oh my God, you're you're mentioning so many things. Some of the ideas and topics I think I'm hearing are just like noticing what's going on around them, whatever activity that they're in, comprehension skills. So especially when reading, are you paying attention to the clues along the way to understand the plot, to guess what's going to happen next? Do we think that these students should do more like escape room type activities where they can test their ability to figure out what's going on? I, I think that's perfect. I have never done an escape room myself, and I thought about mentioning an escape room in the podcast, but I didn't want to come across as the old millennial if escape rooms weren't a thing anymore. So if escape rooms are still a thing, then absolutely people can go for it. I just wasn't sure if it was still. Dr. Charles, let me tell you something right now. <laughs> Even if escape rooms were not a thing, our pre-vet podcast listeners are so dedicated to this profession. <laughs> they're going to find the one escape room. If a veterinarian tells them to do it, they're going to do it <laughs> okay. in the escape room. I, I, I'm also hearing you say that asking questions of their veterinarians, professors, mentors is a good thing. They yeah. need to be asking questions and finding out why something is going on, retaining that info, and then applying it later. They need to be asking, and I don't want to stress people out, but they need to be asking thoughtful, <laughs> intelligent questions. I agreed. Because, uh, you know, as, as a professor and I interact with undergraduate, you will have students that come to you that, you know, want to show that they are smart and they're interested and they want to do things, but they show that by fact dropping. So you know yeah. how some people name yeah, I, drop? Oh boy, do I. Yeah. So there are fact droppers. They're like, oh, you know, this and this is this in this case. And it has nothing to do with what you're talking about whatsoever, mm. but someone just wants to show that they know something. And I, I do understand that. And, you know, it, it's hard sometimes as a undergraduate to try and show to a veterinarian or a professor or something that, you know, you can do those things. Mm. Just th give it some thought. Chill out. Just Chill relax out. a little. Um, let me ask you this. So if you got someone who is the notorious fact dropper, if you got their packet and you were writing them a letter of rec, how would you rank their intellectual ability if they had never shown you the, the things that we're talking about, those thoughtful questions, the taking information and applying it to others? It's just people who wrote memorization and word vomit on you. Are you ranking them lower in that section? Yeah. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so it is beneficial students to show intellectual ability in the ways that are quality 
versus maybe like quantity interactions, just having thoughtful, provoking conversations. It also takes emotional intelligence to form a relationship with someone to even have these conversations. Absolutely. It can't be some kind of surface relationship. You can't tell someone's intellectual ability just by meeting them a few times. Correct. Okay. Oh, I'm excited. We're going to go do an escape room is what I hear you <laughs> saying. By the end of this uh, semester, we're taking Dr. Oz to an escape room. Okay. These are students who want to go to vet school, but eventually they're going to graduate and become veterinarians. Do you think intellectual ability changes from vet school to the profession and how? Um, yes, and it it actually has to in most cases um, because when you are going through veterinary school, you are learning everything you need to know to graduate as a DVM and pass the NAVLE, right? Right. As DVM degrees stand now, when you have a DVM, you are able to practice on dogs and cats and horses and cows and maybe sheep, llama, you know, as, as we get farther away from the main species, less and less. But, you know, you need to know all of that. So your intellectual ability and your synthesis as a vet student is going to be very different than how you are going to develop as a clinician, because as you develop as a clinician, you are going to probably find an area where you are more focused. You know, very few people are going to go out as veterinarians and see that full range of species. Um, and you're going to probably start to develop some special areas of interest. Even as a general practitioner, there may be some things that you enjoy more than others. And so you are going to keep up on the field in that area with a little more detail. I so I am a veterinary pathologist who studies viruses and infections in frogs, snakes, turtles, and tortoises. Do you know how many lectures in vet school prepared me for my career? Oh, maybe three. Not even. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it. There's no veterinary pathology of those species. Really, doesn't it? It's hard to to teach it to even pathologists. Mm. So you may find that your career in veterinary medicine is something that you weren't even necessarily exposed to as a veterinary student. So because of that, you need to learn all new things. But the skills you learn as a veterinary student to put all of that material together are essential for your success as a clinician. Do you feel like you are also a good guest to talk about intellectual ability because of the field that you're in? Because it really couldn't have been taught to you, you had to go out and figure it out and find the opportunities versus maybe like small animal GP, which is predominantly a veterinary school education. Yeah. And, and it's also, you know, even pathology or infectious disease work in general, um, every case I approach is a mystery. Like I am, I have to find the answer. In GP work, a lot of cases will be a mystery, right? But you're also going to have a number of cases that are annual exams mm -hmm. or vaccines or but as a diagnostician in any of a number of fields in veterinary medicine, you approach each case as a complete mystery and you need to find the answer. Oh, I think I would hate that. Oh, I see. I love it. See, it's I, perfect. <laughs> I like waking up. I like a routine. I like knowing. See, to me, do you know the concept of growth mindset versus fixed mindset? I do not. Okay. So fixed mindset is basically I like to do things that I am good at. I know I will be successful in and I they like gold stars. Growth mindset is I like to be challenged. I don't care if I haven't seen this before. I do a hard puzzle. I want the hardest puzzle next. That sounds like your growth mindset. Yeah, that's That very much describes what I like. Yeah. Do you like to herp? Are you a herper? <laughs> I. What are your thoughts on herping? Maybe I, tell so, them what it is. So herping is um, you go out into the field and you look for free ranging reptiles or amphibians in the field. Um, and I think that the idea of that is so much fun. And when I lived in New York, one of my favorite things to do in the spring was the first rain after snowfall, all of the salamanders come out from their brumation oh, or their cute. sleeping period. They climb out even under, over the snow and they go to their vernal pools to start getting ready for breeding. And I love to do that. I am kind of an embarrassment to reptile and amphibian people because I don't love field herping that much. I am not, I don't like the heat. I don't like the humidity. I like nice controlled scenarios. I, 
I was able to do as part of my training, I got to go to Myanmar for a month and do work with Burmese star tortoises in the wild and all. And while it was a great experience, I, I don't have a huge drive to do it again because I like control. I like to be under controlled settings. And there's parts of that herping and that being out in the wild that is just everything is coming at you from but different you, directions. you just said you like a mystery and a challenge. Yeah, but I'm in control. No, is, I really... <laughs> retweet. What's your... I don't know anything about astrological signs, but what is yours? I, I think I'm an Aquarius. I don't really... That means, I, I, I don't, don't know why I asked. It doesn't mean anything <laughs> to me. So if you're telling me that a, that a bunch of vet students asked you to go herping with them, would you go? I would I would go. And we have a vet student. We have the Veterinary Society of Herpetology. Yeah. Uh, and they do. They go out herping. Um, I have been asked to go. I haven't gone yet. I promise I will, but... But, New yeah. Year's resolution. Do you believe in New Year's resolutions? Uh, no. Yeah, I can't. Okay. Um, <laughs> Dr. Oz, what's one thing that a pre-vet student could start doing tomorrow or today if they want to start working on their intellectual ability? I think it's, it's, it's every little thing. Maybe you do a crossword puzzle. Maybe you do, what was that popular app, Wordle? Is okay, that... it's still popular. Okay. Wordle, Quartle, and Statal, folks. Okay, all the doles. I yeah. think you could easily do, I mean, anything that's going to exercise your mind and make you go kind of into those recesses that you don't reach into all the time to pull things out, you are exercising that part of your brain, and that's going to really help you for vet school. What's something they could do a month from now? So something that's maybe not as easily to attain that's on their phone or in, in front of them. So um, I think a month from now is start especially if you are working in the clinic or you're seeing animals or you you know you know of, of cases is read up a little on those cases pull a primary literature article about what you are seeing you are probably not going to understand 80% of what's in that article but if you go through the article and highlight or underline the things you don't understand and slowly go through and start to look those things up you don't need to become an expert but you're starting to to set those neural networks in place that are going to set you up for success in med school. Yes. And then what about a year from now? Like a big ticket item where a year from now we'd like to see our intellectual ability improve and how did we get there? Um, well, I guess how fast you can get out of an escape room. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So you start it and you just keep building up yeah. that quick speed. Just set goals for yeah. yourself. You yeah. know, I, maybe I, I think my month and my year um, are kind of tied. Yeah. But a year from now, pull out another paper mm -hmm. that's related to the paper you looked at one month in, read it and see how much your knowledge has improved because yes. you've kind of started that and it, it you will actually feel really good. You will feel like you have learned something and you're starting to get into the field of veterinary medicine before you're even in veterinary school. To me, an attainable goal would be once a month, read a paper, but every month rate on a scale of one to 10 how much you understand it and That's then compare yeah. one from a year ago. Dr. Oz, any other advice, encouragement you'd like to give our pre-vet students as they, and a lot, you know, often I have a feeling a lot of vet students will also be listening to this one because they do enjoy who you are as a human. What advice do you have for everybody? Um, it's a long road. Um, you, you have to, uh, there's going to be a lot of roadblocks in the way. And um, one of the things that I didn't do well and I want everyone else to do is I only ever thought of my end goal as I was doing all of this, Even as undergrad in vet school. It was always someday I'm going to get to that place I want to be and everything is going to be great. Take a second now, stop and enjoy the things around you. Um, there, take enjoyment in the little things because it's a long road. And, you know, for some people, if you decide to go a path like me, it's just going to keep getting longer. And if you keep putting it off, you're going to end up regretting things. You are, it is all about the journey and not necessarily the destination. Um, so take enjoyment in the little things that you can while you're learning um, and make sure to take time for yourself and don't completely overdo it. 100% agree. Be aware of a rival fallacy, thinking that once you get that goal, you've made it and you feel right because you're going to miss out on a lot of really, really good moments. 
Well, Dr. Oz, thanks so much for being in our hot box today. <laughs> You're very welcome. Folks, take this advice, take your time to really start getting more serious about the conversations you're having with others, about how you're approaching problems, getting more into growth mindset, about getting excited about challenges. And then when you're talking to your professors, make sure you're not just dropping facts, but you're asking quality questions. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Um, it's really hot in the booth that we're in right now, quite humid. Can you tell me uh, what kind of animal would be thriving in this kind of terrarium-like <laughs> environment? Uh, most snakes would love this. Yeah. Some of the lizards. Guys, it's so know, hot yeah. in here. And we're both from New Jersey, so we're doing our best. Carissa here. I'm the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. It can be terrifying to try and correct something you feel is wrong, but being a veterinarian means being an advocate for others when there is a conflict. Join Alex Avellino and Ted Spiker as they walk us through conflicts management and resolution on today's episode. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today my guest is First of all, I should just start by saying this is a big, big deal today because we're talking about conflict management and resolution, which I think is a great topic, but also can be difficult to talk about. So I'm excited to have Ted Spiker here. Ted, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will you tell the folks now you're not a veterinarian? I certainly am not. And I should remind our listeners that every other episode, so even numbered episodes, are non-veterinary professionals. So you are representing journalism today. So will you tell folks who you are? where you went to undergrad, your professional journey. Okay, uh, real quick. I am currently the chair of the Department of Journalism at the University of Florida. I've been at UF for a little over 20 years. Um, on faculty, teach a variety of courses, focusing on magazine writing, sports media, health media. So there's a little bit of connection totally. here. Totally, totally. Um, and my background is in uh, magazines. Spent about 10 years in, in magazines before I uh, came to teach. I uh, went to the University of Delaware as undergrad and go blue, hens, blue hens, blue roll. Blue, is it roll fighting, hens? Fighting blue hens. <laughs> Come on, fighting blue hens. Fighting blue hens. And uh, masters uh, at Columbia University. Uh, no PhD. Uh, we're professional schools, so we have a mix of uh, mix of uh, faculty who are PhD and those who are more professionally oriented. But my outside is I still do a lot of writing and most of that is in the health space. So I do have an interest in, even though it's not the animal body, the human body and there are- It's one health, there's one medicine. There they, one they're health. translatable. What of, of health, of sports, journalism, all that, what wakes you up in the morning? What are you, which topic are you most passionate about? I mean, this will, this will be sort of weird and maybe sound like a wishy-washy answer, but what I love about journalism, what I love about teaching, what I love about university atmosphere is that it's usually different all the time, right? So I wouldn't want to do health every day or sports every day because, you know, journalists are, we're trained to do a little bit of everything. Sure, sure. And that's sort of the fun of it, right? The novelty of learning different things all, all the time. All so. the time, yeah, little experts in, in all areas of the fields. So, conflict yeah. management and resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. I had kind of, I knew I wanted to have you on the show. You speak to my undergrads, um, always like a great storyteller, especially when it comes to like talking about sports and, and you know, the excitement of the hero's journey. You start off and then you become a champion, all, the, all those good things. But we're gonna talk about something maybe not as fun, which is conflict management and resolution. As a department chair, I thought you would be great because I'm sure you're dealing with faculty and students. So when, I'm just curious, when we said that this might be your topic, what were your thoughts? Were you pumped? Were you like, oh God, I don't want to talk about this. I deal with it all day. No, so I was really excited because my whole life I've been conflict averse. Oh, ooh. Totally conflict averse. Okay. Like, I, like there's a faculty member who nicknamed me Switzerland. Because I'm just, you know, I try to see both sides. Yeah, yeah. I, I want peace. I want people to be happy. Okay. And I do not like conflict um, and traditionally haven't. But over the last, I'd say, four or five years, um, I've sort of embraced it and had a change in the way I think about it. And that's, I guess, what we'll talk about um, today. No, so but I learned that by being conflict averse, you are letting down a lot of people. Oh, letting, interesting so, so perspective. So you're, you're letting down maybe yourself, you're letting down your opponent or foe. 
Yes. Um, yeah, sure. yeah. And you're letting down certain stakeholders that may be a part of the conflict that is, are not directly in it. So it's your almost your responsibility mm. to engage in conflict. Now, there's a big difference between healthy conflict and yeah, like yeah, yeah, drama. Yeah, 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 seeking it out. Yeah, and all that stuff. Right. right. I don't want unnecessary conflict. I don't want that. I don't mm. like people who just stir up things. You right. Know, I don't like that. But conflict is a healthy part of growth. It's a healthy part of a team. It's a healthy part of um, what we do. And as soon as things started to shift and I learned how to sort of figure out how to approach it, my approach changed. And and I think it actually has – it's a it's a health thing. Okay. So here's my – so all well, I'm, you, on the, I'm on the edge of my seat because I'm no, like, yes, teach me how to no, not be afraid of conflict. No, so I, I, you know, I think all of our health-oriented people here will will get this, right? Okay. This brain is probably the most complex organ we have, right? Totally. We have a reptilian side and we have a logical side, <laughs> yes. right? So in conflict and in any emotion, reptilian kicks first. in. It's the first, yes. right? It's the first. So whenever there's conflict, there's anger, there's competition, there's this just... Eh, instinctual need to be engaged and to fight or flee. Right? Sure. Right, right. And that's the reptilian function. And it will always kick in first. That's why we're tempted to eat the taco because it's right My there. God, it's yes. why we have all emotions. So right. emotion is, is first. And that's why conflict is so hard because when we get the emotions intertwined with it, yep. then it doesn't become about solving the conflict. It becomes about winning. It's not right. logical. So we yeah. need the yes. executive function. We need the logical yeah. side of the brain to deal with, deal with conflict. And yeah. as soon as you sort of get past... The things about not taking it personally, about not having Preach. to win. Preach, come on. It's hard. It's <laughs> well, hard. I know. I know. I know. It is hard. <laughs> but there are some ways, I think, to deal with it. And wait, wait, wait. But what made you, are you going to tell me what made you shift four years ago? Like, how did the shift happen? I think over time. Okay. Um, and I think it was a series of factors. Um, um, I don't think I'm out of turn saying this, like. When I t- so I'm a faculty member for whatever, yeah. you know, 13 years. Okay. All right. I don't have I have student conflict, but I don't have like this infrastructure con- of conflict right. that a char- department chair has. There's there are conflicts with students, there are conflicts with faculty administrators, all kinds of conflicts. Yeah. Um. And I had a pretty big conflict internally. It was a long term conflict, and it was a long and it and it just ate me up. It just Drove me crazy, drove me up a wall, and I and I don't think I'm at a turn saying, and I don't mind saying this. As soon as I became chair, I started like, like bourbon every night, right? Like I'm going, <laughs> just, coming home because you're so stressed. Well, yeah, I just needed something to to chill, chill out, right? okay? You know, and then I did a couple things, and we did a couple things as an organization that sort of figured out the conflict and figured out some resolutions, and you know, I saw what had worked and what had not worked, and it clicked. And I also did some leadership training. Okay. And, which is really good. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I just think just shifting your perspective, which, you know, we could talk about in a little bit in terms of how to do that. You know, it's easy to ignore problems. Yes, it is. Right. And then so the conflict festers. Sure. And the conflict creates more conflict it when does. you ignore it. Right. And then when you actually address it, it's uncomfortable. But when you fix it. It feels so much better. It feels so much better. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, having the the logic side override the emotion side. Yes. Is a, is a key. Right. And that's right. in short term conflicts and and really long, long term conflicts. Yeah. And maturity to be able to let that executive function take over. Yeah, and, and it's not, it's not even maturity as much as it's taking a beat. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I and I think that like that's the key. I mean, the whole you know take a deep breath is just cliche. And, and Do you think? Well, it's I think it's cliche advice. But it works. But it works. Yeah. And I and I think I might tell you a story later where I did that. Okay. And um, but it it's it's just about taking a pause to let just give your logic uh, a second yeah. to override the reptile. Okay. Okay. That's it. So you're saying, okay, so we're presented with conflict, that reptilian side of our brain, the caveman side of our brain kicks in, and instead of engaging with that, take a second and then let the executive function and the logic side come in. I think. I mean, obviously, everything is variable dependent. Depends on the conflict. Depends sure. on who you're I mean, if you're, like, in a in an alley and you have to fight for your life, yeah, go full lizard. <laughs> full lizard. Yeah, but yes. if you are dealing with humans, clients, other veterinarians, technicians, um, you know, family members, take us take a beat. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So as department chair, you have all these opportunities to engage with conflict. I like that there's this reframe that you're saying that being averse to conflict isn't helping really anybody because we have to approach it. Yes. Okay. 
So then, I mean, tell me some stories then. What 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 examples do you have of maybe conflict that went well and conflict that didn't? So the so the one went bad was. So I've been teaching at UF for 20 years, uh-huh. and I taught before that as an adjunct while I was working in magazines. So I've been teaching for like 30 years, mm-hmm. right? So it's, I have a lot of students. I have never, ever once snapped at a student. I don't see you snapping. You don't I, see, well, you're don't. not a snappy I'm not, guy. I'm not a snapper. You're not a snapper. I'm not a snapper. And, um. Wait, I, are you about to tell me that you snapped at a student? Oh, what happened? Yes. <laughs> it was a problem child. Well, you know, it, it, I won't get into the details because, yeah. uh, you know, nobody really cares about the details too much. But what happened was the student asked for some special circumstance. And and what we try to do is we – I don't like being this is the way it works. This is the rule. You can't do it. Right. It's, You're it's flexible. Like flexible. Work with it. Yeah. Maintain our standards, but see what we can do to, to reach your goals. So this student had this – unusual request, a request that I probably wouldn't have approved. So I really thought and I worked. I had to bring some other people into it. I went through a lot to sort of make it work and and sort of compromise, maintain standards, but give the student what they wanted. And um, I thought I did that. And then what I did was I left, in my mind, this is important, in my mind, right? We all have different perspectives. Absolutely. In my mind, I said, okay, this is how I'm leaving it. You confirm with me that this is what you want to do. So after the student left, I actually wrote out an email confirming what I had talked about, and I kept it in my drafts folder. I think everyone should listen. Always document whatever you're dealing with with conflicts. Okay, so we have an yeah. email ready to go. Yeah. Okay. And it's ready to go. And it sits in my draft box. It sits in my draft box. It sits in my draft box because I never got confirmation. Okay, no follow-up from the student. Three weeks later, a student comes in. And are we all set? And I deleted it from my draft folder. It's like, I guess he doesn't need it oh. anymore. Deleted it from my drafts folder. A student comes in and says, are we all set with what we talked about? And I just, just inside, I boiled, and I could tell my tone was getting a little, a little huffy, not too bad. Okay. It was a little huffy, like you were gonna get back to me. Like I actually went through all this to make this happen. And yeah. I, I went. He's like, no, that's not what I. Yeah, I remember this, and you know, I may have gotten it wrong, but in my mind, I wouldn't have deleted that draft if I wasn't waiting. For okay. It. Okay. Yeah. So I started explaining all of this. Uh-huh. The student steps to me and says, "Time out! Time out!" Ew. Ew. And I'm, like, and I'm not one, like, about titles. And you but have to, still. But you tell me to time out. Yeah, right. And I said, don't you tell me to time out. Oops. <laughs> and it was it was much. Did they have a face, like, oops, like they knew they did something wrong? Uh, I don't think so. They, uh, you know what? Anyone who has the audacity to say time out, time out to a professor is, like, they probably aren't going to be worried if you snap at them because they're out of their mind. And, you know. No. So I, well. <laughs> Yes, and that's why I did it, because yeah. I was sort of estab- trying to establish the boundary. And I right, said, right. I'm going to go to the restroom. You can go into my office. Because uh-huh. so you the, needed a break. It was the pause, yes, right? Yes, the pause. And I knew that. I shouldn't have talked like that, even if they said that. I shouldn't have talked like okay, that. Okay, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. So I came back. I apologized for talking like that, but I still explained my, my point of view. So that was a minor conflict. It was yeah. an in-the-moment conflict. It was not a festering conflict. But that's what we deal with. We, we deal with in-the-moment in the moment. emotions. Yeah. B- but if we break it down... Right. So like, let's go through the steps, because what happens is these these pre-vet students are going to have these veterinary school interviews and they might be asked, talk about a time where you had conflict. So they might tell the story, but then they need to break down the steps. So what I hear you saying is that this student had this unusual circumstance. You jumped through a lot of hoops to make it happen, had your follow ups ready to go. Student doesn't follow through, but then comes in later and has kind of what I'm hearing, maybe a bit of entitlement about the next steps or. Uh, maybe has a tone, and then. Well, I think it was a miscommunication. It like, sounds I like think, a miscommunication. I think that sure. Absolutely. Thought okay. What would... Yeah, miscommunication, and then, but then approached you in maybe a more, I'm gonna say, aggressive way. Well, I'm gonna give the student credit. The student reacted to my huffiness okay. about him asking the question. Okay, fair. I'm trying to see this other yeah, side. Yeah. Right. 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 And, so um, breaking down like whatever the conflict was, but then and then following up with, I knew. That like you knew you were in that reptilian moment, needed to take a break, came back and apologized, which is like a big move. That's a mature move. Right, because I think I should have gotten an apology. I I, I, not, I do I, too. I, I, I get, do too. I did not get one for But you apologize. you apologize and and then so what would you say like in the future? What do you wish you had done differently? And how I, could I, you have done differently? I think I could have absolutely said it is inappropriate for you to tell me to time out. Okay. Without saying, don't you tell me. Yeah. Like, okay. I, I was like, you can still so maybe sort of more maintain... colleague, less dad. I, Cause like, I didn't go dad. Well, I mean, I, I actually, I guess it, it was kind of it, dad. It, to me, that's what I, when I heard, don't you tell me, my brain said, that feels like dad. Right. 
Yeah, and, and I, you are I, a dad. And I yes, but I never do that. Like I, yeah. I've never talked to a student that way. Right, right. Yeah. But in but that I, moment, I could, I still could have maintained. Yeah. you you talked out of turn to me. Absolutely, and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, do you feel like is it important for students when they feel like they're in a conflict to figure out if they have things that might trigger them, that will take them over the edge? So, if it's like I already have this issue with. I did a lot of work for this person. They haven't followed up. Now this person's coming back into my office. Should they have awareness that there might be a conflict approaching? How can they kind of prepare? I think, you know, anytime there's a there's a conflict, it's because you feel like a right has been wronged. Or oh, like right. an injustice. Right, right. Yes. That's what it is. And, yes, yes. And you may be right. But you also have to think there's another side to the story. Right? Yeah. Or there's another perspective. And that's what I've tried to do is try to understand other people's perspectives on on it. That doesn't mean they're right. No, it doesn't right, mean they're right. right. It doesn't but, mean they're right. But it, but it does give you sort of a, um, less of the I got to win approach. Yes. And more of the let's just wait, let's just sort of squash it. Well, let's, let's figure it out. Most of the conflicts aren't about like, you disagree with me. Mm -hmm. Most of the conflicts are about I need an action and my action is not being mm -hmm. fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And you need to how to make that happen. You need to change my grade. Okay. To, right. There's an action that needs to be resolved, yes. and either you win or you lose. Right. So it's not like I think my grade should be this, and I think my grade should right. be that. Right. There still it's, needs an action. There's an action. Uh -huh. So it's less about respecting opinion. It's about it's about sort of figuring out what the right solution is on on people who have opinion about whatever the conflict yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. So, so I can think something about you. You can think something about me, or we can have competing thoughts. Yes. But what is the actual thing that we're trying to resolve? Right, because there could be, there's a lot, I mean, what I'm hearing is there's just different conflicts. Because you could have a, an argument with someone, and that just might be like, all right, yeah, right disagreement. Right. But if there's a conflict between how are we going to get something done, and we have differing ways to get it done, or someone's not doing what they're supposed to do, I think a good example in undergrad is group projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many conflicts happen because of group projects because maybe somebody's not holding up their end of the deal. Uh, they're not available. There's some kind of conflict there. So how do you make sure that you get what you need to get done while keeping your cool right. and your reputation? Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Do you have an example of a time where you handled conflict really well? I think so. I mean, this is, <laughs> I mean, my memory is not very good, so I'm using recent examples, but I'll try to keep this one quick too. So um, we're in a meeting. And someone in the meeting didn't like um, one of the decisions that was announced, that I announced. Okay. Even though it had been talked about for months. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> and and then somebody else in the meeting said something that further offended the, the person. Okay. So the person dropped off the Zoom. Like, the person just disappeared off the Zoom. Oh, you're joking. No, no, no. That feels immature. Which, but, but okay. Like, rather than, like, that's They took a break. They a took break, a break. Right? <laughs> so, um... The person who was mad was mad. And I saw this person in the hallway probably 30 minutes later. Oops. Wouldn't even look at me. That's awkward. Wouldn't even look at That's me, awkward. right? And right. usually it's fine. Right. right. Everybody's friendly. Wouldn't yeah. even look at me. So, oh, gosh. Um, you know, we set up a time to meet. And, Did um, you reach out to them? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I meant to check to, to see if I had, but I'm almost positive that, that I did. Um, and we met. And the person's demeanor was just still very mad and upset. Mm -hmm. Explain it like this person went first, right? They just said everything. Okay. And um, it was it was an interesting conversation because I had to acknowledge how this person felt. Yeah, empathy. But I also had to correct some errors. Sure. So I corrected the errors. Mm -hmm. And talk through the decision right. again, yep. even though it had been talked through several times. <laughs> tried to explain it more fully. Uh -huh. um, and and then what I think was a fairly successful tactic was talked about trying not to view it as something that was bad for you. But here's how we're going to spin it into more opportunities for you in a different way. And this is what I would like you to think about mm -hmm. and think about how this can create a new pathway for you and create different opportunities and make you fulfilled. And, you know, the, the, I don't have, I have a good relationship with this person and this person is a good performer. So by the end, very different demeanor. Okay. Happy, thankful. Uh-huh. Appreciated. Okay. Just appreciated talking. 
understood the decision now, and it was, um, and, and I. I think it was about a couple things. One was listening. Two was new opportunities, right? So it wasn't just, here's the decision, this is what's going to happen. Right. And three, giving some space to the person mm. to be able to sort of talk it through. Yes. Um, but I think that's built over time. Like right? trust. In the, the, trust in the relationship, right? yeah. So I think even though there were emotions about the decision, mm-hmm. there was trust that we were trying to make it okay. And the, Something too, thinking about conflict, people might think conflict does involve like yelling or icing somebody out. But if you have trust with the person, you might be doing either one of those things and there's still trust there. Like you can trust that we'll come back around. Because this person comes at me like in a really good way, challenges me, Uh makes me think about different things. You know, doesn't he just, this is what it is. It's how they are. Yes. Okay. But this is what the person does that's brilliant in my mind. Is he, it's either before or in the middle of the discussion. He o- always establishes we 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 share the same goal. We want best. We want what's best for our students. Mm-hmm. So before you even start. Yes. So we have common ground. Yeah. So he is so smart that he establishes a common ground, hmm. and that allows us to not be like you're right, I'm right, you're wrong. Right. It's, yeah, we might th- disagree on how, but we're we're after the same goal. That's a good strategy. It's a great it's a great strategy. And okay, that's, I've actually learned from that and tried to apply that. Okay, to conflicts. Like, yeah. Okay, what do we get after here first? What's the result? Not like who wins. Yes, but what's yes, yes. The result for the letters of rec for vet school. They can ask anybody who is a professional to write them a letter of recommendation. So. There could be a student someday in one of your classes who wants to go to vet school and they get really close with you and they say... I've had journalism students who... Is that right? It is. Has anyone asked you to write a letter? Write a letter I think I did write a letter. This was 15 years ago. Okay. So then you've had experience in this. So right now there's this form and you have to fill out the form and let's say it comes to um, conflict management and resolution and you have to rank a student either excellent, average, or poor what kinds of interactions would you have to have with a student in a classroom to be like, they have excellent conflict resolution? Because in my experience, most of the time, my students, there's not that much conflict in the classroom. Like we're we're teaching, they're learning, having a good relationship. What do you think some ways some students could get closer with professors or professionals to show them you're a good manager of conflict? It's amazing. Like this generation of students to me is incredibly polite and mature. So when I have students come and have a conflict. Uh-huh. I mean, the aforementioned example. Of Except for that one, right, that was just one. Have been incredibly polite. Right. I mean, that person actually was actually very polite in the beginning. Huh. Um, <laughs> um, incredibly polite, mature, respectful in how they ask a question, say they understand if it's not possible. Yes. Right? So, I mean, there are students who come at you and say, this is not right, this is why I'm paying right. for this class. Right, and that's not a good look. Right, mm-hmm. and you may, they may be right, but you know, I subscribe to the theory of your kindness is going to be a lot more effective than being a bully, mm-hmm. right? Now, being a bully can work with some people. Short in some term, short term, short folks. Term. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and so I don't know. I mean, it's hard for a student to, to show that, you know. Yeah, I think, but what you're talking about with the terms, like, I understand if it's not possible. I would say most students, unless it's a huge lecture, are going to engage with their professor at some time, either through email or in person, about something that they need. Yeah. A wedding is coming up. They have a doctor's note for something. They don't understand an assignment. So maybe the, the key word there is polite, just staying polite and professional in all of your interactions with them is a good step in the right direction in case there might not be any big conflicts throughout the semester. Yeah. When we say conflict, we think war, yeah. we think winning, we think mm-hmm. losing, we think aggression, we think anger, we think this bad thing. And I think conflict needs to be reframed as a negotiation or a persuasion. Or, just, you know, so instead of a war, it's a dance, right? And, mm, oh, and, yeah. You know? Yes. Well, a little back and, and forth. Right. And I think that helped me yes. to say conflict isn't a bad thing. Confl- it's it's just we're just talking through something that we have sure. we have to come up with. It's neutral. Answer. It's not good or it's not bad. Right. Okay. Yes. Conflict is a dance. Well, yeah. I yeah. love that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you give a little, I give a little. Maybe we pause in the two step. We listen to each other. We reflect. Maybe we take a break. Maybe we say it's water break. We need to come yeah. back to the dance, see how we feel. Maybe not facing a conflict right away. You're still facing it because you're thinking about it. 
instead of running right into it. For sure. So yeah. if someone's saying like, oh, I don't want to deal with this, it's like, oh, I haven't dealt with it yet, but I'm still thinking about it. I'm strategizing. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm getting limber before the dance. Well, you know, there's some, so again, we'll side street this a little bit, but I have this offline conversation with a few of my colleagues about <laughs> about like conflicts and, and, and we came to sort of this sort of, a couple of us by nature are very fast responders. We're fast responders. We want to solve the problem. We want to move on. We want to help you. Okay, that's me. So over time, we've sort of tapped into this idea of, like, you can take a beat. Yeah. And sometimes the conflict resolves itself. But, it you know, this whole conversation, it doesn't mean you shouldn't stand up for yourself and be assertive. So true. Friend, right? So, so true. It's, it's, again, it's not about, you know, being just rolling over or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and, like, you know, power dynamics are a huge thing, right? Uh, Who yeah. ultimately has the power is central to sort of how you deal with the conflict. But when you do have the power, you need to be open. Mm. And when you don't have the power, you need to be unafraid to sort of to sort of talk it through. Right, you know? so you have to decide in each conflict, what position are you in? If you're in the position, let's say the more subservient position, let's say student to teacher, if you're gonna approach that professor with conflict, maybe have solutions ready to go, maybe have drafted a really nice email ahead of time, have somebody read it over. And then if you're the professor, when y'all eventually get to that point, when students are coming to you with conflict, how are you going to respond? Are you going to respond like, you know, attack mode? Or are you going to give it a beat? Remember how you fell in their shoes? There's a lot. There's, this is layered. Well, so, you know, we we think of conflict as conflict management. Conflict management is really persuasion. Oh, oh. I mean, how do I? I don't need to beat you and win. Mm -hmm. I'm hopefully trying to find a solution where you kind of see you're on board with, right? I mean, we don't have to agree, right? but I want to use my tools of persuasion, not my tools of conflict management. So I think that's what happened in the example with the person who we gave opportunities to. Mm -hmm. I was able, mm -hmm. I used I used the two tactics, or three tactics of per persuasion, you know, data, you know, so I used some data to make the, okay. the case, some storytelling, which is the emo we emotion, we love connection. And then the third is the emotion, right? Yes. Is to make you feel good about sort of where we're, we're going. And I didn't do that sort of Manipulated. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I did it because I really truly believed that what we were doing was better for our students, but I still want what's good for you. Yeah. Too. Well, I, I hear you that it's not manipulative, but I also like this, this thought that you can kind of gamify conflict. Like we're not trying to win, but we are trying to help persuade the other person to get on board with what we think is best yes. for both parties. And so instead of approaching conflict in dread, because so many, I know so many students are like, I, they're conflict averse. They don't want to have to approach anyone. They don't have to deal with anything. But approaching it more from that, like, asking questions, curious, fascinated standpoint of like, okay, this has come up. How can we make it work? It'll just make you, like, it'll bring your cortisol so much. It'll bring it down. You'll feel better. It's absolutely true. Yeah. What can the students do like today that can help them with conflict management and resolution. Okay, so this is, so today, yep. I would say you go on your social media channels <laughs> and I would follow Adam Grant. Who's that? He is um, an organizational psychologist, ha has a huge following on social and all media, was the youngest tenured professor at the Wharton School of Business. Wow. Um, he has a popular podcast called Work Life. And the tagline is how to make work not suck. Oh, I'm excited for myself for this yes. too. So he's got a podcast, he's got books, he has, you know, counterintuitive thoughts about the workplace. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's not all about conflict, it's about leadership, it's about performance, it's about it's about conflict, it's okay. about everything. So Great. I would I would subscribe Instagram and Twitter um, and podcast to him. That you can do today. today. Okay. And, and and it's the gift that keeps on giving. True. Yes. Okay, what can they do in a month? So in a month. And we're going to assume that you're going to have some kind of conflict. You know, it could, so, be, it could be in a relationship. It's I bet the second they turn this podcast off, something's coming. Something's coming. It could yep. be in their inbox. Well, they don't even check their email. So it's in your text <laughs> messages right now. Um, the next conflict you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You actually make a purposeful effort to squirrel away. Yes. And write down your strategies for handling the conflict. What points of view okay. are from the other I side. I love this. And what your common goal is. Just write it down, yes. right? And then so you have it and you think about it and maybe you help c come up with some solutions that can solve the conflict. It's just, it's the executive over the reptile, Yeah. right? So 
just it's just a simple next time conflict just simple write it down as an exercise for yourself I, I well and I like it too because uh, these are pre-vet students high function and high achieving they know how to handle homework so we've basically given them a homework assignment but a life homework assignment the next time conflict comes up have a plan and I'm gonna tell you guys this if you are in a vet school interview and they say how do you handle conflict and you tell them I approach conflict strategically with a plan and I get my thoughts together and I think about persuasion and empathy and the other person's perspective Oh, you're ace in that interview. Yes. So it's good strategy. A year from now, what are we hoping that these students can achieve with their conflict management and resolution? Okay, so I've got two. Can I give you two? Please. Uh, well, I mean, if it's a you if, can persuade me framed, to give you two. If it's framed as one thing, I don't want to break the rules. No, but you can absolutely okay. give two. So, the first one I would do is so I am, I am generally um, so respectful and in awe of our STEM folks and the people who go into medicine, especially the people who go into veterinary medicine. It's one of the most selfless professions there is. So, you know, kudos to you and thank you for what you do because our pets mean everything to um, all of us. So very much appreciate all you do. So in a year though, I think you could do a little bit of reading and studying on persuasion and communication skills, right? That doesn't mean you don't have them, but it, it's maybe not your natural inclination. Because if you are dealing with conflict, just having, it's not about, again, not about winning. It's about how do I talk to people? How do I email people, right? So using your written and oral skills are, are a great tool. And it doesn't happen overnight. So it, it does take a little time. So read about it, think about it, develop those skills. That's one thing. The second thing is, um, you know, I think this will be more important in, the, in your veterinary career more than maybe now, or in, even as a vet student, right, um, is to find and use two conflict buddies. Oh, what's a conflict buddy? I don't know. I just made it up. Okay. <laughs> Let's develop this. TM, no. conflict yeah. buddy. Conflict buddy. And because I use this without calling them a conflict buddy, is that I have two or three people that I can go to, but here's the key. They can't be yes people. Ugh. They, they need to challenge Ugh. you. They need to challenge you. Okay. God, I know, to, I know exactly who mine is. They need to challenge you. They need to challenge you and to help you think through it and how you not, may not always be, be right. Professor Spiker, we always ask uh, our guests to give like a big piece of life advice. Oh my gosh. So something that you think has really impacted you or uh, you wish you would have heard when you were in undergrad, something that only really they can hear from uh, your perspective. What, oh what do they God. need to hear? I don't know if I... What would you tell? I mean, you have two very high. I should. I just. I think it's so cool that both of your boys played lacrosse at a, at the collegial level, and you've trained and raised athletes. I don't know. What would you What would you tell high achieving folks? I I say this to uh, journalism students, but I think that it applies to a lot of different paths. Is um, is we're in a really complex world now, where there's a lot of different skills and a lot of different things you're doing, and you have to know a little bit of everything. And this is especially true for you know, vet students and medical students, right? They got to know a lot. A lot. So, you know, what I, everybody likes to pit things as one or the other. You're a specialist or a generalist. And what I try to tell people is, I need you to be a generalist because I need you to do a lot of things well in this world where there's so many things going on. But if you want to stand out, you do one thing better than anybody else does. Oh. And... And so you sort of, so it's it's sort of unfair. Yeah, do it and, all and be and, really good. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh but, no. But it doesn't have to be like you know to that extreme. Sure. Right. Like somebody, and you can apply this to the medical field. But you know, somebody come comes in here and all they know how to do is write is great. But can you do audio? Can you do video? Yeah, it's, can you, do you need to be a one man band. Be competent, but also. But also do one thing. Do and one the, and, thing. And the one thing can be in a subject area or mm -hmm. it can be a skill. Sure. Right. And, sure. and I think that applies to the medical field. Um, vets are, you know, they're obviously there are a lot of specialists in the in the veterinary world, but they're they're also a ton of ton of generalists. Right. Too, and they do know. all the things, but maybe they're good at really what, what is the one thing you're really good at? I'm not. I'm not good at anything. You have to be I good am. at one what would you say though? Because here's the thing Eating and bourbon. Listen. <laughs> I'm really good at tacos and <laughs> <laughs> you had I had some out of your what did you make? Jambalaya? Jambalaya. Gumbo? That was Jambalaya. good. Jambalaya. Thank you. But I think I, I often ask students, I'm like, tell me three characteristics about yourself, and I force them to. You know, you yeah, have to be able to list something about yourself. So I, know, really I, I think I'm going to say I'm, I'm good at podcasting. I am, you're very good at podcasting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And what are you good at? 
don't know. I think I'm I, I think I'm a pretty decent, you know, teacher. I think you're a great teacher and the Thank students you. love you. Thank you. And your TikTok is is good. Yeah, it's okay. I, uh, I like it. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on and talking about conflict management yes. and resolution and making it a lot more... Not what? conflict management. I, it's negotiation. Your conflict negotiation, negotiation and, and persuasion. The dance. Yes. The, the dance of the conflict. Yes. I feel inspired to that just... That feels like a movie. I'm ready to just go up to everybody conflict. right now and instead of having my fight face on, just like my very neutral, let's, let's dance. talk let's face. Dance. Let's, let's dance. dance. Like Batman. Is that... Did they say that? Batman? Didn't... No. What does Batman say? <laughs> let's dance. <laughs> no, it's... Did you dance in the... I told you I can't remember anything. <laughs> it's all the bourbon. Stop it. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Um, I should say that Professor Spiker and I know each other because we work out together on the weekends. We do. Yeah. So yes. we work out every weekend, and we do pretty fun workouts. So that's how we, we know each other. We will not do burpees on this podcast. No. Oh, my God. I, we should do burpees. Yeah, that's just, that's just not that's good a, listening. It's, a ter- <laughs> it's just not good listening. That's a terrible idea. You're listening to Carissa, the UFCBM communications intern and a pre-vet student. Figuring out morals and working through complex situations is vital for any leader, especially someone who tends to the health of many. Dr. Deal and Dr. Southern will present animal research and livestock care insight as they share awareness in fields known to have hot topics in vet med. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and I am so excited to bring on two veterinarians today to talk about a pretty tricky topic, something that you're going to be asked about on your letters of rec for the VEMCAS application. It's the big E, ethics. And I'd like to welcome two Brittany's, Dr. Brittany Southern and Dr. Brittany Deal. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited to be here. Thanks, Alex. Happy to be here. Uh, Both of these veterinarians have spoken to my undergrad classes. I knew they are great folks to talk about this topic, and their fields of vet med also make sense to talk about ethics today. But it's a hard topic to talk about, so I am pumped. Uh, Before we get started, will you all tell us undergrad, vet school, post-vet school journey, um, and then how you ended up at UF? All righty. Yes, This is a very challenging topic, so we'll see where it goes today. So my name is Brittany Southern. I am originally from North Carolina. I went to UNC Chapel Hill for undergrad, and then I went to Tuskegee University in Alabama for veterinary school. And after vet school, I went and completed a small animal rotating internship in Houston, Texas, After my internship, I ended up working in practice for a few years as a small animal emergency clinician. Um, I quickly was burnt out, and I wanted to kind of go back to my first interest in vet school, which was working with animals and research. Um, So at that point, I pursued and completed a laboratory animal medicine residency at North Carolina State University. And I've been here in Florida for a few years now, and I work as faculty um, as a lab animal vet. So Dr. Southern is representing lab animal medicine today. Definitely big in ethics and lab animal. Dr. Deal, tell us your journey. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm Brittany Deal. I'm originally from southwest Pennsylvania. Um, I grew up on a farm there, and then I moved. I went to West Virginia University in Morgantown for my Bachelor of Science degree, and then I went to Virginia Tech at Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine uh, for my DVM. I graduated there and then moved to Florida following uh, that to pursue an internship with the Food Animal Reproduction and Medicine Service, also called FARMS, at the veterinary school. And then after the conclusion of that in one-year internship program, I started a combined master and residency program with the same department or same service, which is farms. And I'm finishing up that program right now, and that will be concluding in July. So Dr. Deal is representing food animal medicine, another opportunity for us to talk about ethics. Okay, so this is going to be kind of a, a panel discussion, hearing from both areas of vet med. There are 
also lots of other areas of vet med that deal with ethical issues, pretty much every single area, I would say. You're dealing with animals, you're dealing with people. You have a lot of folks who are really passionate about animals, so ethics always come into play. So before we even get started, when we say ethics, what do we think of? What should the students be thinking of when we, they think of ethics? What is it? That is a great question. Um, I will say for a personal standpoint for me, I always loop ethics in with welfare. And so when I think of welfare, I think of, you know, the state of the animal and its current condition and everything in its environment. So, you know, the food that it's eating, how it's being cared for, how it's living. Um, and then I think ethics itself you know, even outside of veterinary medicine, it's just your day-to-day -day choices that you're making and your morals. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Southern's statements there. And yeah, to me, just it's a simple thing, as simple as it sounds, even outside of the veterinary realm, it's the difference between right and wrong. Um, so, and we all have an innate knowing of what that is, and it's it's applying that, then you take that a step further to what your career, your job is, and in this specific scenario, it's veterinary medicine. I think we are going to jump all over the place because I am just like, my head is spinning because what is right and what is wrong could be different for each person. In the profession, do we have standards of ethics and things that are like, this is right and this is wrong and some things that are just not gray areas in your particular fields? Do you have those? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I will say for every single veterinarian, we all took an oath, right? When you graduate, you put your hand up and in that oath, it does talk about um, how you will practice and using your ethics. Um, so it is something that's very important. I think there are there's definitely professional judgment, right? That's kind of the beauty of medicine that you can make your own professional and clinical medical choices. Um, however, at the end of the day, yes, we do have an obligation to you know uphold these standards, and it can vary from person to person. Yeah, I completely agree with that, and then. In addition to that, most of us um, within the veterinary realm have um, veterinary organizations that are, you know, broader areas that we belong to. So and the, most of those are very focused on certain species that we work with. So some of those um, groups, uh, an example for, for me at least is the uh, AABP or the American Association of Bovine Practitioners. They have certain um, standpoints that they put out there that we um uphold for certain topics and then there are other topics that there's not really a standpoint out there um, that again you have to use your own personal uh, clinical um, judgment to make a decision on what needs to be done for that animal and considering all those other things that we just previously mentioned and every aspect of veterinary medicine has something um, like that um, just it varies again depending on you know, which species you see or where, which area you focus on. So when we say standpoints, are we saying that there are some folks or organizations who maybe don't agree with certain practices? And then if you are met with somebody like that in the press or the public, there's like a kind of a boilerplate standpoint of this is where we stand on this. Is that what we're talking about? Do we have an example of something that comes to mind of like, in this particular topic, our organization believes blank. So what's an example, like a concrete example? Yeah, so the first thing that comes to my mind, and this is, you know, from the AVMA, you can even find it on the AVMA website, um, is with horses and soaring. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of history with horses and their feet and making them have a certain gait. And so the AVMA has put out um, – a statement basically saying, you know, their thoughts on it and their recommendations. And I think as Brittany said, you know, depending on the field of veterinary medicine that you work on, work in, there are similar statements. So, mm -hmm. you know, for my specialty college, the American College of Lab Animal Medicine, um, we also have different statements. Um, one of the big ones would be like euthanasia. And so with euthanasia, there is, um, you know, we want to be able to provide a good death for these animals. And so there are certain guidelines on how we want to give an animal a good death, depending on the species, depending on the situation. It, I mean, like, 
When you mentioned horse soaring, I think that's a good example. That actually used to be a question on our application many mm. moons ago to ask students what they, how they felt about horse soaring. We had a couple of like ethical issues. So on there, there was horse soaring, small um, small animal shelter euthanasia, mm -hmm. like I think GMOs, different things with like steroids, hormones, and like uh, food animals. And we'd ask the students like, how would you approach a plan to this ethical issue? And it's interesting because what I hear you saying is there are recommendations and there are standpoints, but it doesn't sound like things that you can and can't do. Is that right? So like, for example, if I'm a veterinarian and somebody asks me to like soar their horse, which folks, that means like kind of burning the backs of their feet to make them or like injuring the backs of their feet to make them walk a certain way. That's what Dr. Southern was talking about with their gait. Can a veterinarian still do that? Like they can do it, right? If they want to. Like let's use let's use elective surgical procedures. So ear cropping, tail docking, mm -hmm. declaws. Mm -hmm. Those are things that are still allowed to happen. There's no laws against them, but each veterinarian would need to decide their personal what ethics, their their morals. Is that right? They're nodding their heads, yes, but they look like I don't want to talk about this. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You can technically still perform these things, but um, it's those standpoints are put out there to definitely make you think, I guess, um, before you do that. And on top of it, if there were um, any type of you know complications or something that takes that a step further, that you know, even if God forbid litigation or something like that, because that does happen. Um, more to have to get involved then those standpoints are things that you're able to fall back on and show that you are doing the standard of care and you know by not performing that procedure if it's something that 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 association is you know saying that they believe shouldn't be done for example so that's it's just basically an extra layer of protection in a way um, for us to just say that there has been um, you know research or just further looking into whatever this this issue is to say that this is really appropriate for an animal or not appropriate. I, I'm loving this discussion. I know it's hard to have, but I think it really is important also just to make students aware that these things are going on. And even just mentioning litigation, you're going to be a, a doctor. You're going to have a lot of responsibility and things could happen. Uh, clients could get angry. Um, people get sued all the time. Organizations get sued all the time. So it's really good for you to know what your ethical, what your ethics are going to be, what your morals are going to be, what you're going to stand for, what you're going to stand against. And so it's good to know that that's going to come up. What kinds of ethical issues come up in your particular field? So we're talking about lab animal medicine, which Dr. Southern, I'm going to ask you, like, let's say a five-year-old comes up to you and say, what's a lab animal vet? What would you tell them? <laughs> Yeah, so fantastic question. So my job and what I am passionate about is providing care and the welfare of animals that are used in research. Um, so the state of our country currently, there are national laws. The FDA requires that any new medication or device that goes into a human has to be tested in an animal first. Um, so my job is to protect those animals, make sure that they are, have the best quality of life as possible while they are here. Um, they're sacrificing their life for science and for us. Um, so that's what I do. And Dr. Deal, same question. Five-year-old says, like, what's a food animal vet? What would you tell them? So for uh, food animals specifically, as far as we're concerned in the United States, that tip, that m mostly encompasses um, dairy and beef cattle, small ruminants such as sheep and goats, and also swine, um, pigs. Some people may include uh, poultry in that as well. As far as um, the animals that I care for, poultry is not is not included, but in some realms that would be. So those are the animals that I primarily am responsible for um, seeing. So some of those things are very um, broad, like herd health types of things. So taking care of preventative care for animals as well as um, seeing sick animals and dealing with things like that. But on an even broader spectrum, another responsibility that um, is very important to my job is ensuring the health and welfare of our food supply. Okay. So now we all are on the same page as to what these two areas are. So I'll let Dr. Southern start what are the ethical issues that you think people think of or like maybe that you know of in your particular field that often come up in lab animal medicine? Things that folks are concerned about. Yeah, absolutely. So a, 
the big one for my field, I would say, is that not everybody agrees with using animals in research. Um, and everyone, you know, has the right to their opinion. And it is a very touchy topic, right? We're talking about animals being used, sacrificing their lives, you know, being euthanized at the end of a study in order for humans to benefit from some sort of science and new medication. Um, and so there are people, there are organizations um, who, you know, have actually come together and organized and who do not agree with this. And so um, kind of the big thing that people will think of is animal rights. And so animal rights is different than animal welfare. Um, so just keeping in mind that, again, there are some people that don't support it. And so then we have to think about the ethics part of it. And so for me, you know, I'm really passionate about this because I think we all can think of somebody that has diabetes or cancer. And you think about someone with diabetes, them taking insulin. Like, where did that insulin come from? How did we know it was safe before it went into a person, goes into a human? And so it was tested on animals first in order for them to, you know, make it safe and efficacious to go on a person. Um, and so I'm not going to sit here and say if there's, you know, something that's right or wrong. Again, everybody is entitled to their own opinion. Um, but that's basically the definition of ethic, ethics again, right? So thinking what you think is morally okay, what might not be morally okay. Um, and so for me, and kind of in the day-to-day -day in my work, I do kind of go through in my mind, okay, I see this mouse, for example, or a dog, for example. What's happening with this animal? What do they need to go through for this experiment to be productive? But at the same time, if this animal is sick, what kind of decisions do I need to make for that animal's welfare? If this animal is really sick and we're going to intervene and do something, does that mean that another animal has to be used to replace that one later? Um, so that's kind of the big thing on the day-to-day -day surface level. Animal rights versus animal welfare. Look it up, folks. Dr. Deal, same question for food animal medicine. What's like the a big ethical issue or concern that folks think about or the students should know about? Yeah, so some of the same thing a little bit applies to on uh, my areas. Um, Dr. Southern was mentioning. So there's a lot of people that uh, do and don't agree with, um, you know, eating meat or eating animal products and those types of things, which is uh, very much a everyday part of my life and job. So ensuring the health and welfare of those animals that we're doing just and doing right by those animals in order for them to um, feed us. Um, and again, I'm, I'm just like her, not going to say whether that is right or wrong. I'm, that's not what I'm here to argue. Um, but I'm here, my job is to ensure that those animals do have the best life possible, um, you know, up until, uh, it is, uh, the, the end for them, um, whatever, depending on whatever their purpose is, um, at the end of the day, but that's a huge part. And then also, you know, within the realms of, of that production, there are certain things that, you know, need to be done to those animals in order to ensure that they, again, have the best life and best welfare. So some examples of that would be um, like in dairy cattle that um, have um, horns naturally, so doing dehorning or disbudding of animals, um, castration of uh, bulls to, to become steers. Those are just some, some very um, general examples um, of things, but that, and also just um, treatment of animals. There's the debates between organic and conventional um, operations and the use of uh, antibiotics and herbicides and pesticides and those types of things, which again, um, we could spend all day talking about. But um, at the end of the day, it's also, it also becomes a question of doing those things. Is that right or is that wrong? I, I'm not here to necessarily argue that, but again, just trying to make sure we're doing right by these animals um, with their time with us. You know, I think an argument or a statement I could hear someone coming up to y'all and saying could be, you're a veterinarian, your job is to love animals. Like, how can you do this to them? But really what you just said is that's exactly what you're doing. Like, we're going to use animals for different purposes, whether it's food, research, whatever. And as a veterinarian, you really are loving the animal by making sure they have the best care. Is that what you would say to somebody who maybe says, like, I thought you loved animals? Like, what would your response be to that? 
Absolutely. Um, for my field in particular, and this is kind of wild to think about, but you know, just a few decades ago, there were no rules surrounding the use of animals in research. And so literally anybody could do whatever they wanted with animals, which is really scary to think about. And so literally my job is to protect these animals. You know, the scientists that work with these animals, most of them are fabulous. They're fantastic to work with. And they have an understanding of, you know, animals and um, that side of it. But a lot of the time, they're not thinking about the welfare. You know, they're thinking about their science as they should be because we're relying on them to come with these new um, medications and things. And so they're not thinking about the welfare. And so that's my job. And absolutely, I'm there to protect them, to make sure that they are well taken care for. If we were not here, who knows what would be happening with them. Right. Like some veterinarian was like, um, I'm going to, I signed an oath for ethics and I'm going to make sure these animals are safe. And we love that. Um, I think when students, those of you who are listening and you're thinking about ethics, you might have an opinion about a certain topic, a certain area. I would really challenge you to find out the opposing viewpoint there because there's always two sides to every story. And if you're only going with what you've been taught from one perspective, you're not going to know the other side and you might have confused ethics at that point at that point. Um, one example that comes to mind for me, and we don't have anybody in the booth to talk about this issue, so I'll bring it up. Um, when we talk about like spay neuter, right? So trap neuter return, trap neuter release. It's a program where you'll go out and you'll spay and neuter cats to help like control the cat population. And and when I heard about that, when I first started at vet med, I was like, that program sounds amazing. Why wouldn't everybody love it? That's like absolutely perfect. But then wildlife folks came into the picture and explained that these cats are roaming around and like attacking the native wildlife. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's the other side of it. And I didn't know that. So there's like good points and bad points for each side. And you need to know both and be able to argue both sides, especially in an interview. If you're coming into an interview really hot about a certain topic, you should still be able to explain the other side to the admissions committee so they understand this person is mature and professional and they've done their research. And you can have an opinion, but you should also know the other side. So speaking of students, we'll take the, we'll take the pressure off y'all for a minute. Let's talk about pre-vet students and how they can start to think about ethics and build their muscles for ethics. But I want to know from you both, because you both work with veterinary students. I'm sure you've both worked with undergrads. How can you tell if a student has good ethics? Because on this letter of rec, a veterinarian or another professional needs to rank them on a scale of excellent to poor for ethics. How would you find someone who could get that excellent score from you? What are some things they can do or say um, what kind of conversations can they have with you? How do you mark someone well for that? I don't know if that's a very easy question, Alex. It, it is not. <laughs> it is not. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think going back to what we said at the beginning, you know, this ethics in general outside of veterinary medicine, it's a question of what is right and wrong. Um, and, and as we also mentioned before, what is right and wrong may look a little bit different to everybody. There are some very blatant things that everybody knows. Yes, you should do this. Or Murder. No, you, it's wrong. <laughs> right. Yes, you should do something. No, you shouldn't do something. But then there's a lot of other things that there's a bit of a gray area or, you know, there's a, maybe a reason that one re in some circumstance one thing might be right or another circumstance it might not be. Um but channeling that back to um, veterinary medicine as well, um, just uh, looking up some of those topics that we had already mentioned and using those in specific examples and explaining, go, taking it a step further, not just saying like, yeah, these are the two sides of the argument, but explaining them why you might have a standpoint on that um, and, and going taking it a step further, going more in depth and showing that you really understand because, um, again, we're not here to judge somebody, even if you're sitting on the other side of the admissions board, saying whether we agree or not agree, unless it's one of those things that's super blatant, yes or no. It's just something that you need to be able to strongly show that you have evidence or you have a, a, a very strong viewpoint on why you should or shouldn't do something. And the AVMA has a lot of um, standpoints out there on a lot of different topics. And even just the 
if you just search veterinary ethics and the AVMA in general, they have quite a bit of um, things that you can look at and read, and they provide uh, specific examples. So that would be um, just at a you know a starting point. That's where I think I would recommend to go. I agree 1,000%. Um, I think the only other thing that I would add is for the pre-vet students, hopefully everybody is working on getting their hours in the clinic. Um, so I would say when you're doing that and you're interacting with the veterinarians and the vet staff that you shadow, just pay attention to the decisions that they're making um, and kind of think about how you feel in that moment and if if you would make the same decision, if you would do something different, because I think that's a great place. You know, we kind of start with our mentors and we see what they do. And over time throughout your career, you kind of take a little bit from each person that you work with and then you mold it into your own. And I think that would go for your ethics as well. Um, and a lot of the things that Brittany mentioned, a lot of these viewpoints and statements that are put out there, um, like use of antibiotics and use of analgesia, things like that over time, you will be able to see and find your comfort zone. Uh, but the big thing is seeing how you feel in the moment. And if you have a weird feeling about it, that's probably your intuition saying maybe you would do something different. Right. We're, we're basically talking about how is your moral compass at this point? And do you listen to it? I think what I'm thinking of when you both are, are chatting, it also can come down to how does a student respond to a mistake that they make? So if a student is in my lab or is, is my intern and they make a mistake and don't own up to it, part of that goes into ethics as well. You know, like if you're willing to own it and, and come clean. So it's Absolutely. knowing what's right and wrong, but also doing the right thing if you do something wrong. And I, I think just thinking about, yeah, the difference of opinion. We've been talking about difference of opinion. Nobody is right and wrong in a situation. And if you have a strong opinion about something and you can back it up, that's fine. I would say, mark me if I'm wrong. In general, I'll, I'll use D-claws because I think a lot of folks know what that is. So, right, like, you know, taking the claws off of cats. I would, I feel like the majority of veterinarians at this point are not big fans of it is my general understanding. However, if someone is still doing it, that doesn't mean they have poor ethics. They might just have a different viewpoint or opinion or a different lived experience. And if they can back that up and are doing things that they think are right by the animal and the client, we might have a different opinion, but we could still mark that person as high on ethics. What do you think? Do, you agree, do we agree with this? And it's okay yeah. if we don't. We, yeah. I would be happy to learn a lesson right now. I, I think you're probably right. I think most people, you know, there's mixed opinions. And it really depends on the cat situation, too. So, again, thinking about its welfare, thinking about its environment. Does it go outside? Does it stay inside? Is it an old, you know, a, a cat that has health issues? Um, so you have to take all of that into consideration. And I there's a lot of judgment in veterinary medicine. A lot. As in every single, you know, every wherever you work, no matter your field. Um and it's easy for us to judge a situation without knowing the full story. Right. Um, so we have to try to extend grace. And I think if you do what you were saying about the students, you know, try to get the full picture mm. and try to understand where the other person, your colleague, mm -hmm. right, is coming from mm -hmm. because they may have a reason for doing it. Right. I think it gets into a risky – as a society, we're going to get existential right now if you, if you all <laughs> will come with me on this journey. As a society, I think it could get really risky if we really start going very black and white. If we're like, this is this is 100% right and this is always wrong. Because even though I did made a joke about murder earlier, sometimes like that actually might be the right move in a situation. Like if you're fighting for your life, like you might have to do that. So I take that back. Like they're, they're, everything really can be gray and it really is situational dependent. And we all are coming to situations with different lenses. So for each person, right and wrong can, ooh, ethics sucks. Mm -hmm. Ethics is rough. Yeah. This is rough. This is rough. That actually just made me think of an example. And this is an example for someone that's interested in going in practice, right? So I remember when I was working in Houston, um, maybe during my internship or when I was working emergency, there was a client who brought in their dog. And the front desk staff said, hey, somebody's here to euthanize their dog. So, you know, 
the vet techs bring the dog back. This dog looks perfectly healthy, likes walking around, wagging its tail, looks fine to me. I do my exam, and I'm sitting there thinking, why would this person want to euthanize this dog? Sure. And so go and talk to the person, and they're just like, oh, we just don't want the dog anymore. And so in my mind... I'm kind of freaking out, you know, because I'm still a baby doctor. Like, am I supposed to euthanize this completely healthy dog? And so we have a conversation about, are there other options besides euthanizing this dog? Just because you don't want it anymore, whatever the situation was, there are other things that we could do, right? You can find another family for it to go to, um, change up its environment. And so I think that too is another situation where yes euthanasia is something again providing a good death to these animals but doing it in a manner where it's necessary because yeah. a lot of times um you know you have to make that ethical ethical decision the client might want to do this but in your mind you're thinking something different ew so what happened what did you I didn't euth- you didn't euthanize. i did not euthanize you did not it. it. i was not comfortable making that move mm-hmm. and again there's other alternatives that you can do right right and so again there may have been a veterinarian who would have euthanized there there might have been absolutely because you get money for that you do you could lose a client Mm -hmm. you lose a client you get money and then money is a huge part of ethics as well right i mean it is Mm -hmm. it is absolutely maybe uh you know my my godmother had a a saying and it was always do whatever you're going to do to sleep at night and so that's what we're kind of talking about here, folks, is like, what will allow you to sleep at night? What do you feel right and wrong about? What can you live with? Do what you can live with. And for that situation, Dr. Southern could not live with euthanizing this animal. Maybe somebody else could, and we're not going to judge them. I mean, inside, we, you know, each person, (laughs) you might be judging them, but you don't know the reasoning behind. And that's why it's really important to have these kinds of conversations to lead with intent and curiosity and, and ask people not from a defensive side, but a fascinated side of like, Oh, tell me more. Why tell me about this so I can understand it better. And then you can have a, a, a bigger picture where everything isn't black and white, but full of color. Well, we've talked a lot about the welfare of animals, but as we know, veterinary medicine is a people profession. So can you tell me when do, like how your ethics as maybe a manager or a teammate come into play when you're working through an ethical situation with the folks on your team? Yeah, so it's really important to take care of the people on your team. Um, Especially as a veterinarian, you're kind of automatically assumed to be the leader. And so you need to take care of your veterinary technicians. They are the bread and butter of everything that we do. Um, And we learn from them, right? And so there can be situations where your staff might get into an altercation with a client or they might make a mistake. And so, again, thinking of ethics and thinking of your morals, um, you want to be able to stand up for people when you have that opportunity. I think having a boss that I knew or a supervisor would go to bat for me would make me feel more comfortable and confident in their decisions in general. And you have to have that trust with your team. And then that team is going to help back you up if you do make a call that maybe a client doesn't agree with. So having the trust all around, having each other's backs, knowing who that person is and what their ethics are will help you defend that person. And you can say, like, I know who this person is and they would not do something like that or they wouldn't do something like that without a good reason. Give me a second to go chat with them. So you also need you need to protect your animals, but you need to protect your people as well. Well, I don't know about you two, but I am ethically exhausted. Wow, what a chat. Uh, We always like to ask our guests to give a piece of advice that either helped you on your journey or something you want the pre-vet students to know. You know, these are folks who are are of all different ages and backgrounds, but what would you need to hear if you were listening to a pre-vet podcast before you got into veterinary school? Yeah, so I think... um... Leading up, you know, even when I got into vet school, you still somewhat have a bit of a narrow mind about certain things. So keeping an open mind the entire time, I think, is is really important. You never know what's going to come down the road, maybe something that you you didn't even know existed before. So keeping your mind open um, to, uh, you know, the 
the different opportunities within the profession itself and even uh, outside of it. And that, you know, also ties back into helping you guys be able to answer all of these questions and things like that that's going to come up in your interviews. But even beyond that, once you, you know, get accepted into school or wherever life leads you, keeping an open mind, I think, is, is really important. And then, you know, not just for your career, but then on the outside, these ethical decisions that you're making, you have to keep an open mind, keep your, your viewpoint, um, able to accept other people's sides of things so that you can really make the best, uh, call at the end of the day and not just, not just hone in on one specific area and, and forget about everything else. Yeah, absolutely. I think I would add that veterinary medicine is challenging. We make a lot of decisions every day, so it's really important to find an outlet. It's important to find something to keep yourself balanced. So figuring that out now while you're a student is really, really important. It will help you in vet school, and it will help you beyond um, once you get into your career. So finding something to keep you balanced Um, And then in addition, something for right now, finding a mentor, that's really important. Finding someone that you can ask questions, somebody that can help guide you, someone that will be honest with you. Um, Yeah. And then keeping yourself well-rounded, like Brittany said. Yes. Yes. Good advice. Staying open-minded. You don't know what you're going to learn from each person, from each lecture, from each experience with an animal, and also having a great mentor who can help be that like guiding force and that help you with your moral compass will be uh, awesome. I think the big word here, folks, is sketchy. You don't want to be around folks who are sketchy and you don't want to do anything that's sketchy. That's ethics in a nutshell. Thank you both so much. It was so fun to talk with you, even though this is a heavy topic, and I think you made it very palatable. So thank you for your willingness to have a candid, difficult conversation. Thanks for having us, Alex. It was a lot of fun. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Excited? Yep. Is it the, it's something that wakes you up in the morning talking about ethics? No. No. Not at all. I'm just worried that I'm not going to have adequate answers for this. I wouldn't have asked you to be on if I had any doubt. Ready? Let's do it. Okay. Hey, friends. It's Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Working in vet med means working with people. Developing skills to communicate and work well with staff, clientele, and the community is not a skill that can be ignored under the pretense of only working with animals. Soon you'll hear from two of our own DVM candidates, Arati Papanikis and Julian Terciano, as they share how they hone these skills. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and I am really excited about our topic today, interpersonal relationships. As you know, in this season, we're talking about the people skills from the VEMCAST letters of recommendation. We're having veterinarians. We're having non-vets on the show. And today, I have two fantastic DVM candidates, Arati Papanakanas. Arati, how do you say your last name? <laughs> Papanikas. Arati Papanikas and Julian Terciano. Did you like that? Was that yes, good? that was very Italian. Yeah. Uh, these are two students in the class of 2026. Uh, Julian has served as my TA before. Arati has taken uh, one of my undergrad classes. They are best friends, wouldn't you say? Yes. yes. Would you say that you, as they say, in sync, <laughs> would you say that you have a good grasp on interpersonal relationships from your own relationship, but also the relationships of your peers? A hundred percent. Definitely. You can see, find these two at lots of social events in their class. You can find them organizing social events, whether it's from volleyball games to outings to karaoke. Uh, these two really do understand, I think, the value of friendship and relationships, which is why I had them on the show today. Before we start, will you both tell me where you went to undergrad, what was your major, and what type of vet you think you want to be? Um, I went to UF for undergrad. Um, My major was animal science, and currently I am interested in ECC uh, and exotics, but I am still very open-minded. I also went to UF for undergrad, go Double Gators. I was also an animal science major and currently fairly set on small animal GP, but have to be open-minded as they say. 
So had you both on to talk about the importance of interpersonal relationships, to talk about the importance for, for like mental health and wellness in vet school, but also networking, business, um, relationships outside of the veterinary field. But the first thing I want to start with is why do y'all think you've been in vet school for now more than a semester? Why do you think interpersonal relationships would even be on the VEMCAS application? Why is it so important? In general, you're going to be interacting with 150 students on a daily basis, whether you're in class, on Zoom, interacting with professors. It is something that's going to be a part of your daily life now and when you go into the field. So it's really important to start those skills early. Julian, you've been a vet tech before vet school started. Yes. <laughs> uh, can you talk about like working as a technician, Why, wh- like how interpersonal relationships kind of came out as a tech? Uh, yeah, so I think it's really important because you want to be able to like build a rapport with like your clients and just build a relationship where they can trust you, but also like be able to like lean on you for support and for help like in situations that they need. I've had multiple experiences where clients like would like want me as their tech just because we've had like a we built a rapport and we had a good relationship where I was able to like really listen to what they had to say and like really gear my uh, techniques towards like their Uh, issues that they had with their animals. Oh, good example. That's a great, like word of mouth is so important in vet med. Having a technician, a doctor, a practice that you would recommend to somebody else that you want to go to, somebody that's like really good, who is good at making, forming relations is so important because it is a people profession. Talk about your experiences so far with working with people in different scenarios, either as a tech, in a, in a clinic, in the veterinary classroom, what kinds of relationships can these folks, pre-vets, expect to form? Some of the relationships you might have already experienced as an undergrad or high school or wherever you may be in life is working on an executive board or in a leadership position. That's something that both Julian and I were heavily involved in an undergrad, and it's continued into Um, vet school. So whether you want to be an officer or just a member of a club, working on a team and developing ideas for whether it be a social event or a professional networking event, these are people you have to get used to interacting with, whether you like them or not. Thankfully, we like our classmates, but um, in the event that you didn't, or regardless of how you feel towards someone, you have to work together to work towards a common goal. When you come into like a class as class of 2026, we were a little bit of a bigger class than normal. So like being able to just be like thrown in on orientation day to like all these big personalities like different personalities too some like more shy some like me that are just very outgoing ready to meet everybody get along uh i think it's very important to like know your audience and like know who you're getting into once you get to know them so that way you're able to like you know become friends with them as they are your future colleagues for the rest of your life oh absolutely So interpersonal relationships is like kind of a very existential topic to talk about, right? Like how do you know if somebody's good at this? When a recommender sits down to score you on a scale of excellent to poor for interpersonal relationships, like how are they even scoring you? And my thought is there are different qualities that might play into this. So we're going to go ahead and list some that we think someone should have to have strong interpersonal relationships. So I'll start and I'm just going to say like, strong nonverbal communication, like maybe making sure that you have like open body language and your face looks friendly and inviting and you, 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 people see you and they feel like they can approach you. Julian, what do you think could be a part for interpersonal relationships? Uh, I would say personality is like a big one. So, and when you say personality, are we saying like, like positive or welcoming? What do you think? Uh, I would say combination of like positive welcoming and just like being like a big friendly smile to like know that like they're just there to like listen to you and like be there to like help you understand like what you want to do. Sure. I would say dependability is a very big one in general, but especially in vet med, knowing you're going to show up on time, ready and professional is very important. And I mean, of course, we have to mention just like oral communication skills. So someone who can hold a conversation, who can make a connection with their words, whether it's with a client, a coworker, a veterinarian, someone who's able to have a back and forth. I would also say being an active listener is really important. Yeah. What does active listening look like? Uh, It looks like, you know, you listen to somebody, but you're also able to like reiterate what they said back to you and make sure that you clearly understood what they were trying to relay to you. Totally. 
I would also add open-mindedness. You want to be flexible and willing to change your ways uh, if new information is presented to you, that you can do something either more efficiently or more professionally, whatever it may be, taking constructive criticism and applying it. Oh, I, that's a great one. I'm going to say trust. So it would be really hard to have a relationship with someone if I didn't trust them. When Aditi mentioned dependability, now I can start to trust that person. That's going to help form a stronger relationship with them. Um, I would also say common interest is a big one. Like me and Aretti formed our friendship, I would say, on a lot of common interests like vet med, but also like our interest in like outside of vet med, like just being nice people, being people that want to like help society like progress into a more like positive direction. Easygoing is another great quality because that means many people are able to relate to you, interact with you, and it, it opens your whether it be client base or friendship base, and that's going to play a big role in vet med as well. So what if somebody is shy? I have to assume you all have some shy classmates. Is that accurate? Yes. yes. Yeah. So how do we think we would encourage the student who maybe relates with being a little bit more shy? Maybe they don't approach others as much. How is that person going to form stronger interpersonal relationships before applying to vet school? I would say having a strong sense of self and knowing – affirmatively what your interests are and things that make you happy. A lot of our shyer classmates tend to make friends because they have very strong similar interests and that's definitely a way you can build relationships despite not being an over-the-top personality. Yeah, great advice because you might not approach somebody but you might join a club where you have a similar interest, everyone starts chatting. In a club there's going to be icebreakers, there's going to be forced group activities and teamwork and so that's a great way for shy folks to really build those interpersonal relations. Let's talk about relationships outside of vet med. So you both have families. Aditi, you're in a relationship, a long distance relationship. Talk about how the skills that you've learned to build from now until vet school is helping keep those relationships alive. What kind of strategies can you encourage everyone else to have? Um, things that they could be doing now to make sure that those relationships are still sustainable. Some of those folks maybe wrote you letters of rec and now you're in vet school. Like how are you staying in contact with all these people? Um, I think the most important thing to do is like I always, especially for the people, the doctors that wrote me letters of rec and even the professors, uh, I always shoot them an email every couple months updating them on my life or shoot them a simple text being like, hey, like, hope you're doing well. Like, I'm just updating you. I finished my first semester of vet school. I actually just did that recently with one of my doctors that I worked with for years. And I texted her like this whole long thing about how like she taught me so much and how it was I learned a lot in vet school and how that related to like uh, what I can apply in, in the clinic in the future. To add to what Julian said, I think time management is the most important. If there are people in your life that bring you joy and you truly want to continue building that relationship with, whether it be a family or a significant other or just a friendship, if you make the time for it, you absolutely can continue to build that relationship and have a strong relationship despite being extremely busy with courses and other responsibilities. Both recommendations from these students to me mean intent. you have to be intentional. You have to intentionally set aside time for the people that you love who maybe in the past you had more time for. You have less time for them now, but you still want to set aside the time. And then for the people who have poured into you and given back to you, you're intentionally reaching out and letting them know you're still thinking about them, you care about them, and you appreciate them. So highly encourage everyone to take a second right now, shoot off an email or a text to somebody who has really poured into your life. Let's talk about maybe some of the don'ts for interpersonal relationships. So what do we think are some things that maybe you've experienced or you've seen that we should be encouraging people to avoid to keep their social circle and their social network positive and professional? I, would Jul say, I just want everyone to know Julian jumped on it. He like really <laughs> leaned in. He was ready to go. Go ahead. Uh, I would say like a big thing is like don't be forceful. Like let it be natural. Let your personality, their personality shine. Like let them also it, for the shyer people too. like let them also talk. Like I know for me, I could have a big personality. I could be intimidating. But you need to, like I said, know your audience, know who you're talking to. Like me and Aretti, we're very high personality, high driven people. But when we talk to, you know, some other people in our community, like we want to like know our audience and know that sometimes you have to take a step back and just be able to approach them in a way that they want to be approached. Oh, my God. I have to pause. This to me is such high self-awareness. Because if I, and there are students in my class, God bless them, they're talkers. They want to make sure that they are heard. They've got something to say every time. 
And if I was looking at that student and then ranking their interpersonal relationships, I would not be ranking them as excellent because I would think this person is not thinking about how their steamrolling is affecting the rest of their class and their peer. So I really like this idea of letting other people talk, being aware of how much you're giving to the conversation and just letting other people shine. In a professionalism stance, um, there's going to be times, whether it be in a job or a leadership position, that maybe you're not enjoying that uh, position or you feel um, put down. There is a way to go about that without burning a bridge and remaining unprofessional that won't impact your future. If something is not benefiting you and it's not pouring into you positively, it's okay to step away. But when you're disassociating from that situation or relationship, going about it professionally is really important to ensure, you know, the vet med community is very small. People talk, people interact, and you don't want that to negatively impact you later because of a single interaction that you had. I mean, first impressions make a big difference, and then one negative interaction can really burn a bridge. We get it. Things happen. People have differing opinions, different backgrounds, experiences, totally. But approaching it from the most calm, understanding, empathetic way possible will really go a long way. You do not want to get the reputation of somebody who is disagreeable. What else? What else are some things that we want to avoid? I mean, I think we should probably establish vet med can be a very high stress situation and keeping those interpersonal relationships strong can be tricky. Before you get to vet school, you are definitely working in a clinic as a volunteer, a tech or an assistant. And you'll see, you'll see the high stress. So you need to make sure that you're thinking about others, maybe assuming best intentions, right? If someone's having a bad day, we were just driving over here and someone gave us a really nasty side eye when we were coming up to the crosswalk. (laughs) And, um, you know, my first thought was like, well, they must be having a bad day. And that's really going to help me maybe chill out when I interact with that person next time. Because if I don't have that attitude, I'm going to come in thinking this person's super rude. Mm -hmm. Have y'all experienced the high stress of vet med and how it can affect relationships? Talk to me about that. Oh, yeah. So definitely from firsthand being a tech, I've seen like many of my coworkers or friends in the field like that that have forgotten when they're in a high stress situation, how to effectively communicate, whether it's with the doctor, whether it's with clients, whether it's with their own coworkers. But it takes like a lot of self-awareness to like put yourself out of the situation. And also, I think it relates to empathy. Like when you get frustrated, people can get frustrated with the situation at hand with if a a patient is not improving and getting frustrated with the client, with the doctor, with the treatment plan or et cetera, whatever the case may be. Um, And I think it's just important to make sure, you know, that they put themselves outside of their own shoes, put themselves inside somebody else's shoes and be like self-aware of the situation that the client's in. To add to that, I almost think that empathy and that sense of closeness comes from the fact that vet med is such a unique experience. Whether you're going through vet school or you're working in a vet clinic, it is very hard for someone outside of those experiences to relate to one another. So our classmates, we like to call it trauma bonding because we're all suffering through it together and getting through these long days. Um, At the end of the day, it's worth it. But, you know, we get almost a little too comfortable with each other and we forget that we're all people. We all have emotions. We all have different feelings that we're navigating in our own minds. So I think taking a step back, like Julian said, and just reminding yourself that before you approach someone in a situation that might be higher stress is really important. Hot topic. Do you think the Internet and smartphones have made it better, worse, or the same for interpersonal relationship building because I obviously have an opinion (laughs) that's that's a really good question uh I would say from my personal experience I'm not the biggest on social media but from what I've seen like on TikTok and like stuff like Instagram and stuff like that I think it potentially could make it worse just because like you could think something about interpersonal communications and how you do something, but then you see somebody else and you're like, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's a bad idea. But at the end of the day, interpersonal communication is such a broad topic that there's no like one way to do something. There's multiple ways to approach situations, but there's normally only a few intentionally good ways to like approach a situation. So I think seeing other people and how they approach situations is good, but at the same time, it's bad because it shows you like that like, 
Like you start comparing yourself? Yeah, like you start comparing yourself to like how other people deal with their relationships and interpersonal skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So I hear you that it could be good because it could be – you could get some ideas and examples and like a pace setter. Okay, okay. But it could also be bad. Mm -hmm. Aritzi, what do you think? I – I do believe that smartphones and the internet have increased our frequency of interpersonal relationships because it's become a lot easier to shoot someone a quick text or forward them a video when you're thinking of them, which in a sense is great, but it's also decreased the quality in my opinion because it's easy to send a quick text or forward a video opposed to picking up the phone or seeing someone in person. And those are obviously a lot better ways to read someone's body language, their voice, everything. And that's a more increased quality of interaction in my opinion i'm glad you said quality because i'm hearing it it has become more quantity potentially over quality for sure i have seen that some students have a hard time making friends now because you just don't have to go out anymore to do that a lot of people don't want to pick up the phone and have a phone conversation there's a lot of anxiety around that so i can see benefits for sure of social media and um connecting with others in that way like i hear people all the time like oh, it's the only way I'd ever see, like, you know, pictures of my granddad. I'm like, well, clearly your granddad's not that important to you if you're never picking up the phone and calling them. No, I don't want to judge anybody's relationship with their granddads. But, yeah, it has gotten a little bit trickier to make those connections. I want to talk about um, laughing together, right? So I think another piece of interpersonal relationships is how it's how you interact with others, but also your confidence and your interaction with yourself. So we were just laughing in the booth about Aditi had a little bit of a stumble with her words and we all started laughing and I thought to myself, if Aditi is not confident in who she is and our relationship together, she could take offense to this. You probably have had interactions with other folks where people get really sensitive to maybe like a joke or getting poked fun at. And so it's really important to also have the self-confidence, the uh, the trust in the relationship to know that these folks don't mean any malintent toward me. Um, you know, they're for me. They're on my team. Have y'all experienced anything like that or, or can talk to them about having the confidence in the relationships? Um, yeah, I 100 percent. I'm a big laugher. So I laugh at literally everything. It's the way I cope with things. Uh, so definitely sometimes I could come off too much. Like definitely with when I meet new people, sometimes I laugh too much just because I'm like, it's just my personality. I sometimes could be overbearing. But with like people like me and Aretti that like have known each other for years now like when we laugh like we we're not making fun of each other we're just laughing and once we get in like a like a routine like we can't stop laughing at this one thing for like 20 minutes when we're in there and like when we're studying like we would be laughing and it would just be like an hour of laughing Julian and I have laughed at a joke for literally 20 minutes and I think Aww. it's I think it's because I come from a Greek-Italian background. He comes from an Italian-Puerto Rican background. Like, we come from big families who are very into laughing and making jokes with each other. So that's our personal background, and I understand not everyone has that background, but that's our personal way of making life a little bit lighter. Yeah, I like the self-awareness that Julian has, that he knows he's a laugher. And so maybe in a new situation, maybe he'd be aware of that and, like, either tell people, like, just a heads up, I'm a laugher, like, I don't mean any offense, or scales back in the laughter, or is just confident in who he is and lets the laugh come. But the piece about demographic backgrounds and ethnicity is also so important because folks from different backgrounds do have different levels of like comfortability with their relationships. So I'm not I won't paint with broad brushes for any particular uh, demographic, but just think about maybe someone, you know, who has a different background than you. Maybe they have different levels of like personal space. Maybe they're a lot more comfortable just talking about things that might be TMI for other people. So keeping that in mind when you're interacting with others and giving them that benefit of the doubt and getting curious about that person and maybe asking why questions um, without putting them on the defense can really help you increase your interpersonal relationships with folks outside of your backgrounds. I want all the listeners to take a second and think about who is your circle of relationships right now? What does your support system look like? Do you have folks who are who you can call at any time if you're in need? Someone that you would share like victories with or defeats? Is Does it go beyond your family? And it's not the number here. I don't need you to have 15 people that you're like, yes, I would call them if I was in a in a terrible accident. Like, no, no, no. But it's like the quality of those relationships. And if you find yourself thinking, mm, I don't really have as many as I would like, or oh, I'm kind of on the I'm out on the outs with everybody right now. So take a second and reflect on why that is and how you can fix it. Have y'all had a time in life where 
maybe it was like kind of a valley season for interpersonal relationships. Aditi is, is saying yes. Do you want to? Sh- do you have things you could share with about that? Beginning of undergrad was a really hard time for me. I am extremely close to my family and my friends back home. So moving to a new place where I knew no one was a big stretch for me and a lot harder of a transition than I ever imagined. I came into college thinking everyone knew no one when in reality a lot of people knew people from back home. So I didn't have that same experience. But it quickly allowed me to join organizations and to reach out to new people. And I'm ultimately glad it happened, but it definitely was a hard time in life for me. So I can certainly relate to that. But like Alex said, there's never a point where you can't turn that around and change that. And especially in an environment where you have so many new and diverse people in front of you. I will say to tag along on that, like coming to undergrad, like you were going to school with like people for like 12 years, like in high school, middle school, elementary school. And then coming to undergrad was like a big change for me. Cause like I said, I have a big personality. A lot of my friends, my family back home, like knew who I was, knew my big personality. They understood that I'm a laugher, like this and that. But coming to undergrad, I kind of had, not that I changed myself, but I had to like tone it down a little to like, like Built, I almost became like a like a little bit of an introvert for freshman year, even though I'm a huge extrovert, just because I was a little weary of like, how am I going to make friends? Like, how am I going to like build these relationships that I built for so many years back home? And then you just like are thrown in a new city and like expected to like make friends. It was a very stressful situation for me. But at the end of the day, like it worked out, like I met like a lot of great people that I even brought into vet school with me. So my biggest advice or biggest tip is to never give up and don't change yourself, but just be really self-aware of like when you're put in and thrown into a new situation or new community. This could be a hot take, but I love a rebrand. Like if you find that you don't love how you've been interacting with others and maybe that's how you've naturally been and you want to change that, it's okay to rebrand. You know, you're starting, you'll be starting vet school. However, you will need to get the letters of rec to check off that you have strong interpersonal relationships. But if you're like, I want to change some things up in the future, yeah, come in starting fresh and scaling back. But you have to do a lot of reflection on that or else the old behavior is going to come out. You can only like force yourself and white knuckle yourself so much. Okay, so let's try to give them some practical tips on ways that they can increase or improve their interpersonal relationships. And we'll give them something that they could do now, something they can do in a month, and something they can do in a year. So what do you think they could start doing like right now to improve them? Um, For sure, my biggest tip is in your classes, literally the simplest thing, go introduce yourself to the professor. Go shake your hand with the professor. My professor that I shook hands with my first day of freshman year was a professor that I TA'd for. She wrote my letter of rec. Who is it? Uh, Miss Amy Imler. We love Amy. <laughs> Yeah. Um. So that's my it could be very scary. Like I remember when I it was my very first class in undergrad. It was introduction to animal sciences. Uh, she was like an amazing professor. And I was so nervous because I knew I was going to pref- I wanted to pursue vet med and my hand was sweating and I had to like wipe my hand right before I, was, I shook my hand with her. But after that, like, honestly, like we've we've built such a great relationship in terms of like a student professional student professor relationship. And she taught me like a lot about interpersonal skills and how when I was at her TA, how I had to, you know, change my almost like adapt my teaching style to certain uh, students that learn different and unique manners. Can I ask you, after she wrote your letter of rec, did you follow up with an email thanking her? I did. I think the art of the follow up trademark patent pending no one steal this is huge that's a big piece i think for interpersonal relationships that if you have a good interaction with someone let them know it was a good interaction if someone writes you a letter of rec thank them if you get an opportunity from somebody if they pass along your name make sure you follow up because then it's like wait a second this person just has good social skills that's literally all we've been talking about this entire time someone who has strong social skills who's self-aware and can maintain a relationship Aditi, what could they be doing within the next like month or so um, that may be a little bit more of a goal? We've talked a lot about self-awareness throughout this podcast, and this can be something now or in a month, whatever it may be to get you there. But doing a, something as simple as some introspection, thinking about yourself, what are your strengths, your weaknesses, 
how you can improve. Something as simple as taking a personality quiz. Um, Alex had us take one for congregators. I sure did. I don't remember what the website was. So it's the four tendencies. We're going to talk about it a lot this season, but about your habits and who you are as a person. Highly recommend. I'm a questioner. Didn't know I was a questioner until I took the quiz, but now I know that's something new about myself, and that's something that I will utilize moving forward. I think the great point about personality tests is it helps you learn more about yourself, but also can help you like project those findings onto others. So, for example, Aditi is a questioner, which means she needs reasons and research as to why to do something. So if she's going to have a strong relationship with someone, she can communicate that to somebody else being like, I'll do it, but you've got to tell me why. And then if she, if the person that she's in the relationship with needs something different, she can give that to them. But just knowing about different personalities and different strategies for each person can be super helpful. It's kind of like the love languages quiz. Have you guys taken that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know what your love language is? Yes. What is it? Mine's quality time. Wait, are you feeling loved right now? Because this am. is this is hot. Very loved. Five star quality time. <laughs> Julian, is that yours too? Um, if I remember correctly, I think it was like a tie between like physical touch and um, uh, gift. Uh, giving and receiving giving, gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Low key, everyone. Most men, physical touch is their number one. <laughs> that's fine. Um, mine is giving and receiving gifts. Is my number one, and that's another important thing to know. If I'm gonna have a relationship with someone. I need to tell them what I need and what I want and what makes me feel great. So it's really important that you have those communication skills and you can speak in I terms. What can they be doing a year from now? What's the long-term goal when it comes to interpersonal relationships? I think in the long term, developing a very strong relationship with a mentor, whether it be in academia or in the vet clinic, these are the people who are going to be writing your letters of recommendation and you want them to be strong outside of what you do within your job. Anyone can be decent at their job, but what do you bring beyond that? That's going to make you an important facet within the field of vet med. So for example, I worked at a clinic, I've been there now almost three years at a small animal practice. By the time my doctor wrote my letter of rec, I had been there about a year and a half that I was developing that relationship with her. And when I went to work, I didn't just ask her questions about vet med. I asked her about her life. I asked her, how was her weekend? Um, what are your hobbies? What do you enjoy doing? These are people too. And forming a bond with them that spans beyond just asking vet med questions is really what forms a stronger relationship, an interpersonal relationship that will carry over into a strong letter of recommendation. Is it Dr. Romy? It is. Class of 2017. We love her. <laughs> I think that's a great gauge of how your interpersonal relationship skills are right now is ask yourself, do I have a mentor or do I have more than one mentor and what does that relationship look like? You're so right. That's the long-term goal. That's the ultimate goal for this season, honestly, is the letters of rec. Getting a strong relationship with these people and you've got to build the skills to approach them, to shake their hand, to talk to them, to follow up about their life, to send emails. It takes time and effort and intention to have these relationships, but they exist. Folks in positions like myself who are maybe in a more of a mentor position, we want to mentor students. We want to form connections with them. And we can see it. Like, I can see it in their eyes. Like, in undergrad, I can see someone. I'm like, they're going to be a, a great student, and I want to work with that student. And I know that because they're asking great questions. They're involved. They're enthusiastic. They're positive. That makes me want to work with someone. Well, Julian and Arati, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Woo -woo. We were doing like a little hangout and one of them was like, so when are we going to be on the podcast? I'm like, yeah, all right, let's do it. So I'm really glad we made this happen. Y'all gave great tips about interpersonal relationships. I think you have one of the, my favorite vet med relationships at the school. So it's lovely to have you in the booth. Shout out to class of 2026. <laughs> I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon. You look panicked. I'm like a little stressed. Your face like shook <laughs> like your dog. Uh -huh. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> okay. This is like really legit. I, I don't know what I was expecting. I don't un understand. You've been listening to the show for, I assume, for years. Uh -huh. Yes, but I guess I never like, I never this is like really fancy. Mm, okay. Any questions? <clears throat> no, I don't think so. <clears throat> Sorry. Goodness. No, you're fine.
Welcome back to the Prevet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we are back to talk about the letters of rec, VEMCAST, soft people skills with veterinarians and non-vets. But today is an odd-numbered episode, which means we have a veterinarian, Dr. Wendy Mandisi. Dr. Mandisi, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Before we start to talk about your topic, which is ability to handle animals, will you tell us undergrad, vet school, post-vet school, where did we go? How did we end up at UF? Oh, absolutely. Well, actually, my um, my undergraduate degree is in music, so I was sort of a... <laughs> oh, I don't think... I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, Singing yeah. Singing instruments? Uh, instrument. I actually play bassoon. Well, who, <laughs> why wouldn't you? <laughs> That's kind of out of pocket. Where did that I know, come from? I know. Yeah, I was I was a music major originally, a music education major, and so uh, that's what I wanted to do. I um, I realized that I had to be willing to travel anywhere to play in an orchestra, which was my goal. And so, um, you know, I was in, engaged, and my husband had a you know a real job, and so I needed a plan B. And uh, so I actually had gotten a job um, as a receptionist in a small animal hospital, and realized I really really loved veterinary medicine. So had to take a few extra prerequisites, obviously. Uh, as a music major, I didn't have a whole lot of my prerequisites for veterinary medicine. So I wound up getting a second degree in biology from uh, University of Central Florida um, Go nice. while, yeah, while uh, working um, as a veterinary technician, worked up to being a veterinary technician. Um, and then I applied uh, to veterinary school, but uh, wound up uh, working for about five years as a veterinary technician um, before uh, being admitted to veterinary school, which happened on my third application. And oh, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you so, have passion for folks who are re- repeat oh, applicants. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Do yeah. you, why do you think it took three tries? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, I had, you know, good grades, not the, you know, uh, the straight A's that a lot of applicants have. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to say. I interviewed all three years, but it didn't actually uh, get admitted until my third year. So, And was that two UF? Where did you go All to were school? UF. Yeah, okay. UF. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you still play the bassoon? I do not. Um, I gave private lessons uh, all the way up until about my second year of vet school. I still gave private lessons and performed a little. Um, but then I actually um, had my daughter while I was in veterinary school, and so then time became pretty oh, short. So. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, she was born the beginning of my fourth year. Oh, my God. Yeah. That, this could be a whole podcast episode, too, about <laughs> yes. how you balance school and having a tiny, yeah. tiny infant. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a challenge. Oh but my uh, yeah. <laughs> and then you and your current title is? I am a clinical associate professor in primary care and dentistry. Is what are How are your days broken up? Is it mostly clinical? Are we also teaching? Are we, what does our, our scope look like? Mostly clinical and clinical, I'm a clinical instructor, so we have students on all of our clinical cases. Um, so most, that is what most of my time um, is made up of. I, I also uh, manage the practice-based clerkship, uh, which sends students out to small animal practices um, for them to work one-on-one with a small animal practitioner. And so um, I do that part-time too, and then a little bit of research here and there, um, but mainly it's clinical work. What is primary care research looking like? What What are your interests? Oh, really? I mean, it can primary care, of course. You know, as general practitioners, we see a little bit of everything. So, really, um, you you have the ability to research um, anything that you want. Um, the studies that I have done most recently, um, we actually um, did a study that was supported by the Fear Free Organization, which actually we can talk about a little when it comes to handling animals. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, that um, w- really what we did there is we measured the heart rate of dogs and cats, um, both in the exam room being examined with their owner present and then in a, in, a, in a treatment area. And so what we found in that study, which was actually published in the Journal of Small Animal Practice last year, and so what we found in that study is um, animals are much more comfortable being examined in the exam room with their owners, which of course seems intuitive, but it's good to have, you know, actual data supporting that. So, 100%. Yeah. And then um, I, I am uh, currently in the process of... Um, uh, writing up a study that we did, um, that I did actually with a first year veterinary student through a program called the FVSP or Florida Veterinary Scholars Program. And uh, we did that. Um, we actually were we had 100 dogs that we um, did both free catch urine samples on. Um, well, mainly that's what we did is free catch urine samples and evaluated um, how much bacterial contamination um, that we can see in just a sample that's caught uh, freely when a dog urinates. 
What are we? Can we talk about the results? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. We're still we're still um, kind of uh, evaluating all of the data, but by far, it's very unlikely for there to be a contaminated sample with a free catch sample. And so that was actually a, a study that was supported by Fear Free as well, uh, because the current accepted technique in collecting a urine sample uh, that you want to be um, you know f- devoid of any contamination is to do what's called a cystocentesis, where you put a needle into the bladder. And oh, so, oh, heaven. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. this is so much better for the dog, <laughs> yeah. for the client. Oh, I love That's that. That's what we hope to show. And so, again, we're still, still evaluating the data, but it was actually very um, uncommon to find contamination in those samples. We love research. Yes, yes. If you, if a five-year-old came up to you mm-hmm. and said, what kind of veterinarian are you? What do yeah. you do? How would you describe primary care to a five-year-old? I mean, I guess for a five-year-old, I would say, first of all, that I'm a small animal veterinarian, meaning I mainly see dogs and cats. When I was in general practice, I saw what we call pocket pets or um, our small mammals, but um, mainly dogs and cats. So I think I would I would describe it that way. And as far as what I do, uh, to, I guess, especially to a five-year-old, we would say that we just uh, like to do an annual exam, make sure that that pet is healthy and happy. Um, eating the right food, weighing the right amount, and um, that there's no, um, you know, health problems uh, going on, and that we would also see that same pet when they're sick, when they're not feeling well, um, when they're limping, you know, scratching, anything that might indicate that they're not feeling well. I think that's how I describe it to a young child. Yeah. Would do you, do you agree that primary care a huge piece of it is the client relationships and forming a strong bond with someone who's going to come back year after year right. to see you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think any uh, clinical veterinarian, I would say that um, whether it's primary care or specialty practice, that that client relationship is going to be uh, one of the most important parts of making sure that your patient gets the care that it needs. Being able to um, actually communicate the need for whatever it is you're recommending um, is very important skill to learn. Um, but, uh, yeah, definitely if you're a primary care veterinarian, then you're not just seeing that animal when it has a special problem. You're seeing them for well visits. You're, you know, and, yes, that client relationship is very important because, again, if you're not portraying or, or conveying to that client um, why you recommend what you're recommending, then they're not as likely to do it. And then you might have an animal that's not on heartworm prevention, for example, or flea prevention or not coming in regularly for its um, for its visits. So, again, that, that communication is is extremely important. Something's really bothering me that I haven't asked about. Yeah. You're very spooky. <laughs> and you just like I just think like it's important to know that veterinarians are more than their career. Oh, you have a sure. life outside of a career. You're yeah. a mom, you've got things going on. But will you just talk about like your general spookiness? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, I mean I th- I think everybody that works with me at um, you know, well, any place I've worked on uh, knows that I'm a big fan of Halloween, really like scary movies, you know, like to hit up uh, Halloween Horror Nights every uh, every year, and so Ew, do you? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, well, heck. I mean, the lines are. You know, now I'm getting to the age where you, but I don't you like love to the be lines. scared. Oh, I do. Yeah, I always mm-hmm. have. Yeah, since I was uh, since I was young. My my whole family's kind of that way. We've oh. all loved scary stuff. I grew up watching scary movies with my dad, and so um, so yeah, it's a yeah, yeah. I love it. The bassoon is a scary instrument. Uh, it it can goes be, very sure. low, those bass <laughs> notes. Okay, it all comes together. It can be. Yes. So you're here to talk about ability to handle animals, which is one of the 16 to 20 um, qualities on the letters of rec. Have you written letters for pre-vets to go to vet school? Oh, absolutely. Do you know the form that I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you're familiar with the form. You know that you have to score these folks on a scale of excellent to poor in all these areas. So let's talk about ability to handle animals, which to me is like... So it could be subjective. Sure. Yeah. And it's yeah. It's also they're learning, so it yeah. can be kind of harsh if someone's like average. But right. when you're approaching that part of the the letter, what are you thinking about? Well, I mean, one of the first things I'm thinking about is how often have I actually witnessed that totally. applicant, um, you know, handling animals. Sometimes we've just seen a couple of interactions, and sometimes we know, you know, that that uh, applicant has worked with us as a technician, and we are very familiar with their an- animal handling s- skills. So that's one of the things that I'm thinking about. And I will, I mean, I'll tell you, there's it, it is a little subjective, and there's so you know, every practitioner has a, a different way that they they often like to handle animals. But in general, um, if you have a really super 
super scared, frightened animal, um, it's not your that interaction is not going to go well. And so, um, a big part of you know, again, we're all fear free certified at, at at UF in our primary care department. And so, uh, one of the things that we really look for um, that that fear free really you know talks about quite a bit is kind of reading that animal and seeing you know what's going on here. Is this animal very protective of its owner? Or are we seeing some aggression because of that? Or are as is often the case, are they just really, really terrified? And what are some things that we can do to help that animal um, not be quite as scared? Maybe that's offering treats. Maybe that's spending some time giving them lots of attention and rubbing and petting uh, before we start doing our examination. A lot of times it's going very slowly. And so for an applicant, one of the things that we, again, not as part of the admissions committee, but if I'm writing that letter of recommendation for a student, you know, it will be, does this, uh, does this, person understand that? Do they understand that you really need to read your your patient before you start trying to handle them? Some of them are super easy. They're very happy to be here and they're, you know, they're they're uh, they're really uh, you know just just happy animals and and so that's really easy. But when we can really tell uh, you know how off how much that person has handled animals, it's what to do when the animal is being aggressive or scared or can you, you know, kind of tease out wh- exactly why this animal is aggressive. Aggression has so many different faces and you, so many different causes. And part of our job is being able to figure out, um, you know, what is the per- reason for this animal's aggression. Will you dive deeper into fear free? I sure. think it's something some of our audience has heard of, maybe yeah. has heard nothing about. So sure. what is it? Well, it's actually an organization you can become certified in fear-free handling. Whole practices can also be certified in fear-free. And so um, really it's just a set of guidelines in, again, reading animal behavior, knowing exactly um, you know why that animal is, or getting as close as you can to knowing why that animal is uh, being uh, you know fearful or aggressive. And also having tools and techniques in order to be able to handle that animal in a way that's not going to make it even worse for you when they come back next time, right? So if you, if an animal has a really, really bad experience and maybe has been, you know, manhandled or, or you know, treated roughly in an in, in a attempt to restrain, um, the next time it's going to be even worse. Whereas if that animal is very fearful and you take a little bit of time, you maybe give them some treats, you know, sometimes that's not even going to be doable. And part of Fear Free is being able to say, you know what, you need to come back again for another visit. And this time we're going to give you some medications to give often the night before and the morning of to take the edge off that anxiety. Because some animals are so anxious, no matter what we do, it's just not going to go well. And so we, you know, part of Fear Free is knowing that and knowing when to say, you know what, it's just not going to happen today. We need a different approach. And so next time maybe it's without the owner, for example, if that animal is very protective of its owner. Or next time maybe it's with the owner. Maybe they do better. And it's just sort of knowing that every animal is different and um, the best way to be able to handle those patients. Um, so it doesn't, you know, it's not uh, distressing for them, their their owner, and it makes it easier for you the next time they come in. Speaking of owners, how often are you or and maybe mm-hmm. other veterinarians, do you think, it, taking what the owner says into consideration. So if the owner is like, oh, they're feeling blank because of blank, right. are you believing them off the bat? Are you kind of putting that in the back of your mind? How often are we finding that like they actually do know what's happening? I mean, it's always really, really important to listen to your client. Nobody knows their pet better than they do. And so I think maybe it's a, a mistake when veterinarians say, um, oh, you know, okay, you know, what, you know, whatever, you know, they and, and not really take that into consideration just because that client doesn't have a veterinary background or an animal background. They know their pet better than anyone. Now, sometimes they may, um, what we call anthropomorphize, meaning they are you know, just making assumptions mm-hmm. about their animal's behavior that may not, you know, probably be entirely accurate. But listening to what they're saying is really, really important and it can really help you. I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, I had a, actually had a patient recently and um, he was very, very fearful and we figured out a way, um, you know, for him, we figured out he actually did not like being in an area where there are a lot of other dogs. And so we, you know, were able to establish that pretty early on in a, you know, in the, in the run situation or, you know, where he's, even though he couldn't see the other dogs the way our kennel is set up, he could still hear them and know that they were there. We put him in a separate quiet area and he was much, much more relaxed. 
Afterwards, we found out from the owner, the dog has been attacked twice mm. by other dogs. And so, um, you know, of course, he's going to be very fearful around other dogs. But again, that information is really important for us to know, because if, um, you know, you have a dog that's been a victim of attack by other dogs, of course, they're not going to want to be in a run situation or a kennel where they can hear a lot of other dogs sure. around. And so the client often has very valuable information to share. So while while their assumptions may not always be you know, cl- clinically relevant, um, a lot of times they can tell us things that are going to make us think, oh, okay, well, he had a really bad experience with X. Let's try to, you know, avoid anything that might trigger a response to that. Completely. <clears throat> are, are you a proponent of having pre-vets get fear-free certified? Do we oh, need to absolutely. help them with their ability? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it's a very valuable skill set to have. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a great program. And probably just time and being oh, yeah. in a clinic and letting someone you know, moving from shadow to volunteer to tech, you know, to so that you can put your hands, the practice. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's not you really, I mean, as some people are just intuitively a little bit more in tune to, you know, being able to see animals and read their body language. I think that some people are just naturally better about that, but there is absolutely no substitute for just experience in doing it. Knowing that, oh, when a cat is making, you know, you know, his ears are doing this, it probably means, again, some of that is taught in the Fear Free program too, but to know that, you know, with with this body language indicates he's probably very scared or very, you know, it's, it's, Probably he's probably about to become very aggressive. This is a warning sign. To read those is really important, and there's n- there's no substitute, no training that can take place short of just lots of hands-on experience. For sure. Mm-hmm. Let's talk um, pet peeves and uh ohs. When you're in the clinic and you have seen somebody doing something, yeah. what are a couple that you're like? I can't stand it when someone blanks or like, ooh, this makes me cringe. Like, right. what are a couple of those? Well, I mean, we don't we don't love, for example, um, you know, in restraining cats, we don't love, you know, doing the scruff technique, which again, I mean, again, as a technician, that's how I learned it too. It restrains them. Is it painful? Well, no, it's probably not painful, but it can be distressing to the cat. Do you have to resort to that sometimes? Mm, maybe occasionally you do, but most of the time what we've realized is that uh, much more gentle handling techniques are more effective, wrapping them in a towel, Mm -hmm. uh, restraining in a different way can also be more effective. I mean, we're we're doing things that they're not going to like, and there's no way around that in veterinary medicine. Sometimes we have to draw blood or give injections, and it's not always going to be something they like. But um, when somebody goes immediately to a more forceful restraint, um, such as scruffing and stretching, and, you know, we don't always, you know, love that. Again, you know, I mean, it's a common practice. So we're an educational facility, and so we usually try to use that time to instruct students and in, well let's try this a different way a lot of times it's just because they don't know any sure, different and that's sure. how they've been taught um, but but by by you know kind of talking them through it they and, and being able to see look you don't really need to do that you know you can give an injection often with a cat just sitting on the table with just gentle restraint um, also for you know another example is you know for example a big dog you know if a dog weighs 140 pounds physical forceful restraint is rarely going to be effective. You just, you're not going to be able to do that. So by, you know, quote, manhandling and and really trying to, you know, hold that animal down, um, you're not going to really be successful because they're going to probably be able to get away no matter what you're doing. So probably not starting with that as a, it, it's it's not ideal. Yeah. Let's, let's think of other ways that we can distract this animal with treats or food. Or again, if we need medications, let's use medications. It's going to be a lot better for everybody. And I, what I really struck, stuck out to me when Dr. Mandisi was talking about this was we're at an educational facility mm-hmm. and we're here to teach. And I would encourage all pre-vets, get a mentor who's willing to teach you. Oh, absolutely. There, there are yeah. folks who maybe would just let you do it and yes. maybe kind of judge that behind your back right. or yeah. not have a really gentle way to correct you. So finding someone who's willing to give you feedback and take the feedback yes. when it's given to you. Yes. Yeah. Let's say, because you serve on the admissions committee. I do. Let's say you get a packet Mm -hmm. and you open it up and that letter for under ability to handle animals, Mm -hmm. a veterinarian has checked either average, Mm -hmm. below average, or poor. What are your thoughts there. I will tell you, I immediately scroll down and read the, what, they, what the reviewers actually writing mm. because what I've realized about a lot of the packets and the, and the recommendation letters is that some people think average just means 
like that's what most applicants are going to be. And so by, you know, I don't look automatically at the number without going down and reading because then sometimes you read and they're like, All they're the time. doing great. Yes. You know, I absolutely recommend this person. You know, if they say, oh, I'm a little bit, con-, you know, if they actually write, I'm a little bit concerned about some of the handling techniques. You know, sometimes they'll say, I just don't know if they've had enough time and enough time with animals. I mean, again, what they write tells me a lot more than the number because everybody interprets the number differently. For some of them, they just mean average is going to be, that's going to be, yeah, a very acceptable applicant. Some people say five, but some people won't put that five or the whatever the, you know, top mark is unless that is just an absolute rock star. They've been doing it for seven years, you know, so it's it's a lot more about what they write than the actual number. So when I see that, I scroll down and I, I mean, I'm going to read it anyway, but that's one of the things I'm keeping my eye out for is, are you actually describing poor handling techniques or do or is it just that it's acceptable to you? I mean, I feel like we could talk about the subjectivity sure. of ratings forever. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm glad you pointed that out. And I mm-hmm. honestly, I think that's more of good advice for folks who are on admissions committees and yeah. folks who are writing letters. I pause when I see an average because I see so many who get straight excellence. Yes. And so I'm like, I agree with you that somebody might just say, yeah, they are average and average isn't bad. Right. But they're competing against students who are getting That's excellence. Right. So I'm yeah. glad you're really reading the letters. Oh, yes. Because yeah. you're right. Often the letters are glowing. Yes. And they mark it. Average. Yes. Like, Everybody right. looks at that number system very differently. Completely. I mean, that's true with, 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 you know, grading, too, in clinical rotations. I mean, everybody looks at the number system um, differently. And so what they write is far more important than the actual numbers they're giving. Sure. Yeah. So I think you were going to tell us a story where maybe did you have a below, <laughs> like an average or below average experience? Uh, well, it was just, I mean, it was one of my, as a technician, it was one of my first um, experiences as a technician, you know, handling an angry cat. Um, and so I, um, you know, w- when you're holding a cat and they, you know, cats versus dogs, you know, dogs bite, but cats have way more weapons at their disposal. So <laughs> not only do they bite, but they have claws that they that they put to good use sometimes too. And so um, I was, you know, holding an animal for a veterinarian that was, you know, examining the cat and the cat completely just freaked out. And so I let go, you know, Oops. because, um, you know, I didn't want to get scratched or it. So I let go. And uh, my my mentor uh, said at the time, he's like, look, you know, your your reaction when that happens doesn't need to be, you can't see my hands, but like hands off, it needs to be. And he puts his hands like down on the cat. And I was like, okay, you know, lesson learned. I need to make sure to hold on to the animal. And probably about a week later, the same exact thing happened. And I just held on to this cat. The cat completely like shredded my arm (laughs) to, I mean, you know, I was bleeding. And the whole time the, the clinician was yelling, let go, let go. And the I said, same you, clinician? Yes, I said, but you, you told me not to let go. Yeah. <laughs> Last week you told me not to let go. And so afterwards, I mean, I can laugh about that now, you know, after a few bandage changes uh, oh, later. God. But um, the, the, my mentor said, look, part, you know, I'm sorry. I sh- it's it's not all or, no- all or nothing. You know, I should have said you need to read the situation. If you're getting injured, you're gonna you you're gonna go. have to it's let okay. go, right? But uh, you know, I didn't want to do the wrong thing. It was, I had just started as a technician, so it's a, it's a funny story now. Yes, yeah. I mean, I would have. I think I would have done the same thing, like full pendulum. Like I'm never dropping this. Right. Guy. I don't care what happens to my. <laughs> he face. said not to let go, right. so I'm, I'm just gonna go. endure this pain yeah. and hold on. <laughs> you worked with pocket pets earlier yeah. in your career. Are there? different ways that I mean oh, there sure. has to be different ways we handle yeah, those guys yeah. I mean sometimes with those little guys like if we're talking about rats and mice and um, hamsters things like that I mean just the handling alone can be stressful enough I mean sometimes they you know that sounds terrible but sometimes stress can cause sudden death in those animals and oh, so, so I didn't impo- do it's nice. very important I didn't do a lot of work um, with birds um, but I do that's the same the same is true for like parakeets and other small um, hmm birds too is sometimes they can you know just have acute heart failure secondary to to really severe stress so yeah you got to be oh very careful with those guys in in your handling techniques and does spe- take a little uh, extra special training uh, from somebody that's done it often is, yeah. is usually what I would recommend is um, you know don't really do a lot of handling in those little guys and, and they can you know guinea pigs for example I mean, you can you know, they can inflict a pretty fierce bite too when they yeah, want they've to got teeth. So rabbits yeah yeah they definitely can so Wow. Yeah. I, I guess something to consider, folks, a lot of you do want to do exotics and like mm-hmm. domestic exotics. So having that strong handling yes. technique is 
literally critical. It's critical. I mean, rabbits are another great example. Um, rabbits actually have very fragile spines, and if you don't handle a rabbit the right way, you can actually get a spinal fracture that would you know oh, have to God. result in euthanasia. Yeah, it actually can be. So when you're handling exotics, it is really, really important. I mean, most of the time, if you're working as a technician or an assistant um, and you are handling those animals, it's because you're working with a veterinarian that is comfortable handling those animals. So usually they can be a really good mentor and source of information on how to handle those animals. Another trained technician also uh, can be can be very valuable. But yeah. I usually don't give a lot of clout <clears throat> to personal pet ownership. However, for the folks who have a lot of domestic exotics at home and have yeah. been successful in keeping them happy, healthy, and alive, right. that's actually a skill set because you've sure. learned to handle them. So I, yeah. I think that is something to think about, folks. If you're going to, first of all, know before you buy one of these guys, right. you really need to know what you're doing. <clears throat> Absolutely. Ooh, yeah. That's scary. Yeah. Now, let's talk about strategy. Well, do you, is there anything else from the, our list? I'll edit this out. But, like, gaps in knowledge, is there anything that – I think you kind of hit on it with the fear-free. Should yeah, we go into, like, yeah. things that they should start doing? So like, um, what resources? We, we talked about fear-free for them. But yeah, yeah. How so do they increase – yeah, I mean, again, it's just going to be as much handling, animal handling experience as you can get. Now, I will – I do want to say that we don't expect you to have, like – rock solid animal handling skills to be able to go to veterinary medicine when go into veterinary medicine or veterinary school when we say that we want to see a lot of experience it actually has less to do with your animal handling skills than it does with just being immersed in a practice type of environment. Mm -hmm. So again, with a, with the high degree of burnout that we see in veterinary medicine for an applicant, what we really want to see is that more than just shadowing a little bit, um, where you're kind of seeing the highlights of a day in veterinary medicine, really being immersed in animal care, what that looks like, having to be part of maybe some of the difficult conversations with clients. Sure. I mean, I think that we want to see more that you know what you're getting into. And that usually is going to require a little bit more than some patchy, you know, shadowing or even, um, you know, more regular shadowing. Again, that, that, that tends to be like a highlight reel of yeah. veterinary medicine, whereas we kind of want to see that you've been, you know, quote, in the trenches and you've been part of that animal care uh, team. And that really says a lot to us about the the fact that you know exactly what you're getting into, you know the field that you want to enter. It's not, you know. Any questions? <clears throat> no, I don't think so. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Goodness. Welcome back to the Prevet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we are back to talk about the letters of rec, VEMCAST, soft people skills with veterinarians and non-vets. But today is an odd-numbered episode, which means we have a veterinarian, Dr. Wendy Mandisi. Dr. Mandisi, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Before we start to talk about your topic, which is ability to handle animals, will you tell us undergrad, vet school, post-vet school, where did we go? How did we end up at UF? Oh, absolutely. Well, actually, my um, my undergraduate degree is in music, so I was sort of a... <laughs> oh, I don't think... I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, Singing yeah. Singing instruments? Uh, instrument. I actually play bassoon. Well, who? <laughs> why wouldn't you? <laughs> That's kind of out of pocket. Where did that come from? I know. Yeah, I was I was a music major originally, a music education major, and so uh, that's what I wanted to do. I um, I realized that I had to be willing to travel anywhere to play in an orchestra, which was my goal. And so, um, you know, I was in, engaged, and my husband had a you know a real job, and so I needed a plan B. And uh, so I actually had gotten a job um, as a receptionist in a small animal hospital, and realized I really really loved veterinary medicine. So had to take a few extra prerequisites, obviously. Uh, as a music major, I didn't have a whole lot of my prerequisites for veterinary medicine. So I wound up getting a second degree in biology from uh, University of Central Florida. Um, Go nice. while Yeah, while uh, working um, as a veterinary technician, worked up to being a veterinary technician. Um, and then I applied uh, to veterinary school, but uh, wound up uh, working for about five years as a veterinary technician um, before uh, being admitted to veterinary school, which happened on my third application. And oh, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you so, have passion for folks who are re repeat oh, applicants. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Do yeah. you, why do you think it took three tries? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, I had, you know, good grades, not the, you know, uh, the straight A's that a lot of applicants have. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to say. I interviewed all three years, but it didn't actually uh, get admitted until my third year. So. And was that to UF? 
Where did you go All to were school? UF, yeah, okay. UF. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, now, do you still play the bassoon? I do not. Um, I gave private lessons uh, all the way up until about my second year of vet school. I still gave private lessons and performed a little, um, but then I actually um, had my daughter while I was in veterinary school, and so then time became pretty oh, short. So <laughs> what year was that? Uh, she was born the beginning of my fourth year. Oh, my God. Yeah. That, this could be a whole podcast episode, too, about <laughs> yes. how you balance school and having a tiny, yeah. tiny infant. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a challenge. Oh, but, my God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then you and your current title is? I am a clinical associate professor in primary care and dentistry. Is what are How are your days broken up? Is it mostly clinical? Are we also teaching? Are we, what does our, our scope look like? Mostly clinical and clinical, I'm a clinical instructor. So we have students on all of our clinical cases. Um, so most, that is what most of my time um, is made up of. I, I also uh, manage the practice-based clerkship, uh, which sends students out to small animal practices um, for them to work one-on-one with a small animal practitioner. And so um, I do that part-time too. And then a little bit of research here and there, um, but mainly it's clinical work. What is primary care research looking like? What What are your interests? Oh, really? I mean, it can primary care, of course. You know, as general practitioners, we see a little bit of everything. So, really, um, you you have the ability to research um, anything that you want. Um, the studies that I have done most recently, um, we actually um, did a study that was supported by the Fear Free Organization, which actually we can talk about a little when it comes to handling animals. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Um, that um, w- really what we did there is we measured the heart rate of dogs and cats, um, both in the exam room being examined with their owner present and then in a, in, a, in a treatment area. And so what we found in that study, which was actually published in the Journal of Small Animal Practice last year, and so what we found in that study is um, animals are much more comfortable being examined in the exam room with their owners, which of course seems intuitive, but it's good to have, you know, actual data supporting that. So, 100%. Yeah. And then um, I, I am uh, currently in the process of... Um, uh, writing up a study that we did, um, that I did actually with a first-year veterinary student through a program called the FBSP, or Florida Veterinary Scholars Program. And uh, we did that. Um, we actually were we had 100 dogs that we um, did both free catch urine samples on. Um, well, mainly that's what we did is free catch urine samples and evaluated um, how much bacterial contamination um, that we can see in just a sample that's caught uh, freely when a dog urinates. What are we? Can we talk about the results? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. We're still we're still um, kind of uh, evaluating all of the data, but by far, it's very unlikely for there to be a contaminated sample with a free catch sample. And so that was actually a, a study that was supported by Fear Free as well, uh, because the current accepted technique in collecting a urine sample uh, that you want to be um, you know f- devoid of any contamination is to do what's called a cystocentesis, where you put a needle into the bladder. And oh, so, oh heaven! Yeah. So yes. this is so much better for the dog, <laughs> yeah. for the client. Oh, I love That's that. That's what we hope to show. And so, again, we're still, still evaluating the data, but it was actually very um, uncommon to find contamination in those samples. We love research. Yes, yes. If you, if a five-year-old came up to you mm-hmm. and said, what kind of veterinarian are you? What do yeah. you do? How would you describe primary care to a five-year-old? I mean, I guess for a five-year-old, I would say, first of all, that I'm a small animal veterinarian, meaning I mainly see dogs and cats. When I was in general practice, I saw what we call pocket pets or um, our small mammals, but um, mainly dogs and cats. So I think I would I would describe it that way. And as far as what I do, uh, to, again, especially to a five-year-old, we would say that we just uh, like to do an annual exam, make sure that that pet is healthy and happy. Um, eating the right food, weighing the right amount, and um, that there's no, um, you know, health problems uh, going on, and that we would also see that same pet when they're sick, when they're not feeling well, um, when they're limping, you know, scratching, anything that might indicate that they're not feeling well. I think it's how I describe it to a young child. Yeah. Would do you, do you agree that primary care a huge piece of it is the client relationships and forming a strong bond with someone who's going to come back year after year right. to see you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think any uh, clinical veterinarian, I would say that um, whether it's primary care or specialty practice, that that client relationship is going to be uh, one of the most important parts of making sure that your patient gets the care that it needs. Being able to um, actually communicate the need for whatever it is you're recommending um, is very important skill to learn. Um, 
Um, but uh, yeah, definitely if you're a primary care veterinarian, then you're not just seeing that animal when it has a special problem. You're seeing them for well visits. You're, you know, and yes, that client relationship is very important because again, if you're not portraying or, or conveying to that client um, why you recommend what you're recommending, then they're not as likely to do it. And then you might have an animal that's not on heartworm prevention, for example, or flea prevention, or not coming in regularly for its um, for its visits. So again, that that communication is extremely important. Something's really bothering <laughs> me that I haven't asked about. Yeah, you're very spooky. <laughs> and you're just like I just think like it's important to know that veterinarians are more than their career. Oh, you have a sure. life outside of a career. You're yeah. a mom. You've got things going on. But will you just talk about like your general spookiness? Oh, sure. Yeah. No. I mean, I, th- I think everybody that works with me at um, you know, well, any place I've worked uh, knows that I'm a big fan of Halloween. Really like scary movies. You know, like to hit up. Uh, Halloween Horror Nights every uh, every year and so Ew, do you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean the lines are, you know, now I'm getting to the age where you, but I don't you like love to the be lines. Scared. Oh, I do. Yeah, I always mm-hmm. have. Yeah, since I was uh, since I was young. My my whole family's kind of that way. We've oh. all loved scary stuff. I grew up watching scary movies with my dad and so um so yeah, it's a it, yeah, I love it. You're listening to Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. You'll have to create a public image in every setting you enter, be it an exam room, meeting, or an outreach event. Stay and hear advice from Rachel Kepsul in demonstrating a professional demeanor. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Okay. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we are continuing on our letters of recommendation, VEMCAST people skills journey with veterinarians and non-veterinary professionals. This is an even numbered episode, which means we are speaking to a non-vet. And today we have my good pal, Rachel Kepsel. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alex. I'm excited to be here. Will you please tell the audience your title at the vet school and a little bit about your professional journey? Because say we are talking about professional demeanor. So will you give them your like last 10 year resume lines? So the titles we can hear your progression. Absolutely. So my current title is assistant director for CVM careers. I do all things career related. So a lot of professionalism in my current role with our DVM students and our residents, interns and offshore students as well. Previously in my career, I have worked in D.C. for five years. I worked on the Fulbright program. I did some international exchanges. And then before that, I worked at a university setting in study abroad and international student advising. So I've been in various different settings of professionalism and what that looks like, which all kind of depends on the place that you're working or in maybe the case of undergraduate students, volunteering, interning, you know, shadowing, gaining experience. And it allows me to provide what professionalism looks like in different contexts. Yeah, perfect, perfect segue, because what we were talking about in the car ride over here is how, depending on what area of vet med you fall into, or even what practice that you're at, professionalism can be defined in so many different ways. Rachel, just off the cuff, do you feel like that makes it almost tricky for students to understand professionalism? Because it has, it can be so gray and have so many definitions. A hundred percent. And I also think, especially for people who are, you know, starting off and maybe volunteering or shadowing or haven't worked in very many settings or really at all, it might be hard to gauge what professionalism looks like and what the expectations are. A lot of times, you know, maybe there might be an employee handbook, but some rules are followed and some rules are not. And so professionalism can look very different depending on each setting. And even for each individual, professionalism can look a lot different. Um, And so, you know, especially looking at students, a lot of times they're going to be in scrubs. You know, if they showed up to a job in D.C. that is more conservative in the way that they approach professionalism, showing up to scrubs would probably get you sent home. A hundred percent. And so I think maybe a key point, always ask. It can't hurt to ask before a job interview or an opportunity, what should I wear? Um, You know, what's the culture like? What are the expectations? So you don't fall into kind of like an embarrassing moment. Let's break down maybe some of the typically understood areas of professionalism and talk vet med, so things like dress, written and oral communication. What other things fall under, like, should we say, like, monitoring time and, and like, the maybe flexibility of that practice? So let's start with dress because that's pretty easy to understand. 
what do you, what have you experienced? Because you know a lot of corporations, you know a lot of private practices. You've heard from an, a lot of students who have visited different practices. When we're talking about professional dress and vet med, what could it look like? It could be so different. You know, a large animal vet that's providing ambulatory services is going to be a lot more casual in their dress and maybe in the way that they interact with their clients because they are, are going, you know, typically to farms or to people's properties to evaluate animals. When I look at, you know, GP and we're doing small animal, I would say it's pretty typical to see everybody in scrubs. And then even, you know, I attended VMX on MLK weekend and it's so interesting to see everybody working in the, you know, vet med industry come together for a professional conference because they were such a wide range yeah, of I outfits. Bet. And I don't think that they are, you know, if I look at somebody and they're a little bit more casual, that is maybe what professionalism means to them and that's yeah. how it is at their hospital. And I would say for you know, for our students, I believe they're supposed to be either, you know, in professional clothing or scrubs. Like totally. they're not supposed to be wearing leggings and shorts, no. do they? Yes. yes. Definitely but, not pajamas. That's one thing we've cracked down on because an undergrad, I mean, it's never professional to wear pajamas, but an undergrad, you'll see students wearing pajamas and it's kind of like, okay, fine. But yeah. in professional school, no. Yeah. Unless it's Pajama day for Spearly. That's right. Yeah. That's the only time it's fine. Sanctioned pajamas. I think what I'm hearing you say, though, is it depends on two things. I think it depends on who's running the organization and who are the clients. Because your clients expect to see the veterinarian in a certain form of dress depending on what they're doing. Let's talk about hair, tattoos, piercings, makeup those kinds of self-expressive qualities. I know a lot of students, before they go into an interview, they ask me, do I need to cover up my tattoos? Do I need to take out my nose ring? What are your thoughts on self-expression? I think it also depends on the interview setting. And I think it's really important to do your homework and research before any interview. If you can do research on them and they seem like a place that is, you know, maybe leans more towards being this traditional image of what we think of professional when we watch shows like Mad Men or, you know, things in the past where everybody is wearing suits. Not that Mad Men is professional because they're definitely not in the way that they act, but they were always very well dressed. Oh, boy. They, you know, women in dresses, blazers, They do blazers, look very dapper, tights. but you're right. Inappropriate behavior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah. we don't drink at work anymore or you know, do a lot of the things that that show does. Maybe that was a terrible example. That's but, true. I mean, like, image-wise... In that show, everybody is, like, dressed to the nines. Mm -hmm. Like, I would hate to have to be that buttoned up all day long. Right. Um, you know, the first thing I do when I get home is change out of my work clothes, and it's something that's more comfortable. When it comes to this self-expression, you should really be doing research on the culture of the place that you're interviewing, what to expect. I love Glassdoor.com. I love just a Google search to see what is going on in the news about them. I like to do a search on LinkedIn. If there's somebody on LinkedIn that maybe has worked there that is a gator or you have some form of connection with, it's not inappropriate to ask them what their experience like was at what their experience is like at that organization and what might be expected when it comes to forms of self-expression. And so in our context for the vet med bubble that we live in, Alex and I, those things are appropriate as long as you're following the professionalism expectations other places. So are people on time? Are they respectful? Are they a team player? Are they able to communicate when they're going to be late? What do their communication look like? So professional communication, a little bit different than regular communication. And maybe I'm straying a bit away from dress and we were going to circle back to this, but right. it all kind of goes hand in hand. If you're being professional in the other ways that they're expecting you to be professional, and then you have these elements of self-expression, your professionalism should not be linked to the way that you look, but really how you operate in these professional settings and if people can rely on you. Yeah. I And I usually, I agree with what Rachel's saying. It, it comes down to communication. It comes down to doing your research. If you're going to go into an interview and you're worried about something, I usually just tell students, if it's not distracting, I think it's fine. If you're worried that it is affecting your interview in any way, then I would make adjustments for that interview. So for example, if a student tells me, hey, I have purple hair, is that fine for my interview? I think as long as it's not distracting, at least for UF interviews, I think in general it's fine. However, if you're going to think about it and stew over it and lose sleep over it, then maybe you do want to change it for that interview so it isn't distracting and they can really just hear who you are instead of just seeing who you are. And if we're thinking about things like equity and access and you're worried about, well, you know, I really can't afford professional attire, Many, many, many institutions have career closets for you. You can thrift something super cute and you can borrow something. Yep, 100%. So I think that that is not an excuse to not look professional. You can find a way to have an outfit that still makes you look great.
let's talk written and oral communication and professionalism immediately what comes to mind is maybe do's and don'ts. Because for me, like, I think an immediate don't, cussing when you first meet someone and like in text, that's probably a don't. Like we don't need profanity in the beginning of a professional relationship. Does that feel right? I would agree. I would say that in my experiences, at least working at UF Med, there is a lot of cursing. Yeah. Um, when you get to know someone. When you get to know people, uh, which kind of makes it feel like a little bit more relaxed sometimes. Like, wow, I'm hanging out with all these board certified specialists and somebody just dropped the F-bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't me, but yeah. like, let's just break that ice. Right. And so I would say, you know, don't start off the bat with that. You know, you have to learn what the culture is. For me, when it comes down to professional communication, it depends on, you know, we're talking about specifically in vet med, but if we looked at vet med in Italy or Ecuador or, I don't know, Sweden, that might look very different because of the different cultural norms in that country. Ah, yes. The cultural norms. We're, I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. This whole this whole podcast, really, Rachel, is like vet med cultural norms, but also in the United States, if you're practicing in the United States. And even like we've talked about how Florida, Florida is different than the right. rest of the states. And Florida is not only different, we're technologically Technolo- no, sorry. Technically in the South. But we're not Southern. But we're not Southern. Yep. And professionalism in like Georgia, Mississippi. Totally Alabama, different. As somebody who has worked in a university in Georgia is totally different than professionalism in the Midwest or the, you know, in the Midwest or even out in the West. Mm-hmm. So even within our own country, there's going to be different communication norms depending on the region. Absolutely. When it comes to professional communication and cross-cultural communication, it's really important to do some observing of Mm. what it looks like Mm -hmm. for professionalism and cross-cultural communication norms. And then for me, if I'm talking about the context of my experience in vet med, I have two students that work for me, two vet students that work for me, um, a couple hours a week and help support everything that careers does because it's just too much for one person. And it's an opportunity for them to kind of grow as professionals and dabble in the world of professional development and supporting students. Professionalism to me, an email if I get from a student that is, you know, no intro, no conclusion. You know, if it's kind of like a text message, that to me is not professional. I can't stand it, Rachel. So when the students that work with me, I don't really care what they're wearing. I don't, I'm super flexible with their schedules as long as they are putting it on our calendars. And if they need to move it, I'm flexible because I know they're going to be there on time, which to me, that's, that is professionalism. If they're not going to be there, they let me know. They're respectful in the way that they email. They have a hello and a signature at the end. Mm -hmm. They can text me because they know that that for me is still professional. In other settings, maybe that would not be professional for me to text my boss and tell them, hey, I'm running late. And are they tech? I'm I'm assuming, Rachel, they're not texting you at off like crazy hours. Like to me, you have to be the part of the professionalism with communication is also respecting of time. If I get an email from a pre-vet student at 2 a.m., I'm not checking my email at 2 a.m., but when I see it, I'm like, ooh, like this doesn't seem professional. It seems like you are so anxious right now that you need to email me at 2 a.m. Wait a little bit later or delay delivery it. And if I'm getting a text message from someone at 10 p.m., unless it's an emergency, that to me is like a disrespect of time and boundaries. Agreed. Yeah, that would definitely feel to me like an you know, invasion of my personal time that I try to have you know, a separation from my work life and my personal life so that I can have time to take care of myself. And when it comes to, you know, hours of the day, I don't even try to text my students that work for me outside of, you know, the typical, you know, eight to five right. that I might be working unless it's like gossip about Yellowstone or something that we had been talking about and, previously. And that's the thing is there are gray areas. So yeah. I'm not telling you if you get close with your supervisors, that doesn't mean you can't text them at 8 p.m. something fun. But just know the difference between, hey, is this appropriate for this time? Should I be texting them about this right now? Or do I need to just like check myself and do a brain dump on a piece of paper before texting my boss? It even comes down to preferences, too, and knowing that person. So if I, you know, if one of the students I have that work with me, if they were not going to be able to make it to work, I would prefer that they would send me an email so that I see it in the morning instead of texting me at 9 p.m. to tell me that they're not going to Yeah, come. because then now we have to think about it. It becomes our job. Right. Now somebody has mentioned work and now I'm thinking about it and everything I have to do tomorrow. And right. like, oh, shoot, right. I'm going to have to make up for, you know, I thought this person was going to I agree with done. the email. And also letting people know with enough time is also a way to respect professionalism. So for letters of recommendation, if you want somebody to help you interview prep, mm-hmm. if you want to make an appointment with somebody, you have to make sure that you are having enough time for them to make room in their schedules. Um, and so if you're not going to be able to make it to work and you have no one for more than a day and you don't tell your supervisor until an hour before, 
that to me is a little bit disrespectful when it comes to professionalism. Well, Rachel, you're also talking about what we end up finding out later. So what, that's what I'm hearing. And and VetMed is so small, everybody knows everybody. And so another piece of professionalism is what you're telling other people and how that could get back to your employer or colleague. So for example, if you're telling everybody, if you tell your supervisor, hey, I can't come in tomorrow, I'm sick, but all of your friends know you were out drinking the night before, most of the time we find those things out. So keep those things in mind about what's too much information, how to be honest, but also like following through on commitments and how it looks from the, how, what the perception is going to be. Can yeah. you talk about that? I would say, you know, if it's a one-off situation and sometimes, you know, somebody has to cancel like a work shift, you know, pretty close to when they were supposed to start working, you know, that's a lot different than if it's on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. I am so glad that you mentioned, you know, how we typically find things out, you know, pros and cons to having technology and social media mm. and computers in our hands. But I mean, I can even like see on Venmo if I'm friends with somebody. Oh my God, Rachel, know, what Venmo doing. is the best way to find out what people are doing. Right. So Venmo, you know, social media, if your stuff is public, um, even if you're preparing for interviews or want to apply to vet school in the future, I don't like to tell people that, oh, you have to lock everything down and not tell people what you are because it's important that people have an idea of who you are as a person and what the representation that you put out for yourself into the world. And as long as there's not anything that's really maybe controversial or really strong political opinions or things that, you know, might not be for everyone, Mm -hmm. as long as those things are not on your social media and your social media is public, then I would say that's fine. If there's pictures of you underage drinking in undergrad, if there's pictures of you doing, you know, maybe questionable things in general, I, I would probably get rid of those because, We can see everything. And there have been times I have just stumbled upon something when I was scrolling through my phone that I was like, huh, wait a minute. Didn't this person cancel their appointment with me because they said that they had something to do? And now I see this picture of them like, and now you've got that bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. I'm glad we got into social media because social media is a huge part of professional demeanor. And the image and the brand that you're putting out there does affect how professionals think about you. Right. And before I forget, I do want to say this goes both ways. So if you're in a situation where you are an employee and your employer is maybe texting you at all hours of the night or emailing you at all hours of the night and it it doesn't feel professional for you and healthy for you, you have to feel comfortable having those conversations. If you're in a situation where you're an employee and you're seeing your employer out on social media and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, like this doesn't feel quite right, I am not saying go approach that employer about it, but it helps you know the kind of presence that you want to have. So I completely agree with Rachel that it is hard. I do in general tell people to keep things on private just because folks will use that against you, but I don't want you to have to do that. So if you want to have it on public, just be very honestly critical of what you're putting out there. I have seen, I have turned folks down for opportunities either for internships or as student ambassadors because their social media to me was too questionable for them to then go out and represent the college. Me too. Same thing. Not, sounds, not even in this role, but in other roles it too. It sounds so harsh, but it it does make a difference. And I think for, for vet med, folks are so passionate that if you give a tour to a, a high school student and then that high school student remembers your name, they're going to go look you up. And I need you to have like your best face forward on your social media. Agreed. There are so many opportunities. You can do so much with your DVM that having a careers professional like Rachel at your institution is so important to help you pick the right job later to make sure you're happy. So Rachel, talk to me about the kinds of conversations you're having with students, maybe about like the culture and the boundaries and how they're thinking about approaching a position when we're taking the black and white things away like salary and location and production and you know what kinds of animals they're going to see what is professional how does professional demeanor and expectations and boundaries play into the kinds of conversations you end up having with DVMs a lot of the things i talk about with them are okay what are your professional values and that can be i want X amount of days per work week. I want to have a place that values wellness, work-life balance. I want a place that has strong mentorship. I want to be able to ask for help and not feel like I'm burdening somebody else. I want to make sure I'm getting good surgical experience. I want to be able to do continuing education. Those are professional values. 
when it comes to your personal values. And a lot of times, the students that I'm working with, even though they're fourth years, they're about to graduate, they might not know what they want to do. They might not know, you know, I would go move anywhere. So it's really hard for me to figure out how to strategize this job search. And I ask about their professional values. And for some people, this is like a whole a whole new thought process. So when it comes to professional values, you know, what's so important to you? Do you really want to live close to family? Do you want to live somewhere new? Do you want to live somewhere that is, you know, smaller, but maybe has everything that you need? Do you want to live in a place where, you know, you're within walking distance to a yoga studio, the hospital that you're at is going to have all the technology that you want. In the future, you might want to have a family, you might want to get married, are there options for you, you know, for childcare? Is there parental leave the place that you're going to be signing? Um, are there things that you enjoy doing in your free time available in the city state that you're choosing to sign a contract in? And for students that I just talked to a student actually yesterday, and the student was just, you know, a lot of self-doubt about whether or not they should move back to close to where they're from and stay in Florida or take this opportunity to move to a whole different state. And they seemed really conflicted about this. And so I asked the student, I said, have you thought about, you know, we've, it seems like the offers that you have all check your professional values. Let's unpack this self-doubt so that you can feel more confident in the decision that you're making. So if we're looking at your personal values, what do you enjoy doing? What is important to you? Do you want to live close to family? You don't care. Do you, and you know, what do you do in your free time? And I said to the student, I said, I really feel like everything that you just told me aligns with the place that you're considering. And you should have confidence in yourself that I'm making the best decision possible for me because I've looked at my personal values and my career values. And sometimes those things overlap. Mm -hmm. Takes a lot of introspection, self-awareness, observation, time, spending time in the profession, having conversations with professionals like Rachel, like veterinarians, figuring out who you are and what you want and what you will and won't stand for. I think one thing that folks think about with professionalism is they think it's all ties and high heels and it has to be super buttoned up. And I've had this conversation with a lot of vet students. We talk about it in the podcast. I think it's season five, episode two with Antonio, where he was afraid that who he was wasn't going to be professional because he is a more casual person. He's very friendly, very people oriented and focused. And he had, I think, a bit of a fear that maybe he would never be seen as a professional. And we talked about how He's actually going to be the perfect veterinarian for folks who are looking for that. So you will be the perfect veterinarian for your clients. You just have to figure out who they are and who you are. Yeah. Rachel, let's talk about some resources that we can provide for these folks for, you know, today, a month from now, and a year from now. What's something they could be doing today to think about their professional demeanor and their professionalism? So for something that you could do today, maybe some self-reflection on what professionalism looks like to you, and then think about the various layers of professionalism. We have dress, we have communication, we have the work culture and team dynamic. We have, you know, maybe whether or not every single rule in the employee handbook is followed or if there's some deviations to that. And, you know, being mindful of, you know, what professional settings that you are a part of. So maybe you are involved in, you know, community events professionalism there is going to look a lot different, the representation that you put out, than maybe what it will look like at a job. And I even think it, in the pre-vet context, for something that you can do today, if you've applied to universities or you're going to be applying to universities in the future for vet school, you know, take a look at their pictures, take a look at their social media. What does the professionalism look like in those places? What do the students look like? Because professionalism at each individual accredited program could be different. And then if you have the opportunity to have you know more than one offer of admissions, try to do some digging about which one is going to most closely match your personal idea of what professionalism means mm -hmm. to you. What are they doing a month from now? A month from now, I would say there are a ton of resources that exist. There are podcasts, news articles, YouTube channels, social media accounts. There are even books about professionalism that you can read and understand, you know, maybe a bit more about professional communication, cross-cultural communication, even the way that you interact with people. So those interpersonal communication, I mean, interpersonal skills, all of those things are, you know, there's, there's a wealth of information that exists in this digital age that you can learn about. So I would say shoot to listen to one or two podcasts and then read an article or a book and then 
after you do that, I would compare it to what you did on day one today about what professionalism means to you and, you know, check off the buckets where, all right, so this kind of was talking about what I'm already doing. Or if you're learning about things that, oh man, I'm not doing that. Maybe I should start doing that. Then do some, you know, additional self-reflection on what you can do to enhance your professionalism. And a year from now, what do we hope they've done? I think it's really important for you know, taking a year and even thinking about Antonio and his concerns, go to settings where you are going to have the opportunity to interact with professionalisms, I mean professionals, and practice that professional communication because the more you do it, the less anxiety or, you know, nerves that you might have when you have to go and do it or do an interview or, you know, go on clinical rotations. The more experience you have under your belt typically makes you feel more confident. You know, you start off with this growth mindset, you might not know how to do it. And if you can go to like a pre-vet symposium or go to a career fair at your current university, some places even have career fairs for community members. Those are great ways to just go and practice that professional communication. Um, I like to equate, and I know it makes people laugh, searching for jobs, kind of like dating, except worse, because if you hate it, you can't just break up with them. Like you have signed a contract huh. and you might have to be there for a designated amount of time. And that can be the same thing for places you're choosing to work that enhance your resume as you're getting into vet school. And that's the same thing. If you start at a vet school and you don't love it, you're probably stuck there for four years. And so it's really important to make sure that your values your professionalism, um, everything that you're looking for and hoping for align with that program mm -hmm. because you're going to have to exist within the confinements of whatever is expected within that program or place of employment until you can leave. Right. And so it's kind of like dating because you want to make sure it's the best fit for you and the best fit for the other party. And, you know, practice makes perfect. So the first option, you know, might not be the best fit for you, but that's why it's important to become more comfortable in these spaces. And there are a lot of resources that exist for students that are either undergrads or they're in that period where they've already graduated, they're applying to vet school and they're maybe working or volunteering. And so those are some things to keep in mind. I think when thinking about professionalism in a relationship context, a big word can also be compromise. You might start off that on today reflecting on professionalism and a month from now after reading books and articles and have a lot of values and goals and thought of boundaries, but then you might get into a situation where you can compromise a little bit. So don't be afraid if it still works for you. That if So for example, for me, one of my strong work values is uh, commute. I wanna work very close to my job. I work five minutes within uh, vet med, but if I found some superstar job that I was obsessed with and my commute became 30 minutes, I could maybe compromise on that. So be willing to compromise and evaluate what you, again, will and won't stand for. Rachel, we always ask our guests to give big life advice to the pre-vets. This can be about professionalism or it could just be personal advice that has really helped you in your journey. So thinking about these students, you know who they are, you know they wanna to get to that DVM level that we interact with them every single day. What advice do they need to hear from you? Man, I feel like I have so many. Uh, the students that work for me, sometimes because we'll, they work in my office, I'll be like, this is a life lesson. Um, and I had one this week that was really funny. I wish I could remember what it was. But um, some life advice. I'm going to go in the context of careers because that's you know, what I'm passionate about is have a master resume. So have everything you've ever done on one giant document and have as many bullets as you want. Maybe if you're currently working or volunteering, continue to add bullets. I always tell myself that I'm gonna forget what I've done and I typically do. And so it's just easier if I write down key accomplishments, things I've done that are extra um, or what I've even done on a regular basis in the semester because it flies by in one centralized place. And then in the future, you already have this document built. You can have a one page resume probably at the undergraduate level, maybe two page, maybe maybe, probably one. Um, but then you can pull what you want from your master resume and craft this one page document that's tailored to what you're applying to. If you are applying to things blindly, I would say it's a better way to use that master resume, tailor your bullets to what you're applying for, and then you have this historical document of everything you've done. And then maybe like a life advice, I just kind of feel like everybody should carry a snack with them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's damn good advice. You know, people get hangry. Um, and sometimes you're in situations where, where you, there is no food, but like maybe just like carry a snack, carry like, a packet of Belvita crackers. Like you never you know. A snack. I did. I ate some snacks on the yeah. way over so that I would be energized and not hangry. Um, I mean, it's, I will say that I've really learned this now in my mid thirties. Most of my moods get stabilized when I have a snack, like same. our blood sugar's messed up y'all. So have a snack, yeah. chill out, drink enough water. 
Rachel, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. <laughs> thanks for having me. I was a little nervous, but this was great. It's a fun conversation, and I think uh, hopefully it helps y'all feel a little bit more excited about professionalism and less daunted by the idea of, okay, I have to have put on a blazer. Like, no, unbutton that blazer. Like, right. let your flag fly, yeah. but at the right location. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. You're not going to have a job that you love 100% of the duties. I need to really start I, living by that. I'm not doing mm-hmm. that. I'm, I keep thinking everything should be 100% amazing. It's it's just not going to happen. Not gonna Nothing happen. in life is 100% amazing. No. And Except for our NYX lingerie XXL lipstick. That is true. Just we want to recommend that. Although maybe, everyone. Like, maybe compromise though because sometimes I wish they have like an in-between color That's for fair. some of the colors. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. I'm Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. On this podcast, we'll dive into criticism as it'll be a content for a veterinarian whose every action will be judged. Support staff, families, and community members pour their hearts into animals and demand that they're appropriately treated. So how do you learn, respond, and grow when facing others' opinions? Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we're continuing on our journey talking about people skills from the VEMCAST application. It's an odd-numbered episode, which means we have a veterinarian in the booth today. Dr. Hamer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I am so excited. I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. Well, I'm happy to have you here. Also, I want to say that I think that you really are part of the pre-vet team because I always see you commenting on our Instagram, and it's always just like lovely comments. So I feel like you're a part of this journey. Do you feel like pre-vets and vet students, like you're passionate about them getting into vet school and moving forward in their career? Oh, definitely. That's the reason that I do the job that I do is watching students grow. And, you know, I look back on my career and there are four or five people that were instrumental. They're the person that tipped you. And for me, if I can once a year be that person, that's a year well done. Oh, I love that. I, I think for a lot of students, they eventually want to become that style of mentor. And I like this idea of like, yeah, once a year we have somebody who we can like tip the scales for. What kind of veterinarian are you? Tell us uh, what you do. I'm a veterinary ophthalmologist. So so you're an eyes. Anything with an eyeball that's not a person. Yeah, right. Uh, Is there, I always like asking, is there any kind of animal that like wakes you up in the morning? Like whose eyes get you up in the morning? Get me up in the morning. At this point to me, I think one of the pluses being at Florida, it's the... Interest, they're unusual animals. You know, we have a very vibrant zoo and wildlife service here. So, you know, it's like I saw a tree sloth today, or I walked around the corner and there's a 200 pound tortoise. You know, you're like, this is really cool. So, but they're interesting. And what's great about veterinary medicine in general is it's multiple species, you know. And then I also have not only multiple species, but I have small animal, large animal, multiple species. So I can be in the barn same day. I can turn around. Then I can be in the small animal clinic. I can be dropping down to wildlife to look at a hawk or do something else. And the eye is an interesting uh, organ and it's different in all of them a little bit. So it's, it's always something new around the corner. Are there any animals that you're like, ugh, this is coming in today and I just don't want to look at it? There are occasional dog breeds that are not my favorite. Um, And we now don't ask. Don't ask. I see you want to ask. There are some dog breeds that aren't my favorite because, in general, they can be a little whiny, a little bitey, a little skittish, a little neurotic. And some breeds are just sort of that way. And you're like, ugh. You know, but then you find a lovely one, you know, so. You mean like of the breeds that you're not excited? There could be a redeeming one. Yeah, Yeah. you're not crazy. We should all find a human like that, too. Right. How did you get here? Talk about undergrad, vet school, post-vet school training. Okay. Um, I was so born and raised in Maine. So there's no veterinary school. I love Maine. Maine's a a good place to visit. Um, And uh, so no veterinary school in Maine associated with Maine. And I worked for a veterinarian, one of those mentor people in your life, 
from the time I was 12 years old. And I had already been accepted to a college in Maine, which is where everybody goes. And then you go on and you try to get into vet school from there. And he said, hey, I've been to a couple of meetings. I met a couple of veterinarians from the University of Missouri. They have an interesting program because at that point, way back um, in the mid 80s, they had always had two years of clinics. So there is a quite unusual program. A lot of places now have similar things. Um, and he goes, that's a kind of a cool place. And so you go, okay. So I applied to University of Missouri. Off I went, I got accepted. And from there, so undergrad in veterinary school at Missouri, uh, and then I did a small animal internship at Auburn University. Um, that's where I decided I wanted to be an ophthalmologist. I had multiple career changes or ideas as I went on. Uh, and then it was trying to get a residency. I was a three-time applicant for a residency um, to go from there. And then I was, so I had worked in private practice for a couple years and then residency and master's at Colorado State University, 23 years at the University of Illinois, and my seventh year here at the University of Florida. Wow, you look great. Well, thanks. That's genetic. <laughs> you look so like a much yeah. young, a very young veteran. That's just genetic. All right, so today we are talking about potentially a difficult topic for yeah. some of us, but I hope we, I think you'll be great to help us lean into it a little bit more, and that's reaction to criticism. So on the VEMCAST Letters of Rec, this is one of the areas that professionals will rank you on a scale of excellent to poor about your reaction to criticism. What are your thoughts on that? Like, do you feel like this is something that's very important for the field? Does it feel relevant? Oh, definitely. I think it's definitely relevant. This is... Uh... It's challenging no matter what. It's definitely relevant for the career that you have. Um, when you're teaching clinically, um, criticism happens a lot. It's how you think of things, how you're assimilating things, how you put that together. And you have to be open to that. And then it's also how do you interact with people? How do you go on from there? You know, the veteran and I talked about I worked for. And he told me at the very beginning, he goes, it'd be great if you love animals. This is a people job. And if you can't interact with people well, you're not going to succeed. This is 100% a people job. So, you know, you're going to be criticized a lot. Um, we don't know. None of us like it. Right. You know, at, at all. I'm a golden retriever. I do not like to be told I didn't do a good thing. I'm always like, love me, love me, love me. Did I do it? You got pet me on the head, pet me on the head. So I'm not a person that by nature responds well. And for me, if you say something like as I was growing up, you know, my mom would say, well, is that the best you could do? Oops. Or we're, we're a little disappointed. Ouch. You know, and I'm like, could you just spank me? That would be better, <laughs> you know, rather than we're a little dis So I'm very sensitive to criticism. And you have to learn to adapt. It's, you know, it may not be about you. They're talking about how you did this thing mm. or how to improve with that thing or that area. It doesn't define you as a person if someone says you didn't do that well. And it's harder and harder in the world today. Everybody wants to be successful. And as we're navigating this career, you know, to get into veterinary school, all of us could achieve that level. And we're used to achieving to that level. We achieve highly. We do what we want. We see it. We get it. We go. You get higher and higher up. There's lots more smart people hanging around you. And you may not be the smartest one in the room anymore, and particularly in that area. So you've got to learn to adapt a little to this is okay. And if I didn't do that thing well, it doesn't make me a bad person. I just didn't do that thing well. And the world today is less receptive of you didn't do that well. Or mm. That's not the right thing to do. Or you shouldn't have done that. Do you think it's because we're, we are taking everything personally and we're saying, like, our actions are defining who we are? And, and I like how you said that by nature, you know, criticism is harsh. Like, is it because we just haven't been trained in that way? Why do you think it's so hard for us to accept that criticism? Some of it's, some of it's personality. So you need to know yourself. You need to, and that's why I love, you know, part of coming to UF, you learn about yourself as a personality. What are your personality types? What are your things? And, you know, what are you good at? And I love the fact that we talk about, sometimes in our lives we were taught about, you need to learn about your um, things you don't do well and you need to work on them. But, but in actuality, you do far better if you focus on your strengths. And 5% improvement on your strengths is gonna do better than a 20% improvement on my weaknesses. So know your weaknesses, know, be objective about that and say, okay, here's where I don't respond well. Here's where, what are my trigger points? What are the things that I do? 
when I'm starting to hyper respond to something that's inappropriate. You, resilience is a muscle um, and you have to decide that it's going to be okay. You know, we have to decide, I'm going to learn that. If you never have any stressors, any stressors going to knock you out, right? And so some of that is like, seek it a little bit, like put yourself in that. And, and we do that as a species. We're the only species in the world that puts ourselves in dangerous situations on purpose. Oh, that's true. Right? And so some of that's a good thing. Some that's a bad thing. But, you know, some of this is what are you, are you looking for the whole thing? Are you looking to improve yourself too? It's, it's okay, right? You're here to learn. I right, know. you're here to be. If you're the same person you are when you start vet school as when you finish, you did it wrong. Mm. There's a and you know I have really intense relationships with four or five people in my vet school class because they're your posse, they're your crowd, they're your safe place. You you navigate vet school together, and you need those people, right? So they need to be there for you, and they're the people that can you know look you in the face and go, mm, no. And kind of call you on your, and your you stuff. Go, okay, because you trust them. You listen to them, right? And you need to be open to someone going, that right there, that's a no. And rather than, <gasps> you know, you said this bad thing about me. It's like, well, yeah, because you were wrong. Yeah, you need right? to hear and it's, it. You're like, we're wrong a lot. Right. So you're talking about your vet school posse, but it also sounds like you have your spouse does the same thing for you. Oh, uh, yes. And I have the best spouse in the entire world, uh, bar none. Um, so it is about, in that relationship too, do you seek and trust this person? If this person comes to you and says, here's, here's the thing. Now, I was terrible at this for the first 10 years, 10 to 15 years of our relationship, you know, because I had a mindset of, you know, this is me, this is who I am, this is, what my life was like, so I get to act this way. You know, this is just me. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to get over it. Yeah. Right. That's not a successful relationship. You know, you need to go. This. You know, everybody can change. Everybody can just. What are the things about yourself that aren't so great? And maybe things that were helpful to you as a child or helpful as a coping mechanism as a young adult aren't good re- things in a relationship, mm-hmm. and you need to move on. So, trusting spouse who can look at you and go. Remember, we talked about this, and I and I could go and say, I need to change this about myself, and I need your help. Ah. And, and my wife had to say, so you're actually going to be okay when I point out one of your flaws, because, Ralph, you pretty much are terrible at that. And, you know, I had to say, you're going to need to help me, because I'm going to probably respond incorrectly, because she's not that person. She's not a confronter. Uh-huh. And I had to learn to be a confronter, because I'm not by nature. And she's like... It's just, you know, and so I would say, you just need to tell me, you know, and she would, you know, save up all the things she wanted to tell me. And then she'd write me a letter every six months, oh, <laughs> you know, and for me, I was so like, sweet. dang, girl, like if you could just tell me this <laughs> once a week, it'd be so much easier. I like that. And so we had to learn, like, don't write me a four page later er, letter every six months. Sure. And I had to say, you just need to tell me. But I need so it's you learn a little bit and, yeah. so, and trust that person because your significant other knows all of your faults. Oy. But how do these veterinary, because these are pre-vets that are eventually going to get to vet school, how do the veterinary students accept criticism from a faculty member where they're only on a rotation with them for two weeks? So in my mind, the trust isn't built. So is it more just the student accepting, I need to accept the criticism, it's going to come my way, it doesn't matter how it comes, and I'll just have to deal with how I feel about it? Well, I don't don't think it's carte blanche. Mm -hmm. Um, In general, you're there for a reason. And they're going to give you a response, and you need to hear it. Now, with that said, there are numerous opportunities where, you know, we're mentoring students, and we're also mentoring residents, or I've had to, you know, have a student who said, you know, this interaction with your resident went poorly. Here's what happened. And so then it had to be like, well, let me hear that, and let me investigate that, and let me go back to that resident and go, you know, that wasn't a great way for you to handle that situation, particularly with this student or this situation. So there's room to grow for everybody. So you have to decide that. I think my one of my mantras, uh, I listened to a gentleman 10 to 15 years ago speak. His name is Bob Goff. And the whole 
premise was least creepy. And I, it's one of my life phrases now. What is the least creepy reason why anybody does anything? Least creepy. And it can be least creepy reason why they you know, said that thing to me, least creepy reason why they wrote that email, least creepy reason why they used that phrase. You know, and he said he was speaking one time when there was a lady in the front row and he goes, I was in another country and she literally had a snake on her head. Get out of town. And he said, hard to find least creepy. He said, I could come up with, I guess she doesn't know it's there. <laughs> you know, but it, it's a thing. And, and I have to reset myself every day. I, I certainly don't want to present myself as I'm a finished product because I'm far from. So I literally have to go least creepy, least creepy, least creepy. And, and particularly with those challenging people in your life, you have to go least creepy a lot. Because that helps us stay sane, helps us have better reactions. Why, if someone's like not convinced as to why, because I'm convinced. I Ever since I've heard you say that, I've been trying to do it. But let's say someone's like, well, why should I? What would you tell them? Well, first of all, it could be true. Right. Right. It, you could be wrong. Like, like totally. let, let your head wrap, totally. wrap your head around that. It happens like, it's possible that you're actually wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the thing where we don't want to be wrong. No. Right. We want to be right. We want to be justified in our reaction to that person. And it could be that that's a person that you have a long term relationship with or you have this list and it's a little bit not great. Um, I'm a person, my default is, you know, I'll sit around and think about, well, I should have said this and I should have said that and maybe I should write this and maybe I should write that. And, you know, that's just a waste mm -hmm. of time, you know, and so it's maybe least creepy is literally least creepy. It they just be. don't interact with the world how you interact with the world. You have to decide I'm going to learn how to interact with this person and you just got to stop and yeah. go, that's how this person is. I used to work really hard to go. We're going to talk and we're going to come to this mm, epiphany mm -mm. and we're all going to hug each other and it's just going to be awesome and you're going to bend yourself to my will. That doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen. So much it doesn't happen. Yeah. And you have to go, well, this person may never change right. how they interact. And it may be there are personality types that don't mesh with mine well. And those are the personality types that I have to really do a lot of least creepy on because yeah. I want to go – Wow, you're just Eeyore every day, and the sky is always falling. I'm a glass half full person, mm -hmm. and when I'm dealing with someone who can't find their glass, it's hard for me. It's like, wow, right? Like you it's... wake up every day and you're this person. Yeah, challenging for me. You just have to go. This is them, mm -hmm. and you're gonna. You have to interact with them. Yeah. You got to figure it out. someone has a bad reaction to criticism how do you think like let's say that you're uh, watching a pre-vet who's in the in the ophthalmology area they have a bad reaction to criticism how can they make it right so that if they ask you to evaluate them later you can still score them high on reaction to criticism I think some of it is interaction of why like if they're they may not know what they're doing no no someone may never have said to them hey how you respond to that may not be perceived by the room in a good way. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. So I try to go, ha, help me with your response. What did you hear? What's the, often it's not the response to criticism, as you say. It's the, what's the coping mechanism? What's the trigger? What's the thing in you that made you go boom on that? And it's often not the criticism. It's not the vet school. It's this other thing. And so you have to go, so help me hear that, right? And, and where are you going to go with that, right? You know, and if you do bad things, how are you going to handle that? You know, I mean, I have had an episode in my life where, you know, I was, have, I was not having a good week. I was not having a good month. Surgery wasn't going well. It was this. It was that. There was a complication. And, you know, Ralph had a moment in the surgery suite. Uh, you know, and then I went, ugh. So then Ralph stopped and said, okay, everybody look at me. I just acted like a poopy pants. I had a moment. I'm sorry. This isn't about you. This is about me. I acted inappropriately. It's 100% my fault. I apologize to the room. That's classy. Who does, right? You need to do that, right? You need to go, I apologize to the room. It was inappropriate. You know, do you go back to that person and go, mm, I acted poorly? And not just doing that to them alone is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But if you have a public yeah. bad, mm -hmm. I think that merits a public 
sorry. Yes, right? so you I go, love that. And this is the model of the behavior, right? We all have mentors. And we have many mentors who can teach us really amazing things, or amazing medical things. But you have to think about, does that mentor model the behavior mm. that you think you want to be highly successful people in our hospital? Don't mentor wellness and how they accept it. So it can be a real problem where and you're going, do you want to be that person? Mm -hmm. Like that's the person you want to be. I really like the if you made a public oops, like make a public apology. I love that. Let's talk about, you know, these students. I mean, in my mind, I'm like, oh, my God, we are just breeding students who are very high achieving, who really avoid, I think, in general, are very like criticism averse. Sure. So how can they start working on their reactions to criticism? What's something immediate they can start doing? I think, first of all, if you're thinking about, do I have this issue? Right? So first hear it, like, do I have this thing? And maybe I need to, so think about it mm -hmm. objectively. Find, to me, find a safe person. Who is a safe person who you can say, I'm thinking about this. Don't hit me on the head. Like you've been waiting 10 years to hit me on the head with this, but can you kindly mm -hmm. and softly come alongside me? I, I need to hear this. Who's your safe person? Yes. Then it's that next thing where I said, you then solicit it. So then you, you got a safe person and you're deciding this about yourself. Maybe there's some things about myself that aren't great. They were great. Now they're not great. Maybe they were always bad. Yep. But what am I doing here? So then you, then you solicit the criticism in a professional environment. Then you have to take it. Right. And then go, OK, I uh, hard for me. I, I need to hear this. Did you hear this? Are we oh, did I get it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my might just go, oh, like I said, you might go someone else. I just think you use your sense of humor to hide a lack of knowledge. And you got to go, wow. <laughs> and maybe that's just insane. And maybe there's a small part of that that's true. Mm -hmm. So and, you know, and then it's 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 not uh, again going back to it's not a about you. It doesn't define you as a person that you did this thing. And if you're going to grow as a person, which is hopefully what this life is about, you know, you're then you got to accept that thing and go, OK, maybe there's a part of this that's true. What you'll often find out is a significant part of it that's true. Totally. What have we not gone over, think, would be that we miss for these students? Another sort of area book for me, you know, is about margin, you know, and and a margin gives you things. This Dr. Richard Swenson wrote this book called Margin. The theme of it is if you think about a page and there's words on a page, there's white space, which is the margin. Do you live your life with margin? So do I have emotional margin? Do I have financial margin? Do I have, um, you know, can I take the criticism margin? You know, even then when I go to work, if it takes me 16 minutes to go to work, do I leave with 16 minutes to get there? Mm. Or do I leave with 22? Because 22 gives me six minutes of margin. So when there's an accident, you don't lose your mind because you're going to be late because you've left yourself no emotional margin, mm. right? If I have financial margin, boom, that thing happened. I can absorb that because I did this, I have critical margin or interpersonal margin, right? Because if I'm really living, it, you're stressed out, you're, you're going, you're going, and you're living at the end of the page, you have no room for anyone being critical of you because you're just treading water. Wow. And you feel like I'm throwing rocks at you, yes. right? Rather than, I'm not treading water, I'm floating on my raft, I'm cool, I got margin, so you can criticize me and I'm okay with that because on this is, a, I'm okay, I got margin. But do you, do you live with margin? So margin was a life-changing book for me. Wow. Because it's all about everything in your life, wellness, emotional, physical, work out, school, everything, relationship. What's your margin? That's do huge. you have white space at yes. the end of the page? Then every, it's easier. That's, I'm not throwing myself as perfect, right? I have to think about it. Like, why am I losing my mind? <laughs> well, Ralph, you're at the end of the page. Yeah, no margin. No at margin the end of the page. for error. So you're like... Suck it up. Mm. So that's the thing of, you know, and you chose this, right? And another thing I say to veterinary students and to residents all the time, you competed nationally for this opportunity to be here. And then you got an acceptance. I got a letter. I'm old. Other people got an email, <laughs> yeah. right? And you have a really joyous emotion. I want you to channel that emotion every day. 
Every day you're in here, channel that emotion of, I achieved this. There are 150 people who want to be me, mm -hmm. who aren't me. Mm -hmm. um, and I achieved, not that, but your know, life is often just a choice. Happiness is a choice. Choose to be happy today. You wanted to be here. And I'm, are you thankful every day? For being here or do you lead with these are the 10 things that's wrong with the world around me rather than do you lead with these are the 42 things mm -hmm. in my life that are really awesome right right Instead then of the 10 become less because we focus on negative 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 rather than i'm really 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 thankful to be here yeah i'm killing it yeah Dr. Hammer, I am feeling really energized about reacting to criticism. I hope someone criticizes me today so I can practice everything we talked about. It's possible because you're practically perfect oh in every way. God. You and Mary Poppins. I was actually going to end this episode by being like, Dr. Hammer, will you criticize me so I can see how I react? You know, but no, I don't think I can because I watched you put into play something that you said when in, our, in, a, in an interaction you had with me. So I watched you on Instagram say, here's how you should do this. And you did it. And I went in interaction with me and I go, <laughs> look at her. She doesn't just say stuff. She actually does it. Sometimes. So you modeled Sometimes. the appropriate behavior. I appreciate that you think that. And when I was in my early 20s, oh boy, did I not. So if you are sitting in the car, uh, walking your dog, studying at home, listening to this podcast, and you're like, oh dear, I have a lot of room to grow. You can. Got a lot of opportunity. So much opportunity. Your margin is wide right now. Plenty of time. To grow. So Plenty don't time. stress. You will get there. Yep. Um, like For Dr. Sure. Hamer says, like you can choose to be Eeyore or not. You can be a Tigger today. Let's be a Tigger. They're way more fun. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. That was so fun. It was fun. Okay. Uh, are all the passwords on your computers or phone FAMACHA123? I feel like FAMACHA no. is such an important word in, in your profession. No, it's not. But do you agree that it's an important word? Sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I, I just, that's the one thing I know about Opto. That's it. <laughs>
marketing, communication, social media, you're living in written communication. Yes. You're doing it every single day. Growing up, were did essays come naturally to you? Like, are you like a, a wordsmith, would you say? How did we get here? Yeah, it's an interesting, um, I guess, journey. So originally, I graduated from Virginia Tech with my degree in communications, specifically in public relations. And to be honest, I didn't know what I wanted to do with that. Um, it was that or broadcast. And I was like, no, thank you to being on TV. Um, but I actually started with like loving writing in general, like long writing. And I was very good at writing long things, creative writing. Um, and then my first job, I was, it was like communication specialist. It was at a, um, transit system. So oh, like, are, like buses? For buses. Yeah. Oh. So I have a little, you know, transportation industry experience. And that was like all of the things you would think of in a communications role, entry level of like press releases and so then I accidentally was having to create their social media. So that was my first go at it where I had to write sort of short, quippy things. And then I was like, oh, man, I'm good at this. So now transitioning to now, that's sort of where I focused. But yeah, I was writing. I've always loved. I just didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And it was sort of an accidental path of coming to it being copywriting versus long formal writing. But there's still elements of both currently. And I, I think on this episode as well, this part is not on Vemcast, but we're going to talk about it. And that's their digital footprint. Specifically, what kind of social media presence do they have? Are they thinking about how that can affect their future? And potentially how they can leverage that for True. a future employer. So we'll be hitting on those two topics. So let's kind of break it up. Let's talk segmented, if we will. Let's start with written communication. Okay. What kinds of tips and tricks can we give them to encourage them to have better written communication? Maybe let's just start with email. Yes, email, that's a really good one. Yeah, if they're applying to a job or they're trying to network or meet somebody, they're going to have to shoot off an email probably. So what are some of the things that we think are do's and don'ts? I think even in thinking back to early Farron who had her first job, it was like you forget. No one teaches you the things like the – what is it? Salutations or like having yeah. your a greeting? Yes, a greeting and a signature line. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's start with the sandwich. <laughs> so here's what I'm saying. Hearing you say it's an email sandwich. Yes. The bread is a greeting mm -hmm. and a signature. Yep. And then the meat or veggies is going to be all of your what we might call copy, uh, but just text. <laughs> so a hundred percent, a nice greeting. Hi. You know. So and so. So and so. Now let's talk about the so and so. Yeah. Let's talk about inclusion. Yes. What do you think is the best and safest way to approach a stranger in an email if you like what how are you approaching it these days? Oh boy. I think it is still the classic like hi hi or hello. I'm trying to do less of the like hey. Oh yeah, like, I would <laughs> thank you. No hi, no hey if you don't know that. No what's up. No yeah. hey. Uh yeah, I agree. I I like a nice greetings. I don't yeah. mind a hello, a hi, a good morning. Yes. I think for inclusion, what I've been doing is I look someone up on mm -hmm. like LinkedIn or their business profile. And if I see that they're using pronouns, I'll Correct. use pronouns. Yep. Otherwise, if they're not, I yeah. think it's speaking with they and generally speaking yep. anyway. And in the title, I think, oh, this is huge. And this gets on some of our faculty members. Um, it's a pain point. Not using, if they have like a doctoral degree, mm. you make sure you use it. It's yeah. really inappropriate. This happened to our dean the other day. Her name is Dr. Amanda House, and a, an undergrad said, "Hi, Amanda." Oh no! It's it's hi, Dr. House. Like, Correct. make sure you are you've done your research, and look that up because I won't know that you've done the research if you address me appropriately. But I'll really know if you haven't done the research. It goes a long way. Yes, it's a red flag. It's yep. distract. It's distracting. Um, okay. Any other distractors in the emails? I think. in speaking of like our long versus short copy, mm. um, I think. That is a time to keep it short and sweet. Thank you. Because I went, I mean, you go through a phase of like, I have so much to say and and you do, but can you get that down to some of these even higher level or not? You don't have time to read it and you're going to skim. People skim. They do. So I think that that's a main focus. Huge. And then even in the sign off, I think thinking about there's all that, you know, best kind of bothers me. There's no wrong way right. necessarily. Well, Maybe. I think the thank you is always great. You're thanking sure. them for the message. I think visually we see too much avoiding the, like, you may have a visual that represents yourself in your signature. And it's great to have sort ooh, of a, ooh. but please, mm, please watch mm, mm. the, no big images. No, yeah. <laughs> no. No. And I, we, I think I want to do this with the vet students and I want to 
say something like A to Z when your signature line is longer than the alphabet, something like that, where oh, like yes. it's too much. So in my mind, less is more. Mm-hmm. Go professional. Your name, if you have a title underneath it, great. Like, you know, if you want to say like UF undergraduate yep. or UF animal sciences major, if you're a leader in a club and you want to say president of the UF pre club, great. And then maybe a phone number. And yep. that's probably plenty. Or even, and maybe you've already done that in, in your middle of your sandwich sure. or meat where you've said, I'm so-and-so and this is right. what I'm doing, where you can get to the point quickly mm-hmm. too. Right. So, yeah. So look at, I would just even Google y'all like solid email structure. Email template. Email yes. template. And it'll show you nice signatures. Um, speaking of templates, can we just quickly talk about resumes? Yes. I think a lot of times students are getting encouraged to these like very graphic designy resumes now. And potentially that might be a great fit for some institutions, but I'd rather you be safe than sorry and just go traditional resume yeah. format. What do you think? I think so. And before I forget, subject line on email too. Oh yeah, so what about yeah, like I think it's just you, something catchy. Yeah, I think catchy but not being too marketing like mm-hmm. um to where you're trying to sell them something, keeping in mind that most of these people are getting lots of spam that sort of says things True. like, open this or they're Oh, yeah, don't cute. do that. <laughs> Please I, read this. Let's, don't do that. We'll, we'll talk to specifically pre-vets. So if yeah. you're a pre-vet, and let's say you want to email me for connections, sure. maybe you want to say like pre-vet seeking opportunities. Right. And that's it. Or, yep. um, you know, looking to connect, which can sound spammy mm-hmm. too. But just I think you could even look up subject lines for emails yep yes okay okay resumes resumes I think one thing that has come up a lot is actually to your point the less is more realizing that some of the I don't know the word to use it but some of the systems um people are using is actually plain text is what you need it's not accessible that you're doing all these beautiful graphic design right so that and I'm speaking to someone who has used these beautiful templates too but it, it, it may look really plain, but actually it's more appropriate to keep it simple. Mm-hmm. People, like Farron said, are skimming. We're looking for buzzwords. We're looking for key experiences. And having a bunch of borderlines and potentially color or images can be incredibly distracting and might just get your application thrown out because the systems will toss it out because it's hard to read. And Word doc versus PDF, that's a huge switch now, too, because... It's it, it seems like oh no you're supposed to be PDF it's very yeah that's what official. I've been doing People am I not supposed to do a PDF no apparently you're supposed to be doing Word docs because of accessibility as well and having it read correctly I I need oh, crap. I don't have the right information <laughs> okay that's but, good to know but I would say it's still best practice to do PDF but there is there are some places where it is searching it skimming it better more accessible to have it be a Word document I mean I could see that plain text I could see that so I think maybe something to think about here y'all is you don't know what you don't know mm-hmm. until you've asked some questions. Yeah. So when you're going into the job process and you're trying to network and make connections, looking things up and asking, hey, I'm about to export my resume. Mm-hmm. How should I do it? Don't assume anything. Yep. I would also say talk to – I honestly think Google is your best bet just because yeah. there's so many resources on there. But talking to folks like Farron or myself – because sometimes if you ask a veterinarian, God bless them, written <laughs> communication might not be their greatest strength. Yep. And so I don't know that you would get the best advice from them. Farron, let me tell you. What? When I see some of the letters of rec from veterinarians, no signatures, no um, letterhead. <laughs> They'll write like a few They're really sentences. getting to the point. They're, getting, they're <laughs> really getting to the point. And it's, it shows me that they might not be the best resources for written communication, which is why I'm glad we can provide them. But they're great. This podcast. Yes. They're great people. They're great people. But they're sticking to physical exams and not yep. emails. And I think, and as someone who looks at lots of resumes, I'm sure you have as well, um, there are some things that were old school. I would be careful with even the templates you find online because there are some that still have you put your home address. Yeah, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't anymore. need that. You don't need that. Um, even it's more common now, I think, to lose some of those more basic skills like, like possi- Microsoft like Word. Word. Yeah. Um, and I think – Email, internet. You don't have to write that anymore. Yes. And I know this is this is probably obvious, but keeping it to one page. There's so much to say. Yes. There's so many where it's too – Two is too much. We say how how I've always been trained is you can have one page per degree. Oh, that's a good yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. So for most of you pre vets, unless you've gone and gotten a master's, and I know some of you have, at this point, one page says enough. They they get it. 
I'm so glad we brought up resumes. That wasn't even on my radar until just now. Yes, and I haven't thought about resumes in a while, so I'm glad too. But I think even another last thing would be the introduction. Sorry. It used to be big to have this long sales pitch in the beginning about mm, yourself. Right. And now sort of your skills should show and your experience should show through what you have. Yeah. But it is important to have like a one liner of like, what are you strong? What's your professional your summary or yes. yeah. And call it not a call to action, but just like who you are. I will say like the trends do change with this. So just keeping up to date with what is currently going on. You even feeling free to maybe reaching out to someone at the company you're trying to apply for or if you know someone who works there, just like, what's their energy? What's their vibe? What are they looking for? What do they hate? Those kinds of things yep. on those written documents. And what are they seeing too much of already? True. Right. Like standing out. Yes. Right. How to stand out. Is there something you can do differently? I think, uh, speaking of resume, the biggest resume they're going to have would be their VEMCAS application, which is the veterinary school application. And there are so many opportunities for written communication on there. One of those is essays. Ooh. You mentioned you've done long form writing yes. before. These are essays that are a little bit shorter. They're around 300 words. Okay. But you have to be a strong writer to get the, your foot in the door in this profession because the application is paper-based. So when we're thinking essays, do you have writing tips for them or things for them to think about? Yeah, I think looking back to it's it's easy to want to like brain dump a lot of the stuff, mm. which like in your final piece, which I have learned that that's a great sort of old school practice still to take it outside of it. Maybe it's a word cloud, which some people hate, but it's it is getting that all of your thoughts out quickly mm-hmm. is what I found. And then you feel better set up to jump in and do your writing. And I think it is just it's proofreading and proofreading and proofreading. And also um, with our news pieces, because that is part of what we do in my office and, and you do as well, is you're making sure you have a good lead and a good, what we mean by that is a strong hook at the beginning. So don't wait until the very end to get to your point. I think get your strong beginning in there. Phil, it's almost like the sandwich again with the emails. Yes. You've got a sandwich going on there. And that is an interesting word count to try to be. It's short, but not short, but long. It is tricky and i think when you mentioned brain dump i think that's a great idea because i hear from students like i have so much that i want to say and they Mm -hmm. need to hear it all and i'm like great get it out on a piece of paper but then decide what they actually need to hear yep i love the idea of teaching them what a lead is because in the beginning a lot of students spend like two or three sentences almost like summarizing Mm -hmm. the essay prompt and like you don't need to do that dive right into it like get us in the beginning without being distracting yes I think we've kind of talked written communication. We've gone over it. Emails, resumes, the application essays. Those are the big ones, I think, that they're going to be experiencing, you know, coming up. Um, Don't sleep on the fact of a really strong, since this entire season is about letters of recommendation, you need to send your documents and an email to the folks who are writing you letters. So just make sure those are very, very strong. So you're starting off on the right foot with those. Let's switch into social media. Okay. So (laughs) most of our pre-vet students have social media accounts. Yeah, they do. That are public. They do. (laughs) They're not set on private. And so anyone can look them up at any time. Yep. We see them. We sure do. Mm -hmm. Do, how do we, where do we even start with this, Farron? Like, are we just starting with like, yay, why social media? Let's start with why social media can help them. Yes. I think um, the most well-known, of course, is like LinkedIn. So that's associated with, you know, this is my professional self. Mm -hmm. I think. I won't go into the negative yet, but I think that does not make up for just to know if you have bad things going on on your other social media platforms. Right. So making sure that you are representing your best self there. I think LinkedIn has so many great features now as far as even assisting with resume writing and stuff like that. Um, I think making sure just classic branding too, like try if you not everyone can get a formal headshot. I get that. But making sure that you appear professional. Right. I mean, your your iPhone, having a friend take a picture of you in a collared shirt and potentially a blazer is great. Put a nice stand in front of a bush Yes. or a brick brick wall. And dropping some, I know it's hard when you maybe don't have as much experience yet, but I think knowing to drop off some of those things you may have added when you were even younger Mm. that might not be as relevant to the experience. So true. And remembering that any sort of groups you follow could be served up to the public. Let Good. Yes. Because we can see that. Yeah. If y'all want to start a LinkedIn today and you want to connect with me and say that you're a podcast listener, I will gladly add you. I'll tell you right now, Farron, I don't know about you. I don't add anyone I don't know if there's no message. No. I don't add them. So make sure you're doing that too. So that's LinkedIn. Yep. Okay. 
No. You want to talk Instagram? Or should we talk negative? Let's do all the socials, okay. positive and negative. So negative for LinkedIn, we kind of talked about. You, we can see your activity. Mm-hmm. Potentially, we can you can overspam someone. You can keep too many activities on there that are old. Anything else for LinkedIn? Yes, I think um, speaking of like adding people, the creep factor as far as like remembering, depending on the, the settings you have, mm. that people can see when you look at their profile. How many times you've looked at their profile. Yeah, so the, and there, that's okay. That's part of it. But not if you're going to check someone every day. Right. If it's one, honestly, if someone looks at my, a lot of my undergrads will look at my profile like one time. And to me, I think that's It's great. endearing. It's yeah. endearing. Maybe they're trying to find out more about me sure. or they, maybe they actually accidentally pushed the button <laughs> um, or they're trying to get a template for their own profile. I love. But if it's every day, that is creepy. Yep. Okay. Don't be creepy. Don't be creepy. I feel like that's a <laughs> motto of this podcast. It is. Don't be creepy. Don't be sketchy. Okay. Let's start. Let's go to Instagram. Okay. Positives. Positives are, I think, let me start with a blanket, maybe mm. negative. Can I do that? Please. As far as, yes. So I think in general, no matter what platform, what we always say, and we do a lot of trainings in our office on personal versus professional social media Amen. use. Yep. And typically that's applying to someone who maybe is for a college handling things, but it it applies to students as well, or even prospective students, of course. I think locking down your profiles, I know it's nice to have a public profile. It may be well curated, which is fine, just making sure it's appropriate. So again, seems like common sense, but you'd be surprised what you did in middle school or high school that may still be there that maybe you can just archive. So Instagram, archive it. Um, you can always bring it back, but maybe it's something you don't want people to see. But starting with the basic of make it private. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing sketchy about having a private account. Not and at respecting all. Respecting your privacy. I like seeing it. Yep. And and also where you can, so like on Facebook and such, like, well, Instagram too, creating those lists. So the close friends list now. I mean, there's some things that if you do have a public profile, maybe you just want to share that little moment that's not so Not the most professional. Yeah, yeah. There. I mean- be careful still in remembering that everything nothing is private it's not private it's not private shots people looking over other people's shoulders i've had that happen before yep yes so just i please don't be naive that if you only quote have friends on your snapchat they're the only ones seeing that like no they're probably also showing it to other people or they're screen recording it yes and not to i feel like i'm just being a very scary person but in our office for the main uf accounts that's a lot of what we get is screenshots and, and maybe it's a friendship gone bad but it's hey so and so did this and and we never want to see that so all the time in the vet school that happens all the time yeah. they'll do professionalism lapse reports and they'll say a screenshot of something that someone posted on their facebook account even if the person's not friends with them like oh, yeah. all the time all the time so just be very hyper aware and vigilant and also if you know that you are doing your best and someone takes something the wrong way and isn't looking for your intent that's okay too they yeah. might not understand something that you posted and you just have to like live with whatever you did and know that if it was in line with your values and you're okay with whatever the consequences are, that's also fine. Yes. And that goes back to like, I would say taking an audit of all of your profiles. So like, is this representative of who I am right now? And it's okay if you were young and we were all silly and we've done things. So does this represent who I want to show myself as? And like it's kind of like the classic, you know, would I be okay with my parents, my future employer, everybody in yep. the world seeing this? I think positives though, it's it's similar to LinkedIn and, and there's lots of overlap of course, but your way to connect with the community there. So hashtags. I mean, following along with those vet related i'm, I'm saying there's wrong a lo- vet words probably no but yeah but there's a lot of accounts that you can yes. be following and there's a lot of educational purposes i i think maybe for me a positive for instagram is that you have a network with mm-hmm. it i'm not so much like excited about someone's account and like if you're super cute i love that for you but it doesn't really <laughs> help me professionally okay twitter yeah twitter so twitter more so than linkedin i would say is that one that's serving your stuff up like to other people so and LinkedIn has gotten a lot, it's happening a lot more, but Twitter's the original place that I warn people of, if you're hitting like on something, that is getting served up to someone's feed that shows as if like they retweeted it, mm-hmm. which is jarring at first when they made that switch of like, wait, I didn't, I don't follow that person. But it's a great also, again, positive opportunity to engage with those things, hitting like on something. Maybe you're not, you don't love it enough to share it and you're curating your profile, which you should be again. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. And then Again, it's the debate of public versus private. So is it something you want 
you to see and mm-hmm. everybody to see. I think the good thing about Twitter is you can be liking faculty research. You can mm-hmm. be retweeting it. You can. Yep. That's a great way to build your network. It's a great way to stay educated on the issues, to know what's going on, so that when you do get the essays and the interview questions, you're a little bit more tuned in. Yep. I would say, I think personally for me, I'm not really ever looking on Twitter to check somebody like if they're sketchy or not. But if no. I, it, it'll just come up. It'll be in my face. And some form or fashion. When we're th- when you're thinking about a branding strategy for your personal brand, you can decide to have all these platforms and use them strategically. Mm-hmm. So Twitter might be where you go to stay relevant for science. Instagram might be where you go to just build your brand and kind of figure out who you are and who you want to be professionally. Yeah. LinkedIn is that online resume and your networking ability. Um, Facebook is a real... I'm just kidding. I know. Facebook. I, well, I think... And, and to that point, it's okay to, again, segment, to have – maybe your Instagram is reserved for this is my personal time. Like totally. I actually feel that way myself. And so – and it's not that you're being fake, but if you have your LinkedIn as your very professional, like I will share this with other people, it's okay to retain your privacy. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So Facebook. Facebook. Um, I mean, I think Facebook is great if you want to look up a menu of yeah. a restaurant. If you want to – Your mom to, is there. Your mom and grandparents <laughs> are there. Facebook is good for organizations. So like – Following the College of Vet Med, we do post yes, on do Facebook. Yes. NUF general. And you have general <laughs> account. So I think it's good for you just to be in the know. Facebook can be where you find some things out. And your groups. So yeah. that's where most of at the college, the communities, that's your keeping your small community with that research and those internal projects. So joining those smaller communities that are relevant to what you're interested in. And Facebook might also be where, like Farron is saying, the smaller communities to go outside of vet med. We want you to have a well-rounded experience. We want you to be a well-rounded human. And Facebook might be where you find those opportunities. I think so. What impression are y'all making with your written communications and social media? Just know that humans, by nature, we judge things. Mm -hmm. And so something is going to come in front of our face, like our brain is going to make some quick snap decisions when we're reading your essays. If we do decide to open up your Instagram accounts, just ask yourself, what impression am I making? Is it a positive one? Is it something that they're going to say, yes, I want them in my vet school? Because that's your ultimate goal. And that's what you need to keep focused on. Yes. And if we want to tiny expand on digital literacy, and it connects to social media is Are you being smart about the content you're consuming, creating, and even sharing? So that's what we talked about, you know, with who can see your stuff. But I think taking in that content. So Twitter will give you the, like, before you retweet something, hey, do you want to read this story first? So I think making sure that you are being smart with consuming your content. Right. Because if I see that you're resharing some really, like, false facts or bad science, that doesn't help me think that you're a... A digitally literate, digital literate. Yeah, it's a hard one. Yeah, it doesn't make me think that you've really thought some things through. It makes me question your judgment. It might make me question your morals and values. So, and it wouldn't even be, it's not even your fault. You just didn't know and you retweeted it. And then now you're kind of like, it's represented an echo chamber. Suss it out. Suss, Suss it, it out. out. First. That's good advice. Okay. What's something that they could do starting today to improve their written communication? I would say AP Stylebook. A- oh, God, yes. I don't know if this is even, like, maybe it's newer to some, I don't know. I don't know. But it, it is the main, in our college, in most places, it's the main, um, what's the word? Like, so- standard for, for writing. For writing. And you've got MLA and other things, but AP Stylebook is the go-to. Mm-hmm. And so we're looking for you to be knowing how to, you know, abbreviate months with days versus right. years. Um, and may, it's a great thing just to check. So there is a cost associated. It's a tiny one, I think, with the online version. Get yourself the paper book even. It does update by year. They'll add words because right. this is life. Right. But it's helpful, you know, the periods and PhD. Like I myself, I'm checking that. I think you check your All words. the time I check it. Grammarly is great. Spell check is great. But that's going to help you actually make sure you're using the correct words in the correct way. I love the AP Style book um, recommendation. I would also say the book Elements of Style is a mm. great book. It's a tiny little book. But it just gets you thinking about the words that you choose and how you use them. And I think it puts you in the headspace of, like, for example, compliment versus compliment. Yep. I'm complimenting someone versus this compliments my sandwich well, mm. a pickle. So anyway, just yeah, getting the you. E versus the I. The e versus yes. the I. So getting you in that headspace that you have to check your words. Yep. What could they be doing a month from now for their written communication skills? I think 
I wish I could say like writing a book, but that's not <laughs> realistic. So I think it is, it's doing some of that creative writing on the side. So similar to how we talked about taking a break when you have sort of a brain block is making sure you're doing your own personal writing. Maybe it's journaling. Mm. Like I know that's such a big thing, yeah. but, and then I think a month from now, are you able to shorten that? Like I can't learning to edit and being just concise. edit yourself. Like, can I go from writing all this stuff that I really want to say to boiling it down? Mm, so what's that. important. Yeah. And a year from now, we hope that their written communication skills you're just a pro. are, you're, you can shoot off an email, yep. you're confident. Maybe, maybe it's your attitude too. I think sometimes folks are a little bit afraid of written communication. We've kind of fallen away from that mm-hmm. in, in the recent decades. So yeah, you're a pro. And there, and there's insecurities. Like you may read something and be like, I don't know how they wrote, wrote that, right. but you may be a pro. And I think you're still using the AP style book at that point a year from now. You're using it every Always, single day. for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. But you know what you're doing. You're confident. And, and also remembering that even people who are well along in our careers, like you and I, I think we're still like reading our emails 12 times. And oh, a hundred percent. No, but we are. We're checking them because we don't want to make a mistake if yep. we can avoid it. And you're paying attention. Yeah. Big life advice from you. Oh, what no. advice do you have for not even undergrads? Like, because pre-vets could be any age. So folks who have a big dream and they want that dream. I think... If I can maybe connect it to my personal experience, possibly, I think it's taking opportunities that are unexpected. So even if it's not seeming to connect currently to your goals, like you may find opportunities there and gaps there. Um, I don't know if I can talk about bars here, but I will say my first job um, toward the end of college was actually working in a bar. And that's where as I was doing things like, I, you know, it was during the summer and it was kind of low. It was I cleaned all the sauce bottles and I would pick up and just write some social media posts for them. And so I think it's finding gaps in places where that'll give you a foot in the door. And that then led to me working at the university that I was about to graduate from. And I don't know if that's big life advice, but I think it is finding those opportunities or finding opportunity in things you're currently doing that you don't think have any. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe asking the folks around you like, hey, where do you think some pain points are? Or mm-hmm. where are there opportunities for improvement? Or has anyone tried social media here and then yeah. just doing it? Yeah, just pick it up and do it. Well, Farron, thanks so much for being on the show today. What a fun discussion on written communication and digital literacy. Thanks, I, I wanna say so much more, but I think that's a lot. Well, we could brain dump all day, but I think we've done a great job of editing it down and making it super concise so these students can see the value of strong written communication skills. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. All the time. And, and get out of your own head. Go on a walk. Yes. Maybe go, if you are uh, you ride a bike, go move around, and then you might get ideas, too. Like, if you're feeling – can we talk about um, – what is, you know, ideas? no, no. What is it? I'm not getting it. My brain. No mental. <laughs> what is the mental block that writer's block? Yes. That's yes, hilarious. Yes, yeah. that I couldn't get the word. <laughs> it's Chris again, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Knowing how to make the right call in any given situation comes from years of background and learning from those with experience. Tune in to hear Dr. Bach share her wisdom on how to make judgment calls with integrity. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today we are back talking about the VEMCAST Letters of Recommendations, People, Skills, and it is an odd-numbered episode, which means we have a veterinarian in the booth with us. Dr. Anya Bach, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Today we are talking about a pretty heavy topic, judgment and integrity and making the tough calls. And we thought Dr. Bach would be great to do this because you are a large animal surgeon and it feels like you're probably making tough calls all the time. Does that feel accurate? It does. It does. Good. Uh, Before we get started, will you tell the folks where you did your undergrad, vet school, post-vet school, internship residencies, that whole educational journey? 
Okay, it's a bit of a, it is a bit of a journey. Um, so I actually grew up in Canada and I did my vet school, um, well, I did my undergrad in Ontario at Queen's University and then I went to uh, the Ontario Veterinary College. Uh, that's at the University of Guelph in Southern Ontario. Uh, Canada is a little bit different in that you have to have residency in the uh, vet school, you know, uh, region that you're applying to. So we didn't have the option to apply apply to different vet schools. Like I only had the option of going to um, OVC, which is the Ontario Veterinary College, which was okay because that had always been my plan in life. Um, I grew up, I have both my parents are veterinarians and I always kind of knew that this is what I wanted to do. Um, so I was very focused uh, throughout my undergrad career and uh, I was very fortunate to get into University of Guelph. I love my time there. And um, after, uh, you know, throughout vet school, I knew that I wanted to pursue uh, equine practice, but I specifically really developed a love for surgery and wanted to um, pursue a residency in large animal surgery. So in the course of that, I applied um, through the internship matching program and I ended up at Oklahoma State University for my first internship, which is a really a great experience. I learned a lot. I had a lot of really fantastic mentors at that place. And um, the second year I applied, um, I got a second specialty internship at the University of Florida, which is where I'm now. And um, that was a surgery specialty internship. Um, it was a great stepping stone and I I was lucky enough that they seemed to want to put up with me for a few more years. So I did end up matching as a large animal surgery resident at the University of Florida. And so that was 2013. Uh, residencies are three years in large animal surgery. So I did 2013 to 2016 uh, here at UF. And then after that was all done, I just decided I wasn't quite ready to leave, and uh, I was offered the opportunity to do a PhD um, with my mentor, Dr. David Freeman, in some uh, equine GI physiology, colic surgery, that kind of thing, which was always something I was really interested in doing. And so I stayed, and I did a PhD, and then at the end of all that, um, I was fortunate enough to, they hired me as a faculty member, and so I've been a faculty member here for uh, about three years. Let's dive into judgment and integrity. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's a, a topic that maybe, do you think it comes with time? Like as a student, you get better with it as you age and go through experiences? Yeah, and I think you know I had you had sent me some some of these questions beforehand, and and you know most of my answers kind of came back to that. Um, so I think when people, you know, are asked this question in in vet school admission committee and stuff like that, it's it's, you know, it's understandable that people that are younger in their life and just haven't seen as much and, and maybe, and I think that a lot of people want to ask, um, answer this question specifically regarding to experience they have in vet medicine, um, which is, you know, fine. I think that uh, the people on the admission committee, you know, they're always looking for other kind of life experiences, but it is true that, you know, when I thought about this question, that's kind of where my mind went. So, you know, I think that in any medical profession, there's, you know, there's always going to be shades of gray, but, you know, in regards to decisions that we make for our patients, what we tell our clients, um, but we, you know, there are going to be things that are more black and white, you know, standards of care that we're all taught, you know, the regulatory issues, things that we know as veterinarians, like this is the way that we should do things. But it really is called, you know, it's the practice of veterinary medicine. And, you know, we hope that we come out of vet school with enough knowledge and experience that we're competent at our job, but it does take time and experience to grow that kind of ability to make good judgments, specifically in regards to, you know, decisions around veterinary care. Um, but I think integrity involves, you know, admitting that we're not infallible, asking for help when we need it, and, you know, really understand that there are resources out there, even as a veterinarian, when you have a case that you need help with, um, and that, you know, understanding that continuing education post-vet school, it's not just about 
you know, uh, getting the box in order to keep your licensing and all that kind of other stuff, things that we're required to do, but actually understand that, you know, getting better at our job and learning, you know, what's new and what, and, you know, what changes over time in our profession is really critical for, you know, operating with judgment and integrity. What questions, so you you sit on the admissions committee, yeah. you read packets, you mm-hmm. sit in the interviews. What questions might evoke these kinds of responses where you're sussing out if they do have strong judgment and integrity? The one I always know about is like, tell me about a time you made mm-hmm. a mistake. Are there any other questions where y'all are trying to evaluate their judgment? I think that there there are like specific questions that we try to, to ask that. I would say that a lot of times for me and the people that I've worked with on admission committee, a lot of times somebody will say something elsewhere in the interview and we're, you know, we try to keep a very open mind and, and looking at holistically at the end of the interview, at the end of the package evaluation, um, you know, where, you know, where we think that these things, um, you know, what the candidate did to sort of indicate to us that they have these things. Um, you know, I think it's it's looking at your own sort of life experiences and try to, you know, find a meaningful example and admit to the mistakes that you've made and, and not just try to pretend that, um, you know, you've never made a mistake. And, uh, and I think we're looking for things like owning the mistake, reflecting on, um, you know, those mistakes that you made. And it doesn't always have to be about, you know, I was working in a practice and I made a mistake on a case. Like, we don't expect everybody to have that level of experience. It's great if you do. Um, You know, we understand that, um, you know, a lot of times that you're going to be in a position where you have to look back at elsewhere in your life, both personal, professionally, from your educational experiences. Um, And sometimes it takes a minute to think about it. And I think that candidates always want to rush into answering, but we're okay for you guys to take a second and think about, you know, your answer. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think that there's always going to be kind of general questions about, um, you know, what was a time that you, you know, failed at a goal? What was the time you made a mistake? That kind of thing. Um, And so those are general things to think about. Um, and self-reflect upon going into these interviews and, and writing your your packet answers and stuff like that. I like that you mentioned failing at a goal because you already like kind of hinted at these some of these students are really young mm-hmm. and they really haven't had a ton of life experience yet. Maybe they haven't made a lot of mistakes. Maybe yeah. they've been really blessed and yeah. they purposely tried to not make a mistake. So I like that a goal could be a response. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I, I, I sought to achieve this goal and I didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Does it almost feel unfair to ask these 20-somethings, like, what big mistakes have you made in life? I guess, but at the same time, I mean, we have a diversity of candidates that come through. And the rea- and one of the things I think that we're looking for in, in vet school admission is that there's the kind of academic cutoffs. There's even, you know, looking at the the candidates, you know, experiences and being like, okay, it has X, this person has X number of hours in small animal, X number of hours in, in large animal. I am always looking for someone that have they seen enough of the profession that they know what they're getting themselves into. And something that, you know, constantly comes up with and, you know, when we talk about issues in the in the, our profession is sort of burnout and mental fatigue and stuff like that. So I want to make sure that people understand, you know, what this prof- like what it have they seen enough of the of the veterinary profession to understand what they're getting themselves into um, both in vet school as well as afterwards. Um, so I think for me, I'm, I'm looking for some degree of kind of mental toughness to and, you know, again, op- and self-reflection um, that this person would know where to add, know to ask to help when they need it and that they, um, you know, understand what they're getting themselves into. I often think that sometimes an easy way to find out if somebody is ready is to look for like the red flags. So when you're reading a packet mm-hmm. or you are interviewing somebody what are some things that you might hear where you're like, oh, like this kind of tells me their judgment and integrity could be a little bit off? I think that, you know, I can't think of anything that I, I really, um, you know, that would really stand out other than, again, just sort of 
not accepting that they've, you know, ever made a mistake and that they've never worked towards a challenging goal, that kind of thing. So I think that there's, you know, there's nothing that I would say is like a specific red flag, but we are looking for some people with just general life experience, um, not just like specifically in veterinary experiences. Yeah, those life experiences are Honestly, I almost feel like by the time you get to that interview, your mm-hmm. packet is strong enough where you've yeah. shown you've got the vet experience. Yeah. The interview is that time to chat about the life experience. Yeah, and and as we kind of say, I mean, most of us um, when we when we go through it, we we tell people specifically that when we get to admission interviews, many people don't look at the packets of the candidates, and we also are looking for you to sell yourself, saying like, you know, yes, I can pull up and, you know, look at you, your experiences and find out what vet practice you work at, et cetera, et cetera, but I want you to be able to present yourself in a professional manner and, you know, with, um, you know, with integrity, but also, uh, you know, with confidence, tell me, I have seen enough of this profession. I know what I'm getting myself into. I am a good bet if you get me into, if you give me this opportunity. Well, that's a good point because on paper, they, you know, you've had time, you've had Mm -hmm. nine months to work on this packet. Now, how do you market it when you actually sit down and Mm -hmm. talk about the experiences? Mm -hmm. Because some folks really are great on paper, but you need to be able to communicate orally about Mm -hmm. what you've done. And it's a balance between, again, being confident, but also being humble. And I think like, you know, as going back to kind of integrity, a a big part about operating as a veterinarian with integrity is, you know, being on like being honest with yourself and being honest with your clients when you're like, hey, I just don't know what's going on, but I'm going to do everything in my power to get you those, you know, get your answers. And I'm going to do everything in, that's within my power to to do the best job for your for your animal, for the client, you know, what have you. Um, so I think it's, you know, being humble, but confidence in the skills and, and experiences that you have. Speaking of what what's in your power and your experiences, Dr. Bach, will you tell us maybe a, a story or two about either when you felt like, okay, I had a tough call to make or mm-hmm. I really experienced this like, oh, I had to use my best judgment and integrity as yeah. a professional? Mm-hmm. I think that, um, you know, I, like, again, everything kind of comes back to, um, you know, I, I think of it as specific cases that I have. I, I always think that I have specific cases cases that I that didn't go well that kind of follow me around like ghost almost and I I can remember every single detail about the blood work and you know how they presented exactly what I found in surgery I remember every single aspect of the case versus a case that I maybe saw two weeks ago that did absolutely fine I couldn't even tell you their name if I tried Um, but I think that I um I can think of a lot of specific examples of, you know, maybe when I wasn't um, as clear with owners about what my recommendation is. I, you know, I think that you have to tell owners this is um, you have to use your best judgment to provide them with uh, different treatment options. But you have to be honest with them in terms of prognosis, what things are going to cost, that kind of thing. And I can think of a lot of times where, you know, maybe I wasn't as clear with the owner about, you know, really what my opinion was the best thing. Mm. And, you know, try to sort of fall back too much on, well, I gave them all their options. You know, I gave them the numbers. I gave them the quotes. And I I sometimes regret the fact that I maybe didn't, you know, do more to sort of specifically say, like, you know, I, I can't tell you for sure that this won't work out well, but, you know, I really think that if we do X, Y, Z, you know, we might have a good chance and there's always going to be some risk with it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just go back to a lot of specific cases and I'm not going to bore you with like the specific medical decisions and, you know, spe- how I did one type of surgery versus another. Um, but I think that I... One of the things that I learned a lot, you know, how I learned to sort of operate with judgment and integrity often came from the mentorship that I got from from working, you know, in various different institutions. I am so fortunate that I'm, you know, surrounded by a lot of really smart people <laughs> at the at the hospital. We all have our specialized kind of niches, even within like medicine versus surgery in the large animal hospital, reproductive cases, that kind of thing. 
Um, you know, there are all, there are always people that, you know, are a little bit better at one thing versus the other. And I think that we do a really good job of, of going to each other um, and asking for help, asking for opinions. And, you know, none of us are too proud to think that, you know, we're always going to get every case perfect. And I think in, you know, a lot of, you know, for everyone that I am fortunate enough to work with on a daily basis, we all just want what's best for the patient and that it's not about us being right or us making the brilliant call or anything like that. We just, and we'll go to each other for help all the time. Even people that are, you know, board certified, certified specialists that have been practiced for 20 years. Um, you know, we want to, we want to be supported and ask other people their judgment, um, and ask their opinion on cases. And I think that I've learned a lot about, you know, operating with judgment and integrity from the people I've worked with. So surrounding yourself with folks who maybe are a little bit more seasoned mm -hmm. in the field so we can learn from their calls and mm -hmm. how they handle tough situations, but also having folks around us who we trust to just lean on. So then if you were asked to write a letter of recommendation mm -hmm. from a pre-vet who maybe mm -hmm. has been volunteering in the clinic, is that what you're looking for, those kinds of communication skills that they've had with others? Or what other kinds of interactions could they have with you to score them on that excellent marking for judgment and integrity? I'm looking for curiosity. Um, so I'll be perfectly honest, like I work in a large hospital and there's a lot of technicians, some who are aspiring to, to apply for vet school, some who are not. Um, but even if not, like I like the, the technicians that I, although I'm, I'm sure it's intimidating at times, like, you know, I, I, I understand I kind of breeze in and out, um, you know, and I am a faculty member, but I'm always, you know, happy to answer questions. So I like to, I think that, you know, people that have spent the time to, you know, ask me questions and demonstrate curiosity um, and openness and willingness to learn, you know, I, I really, I really respect that. I don't, you know, expect them to be, um you know, expert, either, regardless of it's their technical skills or their knowledge base, like that's not the level of expectation. I want them to, um, you know, again, demonstrate curiosity and ask questions and then, you know, learn. Um, you know, I like to, I think if I can especially see sort of improvement over time, that always um, goes a long way. Um, and, and, you know, some, some, of some, some of the best things that you can do to really get a really strong recommendation is just be a hard worker. And that's the that's the same whether you're aspiring to get into vet school or you're a vet student that's applying for internships and residencies, like, you know, or doing well on clinic rotations. You don't have to be the best at anything you do, but if the people around you can just see that you're working hard and putting in the time and not being lazy like that just goes so well so far to uh improve you know um you know to to get a good letter of recommendation um so i think hard work curiosity asking questions um and, and also you know demonstrating that you're doing a little bit of your own work so maybe um you know asking questions but then also like following up and seeing if you can investigate a little bit more on your own and that's that can go a long way to sort of show that you're really serious about this. Oh, yeah. I would appreciate it if, if an intern or a vet student just completed a project or did some work for me and mm -hmm. then they followed up with, hey, can you give me some feedback? Mm -hmm. That shows a lot of integrity, I think, instead of yeah. just saying, like, I finished this, give me the next task. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do a judgment lightning round. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tim Hortons or Dunkin' Donuts? Oh, absolutely Tim Hortons. <laughs> do you feel like you have to say that because you're from no, Canada? No, it's better. It just is. <laughs> um, milk in a bag or milk in a carton? Milk in a bag. Are you? <laughs> do you want to tell them? Because they might not know Nobody what's up knows. with that. Yeah. So in Canada, you if you buy like a th rather than a three gallon like jug of milk you get like a bag and they have like individual one liter bags of milk and then you put it in every household has like a you know just like a plastic jug and then you slide the bag in <laughs> it's so hard to explain on the phone just google it like you like it makes works real well Chris, your face is just dis i can't tell if you're shocked, i'm sure it's disgust, more disgusting. environmentally friendly it's so, definitely so. more environmentally friendly i just feel like it reminds yeah. me of like wine in a bag like yeah. you slap the bag yeah okay my last one for you is going to be is hockey better in canada or the united states honestly i am a terrible canadian in this respect in that i don't really watch hockey <laughs> okay 
okay. Well, I, you had integrity to tell us that because you could have lied. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about these students want to get better with mm-hmm. their judgment and integrity. Mm-hmm. Let, when we're thinking like long term, but also short term goals, what's something they could start doing like today or this week to start working on that? I think it goes back to observation. I don't know how else to to teach that. I think that, you know, for me, I, I do teach a lot of vet students, um, usually on a shorter period. You know, I have the vet students that I teach the didactic or classroom work, and, you know, I don't have a ton of one-on-one interaction with them. Um, and then I have the vet students that come on to the uh, rotation, and I have them on, like, large animal surgery for, like, two weeks. Um, and, again, I can kind of see their improvements in terms of their, you know, technical skills and their knowledge base. And so I can – but big picture, holistic things. Things like judgment and integrity are really hard to um, sort of teach on a short-term basis. What I do see is with training my house officers, so like we have, you know, interns and, and residents that I train, and I can say that that is, it's, you know, hard to teach that specifically, but when I see the improvements in that, it's, it's probably the thing I'm most proud about is just like seeing them sort of improve. All I can say is that I try to just give whether it's students or house officers the opportunity to observe me as much as possible not just like technically in surgery but like you know talking to a client and seeing you know how I talk to them the subtle sort of personality like the subtle sort of communication skills um, that I use to convey my message effectively um, and you know how I sort of frame the the information so it's manageable um, so those type of things I think you know all I can do is sort of be the best example I can be I don't really you know and so it goes back to for students to try to just observe, you know, other people. And other than that, just, you know, live your life and, you know, experiences will come out up and you'll make mistakes and look back and see what you learn from those mistakes. Self-reflect and, you know, I think that's all you can do. So strong mentorship, time and reflection. Yeah, exactly. That sounds a good summary. (laughs) Is there anything else that we did not discuss that you feel like will be helpful for these students when they're thinking about, as I'm going to call it now, J and I, judgment and integrity? (laughs) Um, I think that like even just if you're somebody that is listening to this podcast, a pre-vet that podcast, you are already in the category of people that is dedicated enough that they want to do everything that they can to be as well prepared, not just, you know, hopefully not just for packets and interviews, but also getting into vet school, dealing with the vet school curriculum and, you know, life after vet school. I can tell you personally, like, I... I I was probably someone uh, on retrospect that had a very strong packet in terms of like my grades and the experiences I had going into um, the vet school application. I think when I look back at the how I answered some of the questions, I like absolutely cringed because I think that I probably didn't do a great job answering some of those questions in retrospect. And I still remember the question so clearly and, you know, and oftentimes think about how I would have re-answered them. Now I did get in and so I was fortunate in that. So I'm, I'm, I don't know how, how I sneaked in or, you know, whether my good grades and, and my, you know, resume was enough to get me over the edge. But I think that I hadn't done like any preparation for what might be on the on the um, interview, and I think that there is a lot of information. We're obviously not going to, um, you know, publish the specific sort of questions, but um, these kind of things that we have been talking about today, um, you know, self reflecting on goals and mistakes that you've made in your past, you know, what you've learned from your mentors. Um, these are all kind of basic things that you would sort of expect to to sort of see with interviews, and so that's. Um, that's the really the the most specific advice I can give to you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, use our ebook, practice with others. You're mm-hmm. going to have your great mentor. They're going to yeah. interview you. Mm-hmm. I think for me, I'm looking at Carissa, who's my current intern. And I, my thought is like, I think when I'm evaluating Carissa's integrity, part of it for me is I know because so far she's like, Everything she said she's going to do for me, she does. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, she's, she's building that trust. Reliability. Super yeah. reliable. Yeah. yeah. So I think integrity also just comes down to, yeah, a strong relationship with your mentors, mm-hmm. making sure that they know what you're about, communicating with them when something doesn't work out. And that's exactly what you're going to do for your clients. Yeah. 
Well, Dr. Bach, thanks so much for being on the show today. What a productive and I want to say like inspiring chat to just think about this isn't like a scary thing. It just takes time. A lot of people are really nervous in there and I, I can tell that. And and like I said, you know, you need to take it seriously. You need to prepare for it. You need to do the work. Um, but you also just need to talk like a human being <laughs> and um, and just realize that there are other human beings on the other end of it. So, Carissa, do you have anything you want to add about judgment and integrity? Building those muscles. Is having accountability with the people around you, even if it's your mentor. That's awesome. That's all we can ask. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Is there any donut chain that you prefer to Tim Hortons? I mean, it's it's different. Like, I mean, the, Tim Hortons is not like specialty, like you know, gourmet donuts or anything like that. It's not that they're fantastic donuts. It's just the ambiance. It's the it's like a lot of fast food, and it's the predictability and knowing what you're going to order. Oh, that's spiritual. <laughs> I really, ex- I know exactly what you're saying. Like, you you're going to get what you expect. Exact, exactly. Wow, that to me means that Tim Hortons has good integrity because you have like the integrity of the donut. Okay. Yeah. You're listening to Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Learning how to express ideas, scientific processes, and medical terminology to owners has to be done clearly and efficiently. Soon, our guest Scott Jamison will give insight on how to hone this vital skill. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and I'm so excited to continue on our people skills season of the uh, VEMCAST application. And today we have, to be honest, I feel a little weird talking about this because I don't know how we talk about oral communication, so verbal communication, but I did bring on a good friend of mine who I think will be an excellent addition to the season, Scott Jamison. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Scott, will you tell the folks a little bit about your like professional life, kind of like what's your job on like a very basic level? Sure. I work in high school sports and I uh, help manage the athletics for the state of Florida. And the reason I thought of you is because you kind of told me some stories about how you'll have referees or parents or students or coaches who come up and they want to talk to you. And there might be heated moments because sports is all about the heated moments. And so you have to have really excellent verbal communication. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about the communication. It's about being empathetic towards people's situation um, and being able to have a conversation with them when maybe they are very heated and you have to try to be the one to calm the situation without telling them to calm down. That is one of the main things that you do not want to do is tell them to calm down. So you have to be able to communicate that without actually saying it, which can be a skill that you have to learn a little bit. It's it's not as easy as it sounds in all situations um, because you've probably been in those if you say, calm down, I was going to say, did you learn out. this because you're married? It, like, yeah, that's There's no way too. you say, tell, sure. tell, I don't want to be sexist, but you're not going to tell a woman to no, calm down. No, I wouldn't that's tell anybody make us mad. to, but yeah. especially not my wife. Of yeah. course not. Um, but, but shout out to Kelly. Uh, yes, shout out to Kelly. But yeah, you, you, it's, it's, um, it's important to not – you don't want people to immediately feel like you're talking down to them. You mm. want to be having a conversation with them, not talking at them and telling them, okay, hey, listen, calm down. Everything's going to be okay. That no, they don't want to hear that. That typically escalates the situation. So, yes, I'm in a lot of those situations. So it's a skill that you have to develop. You can't just have it happen. No. So are we saying that verbal communication can also come down to – not just what you say, but also how you say it and maybe what you don't say. So we're Correct. not going to, in some situations, we might want to say calm down, but we know that's going to escalate the situation. Yes, it's it's yes, it's yes, a lot about what you don't say. It's your body language. It's are you looking at them? Do you look disinterested? Do you look oh, yeah. like you care about what they're saying? Because people can tell that too. Now, sometimes it's over the phone. And so, yeah. you know, you have to be locked in and you can't forget what they said and you have to be paying attention to what they're saying. Oh, staying present. Staying present in the moment. Yeah, and especially in person for sure. It's about what you don't say. It's it's giving them the attention, looking at them, making it seem like you care. I mean, you should be caring, but yeah. sometimes you're you're over you're, it. You're yeah, you may be over it, but you have to still um, understand that it's very important to them, which me- means it is important to me in that moment. That's delightful. Mm-hmm. 
you mentioned two things, and I'm glad you said it. You said in person, but you also said on the phone. So to me, like, that's kind of the only two ways to have verbal communication, unless we're talking Zoom, right? Actually, right. that's probably a whole other mm-hmm. set. Because that is another one. Zoom, you're having to have communication kind of skills. Yeah, because you're having to, like, make eye contact. You had to still have the body language, because that's a good point. You know, on the Vemcast application, and, you know, Scott, to, to remind everybody at home, which they know, but just so you know, the Vemcast application is the application that you use to apply to vet school. Okay, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal for these students who want to become veterinarians. And when we're talking verbal communication, there is not a nonverbal section on this app. So I kind of think that verbal oral communication is going to go in with body language as well. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. Yep. And it's the tone that you're using. It's all different sorts of things. I mean, you can get turned off immediately by somebody on the phone. You can't see them, but you can almost- Oh my, every day I get turned off by someone on the phone. But you can picture how they're probably sitting in their seat and how their head's leaned back and they're just disgusted to have to talk to you. You can tell that by the way somebody is talking. You mentioned tone. Will you tell them one of your side hustles? I'm talking about- PAing for the Gators. Oh, that one. Okay. Yes. Yes. So another reason I asked Scott to be on this show is because Scott sometimes serves as the public announcer at Gator games. Um, I would I would venture women's basketball is maybe one of your That's claims the main to fame. One. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that to me is also oral communication, like having the confidence to have to get up on that mic and have the tone to get people excited. And that's like a whole nother level of like professionalism to know how to use those oral communication skills. Definitely. Can you talk about maybe building confidence to have the guts to get up on a mic in front of thousands of people and announce the games, like helping the students understand that they can get confident about that? Yes, that was that was a difficult one. I started doing those when I was younger. Um, I happened to know someone who uh, was had an in at the University of Florida with doing that kind of stuff, and they knew I worked in college athletics prior to high school athletics, and so I had done some games um, at Santa Fe College here, and so he knew that I had the ability to do it, and kind of said, "Hey, can you do a so a baseball game?" It's back when I was probably I don't know twenty four, twenty five, twenty three, just just out of college. And I said, sure. Yeah, yeah. Who The, the Gators? And yeah, they're playing Florida State. And I said, oh, Ooh, that's a big game. Oh, Florida and Florida State for the first game I'm ever doing. He's like, yeah, yeah, you can come shadow for a couple games and then you'll be fine. And I was like, okay. And it was really nerve wracking. But confident, you use the word confidence. That's a really big thing because you can sell a lot of that. And I've watched enough games and done all that kind of stuff to where I said, yeah, I can do this. But it's a whole different ballgame when you get behind the mic and you know every single thing you say, everybody is hearing. Right. And so you have to do it in a way – that is professional and the University of Florida is has an expectation for what they want. Same thing with their students. There's expectations for their students. There's expectations for everything and even public addresses. Simple as it may seem, you go to the game, you don't even think about it. There's so much going on behind that um, that it's you're kind of the conduit for what they want everybody to know. Besides the big video boards and stuff. Right, you're, it's you're your voice, so your it, oral communication. So it is a, um, yeah, yeah, that was nerve wracking the first couple of times. But now it's just kind of, it's like riding a bike. You just get out there and you do it. You know, one of my favorite TED Talks, if we're thinking about oral communication, is by Amy Cuddy. And it talks about how your body language like might shape who you are. But she talks about like faking it. Because you know the phrase, what is it? It's faking it till. Till you make it. And her phrase is fake it till you become it. Hmm. And so when you're telling this story about going out to that first big game, like never having really done it at that level before, but you're like, all right, I'm going to shout. I'm going to go for it. It almost feels like to me that you you just did it. You're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this a shot. I'm gonna have the confidence to do it. And I think that's what these students need when it comes to oral communication. Scott, I don't know how much you know about veterinary school, but a, a lot of students I think come to vet school because do you know what they love? I'm gonna take a wild guess. Yeah. Animals. They love animals. Okay. Cool. And sometimes that could come with maybe. A dislike or maybe not as like an affinity for people. people. Okay. And so I have some students, especially in this in this generation, who don't like to talk on the phone. They're not used to making phone calls. They're used to texting. They're used to maybe having more like written communication interaction. So the phone calls can be tricky. The one-on-one conversations can be tricky, especially when dealing with like an angry client or if you have to deliver bad news. And so that's – I want to come back to like – fake it till you become it. These students need to just go out there and practice it. But can you talk about how working with the high school athletics, how you've built the confidence to have those maybe uncomfortable interactions? 
Sure. Yeah. So that the worst part of the job in any job, I think, is giving people bad news. So you kind of figure out ways to give that bad news in a way that maybe you can circle back around and make something positive out of it in, in some way, shape or form. And I think the whole fake it until you become it is a really that's very profound, actually. Everybody um, should watch that TED Talk. Google it. That, that's, that's your homework. Very profound thing to say, because. Just circling back to the first time I did the game, I went in and said the the idea being and I had a situation at my current job where I had to speak to about 200 athletic directors after I'd been on the job for like three months. And so my my thought process was, OK, I don't want them to know that this is the first time I've done this. 100 percent. So I have to go in there and just be confident and act like I've done this 100 times. And, you know, it was there was some hiccups there and some stuff I didn't know. I said, I'm going to have to get back to you on that because I hadn't been doing it long enough. Um, but as I was leaving, everybody came up and talked to me. Same thing at the Gator game. All right, see you next game. You know, it was kind of a thing. Where I was, and I'm thinking, man, I don't know how good of a job I did. But being confident and just sort of walking in there. And you don't want to be overconfident. You right. don't, don't want to say, ah, oh, I'm just going to. But there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a definitely a difference and a fine line between the two. Um, but the, the idea of the bad news stuff and – that's something I had to get used to at, at, at my current job um, because, unfortunately, it's part of it. So what I would do with that is make sure that the only things people didn't hear from me was the bad news. So I would call schools, for example, and just check in on them. Hey, how's it going? Smart, or, smart. or talk to them about other stuff or say, hey, saw you guys won this game. Great job. And if I can help you with anything. So then when you have to deliver that bad news, it's not like, who, who is this that I'm okay, talking to? Okay, good point. So starting like a building relationship, yeah. having some trust there. Yeah. And I think that's, um, you know, in, in vet school, I don't know exactly how that would maybe um, relay, but right. uh, I can tell you that we left a vet because they did not communicate things to us and they were very short and mm. I don't want to use the word rude because mm. um, that's maybe not the right word. I just think their bedside manner was a little bit – it's like we're dealing with our dogs. They're members of your family. Yeah, you, you, know? ha yeah, you have animals. Like, You've experienced vets firsthand. So we changed vets at, at one point and it was just like – and it wasn't – the work they did was fine. But we wanted to be able to have that. I don't want to say a relationship. You don't necessarily have a relationship with your vet. Some I mean, people I think may. you can't. Yeah. Some people, large animal vets, may have a relationship with farm, sure. farmers and, sure. and that kind of stuff for sure. Um, but even for us, it was like we want to be able to go in there and ask questions and not feel stupid right. and not feel like our dog, there's something wrong with them just because of certain things and everything like that. So um, there's an art form to doing that and developing that. And, um, you know, I guess. For some people, maybe they don't ever get that wake up call of, oh, gosh, I'm really turning people off. Mm. But oh, yeah. there's some self-awareness there. There has to be self-awareness. And that's something that um, takes time to develop as well. And recognizing that, OK, I do have to have self-awareness in this situation. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm doing things incorrectly. Well, I, I think it's a, a marriage of self-awareness and then asking folks you trust for feedback. Mm -hmm. So when you said after doing the first game or that huge meeting with the 200 you know, folks, Maybe having someone who has your back in the audience to give you actual feedback afterwards. Like for real sure. feedback, not you, yeah. did, you did great. No, you need feedback. Yeah. So I think everyone, and I, I guess for us, for vet school training, we do client communication training and, and they get some feedback. I think there could be more for sure because you might be having a really great day or a really rough day. And, and I don't want you to determine all of your oral communication skills on one or two client simulation settings. So having someone who can give you some feedback, even just if you can do some public speaking engagements. And I want to address something, too, when you were saying I didn't want people to know it was my first time. One of my biggest pieces of advice for any human, I – and I don't – I mean, I'm sure someone could, like, come at me and say, like, oh, I disagree. I never tell someone when it's the first time I'm doing something. Yeah. Like, if you have to get up and give a talk, and the second someone gets up and gives a talk, and be like, oh, I'm really nervous. It's my first time. Immediately, the whole audience, I think, is looking for – Every indication it's your first time mm -hmm. or the first time y'all are like, if you're on your first day as a vet, I wouldn't tell anyone. No. I, I mean, you know, I, sure. I inside you can be excited, but I would not tell the clients. The first time I taught a class at university, I did not tell them it was my first time teaching. It's my first day, guys. Yep. Nope. Yeah, no. Not telling them. Probably I, not a good thing to do. I don't think it helps yeah. you or the other folks. So that, you know, that's just my opinion. The interaction you had with the vet, that wasn't great. What could they have done differently to help keep that relationship going for y'all? So it was just a combination of different things after a while um, where it, 
we would see the assistance a lot, which is fine. The vet is pulled in a hundred different directions. We get that the main vet is, um, but it was just always very short interactions and it wasn't the, yeah. And I, I, I can, it's, it's easier for me to compare it to our new vet who, Hey, how's Barley doing? Mm. How, and like, they act like they're, Oh man, it's so good to see him. He looks like he's doing great. And they, even, even if she literally was out in the hallway reading up on stuff and then just giving herself 30 seconds worth of research to come in and then talk about the dog. It made huge. us feel like, oh, she cares. Huge difference. She cares. Well, and that was a huge thing with the other one. There didn't She didn't seem to care as much. And this one, like I said, I don't know. Maybe she remembers everything, yeah. but maybe she also took 30 seconds before she walked in to look at the chart, look at this, look at that, and then come in and, and start talking about it like, Hey, good to see you. Yeah. you know, so that made a big difference, and so that was, you know, and we we realized we made a good decision after afterwards. That. Yeah, y'all yeah. have to be efficient. Like I get that you might only have fifteen minute appointments. A lot of clinics work like that, yep. which means you have to be really good Absolutely. at building a connection quickly. We always say like be chatting with the client while you're doing the physical exam. Using someone's name is so huge. Shaking someone's hand. Or whatever seems appropriate in that situation. We weren't shaking hands for COVID right, for a while. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, you don't have a lot of time to build trust, but there's little things you can do. The eye contact, the tone of voice, seeming interested, asking a few questions. You got to do it. Oh, yeah. You got to do it. You'll lose clients if you don't. Yep, you will. And it has to be a concerted effort too. And it's the same thing even if you're on the phone and you know you have to make 15 phone calls. And those, I know, those, it's hard. Those last few, you might be trying to just get through them mm. but you'll want to treat the last one like the first one like you're oh say that again you got to treat the last one like the first one that's so true yes. because you the, the, again people will know and you don't want to get the, re the reputation builds up really quickly I know. with that kind of stuff and i think people don't understand that that you, you don't want that reputation you want to be empathetic to people's it, like i said before if it's important to them it needs to be important to you it's not going to be the most important thing in the world to you but mm. When I have a parent call or an athletic director call or somebody like that and they're telling me something in the back of my mind, I might be going, this seems like very small potatoes, but it's not. But not to because them. Because they took the time to make that phone call, which uh, means I it guess. was important to them. I know. And it's hard. It, it, it can be sometimes frustrating. And there's people that just say, all right, I'm just going to put my phone on D&D &D for a while. I don't mm -hmm. want to have to deal with it. And that's fine. But call people back. You make said that connection and it goes a long ways. They won't the people. It's my goal is always to get people to thank me by the end of the call, no matter how mad they are. It doesn't always work, mm. by the way. It does not I like that goal, work. though. But I always want them to say, you know what? I don't like which I don't like your answer. <laughs> yeah. I would have preferred something else, but thank you for taking the time to talk to me and hear me out. Because sometimes people just want to be heard. They don't. They don't necessarily. They know what the answer is going to be. They call the reason that they're calling sometimes. In certain instances, it's because they've exhausted every other thing that they can, and they and no one's listened to them, and they just need to be heard, and they know what answer they're going to get, but they still need that 10 minutes to vent about their kid or something like that, and they want to know that at least you're engaged with them. You're going to try to maybe give them some options moving forward, but they know the answer is going to be no, but they can feel like it was productive. And I think a lot of times people get shut down so many different ways. If they can have that one time, it can be a huge difference for them and for their kid. You said something to me a few weeks ago. I forget what we were talking about. We, I would think I was just telling you that I had had a bad, a bad moment with someone on the phone. And you said, do you remember what you said? I don't. You said, if you're in customer service, you don't get to take a day off. You don't. And That's I was true. like, oh my God, you're so right. Like, it doesn't matter if I'm in a bad mood, the person I'm calling is in a bad mood. If our job is a, is in the service industry, which is your job, which is my job, we really do need to be on when we're dealing with our clients. Mm -hmm. And like you said, if you need to put your, on, your phone on Do Not Disturb, go take a walk, but you need to come back and then yep. you need to treat that last client like the first client. Yep. Here's my, my question for you. Where did you learn this? Like where? Because the things you're saying make a lot of sense that some people just want to be heard. They know the answer they're going to get. My goal is for them to say thank you to me at the end of the phone call. Is it time? Is it experience? Is it how you were raised? Like how did you get here? A combination of all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up with my dad. Oh, well, both my parents. But my dad always telling me to respect people, respect people. They may not respect you, but you should have respect for people just as a human being. And again, if it's important to them, just make it important for yourself for that. Even if it's for five minutes, make it important. And if you make it important, 
then you will be engaged in that conversation and you might be able to help. You may not be able to help them, but they'll feel like you at least did something for them. And I think just over the years of having to deliver information that is not good, you have to find ways to, you, you can't just say, and, and, I'll, and I'll be honest with you, when I first got to where I'm at, I talked to people who, when they would call, I was excited to be there. I was beyond, I was very excited to be there. And I, and I loved my previous job. I learned a lot from there, a lot what not to do um, in interactions with people. Um, and that helped shape me. Um, I was up building relationships on campus that sometimes were, uh, had gone by the wayside. And I said, well, we, we, we need marketing people. We need them to be on our side. So let me go up and talk to them. But when I first got there, I was excited to be there. And so when people would call, I would have maybe a 15 minute conversation um, and I'm thinking, gosh, that shouldn't have probably taken that long. Maybe I let them talk for too long, but then those same people would call me back again and they'd call back again. And I had a couple of them say, you know what? Things have changed at the FHSA. It used to be, we would just, and I'm not just saying this is me. I'm saying it was, it was a, cu a cultural change from everybody. Um, it, we used to just call up and, and get a no or get, you know, or something like that years ago. And I, I took that almost personally mm. of like, well, I don't like that at all. I don't want that to be the reputation of where we're at um i want to again for people to be i want to like communicate approachably i don't know if that makes a no, ton of sense yeah. but i want to be able to but communicate be approachable, approachably yeah. and so every time i talk to somebody i want them to hang up and go well i know if i need something else i can call scott yeah and so even if it's somebody from a different department they know they can at least call me they'll get in touch with me i'll get in touch because we, we have a wonderful staff everybody's really engaged in the customer experience that's mm. what we refer to it as that's what our boss says that wants to be a customer experience not even just customer service but a customer experience so that way it's um all of it combined, not yeah. just the service aspect of it, but the entire experience for them, um, because that's what we deal with is experience for student athletes. Um, and we want that to be, you know, the most exciting time of their life. Some of them, that's the only time they'll play sports. Um, so we want to say, all right, this may be the only time they go to a state championship. This might be the only time they go to a district championship in their life. And how can we make it as as good as we can possibly make it? And I try to treat everything like that because not every kid makes it. So it might be a situation where sometimes the communication you have with them is the most important time that you'll have to talk to them and not unless you may not see them at a state championship event. Oh, um, that's so it makes it easier to have those conversations when I'm like, oh, this is important. Oh, this is going to be an important phone call. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, no matter who it is. Um, and sometimes you're just getting screamed at. But yeah, again, how are you dealing with that? Because they're going to get these students are going to get screamed at, at yes. both as DVM candidates and as and as veterinarians, internally, mentally. Like, how are you dealing with it? It can be difficult mentally at times. Um, you can feel like you take it personally because um, there's times people will call up and blame you personally for whatever issue that they're having, and you know it's not necessarily you individually. It's not something. It may be something that's a state law. It may be something that's a, a rule in the book that you just can't get around and again sometimes you have to let them just sort of vent while also not just you know laying your head back and taking the the receiver off your ear you want to listen because you may pick up some things in what they're saying and then you may be able to help them out with that well i you know i noticed that you mentioned um this you do actually have some options we do have some due process you can go through um we do you know it's not the end of the road so don't give up um you know you never know i and i and i try to tell people because sometimes i go ah I'm, I'm so sorry. I know I'm just so angry. I said, it's, it's not anger to me. It's passion. You have passion oh, for your kid. You're good. You're very good at that customer experience. Pa passion is different than anger. I said, it's your kid. So it's passion. It's not anger. And, they, and that always, then they're like, okay, he gets it. Okay. Help them come off the it. defense. Yes. I hear you yes. saying that oral communication. And I think, you know, we're kind of like, we're hinting at this this whole time. Like you got to have the listening skills. So it's both because if I want to communicate with someone else, I need to know what they're saying. I yes. need to be listening. Otherwise, I'm just going to be saying my perspective. They're never going to hear me, and we're not going to have a, a productive conversation. Yeah, correct. So, and sometimes you have to listen for a while to pick up information. Sometimes you can pick stuff up in 10 seconds, but you've got to be listening the entire time because you may pick something up in that quick, short conversation that you can turn everything around. Or you might have to listen for 20 minutes while they say the same thing over and over and over again because it's making – I don't know if it's making them feel better necessarily, but it's what they feel like in that moment they need to do. At times, it can get to the point where you may say, okay, you know what? Listen, um, let's – we're not being productive right now. Let's take let, – let's 
circle back to this a little bit later. I'm going to go talk to my boss. We're going to have a conversation about it. Then they feel like, oh, okay, he's going to escalate this thing. All right, well, then we'll let him do that. And then we'll let, let's talk about this again tomorrow morning. How, how does that sound? We'll set up a time to talk. We can have a conversation about this later because it's not, it's also not productive to just have somebody screaming and no, yelling. No, they on calm the phone. down. Right. So, Scott, like technically, you could be asked by a pre vet student to write a letter of recommendation for them for vet school. That could happen because you're mm-hmm. a professional. Mm-hmm. You might have an intern working under you or sure. an undergrad or even someone who's out of school who works for you. And they say, Scott, you know, we've been working together for a long time. Can you write me this letter of rec for vet school? And you get the form, and it has the section on oral communication where you have to rank them on a scale of excellent to poor. What kinds of interactions do you need to have with someone to be like, they have excellent oral communication? Hmm, That is a very good question. You know, I think some of the uh, simplest things are sometimes that you pick up on, at least for me, pick up on uh, the quickest because just if I was going to rank somebody and I want to, again, see that they're engaged, I don't have to have them staring me in the eyes the entire time, but somebody who, when I go to talk to them or ask them something or have them go talk to somebody, um, I mean, there's been time to have had interns and you don't necessarily want them on the phone because you're like, oh, yeah, oh cause you know, they're not skilled might not be and, oh. the best on the phone. And then Oops. there's other ones when you're ready to put them out there, right out there to be in front. Um, I do want to mention, I recognize that there are folks who oral communication just isn't their skill set, sure, right? We sure. have, we Absolutely. other, you know, there are, there are definitely some folks who are better with written communication. We have folks who come from just differing abilities. Absolutely. But this is part of the form. So you want to work on it. And right. you're saying people can work on it. They oh, yeah. can be moldable and trainable. And, and because the oral communication thing is on there, it goes to show you how important that I mean, is. Phone in person clients but even not clients the technicians that you work with the assistants the interns the students the other veterinarians the managers you have to have some for, you're, you're going to be talking to people you mm-hmm. got to be a talker and it has to come off the right way i also want to point out good time to remind you that during the interview some of you have <laughs> some of you some students are ramblers you got to learn to be concise yep. That's something that we're looking for in the interview is can you get a thought across in a concise way? If you find that you're not able to answer a question within, in my mind, 90-ish seconds in this interview, you're going to have some problems helping people like pay attention. They, we just don't have the attention span anymore to listen to a soliloquy. So get those answers concise. We're talking a lot about growth and getting better. So Scott, let's talk today a month from now and a year from now. What's something they could start doing today to work on these oral communication skills? I think having conversations with people, going up and talking and um, dis- discussing, and it sounds so simple and so ridiculous, but just actually talking to people and talking about different things, talking about different topics and having, being able to, th- one of the most important things is being able to think on the fly and being, totally. able, to, and being able to read a room and see like, oh, maybe I need to go in a different direction with this, um, you know, because there, there are times when you start talking and, okay, you can tell. I'm not You're really either out. winning people over or I'm losing people and I've got to change, not getting dejected about it, but just going, okay, different group. I've yeah. got to, I've got to adjust, but, you, but you've got to have the self-awareness and the ability to, I, it's not like I made this up, but reading a room you got to be able to read a room mm-hmm. and say, all right. I got to know my audience a little bit. And whether that's one person or whether that's 50 people is you do have to know your audience and who you're talking to. Um, And so I think something to start doing now is not always just being on your phone. And I'm guilty of that too, by the way, Um, being on your phone all the time and wanting to just always text, but pick up your phone and call somebody and talk. Ooh, ooh, I love that. Instead of texting and actually have a conversation. Cause I think we get, and again, I'm lumping myself into this. You get into the crutch of just sending a five second text about something or asking a question. And it's like, "Ah, pick up the phone. There's times at work. I'm like, I just want to send an email, but I say, you know what? I'm going to call the person and talk it out with them. Cause that's how you build relationships. Anyways, emails do not build relationships. And it's hard to sometimes, and you can't read tone an email no. so mm-hmm. we're okay so we're saying today i say challenge talk to somebody in person maybe someone you're not as comfortable with so yes. not like a best friend and call someone mm-hmm. okay what could they be doing a month from now what's something that maybe over the next month they're thinking about working on reading listening to to get better 
I would say challenge yourself and step out of your comfort zone with different things as well. And I don't, I'm trying to think of some examples that could be on campus. Um, well, I but, mean, you could run for a position in a club. Yep. You could. I, I would mean, say take, take a speech and speech and debate. Everyone should take a class speech and debate is, in public speaking And take class, more yeah. than one if you can. Yeah. A year from now, what do we hope for them for their oral communication skills? What could they have done? What could they have tried? Where should they hope to be a year from now? I think a year from now, um, you obviously you would want to see growth in that. So if you're not continuing to stretch what you're doing and the different things that, you know, trying different things too. Um, and I think it's just as simple as you you almost have to put yourself into situations to be able, because, you know, you can't fabricate every situation. You can't just go up and start talking to somebody and, and, and run through scenarios or whatever it may be. You almost have to do it in the real yeah, world. Yeah, it has and, to be organic. And be thrown into it and be organic. So whether that's at your job and having to deal with difficult situations, and there's going to be times when, Again, you are in whatever job you may have or if you're working in a lab or something like that, you may try to avoid those difficult situations. And it may be like, oh, hey, there's somebody really angry out there. You go talk. You know, say, oh, no, I'll, go, I'll go talk to him. Good idea. I'll go talk to him. Embracing the challenge. I, I have sort of made that the thing at the office. Like if you have somebody that's angry, put them through to me. I will talk to him on the oh, phone. Oh, Scott, I just got chills. That is so I don't cool. care how mad they are. And, and, and sometimes it doesn't go particularly well. But put them through. It's a challenge. And it's something that if you ever want to have the ability to grow, you have to be in uncomfortable situations and you have to want to step up. And people will notice that, too. If they go, she wants to deal with that same person that comes in and complains all the time. Yeah, because now it's a challenge for me to find out why are they complaining? Ooh, all I'm going to do I'm going to do what this. is I love this because th- 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 there's a reason. Right. People aren't just mad for no reason. People no, are upset something's, for something's no, there's going on. something. Yeah, something happened. And you don't have to be a psychologist no. and get to the bottom of it. But no. there's there's some surface things that you can help them. You know, so, OK, how can we help you? How can we do this or yeah. whatever? OK. Talk me through it. Yeah. Some you know what? You know what? You're right. That is actually frustrating. <laughs> I, I do understand why you're frustrated. And sometimes you'll catch people off guard like, oh, you do understand? Because no one else has told me they understand. They just get mad that I'm here or whatever. And so I think stepping up and. When there are those, put yourself right out into them. What's the worst that can happen? You know, at the end of the day, is no, you learn something. Just compose yourself, hold yourself together, and and show people, and then you will. It will be amazing how quickly you'll realize. Like, oh, I can do it's this. Not that this bad. isn't that yeah, bad. It's this not is that not bad. really that. Do- I'm not special. You're not special. I mean, you're special. Thank you. But yeah, um, but there's nothing special about what we do. It's just doing it. You you have to do it. You you can't just pass it off to everybody else or avoid difficult situations because then you never you have to fail to get better Mm -hmm. it's i tell my kids they play baseball baseball is a game of failure you're going to strike out a lot but you're also going to hit some home runs but you never hit the home runs unless you get up there and strike out a few times like it's just you have to it life is a game of failure I also want to encourage y'all to do some linkedin learning trainings go on youtube listen to some ted talks especially for communication in the healthcare field especially when we're talking about different cultures, races, ethnicities, Mm -hmm. things to think about, cultural competence. You want to make sure that when you finally do feel confident enough to get up there and talk to those clients that you can think about different lived experiences, what might what might or might not make someone comfortable. So I think that would be really wise too with oral communication. That would really show a next level of intelligence and interpersonal communications if you think of it from that level. Yeah. communication as well scott we always ask our guests to give like big life advice so if you were going to give some advice that either you've heard that has helped you or something you wish you had heard at the time like when you're really trying to get that career started and get those big goals and get into that office or that clinic that you want to be at what advice do you want these pre-veterinary students to hear from you so i think it's something that i heard from my dad from my current boss is, and it's, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this too, is do whatever you do, whether people are watching or not watching. So you're not always, when you know there's a promotion coming up, you don't all of a sudden just flip the switch and start doing your stuff. You're doing it all the time. And I promise you, people notice that. A hundred percent, they always notice that. I notice that. When there's a job open, all of a sudden everybody's, walking around, trying to help people out, trying to do different things. Just be on all the time and don't 
expect things. Um, things don't always come when you want them to. Um, I had grand visions of what I wanted to do at the college level. The timing didn't work out, but you can't hang your head and then just, oh, it's not fair or I deserve more. You deserve what you have. You deserve what you get and you deserve what you work for. And I think that you have to be willing to put in the time and you have to, again, you just always be on. People will notice that and they'll go, that's the person we want because even when no one's here, they're here by themselves or they're here with one other person, they're working hard or they're going above and beyond. They're talking to all these different people and they're not telling people about it, but we're hearing about it and we know that that's how they are. And so I think that's really, really important. And that's something that is just, just always be on, always be, you know, stay passionate about what you do and don't do it just when you think people are going to notice it and when it can better you always be doing what you need to do. You don't have to get ready if you stay if ready. You stay ready. That's right. Well, Scott, thanks so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. I feel inspired to Good. work on. I mean, I'm a talker. As I am too. You're a talker if people too. People couldn't tell. I tend to get going. Yes. Yeah, but it. We can be better. Mm -hmm. We can be better talkers. Oh, yeah. We can think about have some self reflection, self awareness. Ask the people around us who we trust. Like, hey. Where can I get a little bit better on those verbal communication skills? What can I do differently? How can I evolve? I'm going to start leaning into the challenging conversations for sure. I definitely want to start being more excited when I get those phone calls that are going to be difficult. And I appreciate this. This was a wonderful opportunity and good luck to everybody out there. But you make your own luck. Remember that. So you, you got to get out there. You got to work hard. You got to be willing to put in the extra time and good luck. I know. Um, I appreciate my vet. They're very important people in our lives, That's right? Because so nice. our pets are our family. Absolutely. So we, you're taking care of our family, so we really appreciate that. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me. Okay. So we're the pre-vet podcast. Okay. Will you pretend that the pre-vet podcast just shot a three-pointer and say it in the voice? <laughs> So I can hear it. So I have to say pre-vet pause cast? For three. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let me see if I can do this. Pre-vet podcast for three. That was perfect. One more time, pause cast. Pause. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But that's good because, you know, it's good to practice. You don't want to do Alex Avellino? Yeah, I do. Well, I don't think they care about hearing my name. Pre-vet podcast for... Pause, Scott. Pause. Pre-vet pause <laughs> <laughs> Pre -vet podcast for three. Yeah, the crowd goes wild. My voice is a little bit shot right now. I'm sorry. I'm allergy stuff. So what did we say? Are we going to apologize? 100%. Are we going to apologize, though? Because no, no. they don't know what your regular voice sounds like unless That's they've true. been to the WBK, women's basketball. That's true. My name is Carissa, and I'm the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Learning to say no and prioritizing mental health as well as family time is challenging in any profession, but can be seemingly impossible in one where lives depend on your availability. Dr. Fagan and Alex Avellino continue a long-going conversation centered on work-life balance and boundaries. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we are continuing on our discussion about the personal people skills from the VEMCAST Letters of Recommendation. Today, we are talking about one of the probably, one of the biggest topics that we talk about in vet med, and that's work-life balance and boundaries. And today we have Dr. Raquel Fagan on the show. Dr. Fagan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Fun fact about Dr. F, her son, uh, Kyle Fox, is in the class of 2025. And so he has been on the show before too. So he is a legacy and his mom <laughs> is here. And so we get to find out how you're balancing it all. Before we do, will you tell us where you went to undergrad, where you went to vet school, and then what post-vet school career looked like. Awesome. So that's easy. I went to University of Florida. Woo! Double, double degree. So, um, yeah, it's awesome. And I actually have my 30-year reunion this year for vet school. For yeah. So so I'm a 1993 grad. That's exciting. Are you yeah. going to go for the um, reunion? 
Oh, yeah, I think we're going to try to do something. I'm not sure what it is yet. We're just starting to set the little feelers out. But, um, yeah, wow. that's exciting. So after vet school, mm -hmm. what did the career path look like? How did we get where we are today? So my very first job was down in southwest Florida. Um, I was there for a year and a half. It wasn't um, – it was a good learning experience. The area that I was in was not a great place for a 25-year-old. Um, it was an older community, and I just was not finding friends my age and things like that. So I wanted something where I had more of a community that I could get involved in. So I moved to Apopka. Um, I went to a private practitioner, and I was there for 10 and a half years. So um, he saw me through my marriage. He saw me through my kids. <laughs> um, and just it was amazing. Um, learned so much from him. Um, has always been a mentor and just a great experience. Um, then we come to kind of what we're talking about today, having the kids and them starting to get active in social activities and sports and stuff. And I wanted to be able to be there for them. So I looked for a job where I didn't have to work weekends. And so I ended up in the villages where it was basically Monday through Friday because everybody's retired and they don't need you on the weekends. So I was there for 11 years and a practice came up that was for sale and I said, okay, well, let's do this. <laughs> let's jump into practice ownership. And it was the best, best, best decision I've ever made. Um, we've had it for six and a half years now. It was actually owned by Gator grads. They basically got married in school, came out of school, built their practice. Wow. Um, so it was, you know, it had been there 32 years, I want to say, when I bought it. And... Um, just amazing. I mean, we, the community absorbed us. We've just, we've grown the business, almost doubled it in the six years. Um, we are me, plus I have two fantastic relief veterinarians that are kind of pretty much there on certain days. Um, I would love to find someone that is a full time. Uh -oh, so, listen little up, plug. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, it's just been amazing. It's, I get to do it my way. Oh so, my gosh, yeah, that's, that's for some. <laughs> that is, I think, a huge dream for a lot of folks. And some of the things you're saying, like you had children, you now own a practice. These are things that a lot of folks want to do. Mm -hmm. So, can we just break down the timeline a little bit more? You graduated vet school, no kids yet. No kids yet. No. Nope. Did you ever think about having kids while in vet school? No. Okay. Abs absolutely not. <laughs> no way. And I'm sure you had some classmates who did that. Um. Or saw, or saw some we people maybe had, in, in upper or lower classes? So we had one um, one girl, I think, golly, that was a long time ago, that I remember was pregnant in my class. Mm -hmm. And I want to say then she dropped down to the next class below okay. us. I want to say she might have gotten pregnant again. And I don't know yeah. where it went from there. Um, we had several that were married mm -hmm, couples mm -hmm. in school. Um but that was, I, from what I can remember, that's the only one okay. that actually had a child. So we would say, like, for some folks, doable. But for you, you were like, I'm going to wait. I'm no. going to graduate. No. I was, you know, I was still I was still young and having fun. and Yeah. <laughs> and so then how many years post-grad did you have Kyle? Okay. So he was born in 1998. So, Makes me feel so old. Yeah. Okay. So I was 31. 31 for our first for boy. For our first boy. Okay. Yeah. And so that would have been in eight, so five years after graduation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you feel like that was a great move for you because you were like settled and comfortable? Yeah, I was really happy in my job. I, I'd been in my job for about um, a year when I met my husband and um, we just knew it was right. Mm -hmm. And we got married in 97. Didn't think Kyle would come along that fast, but we were married and then he came along fast. But it was a good timing because I had been out in practice enough mm -hmm. that... I kind of sort of went to a little bit of a part-time. Um, I was working, uh, let's see, I took a day and a half off during the week, and I worked on Saturdays. So we were open Saturday morning. So, um, you know, that was good because then my husband could watch him on the weekends. I still had a day and a half during the week, and that was pretty good. And then the second one came along two years later. Um, again, I was still just working. You know, I still had the day and a half, and that was great. My sister-in-law was watching the kids, so we didn't have to worry about daycare. Um, when they were, when Kyle was three, he went into a preschool program that was literally a block down the road. So I could go 
watch his little preschool programs and stuff like that. Um, but then things started to change when they got five, six, seven, when they started doing sports and right. soccer. Well, and Kyle's episode on the season, his season is about extracurricular activities. Yeah. He is very involved. Yeah. So would you say that was a value for you to be, you, you mentioned like you wanted to be there. Yeah. So then how would we, how did you make that work? Do you think it's changed too over time? Because that would have been what, like 10, 15 years ago when he was starting to get active. Yeah. Do we feel like expectations have changed in a good, think, bad way? Well, you know, you have to look at veterinary medicine as a whole. Um, I mean, we've seen the flop from more men in the field to way more women in the field. A hundred percent. And not to be, you know, I, I, I still think women are seen as the caregivers and the child raisers. And I think that's where it's a little bit of a hard decision to make because you want to do what you want to do. I went to school for so long to do what I love yeah, doing, right. but I also wanted to be there for my kids. And yeah. so sometimes you have to find that balance. And I'm really proud of the fact that when I leave work, I leave work. Like I don't carry it with but me. But how? What is the secret? How are you doing it? Because so many people are not able to do that. Yeah. So number one, um, it, maybe it's easier because I, I own a practice now, but literally the last appointment that is scheduled is 445 and our doors close at six. And if somebody calls at 530 and their dog got hit by a car, they go to the emergency clinic. Right. Um, if they so call boundaries with that. and their dog's been vomiting all day, they go to the emergency clinic. Mm -hmm. It's an itchy dog. That's not an emergency. You come in the, the next day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there wiggle room? Of course there's wiggle mm, room. Mm -hmm. But every case is individual, and they come to me and ask me, and it's my choice. And, you know, some people may not like that, but in the flip side of that, you've sat and watched your dog all day, and you call me at 430. A hundred percent. That's not Poor planning happen. on their part. Your poor planning on your part does not make it my emergency. No, it does not. And I think you just have to get used to saying that. Like that, so many times, you know, you hear that veterinary technicians hate their jobs because they're there till, you know, they're supposed to leave at six or they're to eight o'clock at night because the veteran took a, you know, 530 emergency. Well, shame on them. Yeah. Because everybody has a life. And... When the kids were busy, I mean, we had to hit the soccer field by 6, 7 o'clock at night. So that means I'm out of there at 5. So you have to make those boundaries and you have to stick to them. And it's hard. I mean, it's... It is hard. Did it come... Has it come naturally to you or was it a learned skill? Like, have you it always... It was learned. Okay. Yeah, it was learned. Okay. I, I can't tell you there were times where I would go pick the kids up from school and bring them back to the office because I had to do a C-section. Mm -hmm. I literally did a C-section, told the boys... Sit there on the floor. Your job is to make sure the puppies don't get out of the basket. Oh my God. And these two little boys <laughs> sat there and kept these little babies from getting out of the basket. So they've been there. You know, if they were sick, they came with me to work. Um, so I was able to balance it. I don't know that there's a really magic way I did it. Mm -hmm. I just decided that my job was not going to become all I was. Yeah. Oh, yes. Like, like That's my job huge. as a mom was first. I love what I do. I would never, as my husband now says, it's in my DNA. Um, I would never want to do anything else. I'm still love every day that I go to work, but I'm so proud of the job I did as a mom as well. And I was there and, you know, if they needed me, I was there. Yeah. You know, well, it sounds like you're talking about kind of values and identities. And yeah. so my question to you might be, and you, and what I hear you saying is like, I don't want to be defined by my job, even though it's what I love. Mm -hmm. So if somebody asked you, who are you? Like, what are the four main qualities, values? What would you say they are? Because to me, I'm hearing veterinarian and mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any other ones that might come to mind? Um, like anything of hobbies or, or anything of those kinds of things? Oh, I'm a huge reader. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if we did veterinarian mom and reader, can uh -huh. you put them in order of importance or are they all on the same level? Oh, gosh. Um, hmm. I would say I would say family is first. Okay. And I would say mom slash wife. Yeah. Um, as that, I have, I have a new husband. Well, we're nine years. It's not new husband. but And I have four additional kids involved. Oh, wow. Okay. So we have a great blended family. And, you know, it, it's always, if, if a kid calls, we're there. Ooh. 
reason a lot of students have issues with saying no is they're afraid about the repercussions. Like, what's going to happen? What well, would you say to that? So, and, and you know, I mean, there's been a big change, too, because when I got out of school, we didn't have as many emergency clinics. We didn't have specialty hospitals. We didn't have the stuff that we have today. Okay. Um, so I did have to pull some on-call shifts. And... I think the new graduates coming out or pre-vet students or whatever, I'm not saying they have to get in there and like pay their dues, Mm. but I think they can't go in and just say, I'm getting off at five. I'm not working past five. I'm not doing any emergencies. I'm not doing calls. I think you, you're coming out brand new. You've probably done maybe four spays. You need to to yes, get you're going to be belt. smart. You need to get some under your belt. Mm-hmm. And I, I see the starting salaries and they want, you know, these everything, these signing bonuses and commission. And I'm like, you, you should you, you have to earn it. You have to earn that. Mm-hmm. Like if you tell me you want one hundred thousand dollars and twenty five percent commission rate, then that means you have to pull in for me six hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, that's and fair. You have you have no idea that you can pull that in yet. That's fair. OK, so let's I, I like where this is going here. So you mentioned like someday you'd like to hire like mm-hmm. a full time vet in your practice. So let's talk about if you're going to hire somebody mm-hmm. and they're coming in wanting this kind of work-life balance like how are you approaching that conversation are you telling them like here are the numbers here's the expectations what does that look like so i i love i i i swear i was talking to my stepdaughter the other day and she was like she was excited about the podcast and she was like I see you after you're done doing medicine, like you're going to go in and you're going to do stuff like this. Like you're going to talk about how you've done what you've done. So my expectations are, yeah, you're going to work five days a week. You're going to work eight to five, eight to six, whatever, you know, whatever I do, you're going to do. Right. I mean, that's, that's only fair, but we're going to, we're going to evaluate things after a month, after three Thank months, God. after six months, Yes, you know, you're not going to, I'm not going to let you fly by yourself and come in and do your first spay on a client's dog. You're going to see one, do one, teach one. I love the see one, do one, <laughs> teach one because, method. Because that's how you have to do it. You, you can't just expect that in school, you're going to learn everything there is, especially if you're going into general practice. Mm-hmm. And do you think that having that balance helps you avoid compassion fatigue, burnout? Yes. Have you experienced those things? I do. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't know that I would ever say I have compassion fatigue. Um, I've gone to... I've gone to seminars because I want to be able to recognize it, not just in me, but in a staff member. Mm -hmm. And um, everything that they were talking about, I'm like, okay, I'm good. (laughs) Now... Does it hurt when we have to make that ultimate choice of ending a pet's life? 100%. Absolutely. It hurts every single one. But we we take every single one individually and every single one of us that has to do that, we take our time where we can digest it and process it and and think about it. And it's usually on my way home mm-hmm. where nobody's around, where I can sit there and go, okay, we did everything we could. And we let this pet go peacefully, and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. So that, to me, I'm glad that we can relieve suffering in pets. That That's how I look at that. Burnout, absolutely. Um, we'll get a bad run of just j- cancer cases, mm-hmm. heart cases, mm-hmm. ones you don't expect to pass away, pass away, um, a bad surgical outcome. And... I've been doing it long enough. I know when I'm burnt out, I can tell it. And so I just, I look at Jeff and I say, I need a couple extra days. And okay. we will, and we will work it out and we'll see if we can pull our relief vets in for a couple of days. And I may not even have to go anywhere. I may just drive over to the beach by myself and sit on the beach. I may go see my mom. I just went and saw my mom two weeks ago. Um, and I was there. I left Friday afternoon. I came back Monday morning. So I was gone. And to recharge. To recharge. And literally did nothing. Didn't have to talk to anybody about veterinary medicine. Mm. And you just reboot. That's how you avoid burnout. And that's how you avoid burnout. That's how you avoid burnout. And so I'm trying to tell, you know, my staff members, because we do provide them paid time off and vacation time and, you know, everything. And I'm like, guys, use use it. it. They won't use (laughs) it. Use it. And I finally think that they're getting it. I think they thought we were going to be upset or mad Mm -hmm. if they took time off. And I'm like, I'm more upset or mad if you don't 
because then you're not going to be good for me. Oof. Then, and, and I've heard them now say, can I just take a mental health day? Yes, Absolutely. Take it. Please. So do yes. you find that in general, folks are not abusing that privilege? No. 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 Because the f- folks in this field are passionate. They want to yes. be here. They care too much, potentially. Yes. Uh, okay. So when, now when you said that you can feel it, that the burnout is coming, do you feel it physically, mentally? Like, how do you know so, to help some of the students who maybe want to figure out how to identify burnout for themselves? Yeah. So mine kind of starts with a waking up in the morning and not wanting to go exercise because I wake up and I start at exercise and when I start to find two or three days where I'm like I need that extra hour and a half of sleep or I need that extra 45 minutes of oh, sleep girl, you're preaching to the choir right and now. I'm like you know what if I'm not feeling like I want to get up something's happening something's happening okay or if I start to find myself wanting to eat everything in sight <laughs> um, I'll start to go for the cokes I'll start to go for the sweets I'll start to go for the pretzels and this and that and the other thing something's going on something's going on okay and if I'm and I'm not going to ever say that I don't ever want to go to work, but there's been days where, I mean, it's just been bad day after bad day after bad day. And you just sit there and go, I just, I just don't even want to go today. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, you know what, just get through. And I find too, I always have something planned in the future. Something fun? It's fun. Yes. Yes. Okay. I love this idea that, because there will be bad days. There's oh, going to be some bad days. There are going to be bad days. In a row. But if yes. you have something to look forward to, that helps keep you going, but also to identify like, okay, I can't keep going right now. I need that break. Yeah. So we're talking beach. We're talking visiting mom. Mm-hmm. Anything else that works for you that maybe we can encourage these folks to try when they're starting to feel that burnout? You know what? I think you also just let everything go. I think I was kind of thinking, what what did I do when I was in school, mm. you know, to really help me? And I think you set a boundary of I'm going to be done at 11 o'clock at night. You know, I have class until five, whatever. I'm going to study. I'm going to get dinner. I'm going to have a really nice dinner. I'm going to take my time. And but at 11 o'clock, I'm done. Yeah. And I'm going to get a good night's sleep. I'm going to wake up the next morning. If I have a test, there's not anything I felt like I could ever learn. From 11 to staying up all night. I know. I'm just going to make myself sick. Right. So I just feel like you have to set yourself with boundaries. And then on the weekends, just give yourself a day to do nothing. Mm -hmm. I never missed a football game. Okay. A home football game. Yes. I never, in eight years, I never (laughs) missed a home football game. That was my release. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and I'm going to cheer for the Gators. And that is, that was my day of not doing anything. Okay. And, and I had friends that didn't go to the games that right. they would sit home and study. And I'm like, nope, this not is for you. not for me. Okay. So I like this idea of students, you have to identify what your boundaries are going to be. If you know that after 11 PM, you've got nothing left in the tank. Why are we still pushing it? Mm-hmm. If you're a night owl and that works for you, amazing. But you have right. to find the things that yes. work for you, which takes trial and error. Oh yeah. So yeah. in undergrad, what works for you might not work for you in vet school, yes. might not work for you in practice, but yes. be willing to give yourself a grace period. Yeah. But also, don't you think it's important, like we've been talking about, to have those other values? Because if all we valued was our career yep. and these freak things happen, we have nothing else to nothing look forward else to, 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 to enjoy. And it becomes like just torture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 What? big life advice would you have for these students about finding a good work-life balance and boundaries? What is something that they need to hear from you that maybe they could start doing today? Yeah, I think, I think having a hobby Yes. and whatever that is, I mean, it may be running, it may be going to the gym, it may be reading, it may be, maybe you want to join a painting class, maybe you want to, um, you know, you've got to have something outside of veterinary medicine. You have like to. it can't be, I'm gonna go volunteer at the local shelter. No, <laughs> something outside of veterinary medicine. Um I started <laughs> I play tennis and, and I've started to play pickleball a couple times. People so love pickleball. It's fun. And you know, it takes an hour. There is nothing that you can learn in that hour that you can't just go out and laugh and have fun. I mean, re- thank you. It's so, it really is like the idea that where people say they don't have enough time, like you have an hour. You have an hour. And it's going to make you stronger later. Yes. Okay. Yes. So getting a hobby, what could they do in a month to help them feel a little bit more like they can control their boundaries or they can start practicing saying no? What should they be doing? 
So if you like to, let's just pick reading for one thing. So ask people you know that are readers. I will, I, I'm, I love volunteering books. So I like to read true crime. I like to read really deep, dark murder mysteries. Oh, sure. So, um, you know, ask somebody, put a note on Facebook, put a note out on your vet school Facebook or whatever and say, hey, what's the, what's the best book somebody's read in the last six months? Oh, that's and fun. give yourself a month to read it. Oh, I love that. So, you know, read for Maybe you don't start out reading an hour every day. Maybe you start out giving yourself 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And then the next night you're like, wow, that was really good. So right. give yourself 30 minutes. Or working out, you don't have to start with going on a, a half, a, you know, 5K. No. Or maybe you say, oh, there's a 5K coming up. Maybe oh, I want to run that. So yeah. get that, download that app on your phone that mm-hmm. says, how do I run a 5K? And it'll it'll walk you through that. Oh, yeah, that's so, true. There is an app you know, for there's, everything. There's an app for everything. Yeah. But it's it's fine. You can't have somebody tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. You have to know it in yourself. I started when I was in school, I started cross stitching because that was just something stupid and mindless that I could just sit there and do. My husband plays solitaire on his phone. It's totally mindless. He can just sit there and carry on a conversation with me, carry on a conversation with anybody, but he's playing solitaire. Mm-hmm. You know, um Something to do to keep your mind off of animals. Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't read animal books. Like, (laughs) if there's an animal in it, that's great. But I don't search out books that have animals in them. Not for pleasure. Not for pleasure. No. And then a year from now, where do we hope these future veterinarians are with their work-life balance? I hope they will understand that it's okay to take a day off, that it's okay to say, I want to binge watch Criminal Minds tonight. And that's okay. Nobody, nobody's going to yell at you. Nobody's going to get mad at you. If they do, they're not the right fit. And if they do, you know what? I got a D in veterinary pharmacology. Did you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and here we are, 30 we years are. later. You know, I don't, have to, I don't have to memorize a drug. I go look it up. Well, I am really excited about encouraging these folks to find a good work-life balance. But what I also heard, uh, my big takeaway is you kind of have to earn... Having a work-life balance, you Correct. need to be worth that hundred thousand dollar salary. You need to have production. You need to be yeah. great with clients, and that takes time. So I do like this attitude of coming in humble, mm-hmm. maybe not demanding. Right. A, right. A, a whole set like you haven't earned that yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I really that part I love. <laughs> um, can you tell me? The last thing I'll ask you is like, what piece of advice do they need to hear from you in general about the profession or something that a mentor told you that was very, very helpful for these folks who are not veterinarians quite yet? Um, You hear a lot of veterinarians that say that they get into the job and then they're like, I don't know why I did this. This is not what I want to do. I, I would not recommend anybody do this. Boy, if if you don't want to do it once you've gone and put in all the the time and effort, get out. Don't don't waste anybody's time because you're not going to be a good veterinarian. You're not going to be a good person that people are going to trust. Decide and change. Maybe it's research. Maybe it's not the hands on. You know, maybe there's another public health or there's another aspect of it. But if this is what you're born to do, I can't see myself doing anything different. Love what you do. You'll never work a day in your life. I read that quote somewhere and I have said it so many times because I love going to work. I love seeing my animals. I love giving puppy vaccines. I love checking ears. You know, yeah, some days are, for lack of a better term, boring, but who can't, who cannot say no to hugging a puppy? (laughs) I mean, it's just, you know, you may have a euthanasia, but I can guarantee you the next appointment, whether it be that afternoon or the next morning is going to be a puppy or a kitten, or you're going to get a card in the mail that says, thank you for what you do. Um, But you just have to, you have to be proud in what you're going to do and, and every day live it the best you can. Oh, I'm just so happy to hear that. You love to hear a person who loves their profession. Um, so I'm really excited for all of these pre-vets who have been listening to this podcast for six plus seasons nice. are, are, uh, I think they are born to do it too. You awesome. know, they are born to do it and they, they might be applying, uh, at your position someday. There we go. <laughs> Send them on. <laughs> well, thanks Dr. Fagan for being on the show today. I really Thank love talking about so work-life much. balance. I'm glad you took time off of your job to come yeah. to Gainesville to talk to me. And I'm Alex Salvino and we'll talk to you soon. I it was a blast. I want to say I'm shocked that it's your 30-year vet school reunion because you look amazing. Like, <laughs> Kyle, you have good <laughs> genes, Kyle, if you're listening to this. Thank you. Hi, friends. I'm Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. 
In this field we're pursuing, there's loss, suffering, and guilt often riddled in much of the hard cases. The ones where there's financial need, a disconnect, or a lack of tenderness. Tune in to focus on emotional stability, a skill needed in a field known for its compassion fatigue. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and I'm so excited to have two fabulous folks in the booth today to talk about potentially a tricky topic, emotional stability. Just a reminder that every episode of the podcast this season goes over the VEMCAST Letters of Rec personal people skill qualities. And one of these qualities is ranking someone on a scale of excellent to poor on emotional stability. So with that, I'd like to welcome my guests, Kristen McCallum and Kayla Shelley. Welcome to the podcast, gals. Thanks so much. This is very, very exciting. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Kayla, do you want to tell them that you manifested this? Mm-hmm. I did by bothering Alex on the daily basis. And also I'm having my Beyonce moment in this very second. I'm really excited to make dreams come true today. Yes. Mm-hmm. Let's talk emotional stability. Before we get started, I should we should find out where our guests came from. So we'll start with Kristen. Will you tell them your title? Mm-hmm. and a little bit about your professional background. My title is Wellbeing Coordinator, and I am in the College of Veterinary Medicine getting to work with students and also just kind of like well-being programming overall. My background is I'm a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida and Louisiana and have been in K-12 through um, educational settings for a pretty long time. Uh, working with students on building skills and uh, all in kind of service of their academic success. And Kayla? I'm a second year vet student here at UFCVM, Go Gators. I, my undergrad, I went to Cornell University, majoring in animal science, and I'm interested in wildlife health and public health. Off the bat, do y'all think, Kristen from a professional standpoint and Kayla from a student standpoint, that having recommenders rank potential candidates on emotional stability is important to vet school and why? So I definitely think it's important, um, especially when it comes to vet students, because when we're doing these recommendations, the whole purpose is how are you going to be as a vet, but also as a vet student, and can you handle yourself in stressful situations? And that's the whole point of those rankings is this person is emotionally stable. Even when something stressful is happening, they're responding in an adequate and healthy way and working in a team setting. So 100%, I definitely think it's relevant. Hmm. I agree, and I love that you kind of – you know, mentioned the experiences that they're going to have as to the why. So I'm actually going to come at it from a different perspective and say it's always good to just be self-aware and to know where you stand. So, you know, if you're not sure like, kind of where your goal is or even if you have the goal identified, if you don't know where you're starting from, then how do you get there? So if you know that vet school is the goal, then you know what the prereqs are to take it, right? So you know where you're at and you kind of mark them off as you're going down your list of, of credits and things like that. Same thing for just well-being in general and being a holistic human being in any field. Um, You want to make sure that you are living your optimal life every single day or as many days as possible. And the start is to know where you're at. So, Kristen, what I think I hear you saying is self-awareness and knowing where you're at really plays into understanding and knowing your emotions and who you are as an emotional being. Is that what we're saying? Absolutely. And I think, you know, others' perspective is really great feedback for us to be able to and grow from. Yeah, so like the, the recommenders, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. we're saying it's really important to form relationships with professionals who know you, who know who you are. Kayla, it wasn't that long ago that you applied to veterinary school. The folks who wrote your letters of rec, what kind of relationship did you have with them slash what kinds of interactions did you have with them to feel confident that they're going to rank you high in these areas? Well, for my first recommender, I was working at that clinic since I was 16 years old, so they definitely knew me. They had seen me struggle and succeed um, working in the clinic, and they've seen me approach problems in hopefully a creative way, and that's why they felt comfortable writing my letter of recommendation, and it was good enough to get me here, so I'm so excited about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And my other recommenders um, were people I either worked with or had, well, yes, they were all people who I had worked with who had seen me react to problems, and they were impressed enough to write me my letter of rec. So we were all very close. Kristen, you've been here for a hot minute now, and you've probably seen a good amount of veterinary students. 
what kinds of emotional situations are we seeing students face in the veterinary curriculum where they might need some extra help or they need to take a little bit more time for themselves? What can these pre-vets expect to face when they get here? That's a great question. When small moments and micro moments can feel really, really big and really massive. So with the emotional stability piece, it comes with, you know, each day I have highs and I have lows and they all kind of regulate and um, kind of maybe uh, balance out in the end. It's how well I, you know, live through those highs and remember them and how well I get through the low moments in order to kind of keep myself balanced and moving forward and not get stuck in those uh, moments that can feel really overwhelming. So I think a lot of times for veterinary students, what I've seen is um, whether the outcome is not what they wanted or someone hurt them or hurt their feelings, um, which can sound you know, kind of like, oh, somebody hurt my feelings, but essentially it's, it feels not great. Um, and so being able to work through those things and say, okay, is that you know, a really significant factor? Is that a smaller factor? What I hear you saying is emotional stability is about like balancing out a pendulum. We have our highs, we have our lows. How quickly can we adapt and move through each one? Yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, I think I see it a lot with like test scores because maybe there's fewer exams than you might have had in undergrad. And so, um, you know, it can feel like one, if you're kind of already a little bit unsure or if think something feels hard and overwhelming, we look for like confirmation bias in everything. So we look for it in some of the smallest of moments. And unfortunately, our brain holds on to negativity more than it holds on to positivity. So um, when I get a score that is not quite what I want it to be, it feels really massive and big and feels like this isn't where I'm supposed to be and all of those things, it's kind of a ripple effect. And we're thinking about test scores because that's one of the main things students are dealing with. They're mm-hmm. students, yeah. they're in school, they have a lot of pressure, there's exams coming every other week. These exams can affect if they have to repeat a semester, if they're gonna get that internship someday. So I think for pre-vet students, thinking about how you do react in an academic setting to your exams, to studying, learning about that. Kayla, for you as a DVM student, What kinds of emotional experiences do you feel like you're facing or your classmates are facing, uh, both within like testing, but other things? Like what comes up often? What are some of the themes that we're seeing when our emotions are going wild? So number one is definitely usually test scores. I like how Kristen touched on it earlier, but it's all about expectations. So you have, you set certain, you build this up and you set a certain expectation for yourself. And when you do, like Kristen said, not as well as we wanted, Um, It's really disappointing, especially if you're spending hours studying, days studying for this exam. It's so disappointing. And in that moment, that's usually where I have to work on my emotional stability. Also, definitely um, relationships come up a lot. Relationships between your classmates, relationships with your significant other. um, That's usually another point of stress for students. And that's also a reminder to everyone that vet school is not just about the exams. It's about the relationships that you build with everyone while you're in vet school. And analyzing how this interaction went versus another interaction can be a high point of stress for people. Kristen, do you prescribe to the con- the idea that having strong relationships is one of the foundations of having a happy, healthy life? Absolutely, because it can be really taxing or beneficial. You know, if our relationships are like in sync and aligned, then that can increase our resiliency and the ability to bounce back from, you know, kind of what we would consider to be setbacks. Um, and in contrast, if our relationships are not you know, where we would like for them to be, that can just be one more thing that we can catastrophize and say everything is overwhelming, nothing is good right now. So that kind of all or nothing thinking is where emotional stability can help out and kind of keep you regulated. And I, I'm, so what I'm hearing is some of the big ticket items are definitely how we're responding to that high, rigorous, intense academic testing experience, how we're managing our relationships. What about the animal side of it? Just working with animals who are in pain, working with clients who are maybe a little bit um, off, off the cuff. How, how do we think emotional stability plays into the actual general practice kind of day-to-day veterinary experience? I think it all goes back to how you respond to it. Um, Personally, like like Alex said, dealing with an irate client who is frustrated about their animal, you're frustrated about their animal, they're yelling at you. And just like Kristen said, some confirmation bias can come into that as well. So you start to berate yourself as well. And I think what 
that comes down to is you have to stop in that moment and recognize that you did everything that you could for your patient and that you're trying your, your best every day. You're showing up every single day. And once you kind of accept that, then I, start, you, I think you start going down the road towards emotional stability on the daily day basis. Yeah. So we were talking about clients and you said, uh, yeah. So I would say, you know, something that I think both veterinary students and pre-vet students can, you know, think about and start to build and work on is when you are working with clients or animals or whatever else, you know, in life in general, you really want to be the thermostat and not the thermometer. It can be really hard to go into a space in a room where someone is hurting or some, you know, someone they love is hurting and to go in and have to kind of have an emotionally regulated conversation with them. So building these skills before you get to vet school will only make it easier when you do get here. It's not gonna make everything easy. It's not gonna make it all you know, a piece of cake when you have to deliver difficult news or just have a challenging situation, but it is going to build up your resiliency and the skills you need to have those types of conversations. So I think about, you know, if I were, it's. Our brain kind of defaults to what we do the most. So we know that like the neurons that fire together, wire together, everybody's kind of heard that saying. And essentially it's just that they also wire together a lot stronger the more we do this thing. And so um, one example that I give a lot of times, which just by default kind of proves that or validates it, I suppose, because I can't come up with a better one. So I just keep giving it and then it gets stronger and stronger, um, is if I were to go to the gym every single day and lift weights with my left arm, my left arm gets really strong, but I'm ignoring my right arm. I don't want to lift weights with that one, so no problem. When I'm out and somebody is, you know, like we play baseball or we're playing a sport or something and somebody throws a ball at me, I am going to go with whichever arm I use the most, not necessarily which one is strongest and healthiest. So if I am lifting weights with my left arm, but I'm right-handed, and so my brain is used to using my right hand for everything, I'm going to put my weaker arm up to grab that ball. Like, that just doesn't make sense. So I have to be really intentional with either, you know, creating more strength in that right arm or using my left arm with which I'm going to catch the ball. So it's just making sure that the skill you want to use the most, you're really intentional in building as much as you can for, like, uh, a response. Do we think emotional stability is black and white? Like you either have someone who is emotionally stable and someone who's not. Does it look the same for each person? Where do we think the shades of gray come into place with defining someone as emotionally stable? So personally for me, I don't think emotionally stability looks the same for everyone. Everyone responds to stressful situations differently, and we should never really grade someone on how this person did versus this person did because they are all coping in different ways. I would say that personally, I think that as long as they're not harming anyone, as long as they're not harming themselves, as long as they have coping mechanisms that are healthy, you know, reading a book, going on a hike, things like that, um, emotional stability can look as big as a rainbow. I mean, Kayla, you're not wrong. When you said, like, each person is going through something or has been through something else, like, Uh, How could it be black and white? Because each person came from a different lived experience, different parenting styles. They're from a different area, different culture. Culturally, Mm -hmm. emotional stability can look completely different. So I like this idea. Kristen, what do you think? Yeah, I think emotional stability is very fluid um, and circumstantial a lot of times. I love, um, you know, uh, my Balak often does like a lot of mental health myths. And we tend to think that mental health issues are permanent and forever and kind of stagnant and fixed. And that's not the case. You know, there's a lot of situational things that happen in life. And um, sometimes it's, you know, the highs are not necessarily sticking around for a long time and the lows are not necessarily sticking around for a long time. So it does kind of it comes and goes and it can be very fluid. And it's it's uh, making me think of a quote you just shared with us about forever. Will you give that Alice in Wonderland quote? Uh, Sure. I hope I don't mess it up. Um, But essentially, I think Alice asks the rabbit, well, how long is forever? And um, the rabbit answers, sometimes just one second. So if you're in a moment, folks, and it's feeling like it's going to be forever, it's valid, but it is going to pass. And maybe that's part of what emotional stability is about, is that maturity to know I'm not going to be stuck in this place forever. And while I'm in here, what can I do to help my to help me get myself out of it? Kayla and I were talking about earlier that we both agree with. Uh, what do we agree about anxiety? Um, we agree that in, 
you stress about it for over two days, but then that there, it takes one second to do, and that's the best way of dealing with anxiety is action. Doing yes. that thing that you're anxious about. Yes, the dread feels awful in the moment. We dread, dread, dread. It take the dread is much longer than the actual act, but the antidote to anxiety can often be action. So if you are feeling maybe today emotionally unstable and things feel completely out of your control, maybe there's something that you can do to get out of that. Kristen. Yeah. Let's say a DVM student comes into your office and they're feeling, one might say, emotionally unstable, whatever that looks like for that person, because we've agreed that it's defined differently for each person. Yeah. What are some things that they can do in the moment to help them feel more in control? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, it kind of depends on just how overwhelming that anxiety feels. I think there's some grounding techniques that could be really helpful um, and really beneficial to kind of get us out of that survival brain. You know, whenever we're experiencing anxiety, our body's not sure what is a physical threat and what's an emotional threat. And those are kind of two different levels, but it interprets them all the same. So if we can help it sense some safety, then we know we don't have a physical threat in front of us. We just have maybe an emotional or psychological threat. Not to say that's not as equally overwhelming. Um, so doing some grounding techniques, which you can kind of find like online. Um, I love ice cubes and three, two, one situations. Um, I think there's also being scientists, like you're going into science for a reason. And I love science because it is really objective and helpful in these times. So whether it's in moments of overwhelm, um, it's maybe a little bit challenging because our brain again tends to kind of be Velcro for that negative experience or um, seeing all of the, the challenging things at one time. But you can also be scientists about it and get like baseline data and kind of objectively say, OK, I got a C on this exam, if that's what it is. Or if it's, you know, maybe it's difficult news with a relationship or a family member or health wise or something else. Well, how you know, how many times in life has this happened to me um, and what is like the ratio of positive to negative outcomes that I've had? Because there's a high likelihood, I would argue, that if you've typically been an A student and you've gotten the C, that C is really impactful. But history tells me that I'm capable of getting the A's and that I can get to that place and, and I have that ability in me somewhere, maybe not every single time. So I think right-sizing the kind of issue that you're looking at, um, and sometimes it is larger things of greater magnitudes, in which case you do want to kind of talk through it with somebody or have maybe some action steps that you can take in place. Kayla, what, what has worked for you as a DVM student when you are in the thick of an emotion? What is something that you gravitate towards in, in that immediacy? Um, the first thing I do is practice square breathing. So that's inhale for four, exhale for four, inhale for four, exhale for four. Um, and that's going to get me past my initial like burst of anxiety. And then I have a playlist. It's called my instant happiness playlist. Play playlist? Oh my goodness. And it's essentially all the songs that has ever made me happy ever. And I have it on shuffle. And that really, really helps calm me down in the moment before I can start processing my emotions and recognizing what set me off and how I can fix that. What about for folks who are trying to think about a little bit more long term a month from now, if they're feeling like they'd really like to start feeling a little bit more stable in their emotions, a little bit more grounded and a little bit more aware, what would we recommend that they do over the next month? Um, I think something I would add for today and the next month is uh, going outside. Just go stand outside for a couple of minutes. We know how powerful sunlight and vitamin D can be if you are able to um, get outside for just a few minutes. Uh, connecting with nature can be really impactful. And it doesn't mean you have to, you know, take your shoes off and feel the ground. You can if you want to. But just being um, outside and away from technology for just a few minutes if your lifestyle affords that. I think um, in a month also, we you could... Uh, you could very well watch, you know, something that is educational and entertaining, like the movie Inside Out, um, which Kayla mentioned was, um, I don't know, enjoyable and informational, I think. Yes. It's all about regulating your emotions. It's a Pixar movie, so you're going to love it. I highly recommend watching it. It really helped me figure out some stuff about myself. Yeah. And it helps, I think, just to even, you know, sometimes we understand ourselves better through relational, like, uh, relationships or context with others. And so if I see what, you know, sad or excited looks like in others, then I can connect to it a little bit better with me. Like something in me connects to something in you, which only builds our community and increases our emotional stability as well. And then in the next month, I would also say, uh, like Kristen was mentioning, something informational podcast. So Brene Brown has a few great podcasts that you can listen to, especially the episode about permission to feel will really help you understand your emotions. 
and in the pre-vet podcast in season one, I think we have, it's one or two, there's an episode about feelings as well. So get into the feelings work. Oh, I was just going to say there's another podcast called 10% Happier. I've which, heard of this. Yeah. Can yeah. help you connect. I don't know if you want to put it out there or not, but sure. it can. Um, we love it resources. Can, <laughs> it can help connect uh, and just yeah, be a little mindful and, and intentional because until until the positive becomes the default, we have to be really intentional in, in doing that um, to overcome some of those those lower moments. What could they be doing a year from now? What do we hope that a year from now we're looking back at this date and time and we're we're feeling what? What have we done differently? I think a year from now you've already built your routine. Um, it's something that's making you happy on the regular basis. And then also hopefully day one you're journaling and a year from now you can reflect back on that and see how much growth you've made over that year. Yeah, I agree. I think the journaling is a great idea, um, whether it's, you know, actually writing it down or putting it in your phone. Um, it helps you to kind of reflect on what you've experienced in the past, um, and it can sometimes take a little bit of the guesswork out of it. So when we recall memories, we don't always recall them accurately every single time. Our brain likes to play a little trick, and so that's a great way to kind of see, oh, this is how I was feeling then, and um, this is where how, I, how I've changed over the last year. Also, therapy. Um, I love therapy. I think everyone should go see a therapist at some point. Um, and I think once you've had that year to kind of grow and check in on yourself and really build a foundation for checking in on your emotions, going to see a therapist is a great step. We talk a lot about like self-care, I think, in the field of mental health and just what that looks like. And um, something else I would kind of add is, you know, there's so many different categories to it. It is not as, you know, a lot of um, news articles kind of let us know it's not just about like taking you know getting massages or taking love lovely baths or eating chocolate and things like sometimes it's doing the harder things that make our day-to-day -day lives better um that are a little bit more challenging and so i would say you know look up some some ideas about what self-care actually is all the different domains and maybe you choose just one to focus on for the year it could be you know budgeting which doesn't necessarily mean like restricting your spending it just means outlining something because i want to make a big purchase or i want to go on a really big trip um, it could be, you know, an emotional uh, category or physical, which would, again, involve the massages because not hating on massages by any means. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the eight or nine different domains um, of well-being and see maybe there's just one that you want to, to focus on. Focusing on all could be really overwhelming, um, but maybe that's also something that you journal about as well to see your growth. I agree. And also to add for any pre-vets out there getting ready to apply, I think that a really good one to work on is feeding yourself learning how to feed yourself in healthy and intentional ways and getting into those habits now because once you get to vet school, there's still plenty of time to build those habits, but it's great if you already have that muscle memory of, oh, I need to meal prep, I need to do this. And so when you're putting good stuff into your body, your brain's going to work better, I promise. Let's bring it full circle. Letters of rec. Kayla, soon, sooner than later, you'll be Dr. Shelley. That is true. Ooh. Kristen, somebody could approach you uh, asking either one of you to write them a letter of recommendation for vet school. When you are evaluating the emotional stability piece, what kinds of interactions, we've, we've talked about it a lot, but helping, you know, watching someone, how they regulate, how they cope, but what are some things you're looking for when you're evaluating that student on a level of excellent emotional stability? I would say um, in that first moment, let's say there's a scenario, a dog comes in, Either we did all we could and it might have passed away or something along those lines. I first thing I want to see out of the student is obviously you can have your moment of expressing your emotions. That's completely fine. But I want to see what steps you're taking next. I want to see you make a game plan. I want to see you reaching out to people and asking for help if you need it or offering help if others need it. I think those are two factors that I really, really would want to see in any person I would feel comfortable giving a recommendation to. I like that. I think I would also add, um, please don't make it where, you know, you're going to run the marathon first and then hydrate. You have to be training for it and hydrating in advance, similar to like your, your feeding yourself thing of building that muscle memory now. Um, I think about uh, just the self-awareness and, you know, does what you are feeling and experiencing on the inside kind of align with what um, others are experiencing around you on the outside as well. 
um, because you want to make sure that you are in this for the long haul, like in the, this work is very sustainable for you. And the best way to do that is really building up those skills now and just continually being introspective so that you can just learn more about yourself. Um, and if there's something that maybe feels scary, sometimes those you know big feelings can feel really scary, you can do it with a professional or even maybe a, a trusted friend sometimes until you get to the, the stage of you know going into therapy and things like that. Um, but most things, if not all things, I would say all things actually feel scary when they're unknown. Um, different is strange, unfortunately, whether it's healthy or not, that's it's always kind of how it registered um, upstairs in our brain. So if that's the case, then just reach out and um, see what you can discover about yourself. What big life advice? Do these pre-vet students need to hear from each of you? Something either relating to emotional stability or not, but something that has really helped you and you think could help them in their stage of the game when they're getting ready to apply, thinking about these big goals and dreams. What advice do you each have for them? So my big advice is don't compare yourself to others. And I know this is a really, really hard one, and everyone is guilty of maybe passing out those papers like, oh, my God, this person got this grade and I got this grade. I'm, it's over with. That's done with. No. You are your own individual person. Everyone is on their own journey. Don't look at anybody else's lane. Stay in your lane, and you will get there. I 100% promise. That's really good. I like that so much. Um, yeah, I think I would say just start building um, all of the habits you can now with some of these things that we've talked about. Um, because, you know, you don't want to be reading the instructions on a fire extinguisher in moments of crisis, like when the time has come that you need it. Um, so... Maybe it's the like just even try not to compare yourself to others right now, right? But you know before you're you're applying to vet school and um, yeah, gauging that kind of growth and whatever else you want to for yourself. Because comparison is is absolutely the thief of joy, and that was that was powerful. I liked it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I practice that on the daily in vet school, and I'm just happy I hit my goals. That's all that matters. Which because you're practicing it on the daily, it just becomes stronger and stronger in your brain, and then. Not only is it your default, but then when others approach you, which speaking of relationships, when others approach you for support or they are overwhelmed or whatever else, it's kind of your go-to to say this thing to them. And because they're seeing you live it, that makes it a little bit more powerful each time. That's cool. The romance between you two is just, <laughs> I am here for it. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the show today. Gosh, thank you. Thanks for um, inviting me and asking me and then giving me the best booth partner ever thank you thank you thank you Kristen and Alex I'm having my Beyonce moment right now and I love it well I'm Alex Avellino and we'll talk to you soon do you want to have a Beyonce moment though yeah do I do a riff what do I don't do? ask me you're the one who you, likes you, you oh Beyonce. My gosh, I, didn't, Beyonce. I didn't have anything prepared well I mean why don't you do the oh, okay. boy you know killing me so yeah Wait, okay so start at the beginning I don't know oh, okay you want to I don't know what song is saying. Um, Countdown, because that to me is a Beyonce moment. Oh, killing me softly. I actually don't know the words to that song. It sounded like a a ghost came out of your body. (laughs) (laughs) That wouldn't be the song I picked. Okay, but have your moment. Okay, we'll sit back. Girl, put your records on. Play me your favorite song. That's not Beyonce. Song. That's Corinne Bailey Ray. I know that, but that's the song I would sing. Oh, okay. In my Beyonce sorry, moment. Sorry, oh my sorry. God, Alex, you're sorry. ruining this for me. I just was shocked. I was like, I know that's not Beyonce. Can I add something to that? Absolutely. Thanks. Um, the only thing you need permission for in here, Kristen, is to feel. Yes, permission <laughs> to feel. Other than that, you can do whatever can you want. I feel? Carissa here. I'm the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. How do you respond when your circumstances seem too difficult to bear? What keeps you motivated when you no longer have your passion or satisfaction? Keep listening to learn about resilience and grit since working in this profession is often met with days that make us question our dreams. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school.
Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we are continuing on our journey to talk about the people skills found on the VEMCAST Letters of Recommendation. And today, I have probably the greatest of all time in the booth, Dr. Michael Scher, to talk about resilience and grit. Dr. Scher, welcome to the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Alex. Thank you. I'm really glad you got to uh, join us today because you know so many of the students, so many of the students and alum know you because how long have you been a part of our program? I've been here uh, going on 45 years. 45 years. And I like that our topic is resilience because you've clearly shown it (laughs) not only in the field, but staying at the University of Florida. So what year did you become a DVM, if you don't mind my asking? 1970. 1970. So you've really seen the entire profession maybe shift and change? I've seen it all the way. Yeah, and you've had to, I assume, shift and change with it. I've had to. And maybe that's what we're talking about when we say resilience, when we say grit. How do you define grit? Grit is the ability to endure, um, challenge that has its obstacles, but you find a way of getting around them and over them. Yeah, and and are we saying that those could be challenges and obstacles for yourself, but also maybe challenging others or or different ideas? Is it it both internal and external challenges? Absolutely. Now, I also want to point out that you're known in the college for two-a-day workouts. Is that accurate? That is true. So do you also feel like you've shown resilience and grit in your personal life and outside of the profession as well? You can say that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let's start talking about why do we even care in the veterinary profession if pre-vets have resilience and grit? Why does it matter? It's essential because it is a long, arduous road And you might have a plan, but you have to be ready for detours. Yes. I mean, they're going through undergraduate school, all of those really intense prerequisite courses, veterinary school, very intense curriculum, and then they become a veterinarian, and that's faced with lots of challenges. You're a small animal vet. Yes. What what do you think some of the big obstacles small animal vets face? One of the major problems is compassion fatigue Mm -hmm. Um, because each day is definitely going to have those moments if you're in practice. Because of, like how, can you maybe, can you explain how you've experienced compassion fatigue? Because I think we use the term a lot and how I've always defined it is compassion fatigue is when you care so much and you maybe start to get burnt out on caring because so much is out of your control. Okay, Um, I've been through a a few ups and downs over the years and what happens is that when you get whacked by an emotional situation and it almost derails you, you have to dust yourself off and say, okay, this was very unpleasant, it was very hurtful, but I'm here for the greater picture. Mm -hmm. And when it all comes down to the final count, you'll realize that you've done a heck of a lot more good than anything negative that would, that has its haunting moments. And um, interpersonal relationships have a lot to do with that as well. To Not having just, folks pick you up and, and feel better at the end of the day? Um, or the opposite, they can be complicated. It can be complicated. It, it, it gets down to uh, grit and resilience mm-hmm. um, because you have a mission to accomplish and you want to continue doing it. I think you're a spring chicken, but tell me, do you feel like you had this same attitude when you were a new vet, or did this take time to build this attitude and the resilience and the grit, or is it something that you were raised with? Well, I had those obstacles all the way back when I was a veterinary student, 
And um, the story goes like this. We were in a surgery lab where we would work on live dogs under anesthesia, but they were all survival surgeries. And one of the final procedures was to take a giggly wire and to manually break a, a femur and then pin it surgically. And my problem was I couldn't and it wouldn't break the bone. Because you felt like ethically it wasn't okay? Ethically, yeah. And uh, I got to where I just couldn't do it. So my professor came up and said, Cher, what's taking you so long? And I'd say, Dr. So-and-so, I just can't do this. It's just against my grain. He said, then are you asking to scrub out? And I said, yes, I have to. He said, you realize you're putting me in a difficult position because of how this might impact on your career with letters of recommendation for your internship, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I stepped out of surgery anyway. Ooh, yeah. that's a hard, yeah. so is it because you knew yeah. I'm not gonna be able to live with myself if I do this? That was, yeah, it was a matter of pain mm-hmm. and it was a matter of, um, your first dose of what life is going to be like out in the real world when you find yourself having to euthanize animals. Sure. Um, some of which won't be sick, but people are going to ask you to euthanize their pets out of convenience to them, and you're going to have to make a whole bunch of decisions. And through my internship at a very busy hospital in New York City, uh, I had those situations every day. It was rough. And it, it built, was really rough. It helped build the grit because you had to keep going. It helped build the grit because I still wanted to be a certain kind of veterinarian. At any point, did you think maybe this isn't for me? Yeah. it uh, Actually, um, I remember having the revelation of coming home from a date on a Saturday night. And I didn't have a car in New York City because it was too expensive. So I took a cab. And I said, wouldn't it be a great idea to be a cab driver? Oh, <laughs> what a different life. that You would have been a great cab driver. Yeah. I mean, you know, you meet interesting people. You, you sure don't, do, yeah. You don't, you don't have to euthanize animals. You sure don't. And um, a millionaire you'll never be, but uh, you won't have that pain. No. And so I thought about it and said, nah, got to go for the residency. You know, just now when you said like you wouldn't have that pain. Maybe that's how we can help folks define what grit is. Grit is pushing through the pain because you know that end result is worth it. Alex, survival is all about pain. Oh God. (laughs) Um, In various forms, Mm -hmm. emotional pain, physical pain. Yes. other forms of mental pain. Yeah. Uh, you got to get over it if you want to keep on going. It's just part of life. We should accept it. It's part of life. I mean, just look at the pain that uh, prehistoric man had to deal with. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, really glad I wasn't around for I that. I mean, like on a daily basis. And because it, of them, we're here. Either eat or be eaten. That's you right. Know? Yeah. And. Uh, so the grit piece is the survival, and then maybe we're saying how I'm kind of going to define resilience is your attitude through the survival. Attitude is essential. Yeah. And I, I see certain situations today mm-hmm. where um, the, some of the attitudes I see are, are, um, are big items of concern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I should say that you are in emergency and critical care. So you right. are seeing the DVM students. You're yes. seeing the house officers, faculty members, technicians, staff. And I am sure that not not at our hospital, because we're so fabulous, but people will have attitudes, right? You, you will definitely see that. And people can never forget the experienced people cannot forget that they are role models yes. for the other people in the room. Right. Let's talk about 
if someone were to ask you for a letter of rec for a vet school mm -hmm. and you saw the piece on the form that says resilience and or grit yeah and you're thinking about how you're going to score someone on a scale of excellent to poor what kind of interactions would you have had to have with that person to say they've got it they have excellent resilience and excellent grit to be very honest with you, I would not be able to fill out that recommendation accurately unless I actually worked with that individual and saw them in the trenches sure. with me, yep. worrying about the same things and hanging in there. Uh, if they were outside of that box, it would be very difficult. And I would say, hey, isn't there anybody else who might have who might have shared certain experiences with you who mm -hmm. could better write this letter. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that takes a lot of guts from a veterinarian to say, too, because some people will just say, like, okay, fine, if you need someone. So I appreciate that about you. It sounds like you have to spend time with this person. Do you think there's a – because our listeners, they want a formula. They okay. want to know how long do they have to spend with someone. Do you think that there's a set amount of time or it just depends on the experiences you've had? You could have that experience quickly or it might take longer. It's actually a matter of chance, of being, really? yeah. of being at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, there might be special exemptions to that for students who are working research projects with professors and they see them on a more frequent basis where opinions about that person uh, do come out um, eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're Writing a letter for a clinical program like an internship or mm -hmm. residency, you got to know what that person can do when things get get uh, difficult. Right. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite stories about you uh -oh. is the story about the the guy who tried to break into your house. Will you tell that story? Because that tell, tells me shows me resilience and grit. And like gumption? Well, <laughs> first, let me just uh, predicate that on my background. I was raised in the alleys of Chicago. Yeah, let's go. And uh, survival was being able to take certain types of abuses, and then eventually you had to learn to give it back. Yeah. So with that learning there were certain elements of not being afraid to take a punch in the face and have and, you been punched in the face and then getting back and giving it back no i'm that's yeah. that's wild i know that's I wild know, it's crazy but but anyway um it's not that you go through your life reacting that way <laughs> to certain situations but i did learn certain elements of defending myself which came in handy on a particular sunday um, afternoon, um, my wife and I were going to go to a movie, and uh, when we approached the car, my wife said, Michael, where's the lawnmower? And then we looked outside of the garage, and there was a guy trying to steal my lawnmower and load it into his car. In, the, in broad daylight? It was like at 1230 in the afternoon. <laughs> that is wild. It's crazy. So... I didn't even you don't I didn't even ask any questions because I obviously knew what he was doing. So I just had to take a offensive posture to stop him from doing that. Well, make a long story short, it ended up where I had to seek certain options mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, then he pulled the knife. Oh, ooh. And then I had to D disarm him and stop him from escaping in his truck. And all of that happened in real life. And do you think yeah. the reason, I mean, you said it, the reason you were able to do it is because how you were brought up. I was brought up where my parents said, you got to learn to take it. That's right. And then we're not telling you to be a bad person, but you have to learn to give it back. And to protect yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's part of why you do have resilience and grit maybe is because how you, your background, how you were raised. And some folks, God bless a lot of folks, I think 
right now, at least in the pre-vet realm, maybe haven't had those kinds of experiences? Most people don't. No, most people don't. Most people don't. And Which isn't a bad thing. No, <laughs> but, it's definitely not a bad thing. But um, I would say, I mean, like if you're going to be a veterinarian in practice, you can't uh, be that you can't show aggression. No, you have to take, stand up for yourself and take care of yourself. So let's say these students listening have not been raised on the streets of Chicago. And I'm sure most of them have. Most of them haven't. Yeah. What are some things that they can be doing to help build resilience and grit and that ability to keep moving forward even when those obstacles are pulling a knife out trying to steal their lawnmowers? Well, you know, they have to accept the fact that certain things have to come at a, a sacrifice. Right. And when you're in the medical profession and your life is dedicated to studying and learning and applying, um, you can't indulge in certain uh, pleasures that other people with less challenging careers uh, have the opportunity to experience. And you hope that someday your time will will come. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you have to sacrifice. You have to sacrifice, yeah. right. And it's not easy. I mean, if if you don't like difficult, don't do medicine. Yeah, right. Uh, period. Right, right. Yeah, period. Right. I don't care if you love animals. I don't care if you uh, love science, but to to love medicine comes with a sacrifice. Why is it difficult? Because it's all encompassing, it um, it it makes you it, it puts you it, it puts you in a a constant pursuit mm. of, of challenges. Oh God! Right? Yeah. You have to keep pushing. Learning. You have to keep learning. You always have to learn. You really yeah. can't say like I'm done for the day. Exactly. That's when you retire. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you're. You're you're all you're always reading. Mm. Uh, you're going to meetings. You're doing CE. Right. You're doing uh, charity work. You're doing something that goes above and beyond the textbook. It really is survival because if we go back to your analogy of you know prehistoric man, every single day was a challenge. Every day is what's going to come at me. Same thing in medicine. Absolutely. And the thing is, you have to understand. And it's difficult at a young age, but every every challenge is an experience, and every experience allows for further growth. So maybe we're also saying, okay, you have to accept it's going to be survival mode. Survival mode. It's accepting that challenges are coming your way, that medicine is difficult, but also what I'm hearing is this is just going to come with time. They need to just keep pushing forward through yeah. the obstacles, but then with time reflect back on them to see how they've grown. Now, there are exceptions. Okay. Let me give you a, a typical example. Uh, somebody who just doesn't want to live or live their life experiencing all those pressures on a day-to-day -day basis. So they opt out into a different direction of veterinary medicine. You have an example? Um, there could be uh, options for working in industry. Okay, so maybe we're saying industry because it's not really solving the medical problems on a day-to-day -day basis might be a good direction for someone who's okay. kind of tired of the challenge. Yeah. The, the, not the challenges, but the constant grind. Maybe options for graduate school. Okay, so maybe focusing a little bit more on just research teaching. Right. Okay. I, I won't say the military because you know it comes with that. Being um, in the military. Like, being in the military yeah. <laughs> and having to go through certain things besides You do. That's yeah, it's not medicine. exactly yeah. like you have to do what the yeah. military is asking you to do. Okay. Okay. But uh, some people do government work and they go into um, the the um, the uh, health service. Sure, and maybe more yeah. of the like um, the paperwork and the making sure I'm going into a facility and checking policies, a little bit more of that, less yeah. of the medicine. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't, and that's what veterinary school is for, figuring that out. That's exactly what veterinary school is for. 
that's what's so uh, great about the uh, type of college that we have because it, it lays out so many different options for so many different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And um, a person who is um, very, very sensitive, a person who just absolutely just can't dust themselves off after a fall and get back in the ring and, and keep on going round after round after round, um, you want to consider other options perhaps. I love this idea is that yeah. everyone, I mean, honestly, I don't think everybody can do veterinary medicine, but if it's your passion and you have the aptitude for science and you can make it through the courses, then come to vet school and we'll figure out where your level of resilience and grit fits in the profession. Exactly. I mean, not everything is go is <coughs> going into private practice or bust. Mm -hmm. um, right. There are many, many happy people yeah. out there who carry a degree and who love their work. But are not that just, are not are not practicing yeah. in, a, in, a, in a hospital. Okay, good. I, this is a great reframe. If someone's sitting there being like, "Well, I really haven't had that many challenges or obstacles, and I don't want to." Some people are just not into it. Hey, that's fine. Different strokes that's for different right. folks, and that's you know? fine. Yeah. Really quick, snake bites. Okay. Would we say that you're the king of well <laughs> poisonous snake bites I and how to treat them? Let me say I do have a great passion yes. and interest in it. Can you, for fun? Liken approaching snake bites to grit and resilience. How did those two marry together? Um, well, if you have a passion, then you'll strive to perfect it. And you've done that. No. <laughs> Dr. Sher, aren't you in like multiple no. textbooks about this? No. I, I I will never be able to perfect anything. Okay. And that's what continues to drive me. Oh, that's good. And that's resilience. That's resilience. And grit. Yep. Dr. Cher, we always ask our guests to give these pre-veterinary students who are from all experiences, ages, walks of life, big life advice. What advice do you have to give these folks listening? Ooh, that's a big question, Alex. Um... One of the main things I would say for every cloudy day, if you wait and you're patient, the sun will come out. That's so nice. I love that. So the feelings will pass. Have resilience. Get through the clouds. Well, Dr. Sher, I'm so glad you came on the podcast today. I'm so glad you came and talked to us about resilience and grit and students. Just keep building those muscles. Consider maybe a different area of the profession that you hadn't considered before if you know that maybe resilience and grit isn't your thing. But I think all of us can continue to build those muscles by doing two-a-day workouts like Dr. Sher. <laughs> I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. I also love that it's Valentine's Day for us. I feel like this, I know. that's perfect. I'm still blushing. <laughs> and I, I didn't wear anything red, but you're wearing a beautiful red dress. Thank and you. Very thank appropriate. You. Thank you. Very. Well, you are my, my veterinary Valentine for life. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. For... It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Being a true leader with honor and accountability is a skill that takes work, one forged through dedication and maturity. Today we are joined by two captains from the Army as they share what leadership means to them. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we are continuing talking about the people skills found on the VEMCAST letters of recommendation. Oh boy, do I have people in the booth today. Two service members from, guess what, the United States Army. I feel so patriotic. I don't think I've ever felt as much love for America as I do right now. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's um, an honor to be here. And of course, you know, it's incredible to serve this great country. Yeah, thank you both for your service, by the way. 
Absolutely. Thank you for your support. Will you tell us your rankings, titles, what we need to know about you? And uh, oh, I should also tell the audience, we're talking about leadership today, which is why we have these two service members in the booth. Who better to talk about leadership? So go ahead and tell us who you are and maybe hometowns. Okay, so my name is Captain Yuri Armstrong. I'm the director for medical recruiting for the state of Florida and Puerto Rico and um, southeast Georgia, which is um, specifically Savannah, Georgia. Um, I'm originally from the Caribbean island of Trinidad and Tobago, um, but I grew up in um, at the age of 17 in Miami, Florida. Hello, hello all. This is Captain Xavier Jones, originally from Queens, New York. I'm currently the deputy director for talent acquisitions on behalf of the healthcare recruiting. Um, my AO consists of Central Florida, North Florida, and Eastern Georgia. I'm sorry, but you both could, after you are done with the military, could have a podcast because both of your voices sound so smooth. So, both captains. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Do we feel like in the military, leadership is kind of a prerequisite? Do you feel like no matter what rank you are, because y'all are both captains, my understanding is that's a little bit higher than someone who just starts off, right? You've been doing this for a minute. But do you think every single service member has to have some level of leadership? Absolutely. I think that it is a necessity uh, for all service members to have some form of leadership. And I say that because regardless of where you begin in the military, at some point, the expectation is that you continue to progress and promote. So it's a necessity that you're continuing to develop uh, those skills in regards to leading other soldiers. Hey, and uh, Captain Jones, I, I agree with your comment. Um, and, and one thing that we we can't forget is is really leadership is is the antithesis of fear, right? And as leaders, we have army values, which is you know one of those are personal courage. Um, you have to be that one true thing, right? And observing from good leaders, um, like you mentioned, not so good leaders. I, I don't really like to call individuals bad leaders. Uh, more so, not so good leaders. And um, of course, listening to subordinates. Um, I tell you, you know, with regard to subordinates, uh, they are the ones who are are in the fight, right? And being able, as a leader, being able to listen, and when I mention in the fight, right, we talk about um, the Army as an enterprise, right, with different specialties. Um, you know, so when you talk to about infantrymen, um, they are the ones in the, in the, in the trenches, right? Um, and listening to them, trust me, they're, they're the ones who are going to tell you, hey, hey, this is how we can do it better, this is what I expect from my leaders, and this is who I want to follow. Ooh, there's a lot to unpack there. What's a backpack called in the military, like in the Army? Is it like a rucksack? That's exactly what okay. it is. We reference it as a rucksack. Let's, uh, let's unpack the rucksack there. So I heard that you're, there's an expectation when you join the military that you don't just get in and get out. You're, you're hopefully moving up in the ranks. So we're trying to encourage those leadership skills. But we're also saying that when we make it as maybe a higher rank, we're really listening to those underneath us, or we, as we would say in the, in the Army, the subordinates. Now, Y'all are both on here today because there is a scholarship, an opportunity afforded to veterinarians. Go ahead and talk to us about what they, what what are what is it? What do they? What can they do in the army? Yes, yeah, so so army vets we call them in the military. Um, they come in as commissioned officers, um, and one of the scholarships that we provide is a health professional scholarship program, um, which is a three year scholarship program um, for. Uh, students that would like to be veterinarians, right? Um, and what that consists of with regard to the benefits that we provide is 100% tuition paid for. Um, we also provide a stipend, 2600 and specifically $2,608 per month um, for that student to really focus on school and um, use that money to kind of offset expenses um, that way kind of beneficial to that student. Um, in addition, um, we provide them with a bonus as well, an accession bonus of $20,000. I mean... I'm sorry, that stipend is huge. What a huge opportunity for these students. And what I like about this topic is it's multi-layered because a veterinarian in general is expected to be a leader in the community, for their technicians, for their staff, for the clients, that's kind of expected. But now we're saying a veterinarian in the army, that's like doubling down on leadership. So here's my question to y'all. Let's say a five-year-old comes up to you and they say, what is a leader? How would you define leadership to like a five-year-old? Like something to really get it down to a concise bit. What is leadership? So I'll, I'll take this one only because I have a, a little guy that's close to that age. Um, essentially, it's you taking responsibility for 
yourself or a small group or enterprise or organization and ensuring the safety, the well-being, the best for each of the individuals and the organization at large? Yeah, in, in addition to that, I would say, and I'm not sure if a five-year-old will um, comprehend my um, All right, we'll advice, go older, 13, right? 13. 13 year old okay. Um, I would have to tell that individual that, that leadership is not really a, a one-directional approach, right? Um, you must know your team, right? And understanding your team in order to build those teams um, so those individual teams can create teams themselves, mm. right? It's really... Um, establishing that environment, right, where individuals can thrive um, in the workplace. Um, you must ensure that your your intent um, and vision as a leader is disseminated to the lowest level because what we see within the military as our leaders provide that guidance, that intent, that vision, we kind of keep it at the leadership level, right? And for that intent, vision, um, and mission to be understood across Echelon, it has to be disseminated to the lowest level. So communication is key mm. when we speak leadership. Are we kind of getting at, we're leading by example too? Like we're just making sure that the leaders and w their beliefs are being shown at all levels so that no matter who the person is, they see the values and the vision and the mission? Um, I mean, ab absolutely. Um, so I'll share a quick story with you with regard to leadership as an example. Um, and 100%, right? That's definitely the approach you need to take. Um, so when I joined the military um, 20 years ago, right back in 2003, you look very young. I appreciate that. Thank you. The army's keeping me young, right? <laughs> that's why. That's why um, these vets from the UF. Um, they should join. They'll, they should look, join. they'll be young forever. <laughs> they have a good career. Yes. Um, one of one of my leaders wanted to um, do a uniform inspection, right? If I may share this story, um, address uniform inspection. I know Captain Jones here un understand that the. The, the details and time it takes to kind of prepare for one of those inspections in the military. Um, there was a platoon, about 30 of us, um, and, and the leader stated the uniforms must be pressed. Um, awards, decorations will be in line with our military work awards and so forth, right? So it kind of be kind of, you know, understand that, hey, you earned this award, it must be on your uniform. Um, so the day of the inspection, the leader had... Um, you know, he showed up to the to the inspection and he directed us, gave us these instruction, but he had none of it, right? He didn't even have the uniform on. Wait, I'm sorry. I have to time out. You're telling me that the leader was coming in to inspect y'all's uniforms and wasn't wearing the uniform? And wasn't it wearing our uniform, right? And that goes back to leading by example, yeah. right? Yeah, okay, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, Captain Joe's know how time-consuming um, it could be to get ready for an in-ranks inspection, we call it, um, in dress uniform. Uh, I personally was surprised and shocked that the leader will ask subordinates to do one thing and not do it themselves. Um, for me, that was the very day that propelled me to move forward through the ranks quickly, right? It was kind of a, a, a instant, um, when I mentioned not so good leaders, mm, mm -hmm. right? Because for, for leadership, right, you kind of, kind of create your leadership style. And I took that example from that not so good leader and kind of in implemented to, you know what? This can't be happening. Yeah, it was like a right? catalyst. It was a catalyst, correct. Um, so I said to myself, I must be that leader in front, setting the standard for subordinates and peers. Mm. Um, in my personal and professional opinion, like mentioned before, uh, that was un unacceptable. And I think we all could agree to that, right? Um, lead from the front and by example, like you just stated. And most importantly, you must be a good follower, mm. right? Because when you take a look at the leader, right, not being in that formation leading by in from the front leading by example right as a leader you got to be a good follower and you mm -hmm. should follow your soldiers mm -hmm. meaning being in the same uniform at the right place at the right time um, to kind of understand and create that healthy climate or environment mm. um, and that's bottom line that's an attribute all leaders should possess yeah i had a supervisor one time who used to tell us at events she's like i've taken the trash out y'all are going to take the trash out too and i always that stuck with me i, I respected that would we almost reframe that that example of the time your leader came in not in uniform, which was obviously a mistake, that it's almost a good thing that happened because that encouraged you to move on? I kind of like that. Yeah. Dr. Captain Jones, what do you think? So it's it's funny because that's very directly correlates to a story that I had. Essentially, I had what we f frame as a toxic leader is what we typically call them. And... I approached my commander at the time. <clears throat> so commander's a, a O3, an officer. I was enlisted, I was a specialist, I'm an E4. And I essentially make the complaint to my commander stating that, you know, this individual is making 
uh, a work, a hostile work environment for me, making it very difficult for me to do what it is that I need to do. And I'll never forget what the commander said to me. It was a Captain Neil Lape, phenomenal officer. And he said, good leadership is good leadership and bad leadership is good leadership. <gasps> And at the time when he told me that, I was just kind of like, are, are you serious right now? There's no possible way that you're telling me that the example that this gentleman is setting for me is a good example. And as I continued to grow within the military, I understood what he was communicating was that bad example was essentially one additional factor for me to learn from to say, do not do that. Even if wow. I don't know what to do, I know what not Ooh. to do moving forward. And and it's, an, it's incredible just hearing that story, right? Because when you take a look at, again, de developing your leadership mm -hmm. style, developing your leadership approach, me personally and professionally, I've developed my leadership style based mostly on what not, not so to good, do. What not to do, right? Not so good leaders. That's huge. Absolutely. Probably 80% of my approach is observing what not to do. Oh, my God. Sometimes it's easier to learn from the red flags than the green flags. So y'all are really speaking my language right. here. And just seize that opportunity because I look at it as an opportunity to seize that opportunity to learn and grow yourself, mm -hmm. you know, to because that individual is replaceable and you're the person that's going to replace them. That's right. So one of the most important things here with the military is understanding the people within mm. your organization, mm. right? Know your boss. Mm. Know how to communicate with that individual. Really to the basics, right? Know how that individual receives briefings. Oh, um, you have to know your people and how they can hear your information. Absolutely. And same thing with the subordinates, individuals, right? We get, you know, I think, you know, and I know this is probably a fact that the military is probably the most diverse organization in the world. Oh, I love right? that. When you talk about different cultures, different backgrounds, mm -hmm. individuals coming from different countries to serve in the United States military. So getting an understanding and having that cultural awareness. And competency. Is, and competency, right, is and the, the cultural awareness, the competency kind of leads to that trust, right? Sure. And with that trust, you're able to communicate more effective with these individuals. Okay, so then let me ask you how you're doing this. Because what I hear is the theme is leadership is obviously about people, right? You have to be a great leader. You have to have the folks under you, but also they're looking up to you. There's a lot going on there. How does the Army train y'all to be people people? So essentially, the Army has a, a small um, set of opportunities where we, as we promote, will go to a school to formally learn, you know, what it is, the processes and the expectations um, when we get to that level. So, for example, uh, we both went to basic officer, officer leadership course, which was essentially part of the training as a second lieutenant. And then we actually ended up going to captain's career course together as well. So as you continue to promote, there are opportunities where you have to develop now in regards to establishing those people skills. Um, that's something that you have to you have to dig deep and essentially find out not only more about yourself in regards to your approach, but then also what approaches or what tools apply to which individuals because you can't use the same tool the same approach for each individual you have to make sure that you're managing it for the different types of personalities different motivations that you're going to encounter as a leader right leadership is essentially mark me if i'm wrong this is gonna sound terrible but if i'm gonna like boil it down isn't it kind of like how to make people do things it sounds so bad but like motivation getting them to follow you that's kind of it yeah, and, and you're right on, the, on, on, you hit the nail on the head there, right? Getting people to do things, and I'll kind of break it down, I'll define it a little more on how we approach it, right? Do you get to make people, the approach that you take shouldn't get, motivate the individuals to do things based on compliance, right? It should get individuals motivated to do things based on commitment, mm. right? And a drastic mm. difference there. So as a leader... Right. You have to ask yourself, are these individuals within your formation, within your organization doing things because it's compliant, being compliant yeah. or because are they committed? Right. So what I hear you saying is, are they doing it because they have to or because they want to? Absolutely. They believe exactly. in the mission. They believe in their leader. Ooh, that's hard. That's hard to get people to want to do that because you're dealing with so many personalities, different backgrounds. Uh, I have to assume you all are in in um, communication with folks that you just don't get along with. So maybe can we get some advice for as future leaders, these veterinarians? What's the advice as a leader for dealing with insubordination, right? Right. So yeah, it's yeah. insubordination. This is an act of an individual really not right um, abiding by the rules, the regulations of that leader, right, mm -hmm. and that position. Um, but for, you know, and we defined 
leadership are going to be speaking about vets, right, mm-hmm. in the military vets in the, uni- in the university is in, and in the civilian um, side or the sector. Um, but for me, my approach really is, um, and we, I think we've heard it before, you know, work-life balance, mm-hmm. right? Um, but me personally, I don't believe in work-life balance. Balance. Oh, hot take, hot take. Um, what is that? What, you got to go right. tell yeah. tag us there. What is that? What does that mean? So so work-life balance, right, is kind of understanding, you know, the, 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 the workload on your individuals, right? What you're really asking them to do based on, you know, the time, distance, right, the resources available. Um, for me, I kind of take an approach of a work-life trade-off. And I'll explain um, that a little more in detail. Um, as I said, trade-offs, yes. Balance, no. How do you measure balance with regard to a schedule, with work, with the people within your organizations? Um, so the work-life trade-off, you really take a look at um, what's important to each individual within your organization. You might want to say, okay, well, as, an, as a leader at that level, how do you understand and get to the ground with each individual within your organization? Well, one, right, you have those subordinate leaders within the formation that's feeding you that information, Right. We do something called a, a equal opportunity survey, right? Which is kind of a survey that you know is disseminated down to the lowest level, and individuals have that opportunity to kind of assess the climate and the environment within the workplace. Um, now, if you set a tough schedule and expect everyone to work around, um, you may find obstacles and constraints, right, for those individuals to work through. Now, if you are transparent with what the priorities are for the organization, it will lead to a conversation among subordinates and your team. Um, What is important to you will be important to them. What's important to them will become important to you. It's a trade-off that builds respect, trust, communication, and transparency across any organization. And again, that's my approach to how I kind of deal with and communicate with across Echelon. Yeah, so knowing what's important to them, making it important to you, that builds the trust. They want to like they want to buy into whatever you're selling now, and then it builds that relationship. Absolutely. So for me, um, I'll say, particularly entering into the medical field, and if you correlate what we do to what we would do in the civilian sector, we would essentially be medical administrators, right? Um, so we're we're familiar with different medical specialties, but we are not the experts. And what it boils down to, to make it very simple, is this. If you take care of your people, they will take care of you, right? And I find that it, it's even more important as we uh, acquire more responsibility, more rank, because we're no longer the specialist in that particular field, right? So if it is in the cards, and let's say he and I down the line are, are majors or lieutenant colonels, um, we do not have all of the tools and all of the knowledge for that level of responsibility, right? But if I'm taking care of everyone within my inner circle, if I'm making sure that I'm creating time for them to spend with their families, to make it to those occasions that they may not have been able to make it to if they were in the field, birthdays, graduations, et cetera, et cetera, right? I'm taking care of that person and it can go one of two ways. And this is my my IO psychology hat coming on, which it boils down to either they will take that time and be productive in a fashion that you desire, or what's even worse and could happen is if they don't trust you, then the time that they're taking that they would be productive for that organization, they're utilizing it to protect themselves, Mm -hmm. right? And that goes back to what we were saying is, is that influence, right? If I'm taking care of you, then I know that you're going to do your best and do your part, which essentially will cover everything for the organization at large. Do you guys say leave no man behind? Absolutely. Doesn't that kind of feel like what we're talking about here? Like leave no person behind on your team, make sure their needs are getting met, make sure you know what their needs are. Like even though these veterinarians, the majority of them are not going to become soldiers um, in the U.S. Army, but they're still doing the same thing. They're not leaving their team behind. So if you want to be a strong leader, invest in your people. They invest back in you. Absolutely. And, and you know, leave no person behind. It's, it's something that we live by. Right. And what, what do you mean by leave no person behind? Right. You know, I'll take any soldier. Right. That could display care. If I could see an individual that cares, if I know that a, a leader cares. Right. So from the bottom up, top bottom, I think caring is probably the most important uh, oh. attribute to have. Why? That's huge. Because I feel like in general, if I say to someone what makes a good leader, they might say something like either maybe they're dominant, they're powerful, they're influential. But we're saying caring is actually way more important. Absolutely. That makes, that makes Le- sense. Leaders, you know, 
that care, subordinates see that. Yes. Care about their life. And then they follow you. And they follow you. Care about their life. Care about their families. Care about the resources available for them to do the job. Um, Cam Jones, what, what's your thoughts on that? I really just wanted to, there's a quote, right, that we've heard multiple times while we're in the military. And basically what it suggests is no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. So wait, say it again for the people in the back. So so for the people in the back, if you're listening. <laughs> all right. No one cares how much, you know, until they know how much you care. Ooh, ooh, that's good. So checking in with your people. I will say we had a dean one time. He knew. I mean, he's essentially like the leader of the college. Right. And he would come around and make sure he knew every single person's name. And I'm telling you what, I'm like, I have so much more buy-in because of that, because it's, it felt like he cared. Or if we had had a conversation previously, he'd bring it up again later. And I'm like, dang, like he really listened. I feel that. And then I wanted to follow him. Absolutely. Captains, essentially, you could have a pre-vet working for you either in the office or who, you don't, we don't know. But they might ask you, can you please write me a letter of recommendation for veterinary school? And you get to the section about leadership. What kinds of interactions would you have had to have with that student to say they are a strong leader? In, in order for me to establish that, that someone's a strong leader, there's, there's a few things, right? So the first thing I'm going to say is listening. And I find that that's very difficult for people in general to do because you'll end up in a scenario where you're having a dialogue, you're having an exchange, and for whatever reason or another in today's society, I see more and more of if I disagree with you or you get me into an emotional state, I'm no longer listening to what it is that you're saying, right? So I, I, I cannot um, continue to support you because now I am emotionally anchored in this direction. So that makes it very difficult. Um, there has to be a metric for success. Right. And in anything that you do, in anything that you would like to improve, you cannot improve it if you can't say, hey, this is where I was and this is where I am now. So that's something that I would have to see from that individual that is, you know, essentially requesting my assistance is are they taking leadership seriously? Are they taking their craft seriously? Are they taking the steps to develop themselves? Because if you're not taking the steps to develop yourself, then how do you expect me to insert in this time, right? Because that's that's the ver that's the variable, the currency that we cannot get back, right? So you're asking me for my time, but you're not taking the time to invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. And then uh, lastly, I would like to see that time and that desire to grow and develop be a a habit. Right. It can't be something that's inconsistent or, hey, Captain Jones, I need this LOR for this specific scenario because I woke up this morning and I think that you should you should back me up. No, I need to see it on a consistent basis. I need to see it when you're coming to formation, right uniform, right attitude. Right. It's a consistent thing. It happens on a daily basis. And then I know this isn't part of a emotional piece, but it's a part of who you are. So for me, when I kind of take a look at leadership and uh, the potential of individuals, because we have to remember that, you know, as you continue to grow as senior leaders or as leaders in general, you have to look at the potential within your subordinates. And one way I measure that, as Captain Jones mentioned with the metrics, is what are they doing to seek self-improvement? What are some of the initiatives that they're taking to grow? Mm. What are they doing to impact the organization when they leave, mm -hmm. right? And if I can't see those simple things with regard to specifically self-development, self-growth initiative, um, the drive to succeed, the drive to make the place better than they, when they got there, right? That's a, a, a measurement that I utilize to kind of capitalize on the potential of individuals and their leadership skills. And those, both of those answers go for all humans, civilians and soldiers alike. What would we hope for today that these students who are listening right now? What is something they can do today to start either evaluating or working on their leadership skills? Uh, I would say a couple things. One, never turn down an opportunity, Ooh. right? Um, and that goes back to um, self-development. And opportunities usually, in many cases, come in the most inconvenient time, right? So, you know, your, your classes, you have a lot of um, um, classes going on. You don't have the time. Um, but make the time, mm. right? And when I say, you know, kind of seize those opportunities, for example, volunteering, right? Sometimes there's there's organizations that's asking for volunteers and then you're probably the busiest person on the planet. Um, but, you know, kind of take a step back, right? And take a look at your schedule and say, you know what? Maybe I could do, they're asking for two hours. Maybe I could do one hour What's today. What's your work-life trade-off? 
work-life trade-off, right, exactly. Right. right. And and the impact that you have kind of investing that one hour, it pays dividends mm -hmm. in the long run within organizations. Yeah. Come, Joe? So for me, uh, I'll cut it down to, to three things, essentially. The first thing goes back to what we were saying. You have to follow, right? Um, most good leaders are good followers, and you'll have those opportunities to end up in those scenarios where you may witness or experience something that fits your leadership style that you want to add or something that you say, hey, that's not necessarily the approach that I would take. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Then the next thing I would suggest is, is teaching, right? Because if you can teach something, then there's, there's a better probability that you've mastered that craft right so so te so teach leadership and then the last thing that I would say is that you have to challenge yourself you absolutely have to challenge yourself um, and you know I've heard some guys in the military essentially say seek suffering right because when you're putting yourself in those scenarios that are going to stretch you um, you're, you're essentially extending that that band that broad width so something that may have seemed much more difficult much more complex well if you're already extending extending that scope then it's no longer a challenge, right? Now it's, this is, hey, this is day to day. This is nine to five. I can knock this out the park with my eyes closed. Is there anything that we want them to think about a month from now, a year from now? Like if based on where they're at today, what kind of leader do we hope they are a year from now? So I would tell you, um, you know, a leader of tomorrow, a leader of next month, a leader of um, next year, I, I kind of would like to provide some guidance, if you may, right? And if anyone, right, as you said, in uniform, outside uniform could kind of take this path, I think they will kind of grow the leaders of tomorrow. So I would say definitely provide opportunities that empower others. Um, create an environment where others can thrive, right? That's your work environment, right? Ensure that's a healthy work environment for your subordinates and your peers. Um, listen, right? Just don't listen to respond, you really have to listen to the people within your organization. Listen to drive change. That's important. Um, and be culturally conscious, right? Understand the backgrounds within your organization. As I said, you know, speaking to the individuals for two minutes, right? You could learn their life within the first two minutes of that conversation. Um, this is enduring, as I mentioned, right? Um, as a leader of tomorrow, a leader next month, a leader from a year from now. So for me, um, within the, this upcoming month, right, if you're listening to this podcast, what I would recommend is that you find someone that you believe that's worthy of following, wherever that is. If it's in uh, your church, if it's in your workplace, if it's someone on your block that you live and you're like, hey, I want to emulate this individual in this regard. So establish that relationship. And then if possible, as you've continued to develop as a leader a year out from now, seek someone that you believe is worthy of mentoring. And, and, and I'm glad you mentioned about, you know, the, the following piece of that, right? And we mentioned it earlier in the podcast with regard to, you know, not so good leaders as I framed it, right? Take those not so good leaders as an opportunity for growth, for leadership, right? Do a self-assessment, assess them, right? And kind of in place, because again, you have to create your leadership style. A leader, it's not cut from one cloth, mm -hmm. right? You have to take those pieces, put it together, and kind of create your own leadership style. Oh my God, all of these students are gonna be such good leaders. I'm so excited and it's so important that we do have strong leadership in veterinary medicine because it is a difficult profession to get into and to stay in. So if we can have some students, some DVMs who really value the mentorship piece and being a strong leader, that's really gonna help, especially the underrepresented students, to feel like they have a path. So I encourage everyone to really listen to what the captain said today about finding a strong leader, then becoming a strong leader at others, and then if you're surrounded by the not so good leaders, taking that as an opportunity to kind of adjust your own leadership style to be the better leader that you wanna be. Because wait a second, where can they be all they can be? in the army that's right the army of veterinarians or the army of the united states of america and just one last piece before we conclude i would just like to say that the views expressed on this podcast are not reflective of the department of defense aren't exclusively of myself captain yuri armstrong and captain xavier jones whoa that's probably pretty important that you said that yeah yeah captain jones captain armstrong thanks so much for being on the podcast today thank you so much for this invitation it was a great opportunity i'm alex avellino and we'll talk to you soon Um, when you say seek suffering, are you trying to subliminally get me to do the skydiving with the Army? Is that why you're saying seek suffering?
perhaps. Yeah, I can tell. We're asking you to um, have some personal courage and jump out of airplanes. <laughs> and leadership. And then I, if I ask somebody to do something difficult, I can say I've also done something difficult. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. There it is. <laughs> Welcome back. It's Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Maturity comes from a deeper understanding and ability to see the larger situation. Being in touch with your emotions, with the ability to respond in a calming way and assess future consequences will give peace to your clientele. Keep listening to learn how to grow in your personal and social maturity. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and today my guest is a UF alum, Dr. Manny Lima, class of 2017. Uh, Dr. L, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. I'm a big fan. I have to tell you, I am thrilled to have you on here because I remember your class so well. Dr. L, can you please tell them where you went to undergrad, where you went to vet school? Obviously, I just said it, but tell us again. And then what you did post-grad, what you're up to right now. Yeah. So I'm originally from Cuba. Uh, I was born and raised there. And then I came with my family uh, when I was 15. So I was a sophomore in high school. And we moved uh, to Miami first, and then we went to Orlando. And then in Orlando, I went to high school there. I went to community college, and then I went to UCF, go Knights. Charge on. Yeah. And then um, got into my dream school at UF for vet school, and, you know, the rest is history. And just so right now, I went back to Orlando. I live in Kissimmee, and I own a hospital down there named Boggy Creek Animal Hospital. It's actually about to be changed to Flora Family Vet. Flora family vet. Uh, Flora family vet. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. Okay. And so um yeah, really excited and uh so I have a young daughter, she's six months old and And what's her name? Amelie. It's like Emily by A M A. Pretty. So it's like a French version of Emily. Uh, um so Amelie. Amelie. And she is uh, you know, like I was telling you earlier, I just uh I cease to be the center of the universe. Now I'm just a satellite around <laughs> that planet and it's it's amazing. Yeah. Good. Well, today we're talking about personal and social maturity. As Mm -hmm. y'all know, we're on season six of the podcast. Every odd-numbered episode, we have a veterinarian to talk about these qualities from the VEMCAST Letters of Rec. And Dr. L is a great uh, person to talk about personal and social maturity because you have had now vet students in your clinic. You've written letters for them. Mm -hmm. You have current students in your clinic. You have all these folks around you. So you kind of know who's mature Mm -hmm. and who isn't. Yeah. So why don't we start with... How would you define maturity? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I think that's um, when I think about maturity, not just in a sense of socially speaking, right? Like somebody's personality, but just maturity in general. Like when you're thinking about a mature wine, right? It's, it's, mm. it's a higher stage of development. Um, so it just takes, I think maturity is just a, it, it's, it's almost like a journey that you go through and you're just sort of peeling those layers and getting to your innermost core, kind of what drives you. And uh, so you become a little bit more, I think, connected to yourself, but also the world. And so you can see things with a different perspective, um, which allows you to react and be more responsible, you know, uh, the ability to have a response to something and in a correct way. And so that's how I would, that was a long- That's deep, answer, no, but, but no, it, that, that was good, that was so deep. <laughs> You know, you were telling me earlier, like you you do meditation, you do journaling. So it sounds like you're kind of tuned into maybe like a higher platform. And you mentioned a journey. And my question to you is, do you think it's linear or do you feel like sometimes with our maturity, we might get to a place and be super mature, but sometimes we regress. Do you think that happens? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it depends on what your journey is putting you through. But I always think, you know, when you're hitting adversity or you're heading into a place that's sort of unknown and scary. Like Mm. for example, me buying a hospital two years out, right. Uh, that was really scary, but, um, I went through different levels of maturity, but I emerged kind of a a completely different human being in a way. So, yeah. And so I think that, yeah, you can regress in your maturity. And I think it's, we regress when we forget to think about the important things, when we forget to, you know, practice gratitude in our lives or, you know, have something that we're connected to that is bigger than all of us. And you may call that the universe, God, karma, whatever. Uh, But 
I think you, you have to keep that at the forefront of everything that you're doing and doing and things that are important to you and maturity will come from that. So what's matured you more owning your own practice, buying your own practice or having a daughter Ooh. or are they different? Completely different. I think having a daughter to me, and nobody ever described it to me this way, but it's like falling in love. Oh, you know, um, you know, I, I, the love of my life is still my wife, and you know, she, she's the reason for everything. Uh, but when I had my daughter, I just sort of fell in love in a completely different way, um, and it's just I found this like well of love that I didn't even know existed within me, and so I've, you know, like I told you, I literally. I am no longer the center of everything. Everything sort of revolves around her and my wife. And so it made me mature in that way that like I, I cease to be the, the most important person and, and they are. And so everything that I do sort of goes towards that goal of like making them priority. And, um, you know, business really, uh, I think unlocked in me another part of myself that I didn't know was there because now you're responsible for, you know, we have 34 employees, right? Wow. Like 34 employees and that's their livelihood and their families. And I have to provide not only for my family, but all of them as well. And I, I have to create an environment that is inclusive and it has diversity and that also at its core is there to help animals. And how do we kind of do that in a really good way? And so um, initially I was sort of like a bull in a china shop, just kind of like swinging my hammer around and like, we got to do this and we got to do that. And you know, I realized that that wasn't really a good approach. So I had to mature and I had to become a more democratic owner that, you know, took everybody's in, you know, advice into consideration and um, let them all sort of shine. And, you know, I think the true measurement of a leader is that if that organization can 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 succeed without you, like you're oh, not even mentioned, that's deep. you're not even like. When you know, I'm I'm away from my hospital right now, but my hospital is doing really well right now. They're they're doing what they know how to do, and I think that's when I say, okay, I, I've done a good job as a leader. Is that they're not dependent on me. They're moved on, and that's the same thing as a parent, right? Like you want them to eventually be able to do that too. One hundred percent. There's a lot of, I think, mature moments that I'm hearing. You recognize that the coming in of maybe like a little bit more tyrannical was not working out, mm -hmm. swinging the hammer. Yeah. You recognize that it's not about you. Right. It's, that means if, you, if you're never mentioned, that means you set up the systems and the procedures and the policies. What I want to know is how did you know the swing and the hammer wasn't working? When did that moment happen? Yeah, well, it started really when I was, um, first graduated. And I started working as a doctor and, you know, I think there was sort of the imposter syndrome and the deep seated insecurities of, you know, I'm giving somebody a recommendation, let's say a technician. And I say, Hey, like I want to sedate this dog and here's the medication. Um, and sometimes they would question that mm. and, you know, I would react poorly to that, you know, and I think that that's how I, you know, initially just, like I said, swinging the hammer and, and really hurting feelings, you know, and, you know, I regret that, but I, I needed to kind of go through that to realize that, hey, like this is a team approach to this medicine and, and they have a lot of input, you know, and now one of my favorite things to do, I, I come out of a room after I did an exam and I turn to my technician and I say, what else would you add? Yeah. What, what are you thinking? And I bet sometimes and they I, give you good insight. Right. And then a lot of times they're like, well, what do you think? You know, it was a diarrhea case and I forgot to mention a fecal, you know, test. And yeah. then they're like, hey, what do you do a fecal? And I'm like, oh my God, that's <laughs> genius. Right. Thank you so much. You know, and so, <laughs> but they're so much more like, you know, collaborative and they're so much more appreciative. And, um, I just love that because I, I love to learn. I love to grow and I want to create that for them too. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, they bring a whole lot of knowledge as well and experience from being on the field. So, well, I, what I hear you saying is if you are going to be a practice owner, but even if you are a veterinarian who has technicians under them and you're not a practice owner, you need buy-in from your team. Right. And if you're running around trying to just be this like leader without getting input, they're not going to have your back right. when you need it. Right. And we talked about diversity and inclusion earlier today in the car yeah. and how we need folks from different experiences to weigh in. Right. And if we don't have the maturity to know that, we're going to make mistakes mm -hmm. and our progression in our practices is not going to get as far. Right. So let's start talking. And sometimes I feel like, and it can be more fun too, like the bad side of everything. Sometimes it's easier to say what isn't maturity mm -hmm. than what is. So tell me, what are some things that you see specifically with the pre-vets? Because that's our audience yeah. where you're like, ooh, they're not showing maturity today. What are some of the things you've seen in the clinic? 
Yeah, I think, you know, a couple of things. We've had some students that have come out, you know, to do externship, for example, or even some of the pre-vet students and um, not really being committed to the learning, right? Having this sort of growth mindset that I am willing to ask a dumb question because I'm so committed to finding the answer because I really don't know it. Mm. And that took me a long time to figure out, but I think the mature students are so committed to, I wanna become the best doctor that I can be, and I'm gonna ask questions left and right, and I'm gonna be involved, and I'm gonna you know, help, and I'm gonna do any, any job that they ask me to do, right? Like, you know, they always talk about the paying your dues and all that, and, but it, there is truth to that. Like, I think there's a reason why veterinary, veterinary schools require so much time for you to spend around animals and in animal hospitals, because you need to be able to read an animal, right? Like, you know, something I see a lot of times is that they haven't really worked in a veterinary hospital before, for example. And I go into a room and I'm talking to the client, but I'm also talking to that animal. Mm. That animal is telling me a story as well as the, as the, the owner. And if you're not tuned in to the animal, if you're not reading the cues, you're going to get hurt. Yeah. And the only way to really learning how to communicate with animals is spending a lot of time with them. You got to figure out the nuances. The way that a dog communicates is completely different than a cat communicates. And, you know, a cat might stare at you and a dog might stare at you and they may mean completely yes. different things. And so I think just sort of being committed to like, I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to learn as much as I can. I'm going to try to help as much as I can. And I'm not above any kind of job. Yeah. Um, and I, I started like that. I was a kennel, kennel technician. Eventually I became a technician. And then after that, I went to the vet school and, and thank God I had those experiences, um, to build upon, uh, because otherwise, you know, I, I would have been in trouble. And, and some of the students that I see, because they're not doing that, I think that they are in trouble. They're sort of like, you know, the other thing I think that, it, you know, we see a lot is the, the work ethic. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes kind of lags behind. I think some students, you know, kind of come in and, you know, sometimes we may have to work through lunch, right? And and that's what's required because there's an animal that needs you, right? Like that owner called at 11.30, right before 12 o'clock when we go to lunch, and there's a block cat that's been blocked for two days. Like, I've never been not able to pee for two days, but if I couldn't pee for two days, That'd be miserable. man, I can't pee for yeah. two hours. Yeah. Like, I'm in, like, distress. Yeah. And so, you know, I am totally okay, and I hope that my team is too, that, you know, we may miss lunch today, but you know what? That animal is going to feel so much better, and that's what at the core of what we do, right? Right. Okay, there's a good, a good bit to break down here. So asking intelligent questions shows maturity. Or not even intelligent questions, just asking questions. Yeah. Because sometimes you just don't know, and so it shows maturity if you're willing to ask. Because some folks walk around with maybe some pride, I know everything. I don't need to ask. Mm -hmm. Get curious. Get involved. Yeah. And then, like you said, being able to read animals, a piece of maturity is just literally time and experience. Right. You can't just walk onto the clinic floor on day one and understand everything. Right. You need to have built the muscle of spending time with the animals, understanding the field, making sure you know you want to do this, all right. of that. And then the piece of there's something more important than me. Mm -hmm. There's something more important than my schedule. Yeah, Y'all are picking a profession that is a caring profession. It's an emergent profession mm -hmm. where if something comes in the door, you might have to skip lunch. Mm -hmm. You might not be able to leave every day at 5 p.m. Yeah. Because your clients are depending on you. Right. Are there other things that it's like, I can tell that student's really mature. They're, they're the mature wine that we're talking about. How do you know that they're well seasoned? Is it always an age thing? Because I have to assume there's some 19 year olds who can be more mature than a 40 year old. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, life experiences, like you said, are going to be huge and how you learn about, you know, um, how to deal with different situations. I think the other thing that I see a lot of, especially from some younger uh, pre-vet and just younger people in general is not understanding um, like what might be going on in the client's head you know, when they're getting upset about something. Like emotional something. intelligence. Emotional intelligence, I yeah. think is huge. I yes. think, you know, you have to be really in tune with that because at, at our core, we're not just doctors, we're healers. Yeah. And we're not just treating an animal, we're treating the families as well. And at any given day, you're going to be walking through somebody through probably the worst time of mm, their life. For sure. You're about to lose your best friend. The animal has been with you for 15, 20 years, if you're lucky. Uh, you know, the animal that potentially was that client's son's mm. dog mm. and the son passed away. For and sure. now they're like, yep. you know, this is the last link. Yeah. And, you know, they are breaking down emotionally in front of you. And so how can you be there for them? Um, and I think that that's 
it's a beautiful thing. It's a heartbreaking thing. We get our, I get my heart broken all the time. I cry in euthanasia all the time because how can I not? And, you know, I think crying, you know, in my community, when I cut, where I come from was kind of a weakness. I always was taught, but now that I've gotten older and maybe more mature, I, I see crying. I, I think it was, um, was it Ted Lasso? There was like a new episode and it was talking about crying is, is, is uh, rain for the soul. Oh, and so that, yeah. And sometimes you just, you got to let it out. You know, mm. I think sometimes when you're not mature enough, you feel like you got to be the doctor and you got to be putting a strong face mm. and you got to be the one holding it all together. And you got to let it, you know, sometimes you're feeling that emotion. Hey, I, I, I feel like crying. I'm going to cry and I'm going to cry with them. And they're so appreciative of that. You know, you're the first one kind of taking that first step. And then now everybody's like mm. synced in. There's so much to unpack here because we're <laughs> almost talking about cultural competencies at this point. Yeah. Because so would we say like in Cuba, how you grow up that toxic masculinity mm -hmm. energy? Oh, yeah. And so what I am now hearing, because in Cuba, potentially, if I'm a male doctor who's crying, they might say immature. Right. But in the States where you are and how you've built the culture of your practice, yeah. it's like that's actually a mature man right there. Yeah. So maturity can also come down to like in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. That's tricky yeah. because depending on what vet schools you apply to, what practices you go to, they might all be defining maturity differently. We were talking about the profession right now yeah. and how we are kind of seeing the need for a balance between our personal needs and mm -hmm. wellness, but what the profession needs. Right. And potentially a sign of maturity is when folks can put their needs on the back burner when it's appropriate to do mm -hmm. what the, the profession needs for that moment. What, what does the client need? Like you said, the block cat, like, yeah, we might be having a bad day. Yeah, I haven't eaten lunch yet. And yeah, yeah, you're gonna eat, you're gonna eat. Yeah. But you do have to have a thick skin and maybe put that client's need before your own, don't you think? Right, and I think it's like you said, it's a balance and, and every day it's a, it's a gliding scale. You know, I think you can't keep doing that, that, that selfless, you know, without taking care of yourself. No, you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of yourself first. You know, for me, that looks like, you know, waking up really early in the morning. Yes. You make, tell them your schedule. Cause I think yeah. that's important because what I hear from a lot of people is I don't have the time, right? but like you're making the time. So will you tell them your schedule? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I, you know, working as a doctor, you know, at the beginning, when I first bought the practice, you know, we went from four doctors to two. And this is in the middle of the pandemic. Mm. And every hospital around us is closing their doors or maybe not seeing new clients. Most of the clients we were seeing had called eight or nine hospitals and they're all getting turned away, even from their own hospital they normally go to. So to me, that was an opportunity for us to be a leader in that community. And those animals were going to suffer if we didn't do something. And so as an organization, we decided to do that. But I'll be very frank, like I hit the wall multiple times in the last few like years. Burnout. burnout, yeah, huge burnout in, in terms because, you know, I, I'm working seven days a week. You know, I'm working six days as a doctor and the seventh day is a Sunday and I'm working as a manager, as an owner. I'm coming in and painting the exam rooms and I'm doing all these things. And at the beginning, you're like, you know, yeah, I'm going to do this. But after you've been doing that for three or four months, you're literally fried. You know, you just, you, you're just feeling yourself getting angry and you feel yourself getting, you know, pissed off about things that didn't used to piss you off. And it's because you're burnt out. And so I had, I knew I had to dial it back. I need to, you know, find a little bit more balance. You know, we started finally hiring some other doctor we were looking, but it was tough, you know? And so, and I realized that I needed a better, it, I couldn't just not show up to work. That wasn't an option. I just couldn't say, well, I need a mental health day. I'm not going to come in tomorrow because I have a full book of appointments tomorrow and a full book of animals that really need me. If I'm not there, nobody's taking care of them. And so I needed to find what was my balance. And so for me, I just decided I did a few things. Number one, I got off social media. I just eliminated. Ooh, say it again. I got, I got off social media. I know that, you know, a lot of people love Instagram and Facebook, but I think, you know, it's completely constantly i saw so many people that weren't having that great of a life but they were posting all about these yeah, that things drives are, me bananas. you know it, it that's what happens you're just trying to show your best self and you're comparing yourself to other people's best self which is not really their best self it's just their highlight, highlight reel, reel yes. yeah like they say <laughs> yes, yes. and so you know I, I just took myself off of that and that was fantastic you know i try to decrease the amount of screen time that i was doing to myself and then i realized that i needed to get some sleep that's really important for me and so 
you know, by 9 p.m., I'm, I'm already in bed and trying to trying to get some Z's. And, and then I, so I wake up at 5 in the morning every morning now, and then I go for a run or a walk or just a little something around the neighborhood with my dog. Um, I meditate for 10 minutes, and then I write on my journal if I have time, and then I make breakfast. So my first um, – I have to be at work at 8 a.m., but my first three hours is literally just self-care. Mm -hmm. It's just like how – what kind of day am I going to have today, and what was what's my intention for today? And then I'm going to show up to work and then I'm going to work hard and then I'm going to get some sleep that night and then I'm going to do it all over again. Um, and I found that I started having more energy. I started having more passion for what I was doing. I didn't feel those feelings of anxiety and depression and things that, you know, I just felt like, oh, I'm, I'm back to myself. And it goes it comes and goes. You know, sometimes you're going to hit a wall again. You're going to you're doing a little bit too much again. You got to dial it back. And then you feel rested and then, and, and then also find like, what is the thing for me? I love quiet time. You know, my drive here was two hours and it was just literally no music. Wow. Nothing on the, it's just literally me sitting there <laughs> for two hours. That is definitely like <laughs> making so many people feel anxious right now listening to this. Cause a lot of people can't do it, but if you just love breathing. it, yeah, I just, I just, you know, taking deep breaths. And sometimes I would think about an email or something I had to do. And I was like, you know what? I'm not doing that right now. I'm just driving and I'm just enjoying so much this sure. moment. So and so, sure. um, and I'm not great at it. I mean, every now and then, you know, I, I fall back and you know, I, I still, I'm not on social media, but I'll go on Reddit and, you know, and, and just then every fun. now and then, you know, you see a video and you're like, man, that was that did not put me in the right headspace. Like, I need to get off of that. Totally. And, and so that that's kind of what I do now. Well, what I hear you say is you made choices that you could control. Mm -hmm. This was like an internal shift. Yeah. I'm not hearing you go try to change things externally that you can't control. No. I'm not hearing you say, OK, we're going to shut down the practice on this day because I need a mental health day because no. you value the clients more for that. And so you just adjusted your schedule. Right. I know a lot of y'all listening aren't morning people. Find time to do what you need to do that helps you recharge. Trial and error. Mm -hmm. See what works for you. It might not be running, meditating, but it, find something. Yeah. We can all make the time. Yeah. There is time for it. A ton of it. Dr. L, let's say a pre vet comes up to you in your clinic. Laura Animal Hospital, what is it? Laura Family Vet. Laura Family Vet, FFV. Yeah. And they say, Dr. Lima, I've been working with you for eight months now. I've loved working here. Do you feel comfortable writing me a letter of rec? Yeah. You go to write it. You come to the part about personal and social maturity. What kind of interactions would you have had to have with that student for you to say they have excellent personal and social maturity? That's a great question. Uh, I think for me is how were they interacting with my team? as well as, you know, the patients and clients, that's huge. You know, do you have that emotional intelligence to really have empathy and, 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 and be there, you know, not only as a, you know, I'm going to be a vet, so I'm sort of above everybody else. No, I'm, I'm there and Ew, I'm part yeah. of the team and, you know, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. And so I think that's really important for me when I'm, when I'm writing that, that recommendation. And I've had people that have asked me to write a recommendation. I've said no, cause I, you know, I can't write it or recommend them. That's mature that you said. Yeah, that. I just, you know, I just feel like, you know, I, and I tell them, I'm like, here's I haven't seen enough from you. And here's the parts that you need to kind of improve on. Um, so I think it's just how they show up every day. You know, do they buy into those values? Are they showing those values, you know, of honesty, integrity, uh, hard work, um, teamwork? Uh, you know, those things I think are really, really important. And how do they deal with diversity? You know, I think that at, at its core, it's the most important part, I think, of being a doctor. I know, me too. Yeah, because like, you know, I think, what was it, Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? <laughs> like, right? And, and I and I, I don't mean that like figuratively, although you could, but you yeah, know. an angry client. Sure, you know, or, or a, a dog. Rottweiler yeah. just like yeah. jumps at you, but um, what happens when shit hits the fan? Amen. How do you handle yourself? Right. Do you take a deep breath and you say, am I a leader here? Am I going to show? I had a, a case um, in our hospital that, you know, one, uh, it was during COVID and they were doing, um, we were doing curbside and then we had two bulldogs, uh, boxers actually, in one of the rooms, the exam rooms, and they were by themselves. The technician stepped out for a second and one of them got really worked up. And when they opened it, the dog just like came out and started going after all the technicians, like literally. Oh, that's like scary. Started, yeah. And so, you know, 
there were people in the hospital that like ran and there were people in the hospital that kind of stood their ground and, yeah. w- and looked for like solutions. You know, there's a fire. Where's the buckets of water? That's right. right? That's and right. so I, I always look for that. Like, what are they going to do when school is really tough? Mm-hmm. You know, and are you going to call out because, you know, you didn't schedule yourself well enough or you didn't study like you should have? Um, or are you going to show up and you're going to do a good job, right? Not, not just be there, but like do a really, really good job. And so I think that that, how they handle adversity to me tells me the most because vet school is adversity. And, and beyond that, I think vet school was the easy part for me, you know, in undergrad, I had multiple jobs and then I had to get A's to get into vet school. And so when I got to vet school, it was like, I don't have to have a job and I can just go to school. But then I graduated and like, that first couple of years, that's another thing with young grads that I see now. It's that they want this work-life balance. And you have to decide right now what kind of doctor you want to be. You know, do you want to be a great doctor? Do you want to make a difference in the animals' lives and their families? Or do you want to have a great work-life balance? Because you can't have two, b- both. You know, in that first year, I had in my pocket of my white coat, my iPad the entire time. And sometimes I would be in a room and they would ask me a question. I'm like... I'm so sorry, I don't know the answer to that, but let me get back to you real quick. And then I would come out, literally open my notes. I had all my notes in there and I would look at it. And if I had a condition, let's say diabetes, that I'd never treated before and you know, I had a case that came in and I just felt like I didn't do that great of a job, I would go home and that night for like two or three hours, I would study. I would study every single thing. I, I you know, dermatology, internal medicine, surgery, emergency, anesthesia, all of those notes that I had, I reread them for months on end for that first year. But it, it gave me an advantage because by the time I was in my second year, there were so many things that were coming in and I'm like, I know what that is right. and I know how to treat it and I can make that split second decision right. versus the people that like are coming in now that they're just like, well, I, I, I just work 12 hours and I don't want to study when I get home. So for this for today, what do we hope our audience can do today to help either evaluate or increase or reflect on their personal and social maturity? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me, and it was scary at first, uh, but the thing that I always tell all my previous students is find opportunities for leadership. I think when you put yourself in a leadership position, whether that's in your pre-vet club, you know, maybe you're running for office and you become the treasurer or the president or whatever, um, or it could be in your organization and maybe you're a kennel, kennel technician, but they need help instituting a fear free, you know, um, you know, like a program, know, a program yeah, in, the, yeah. in, the, in the hospital, like take step it upon up, yourself step to step up. But hey, I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put a little bit of extra on, my, on, on me because when you start putting yourself in leadership positions, I think that makes a huge difference because you got to show up for other people. Mm-hmm. It's not just you. It's you and the spotlight. Right. Because when you're a leader, you're seen. And if you're seen, you can be hurt and you can also be judged. And you got to be wanna, on your game. You got to be on your game. You yep. can't just show up and do a half ass job. And right. so um, the other thing I think is constantly being relentless in terms of figuring out what is it that you're putting into your everyday life. Like what a, if you're on social media a lot and you're seeing negative things or if you're, you know, at home and you're watching TV and you're watching things that are just, you know, depressing you or, or yeah, yeah. be extra, extra careful about everything that you're allowing yeah. in your sphere and the people as well that you allow in your sphere. There's friends that are going to be friends from high school who are holding you back mm-hmm. and you got to be mature enough to say like, hey, this is not bringing anything to my, my, my yes. life anymore. I'm going to say no to this anymore, you know, going forward. And then the other thing is going to be reading. For me, reading has always been part of my life since I was little. So I'm constantly either listening to a podcast or reading something that makes me like think mm. about things in a different way. Yeah. How can I grow uh, yeah. and learn from somebody else? So, so we're, we're putting helpful things on our plate, leadership, podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. We're taking negative things off our plate. Those are toxic relationships, maybe yeah. the social media, the things that are hurting us. Yeah. Be mature enough to know what's going to help you and what's going to hurt you. Yeah. Where are you going? You know, what's your North Star and, and what's going to help you get there? So I love that. Dr. Lima, we always ask our guests to give like one big piece of life advice. I feel like you've given them so much good advice so far. But yeah. what is one more thing, whether to deal with personal maturity or not, that you're like, they need to hear this from me. Maybe I'm the only person who can tell them this. A really good documentary on um, Netflix from Jonah Hill, and it's called Studs. And it's about his 
um, therapist. And he said, there's three things in life that you can't get away from. And basically he said, hard work, heartache, and hardship. And he said, those are a constant of life. You're never going to get away from that. You, you, you have to stop running away from that. You have to sort of embrace that as part of your, you know, like that's going to be part of your life always. And it's part of the price we pay for being alive. You're eventually going to say goodbye to every person being in your life, or they're going to say bye to you. It's, you know, we're all going to die. And I know that sounds really morbid, but our job and as doctors, we see that every day. Our patients die. You know, we see family members that die or even clients that die. Like, and so that makes us remember that, you know, don't sweat the little stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. Remember that just being right now, me and you having this conversation, I'm so grateful for it. You know, this is such a beautiful moment to share with you and that I get to, you know, just be privileged enough to be here and um, hopefully give some sort of advice. But, um, you know, I, you know, continue to have that gratitude in your life. And don't forget that, like, don't 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 be so worried that, like, hey, you're, I'm going to work really hard this week. That's OK. You know, you're going to have your heart broken by, I don't know, how many people or how many situations. And that's okay, too. And you're going to recover. And each time you're going to become a little bit more mature, a little bit more developed. And you'll learn to appreciate life a little bit more, I think. Uh, And that's what my journey has taught me. So. And that, in a nutshell, is why Dr. Manny Lima is one of the favorite graduates of UFCBM from the Office of Academic and Student Affairs. Do you want to say anything to your baby daughter before we get off this? Because she might be listening to this, like, you know, oh, five, five years or more. Oh. Like, what would you tell little Miss Amelie? Oh, I just, I would say that she's just uh, the most beautiful thing I've ever laid eyes on, except for my wife. You know, they're both in that, I would say, equal. Um, but that I hope that, you know, I, I do a good enough job as a dad to, to raise her to be resilient and to find something that really gives her passion in life, just like veterinary medicine does for me. And uh, she gets to make a difference because at the end of the day, I think that's what we're all here to do, you know? And so, uh, and that I love her very much. Oh my God, so good. Well, Dr. Lima, thanks so much for being on the podcast today and making time in your busy schedule to, you know, talk with our students, visit with friends from the hospital, come onto the booth. So I'm so glad we could talk about personal and social maturity. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for everything that you do. I think this is fantastic. And uh, yeah, we're, we're very lucky to have you. So thank you. Yeah. I'm Alex Avellino, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. This is, this is live? No, oh. <laughs> I'm going to edit it. Thank All God. right, ready? Yeah. Hey, friends, it's Carissa, the UFCBM communications intern and pre-vet student. Today, me and Alex just finished recording the last episode of the season focusing on self-awareness. I'm so excited for you to listen to me and Alex talk about growing in who you are, loving the people around you, and finding ways to take advice from other people and mold it into making you a better person. Thank you for joining us on the season, and I'm so excited to share with you guys a little bit about me and a little bit about how to grow. Welcome to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, your tour guide on the journey to becoming a veterinarian. Listen along as we provide you with tips, tricks, and tales on applying to veterinary school. Welcome back to the Pre-Vet Podcast. I'm Alex Avellino, and we are... I can't. I'm not even going to do it the normal way, Carissa. I'm going to. We are finishing up the pre vet podcast, period. Like, the last one. The young people say that, right? Period. Y- yes, they do. They. Mm-hmm. This is the literally the last one. I know it, guys. I don't know if you know this, listeners, but I have been saying that the podcast was going to end for after season three, four, really? and five. Yes. I kept being like, we're done. Like, we, we wrapped it up. We've done everything we can, Aww. which is a good life lesson to everybody that, like, never say never. And, Wait a minute. There's a lot going on here. And I feel like this is... Okay, hold on. I'm facing Carissa now. Okay. Okay. We're in it. First thing I should say is we are finishing up the season about people skills, personal skills. Carissa, what is this episode even on? This is self-awareness. Mm Self-awareness. So Carissa, my fabulous spring intern, is here with me. You know her because she's introduced every episode this season. Every single one. (laughs) So I said to Carissa at the beginning of the season, like, oh, you and I should do an episode together. And then we decided to do self-awareness. And then I come to find out this really will be the last episode because oh, I know I am leaving Heartbreak. the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. It's too soon. Is it? <laughs> is seven and a half years too soon, Carissa? Feels lengthy to me. 
I don't know, everyone I talk to is like, it won't be the same without Alex. And they're pretty heartbroken. I mean, yeah, it's definitely going to be, it's definitely going to be different, but it's not going to be, that's not a bad thing. You know what I mean? But, but I think my point here is I've been saying never for so long, or I've been saying it's over and then I kept doing it. And I want to, this, this goes along with self-awareness because (laughs) we should know ourselves to know do we really stick to something if we say we're done? True. A lot of us, I'm, hello, relationships. <laughs> you know what I mean? Alex. Did that hit too close to home? <laughs> relationships or um, for me too, when I graduated with my bachelor's, I said I would never go to school again. And then 10 years later, I decided to get a master's. And you work at a school. I work at a school. <laughs> and so like, where was the self-awareness there? You know what I mean? But yeah. now self-awareness comes down to like reflecting on our behaviors, our patterns, our emotions, and seeing who we are. But my point to you all is, Really never say never because if you say never and then you're wanting to make that choice later, it's going to make it harder. Every time I pick the podcast back up, I was like, oh, I said I wouldn't do this again. And then I had to like go through those emotions. And you killed it. Thank you so much. Have you experienced anything like that where you're like, I'm not going to do blank, but then you end up deciding it was the right choice and you do it? Um, I feel like I try not to say no. To I was a lot of literally things. gonna say you're yeah. not a you're not a naysayer. I'm definitely not. I'm just a give it a go kind of girl. You are, and we just see what happens with it. Oh, well, and I think I'm glad that you and I are talking about self awareness because I think you have high self awareness because every time you've told me something about you, if I'm like, oh, tell me about yourself, or when we talked about this position, you're like, here's who I am, and then you followed through with it. Do you think you have high self awareness? I think that self-awareness is a difficult topic for me. Mm. Um, Yes, because I think a big part of self-awareness is being aware of who you are, but also listening to the feedback of those around you and how they see you. And I've had a lot of like sit down moments with my roommates this past year about like me growing and my self-awareness and who I am and having to have intervention from them to grow as a person. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, heavens. Okay, so I want to break some things I down. It's like a big statement. Shoot, that's what that was a large. Also, yeah. kudos to you for even saying that statement out loud and feeling comfortable sharing that yeah. with us. So we appreciate it. Someone said to me the other day, and I maybe we mentioned this on the show. Someone said the definition to them of self awareness is my belief in myself and who I am being in line with the feedback I receive from others. That's really good. I thought it was really helpful. And I'll be frank, audience, I did not look up the actual definition of self-awareness, and I want you guys to do that. Um, But Carissa, are you telling me that what the roommates told you is not what you thought about yourself, or is it? So I can be a very spontaneous person, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you've noticed that, but I just love to do crazy things all the time. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes my roommates have to have sit-downs with me, and they're like, hey, Carissa, like, I don't quite know if this is the goal we're trying to reach or if we're doing this the right way. And there was even times where I had to have intervention with them to just be like, hey, like in a loving way, like maybe let's approach this a different way or maybe things aren't going the way that they should be. And then with their help, I was able to get intervention and actually go to a doctor and see if like what I was living wasn't necessarily the most healthy lifestyle. And I was actually had some stuff going on. And then with the help of the doctor, I was able to see that my hormones were in balance because, yeah, my roommates were able to be like, this is not normal period swings and hormonal balances. Oh, interesting. And, yeah, and they're like, I really care for you. Like, you shouldn't be this out all the time. Like, it's not okay. Okay. But what my normal is, isn't their normal. Mm-hmm. And so being able to have the outside perspective is like a really great part of self-awareness. Because Ooh. I didn't know yes. that you... my pain wasn't normal. Okay, I, what I'm hearing here is there was a part of yourself that was not aware. Yeah. Not that you were in denial. Oh, Absolutely. Right. You were not in denial. They just were like, hey, we want to point something out. Yeah. Okay. so I think that's something that we should think about, folks, is with and I we we dove right into this conversation just as a reminder. So people are (laughs) going to be evaluating your self-awareness. And so there can be a lot of things going on there where you might be in denial or you might not be aware. Yes. And it sounds like for this instance, Carissa was not aware of this particular um, time of your life where your roommates want to be like, hey, we want to point something out here. Let's get this checked out. The denial piece would be if you were saying, I am 100% healthy in this area. Mm-hmm. And then they had to have a real intervention for oh, you. Oh, yeah. Yes. That would be bad. And okay. not listening to their feedback is part of denial. Like, mm-hmm. how can somebody come up to you and then have the hard conversations with right. you and you push them off? You know oh, you're I mean? not going to grow. No, absolutely not. Now, I will tell you, a piece of self-awareness for me that I tell friends and family historically, and I'm getting a lot better at this because I'm aware. And there because I've acknowledged it. But if someone gives me feedback, my usual reaction is I feel defensive because I'm like, uh-oh, 
I've done something wrong. My intentions have not been seen mm. or like I did a project and if they come to critique it immediately, I'm like, oh, shoot, I did this project to get like praise and feedback and be helpful. That's not what I'm receiving. So a lot of times I'll get defensive first, have to step away, reflect, and then I come back. So yeah. I think what you're saying is having folks around us who can give us feedback is so important for self-awareness, yes. but we have to be self-aware about how we receive and accept feedback. It sounds like your roommates know you can receive feedback. Yeah, yeah. I'm very much a tell me how it is kind of gal. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's definitely hard to hear things and I have to like take my space and just internalize everything and like think through it Um, because I like to take my space and then come up with the best response so Mm. that I'm kind of loving the people who are loving on me in return. Right. Um, And just kind of talking through some things with people is definitely super helpful. But Carissa, why are you like this? (laughs) Why do you think you are kind of like a like let's try things kind of girl yeah. uh, and accept the feedback like where did that come from have we always been like that did it take some growth like how did we get here um definitely my upbringing mm. so my dad worked in ministry my whole life so kind of in the church my life was super chaotic because he worked with high schoolers mm-hmm. and so you never quite knew what was going to happen in the house so it was you definitely had to go with the flow learn how to do things and then my dad being the pastor he is I heard a lot of sermons and that's just kind of the way that I was like given feedback was mm. like we're going to sit down and we're going to have these long conversations and it's going to be hard <laughs> and you're going to get through it um, and so he was always very like emotionally at a higher level. Like intelligent. Like, yes, yes. Yes. And so he'd always be like, let's talk through these feelings. Like, let's have these conversations. Wow. What yeah. a gift. Which was insane because usually the moms are like, let's have our feelings conversation. Sure. My historically. Dad, yeah. yeah. My dad would sit down and like, let's be, let's talk about our feelings right now. Did you, when he would have those talks I with you, it. I was going to say, oh my gosh, I hated it. When do you think, do you still hate it now? Um, I think everybody kind of just like, I want to be an independent person. Okay. I don't want my parents tell me what to do. Okay. Um, I don't hate it as much now because I've seen where it's made me grow. A hundred percent. Like there's so many well, things. Well, that's self-awareness and maturity. Yes. There's so many things in my life where my dad has like made me do it where in the moment I was like, this sucks. Right. Like, I don't want to do this. But now I love it. Like for example. I hope you're going to tell the basketball story. I'm going to tell the basketball please, please story. Please tell it. Yes. Yeah. So I, I had to play two sports a year because my dad. Um, because and, he just thought it was wise. Oh, for sure. Teamwork, leadership, personal development. Absolutely. Okay. And he's like. I became obese. I don't want you to become fat. So two oh, sports year. Oh, every year. interesting. That was one of his big okay, reasons. Okay, okay. Because being active nar- now, so yeah. it's the heart- healthy habits. And Self awareness on his part to help his kids. Absolutely, and he always did sports. Mm-hmm. We're kind of athletic, and mm-hmm. so it's really been great. <laughs> We're kind of athletic. Kind We're of kind athletic. of a big deal. So self awareness, you know, you're athletic. Yes. Okay. I, and I love doing sports, yeah. and I love having like the physical aspect to kind of take my brain off school. So I had to do two sports a year, and one of the sports I ended up doing was basketball because my dad wanted me to do it. And I hated every second of it. Um, for four years, I played basketball. And we, like, come home crying. And I was like, this sucks. Like, I hate doing it. Um, but it was one of those situations where my dad's like, you're too good at everything else that you're doing that I need to put you in a situation where you kind of suck wow. to keep you humble. Woo, woo, and, oh, I know. Woo. Which sucked in the moment. Like, being in middle school and high school, it sucked. I'm sorry. The fact that it was four years. But the point is, when he made me play basketball, I was in this uncomfortable situation that I hated. Mm-hmm. But now I try to put myself in uncomfortable situations to grow. So that's what I first told Alex. When we were I talking. could not. I was shocked. <laughs> when we were talking about this internship, she was like, yeah, do you want to do this? And I was like, communications, like, girl, like, I love people and I love pre-vets and I love talking to people and I'm very sciencey, but I don't know if I'm communications oriented. Right, right. And you was, did say that. Yeah. yeah. But I knew. So you had good self-awareness about yeah. yourself. But yeah, you told that story. You yeah. said that you were just like into growth mindset. Yeah, I was like, I'd love to grow. Like, I'd love to be in this position because every semester I do something that's really hard for me so right. I can grow in it. Exactly. And, and that's so what we're doing. That's what I was looking for more than someone who knew what they were doing yeah. because I'd rather have someone who's just like, I recognize who I am as a human. Mm-hmm. I have a good attitude. I'm probably never going to tell you no, which is a great, <laughs> yeah. great thing to have in an intern. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you had the self-awareness, which told me like, I can train her to do whatever because yes. you've been put in those kinds of situations. What I would be telling everybody right now is just ask yourself, where have I shown self-awareness? Where do I need to grow? Yeah. What has the feedback looked like for me? I love it when people give me feedback. Of course, I you're so people, crazy. <laughs> I will ask people all the time, like, hey, like, what can I grow on or what can I do? And I even took sticky notes on my wall. This was such a weird moment for me. And I wrote down feedback that people had given me and put the sticky notes on my wall of like like things that I would you like heard. look at it every day and do push-ups and be like, I'm going to change this. Like, I am working on doing push-ups. I'm going to get bigger arms. Um, <laughs> but no, like I wrote these things and my roommate was like kind of concerned that they kind of seemed like negative things that I wanted to work on. But 
they weren't negative to me. They were just, this is the feedback I'm getting and how can Whoa. I present? Yeah. Wait, that's huge. This yeah. keeps coming up for me. I've heard this in multiple podcasts this week. So I feel like we're right on target with folks are saying an experience can happen to you, but it's how do I interpret that experience, yes. specifically with trauma, yes. where folks who have been through something really hard, let's say, well, we won't name traumatic experiences, but let's say person A experiences a similar experience as person B. Mm -hmm. Person A might be like, this has ruined my life. Person B might say, how can I lean into this? What does this teach me? Yeah. Why did this happen? Let's learn and be fascinated instead of doomsday. We get to decide. Absolutely. But that takes a lot of maturity, self-awareness, personal growth. I will also say I think it, it's also a privilege to be able to take trauma and look at it from a positive light. A hundred percent. And you can't do it right away. Like when you've no. been through hard things, like there's definitely a time of growth. And like one comment that I've heard, like if you've been through something super hard, once you get to the point where you're not crying when you're telling the story mm. and you can get through telling mm. the story, that's when you're getting to a point of growth. And like, then you can learn into that. And like, we've, we've all been through, I mean, most of us have been through some pretty hard things. Sure. We we can't have those conversations and we can't share those mm -hmm. things. But once you get to a point where you can, and you can share your story, right. and you can talk about what's happened. You can learn so much from it like so much of my childhood has shaped me and everybody else and it's beautiful to look back and be like I am the way I am because of how I handle these situations it is not easy but I do think it's a choice yes it's a choice because what people it's are doing it easy. anytime I see people doing something I'm like oh if they're doing it then that means it's an option yeah that means it's an option um I know for some folks like the self-awareness right now is probably a little low Yes. Probably a little low. And yes. so you might need some people in your life to give you that feedback to help you grow. You might need to go through some hard things. I also want to acknowledge neurodiversity mm -hmm. and self-awareness. Yeah. Because there are folks who maybe are on um, the autism Asperger spectrum. Mm -hmm. There My might brother be, is. Okay. Yeah. There might be folks who are just like neurodivergent in different ways where self-awareness looks different to them. Yes. And some for some people, they're hyper self-aware. And for some people, they have like lower affect. They're not aware of how others perceive them. They might be missing those social cues. So I recognize that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't care how they're perceived, which ooh, can change their self-awareness. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. so we're talking about people who are just like, I don't I don't care. Yeah, they're just like, I am who I am. I'm yes. super confident who I am. And I don't care how other people perceive me. And I'm going to be true to who I am, which mm. can be good or can be bad. Interesting, interesting. You're right. So it's yeah. like, it, it, for folks who are listening right now, try to ask yourself, which one of these am I? Mm -hmm. Are you too confident in yourself that you're not being aware of how you're one perceived? One might say arrogant. Ooh. But I but I totally get what you're saying that yeah. for some people like that we are told don't care what other thing others we think are. about you. We're told that all the time. And I would challenge, I don't think that's a great person I want to work with. Thank you. I want people who do care, not to the point where it's it hurts who you are, your self esteem or your productivity. If you're a person who cares too much, like someone who identifies as a people pleaser, and I'm putting air quotes up, mm. I don't love that for you either. But no. we have to have, if we're going to be working with others, there has to be some level, I think, and it sounds like you agree, where we do care how we are perceived by others. Yeah. And that's just being empathetic. That's being a good team player. So I'll use me, for example. I am self-aware that I am loud in the office. <laughs> My music is usually loud. I'm usually like on the speakerphone. I'm a shouter. <laughs> I recognize that that is not, a great, not great for a lot of people in the office. I try to tone it down. But I could be coming in being like, I don't care what they think. Yeah, you're like, I am who I am. Right, this and I'm not going to change. That's yeah. a hostile working environment. Thank you. And I think especially for employees and future vet students, you are being employed by whichever school you go to to be a student there. You have to follow those cultural norms. Yes. I mean, you don't have to, but it, you might not be as successful. You might not be as well liked. And you might not be getting referrals to your veterinary practice That's someday. That's true. roommates. Mm -hmm. Carissa, can we just complain for a minute? Girl, go on. Thank you. Thank you. There are some people I know who have no self-awareness. Oh, please. It, it's like if there's a consensus, and I usually tell my undergrads this, if three people have told you the same feedback, and I'm yeah. saying people from different groups, because sometimes there's like hive mind and group think where Ooh, people get together. Good point. Right. So like there can be like a bully moment where they're like all trashing someone, and I don't like that. But if you have three people who's like a family member, a coworker, and a friend who have given you the same feedback, it probably is true. Yeah. Like that's their their perception of you. And so it, I'll use I terms. That would be their perception of me. So I've been, I've gotten that I have an RBF from most humans. Have you noticed it? Most. I mean, some, yeah. <laughs> I mean. And it's just my face. 
And exactly. And so, you don't mean anything by it. No, 100% I don't. And But I have to be aware of that and be self-aware. Yes. I'm not trying to look irritated, frustrated. That's just my face. And so I want to take that feedback in and then adjust. I'm not changing me. I'm just aware. I don't want people to think that. So I had to like fix exactly. my face. And you just have to be respectful of those around you. So especially in veterinary medicine, emotions are so high no matter what you're doing. They like, really are. I work at Urgent Vet. And so it's kind of an emergency, but Urgent Vet field, it's a little less than emergency. Mm-hmm. And all of my coworkers are so tense all the time because we're doing so much. So like, mm. how can I in my shift be like, hey, what do you need? What can I do for you? How can I make your cases go quicker? Like, and then I'm, I love to be everybody's biggest cheerleader. That's one of my goals that I've been working on this past year. So like, how can I give them like little tidbits of like, hey, like you're doing great. Like that was amazing. Mm. Like that was strength was great like that was a beautiful pope like Mm, you did great mm. and i'm so proud of you or just like saying little things yeah like if you're making the whole group better it'll make your day better too oh that's a good point so it's not just yeah but i would also say knowing the group because i bet i have to assume some people don't want a cheerleader in those moments am i right are there a few maybe who are like oh yeah i need some space i've had some coworkers where they i'm a very i'm a lot and that's okay (laughs) i'm a very happy going energetic person okay most of the time okay and sometimes it's a lot for some people, especially yeah. when they're down and frustrated yeah. and things aren't going their way. They okay. don't want to hear they're doing good. They just want to get through the day. So then what do you do when you know that? So I've definitely had those conversations with some coworkers and been like, hey, like, am I supporting you or am I not supporting you? Like, is this oh, helping I you? Oh, I love right? that. You do that. I, I do ask people because I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I can be a lot because I've been told. And so I want to <sighs> make sure that I'm loving them in a way that's loving to them, not wow. just loving to me. And that's a great teammate. Yeah. Because you're you're meet and you, that's knowing your people. Yes. And so we talked about that in the leadership episode with the army. We talk about knowing your people and what they need. It sounds like Carissa, one is self aware, and I hate the term a lot because I've also been told I'm a lot, and I don't know about you, <laughs> but like it hurts my feelings sometimes. Really? It does. Does it not hurt your feelings? No, just because it's kind of funny. Like, have you ever heard the phrase like, "Oh, well, if I'm a lot, go find something less somewhere else." Yeah, I have heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. Which is funny. But also, I like who I am. And if I didn't want to be who I was, I would change. But I like who I am. Well, and here's what we're literally giving an exact example of what we just talked about, where you've been told you're a lot. Yes. I've been told I'm a lot. I'm a lot. I've internalized it negatively and you've accepted it and become amused with it. I love it. Maybe I'm going to reframe and just lean into it. Like, I mean, I am. I am also (laughs) a lot. I mean, but it's a good time. So, but if your coworker, if you have the self-awareness to know Mm -hmm. that you can be perceived as a lot. Yeah. And then you're willing to know that and approach someone and say, I know that this can be a lot is this supportive to you wow what a move and then be prepared for them to be mad at you or negative and then be like that's okay Mm. I just know that they don't want this in this situation so I will be quieter I won't cheer them on like I'm cheering everybody else on and I'll like not be as excited like outwardly when they're around but there are 100% folks listening right now being like Carissa no you shouldn't change who you are based on other people what would you say that's not the same thing because My whole goal in being a cheerleader is to love on people. And if Thank I'm not you. loving on them with what I'm Thank doing, you. then it's not, you know, like that's selfish love. Have you heard that the phrase of, okay, so of course, you know, do unto others as you yes. would have them do unto you. Yes. You know this from the Bible. Yes. But I think the new thing and probably the more appropriate thing is do unto others as they would want you to do for them. Because what you want yeah. might be different than what Stephanie wants. Exactly. We have to find out Stephanie's needs. Do you agree with that? Oh, I definitely agree. I mean, should we just go through? Because I, I think one thing I always make students do when they have interviews, right, is like talk about yourself. Yeah. Give three qualities of who you are. Okay. So I want to hear from you. How would you, how would others, because like we're saying, self-awareness is a big piece, Mm -hmm. how others perceive us. How would others describe you in three words? Um, I have gotten energetic a lot lately. I would agree with that. All my new coworkers. I stand that. Um, Oh, thank you. That was beautiful terminology. Thank you so much. I tried to slip it in so, so smooth. (laughs) Um, I would say energetic, positive, and let's see. I really love people. And so I don't know if loving is the right word or caring, but like how I can. So my biggest thing is how can I love other people? And that's why I want to go into veterinary medicine, not because animals, not because science, because I love people. And Mm -hmm. those are just great aspects. Yeah. One of my favorite Bible verses is Galatians 5, 6. The greatest of these is faith expressing itself through love. Okay. So if you're not loving people, how are you? What are you doing? Like like literally. What are you doing? That's my reason on this earth is to love people and take care of them. Oh, you know your purpose. Absolutely. Yes. And that's what I've been told. And so like. 
how am I expressing these in my quality? So definitely energetic, mm -hmm. definitely positive, and is the word empathetic people. though? Like, because because to have. It, to me, what you're saying is it's mm. encompassing everything. You care, you love, yes. and it's all about the other people. Absolutely. Okay. Like, how can I serve them? Yeah, you have a servant's heart. I love serving others. Yeah, you, you do. You really do. Okay, so we have that self-awareness of what others would say. And so then maybe tell me one thing that someone has said where you're like, this is something I want to adjust a little bit. Like I'm, Or maybe maybe it's not them or you've, you're aware of it. Something yeah. that you're like, this is something I'm aware of that it's time for me to edit. Mm -hmm. I always love growth and that kind of mindset of like finding things that I have. Like I told you, I have sticky notes on my wall. Yeah, you do. You said, do. And I can work on them. And it's just one of those things where like I see them and they don't hurt my feelings. It's just like, oh, I'm aware that I can come off this way. Like I can be loud or I can be a lot or I can be. Um, it's just a lot of things. Well, Let's what's see. one that comes to mind that you're working on right now? Yes. So currently I've currently like in the past week or so been told by one of my friends that um the way that I was loving them was not loving to them. Like I reached out to them and I was like, how can I be a better friend to you? Cause I feel like we're pulling apart and I feel like this isn't working out Good well. Good self-awareness. And so he reached out to me and he was like, well, you coming over and hang out with my friends and hang out with us, like you are just a lot all the time and I'm an introvert and I need my space. So like me realizing that me trying to go out of my way for him is in a way that I'm loving him. And like, I love to just show up at people's house and be like, hey, I have something for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a lot, I'm fully aware. No, I, I think my face is showing, see, this is interesting. Cause yeah. are you saying that cause my face? Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm just, so I'm glad we're, we'll take a pause. So I think my, what, describe what my face looks like right now. You were shocked. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about everything that you're saying and how it applies to me. And yeah. so I, my face shows shocked, but really it's pensive. Okay, okay keep going. So I would just show up. He, he went to a funeral that day, and so I felt really bad for him. So I showed up with some snacks and, like, a handwritten letter and, like, one of my really big stuffed animals. And I was like, I know it's a very hard time to go through this stuff, and you don't need to talk to me. I'm dropping it off. I'm heading to worship night. I hope you have a good night. And he was like, I don't want you coming over because I'm already going through a hard time, and I know you're trying to love on me, but it's not loving to me. Okay. And so – Figuring out respecting his boundaries yes. is kind of hard for me sometimes because I do you want, want to love, you love, love so much. That's interesting. So that's something I'm definitely working on is understanding what people want from me and their boundaries. And I don't want to cross anyone's boundaries. No. But I want to love them. And so having the conversations of like, how can I serve you and what do you want from me? And then the restraint to respect oh, the boundary. it's so hard. Yeah. Because I just want to take care of people. Like I even had a conversation with my roommate today. I was like, hey, I know you have this situation going on. What do you want? What roles do you want me to take? Because mm -hmm. I'll take whatever you want from mm -hmm. me and I will do it to the best of my capability. But I think the roles are changing from what you've previously asked me in this conversation mm. and what you want from me. Yeah. So let's have a recheck and let's see where we're going from here. We love a recheck. It's so hard. I want to also offer to everybody the phrase, because like as Chris is talking about going in for rechecks, how can you help your friends? Um, this phrase came to me and I asked you it in the car as we're driving. Mm -hmm. I heard it in a podcast. But for folks who are like, I want to be more self-aware, especially with my relationships, if you want to help someone out, you can ask them, what can I do for you? Can I give you support or solutions? Yes. And that really helps those of us who like to fix things. Mm -hmm. Because if we go in being like, okay, I'm going to help them, they might just want to vent. And that might yes. just look like support. Or like you and I were talking about an issue you're having and I said support or solutions and you said solutions, mm -hmm. which actually checks out for your self-awareness yeah. <laughs> because you want to grow. Yeah. Most people are like, I just want support. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But that actually doesn't shock me that you said solutions. Carissa, we've already been talking for 30 minutes and I could <laughs> oh, keep no. talking to you for another 30 about self-awareness. So let's wrap up some takeaways. Okay, I'm ready. So as you know, right, you're mm -hmm. going to be applying to vet school. You're going to be asking folks to write you letters of rec, and you're yes. going to hope that they check off that you have excellent self-awareness. And honestly, based on what you've told me and what I know about you, I don't know how they couldn't check that off. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> but for students listening in, I, here's what I would tell you to do. I would, one, write down, and I had my personal branding students do this last week. Look at you. Thank you. I had them write down their brand. So who they are, like your personality statement, mm -hmm. like who are you? And then I told them, text 10 of your friends or family or coworkers and ask them what they think their brand is to see if it lines up. Okay. And you have to ask people who you can trust and who will be honest. And people who know you. Thank you. People who know you and yeah. aren't acting out of their own issues all the time. Mm -hmm. Because you want to use someone who is trusting and trustworthy. Because if you ask it someone who's always negative – what your brand is, they're going to come back with something that might not be true. So good point, Carissa. Yeah. Carissa Parker. Guys, check in with your people. <laughs> but here's what I'm going to challenge all the listeners to do. If we're all in agreement for this episode of the podcast that self-awareness is the alignment of 
who I think I am and how others perceive me. Ask a few others, either text, email, phone calls, who they think you are, if they could describe you in either three words or one sentence and see how much it lines up. I think that would be a great way for Mm -hmm. y'all to check if you have high self-awareness. Yeah. I recognize that maybe you don't have 10 people you can ask. Go down to whatever number you can. But let's all see if we can start becoming more self-aware, accepting feedback, growth mindset. I will tell you right now, going into my new position. Mm. Oh, I know. That's so exciting. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. I want to be hyper self-aware Yes. going into it. And I want to be able then to also tell folks, hey, this is who I am and how I operate. So I'm so glad we just had that moment of my shocked face versus pensive face mm-hmm. for me to let others know, like, hey, you might see my face doing something that looks negative. It's traditionally just my face. Please don't take <laughs> offense to it. please, Because I get from a yeah. lot of people that I'm intimidating, that I'm Good. scary. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. But if they don't know me, right, True. and they only see me in a classroom on like a couple days, they, I get I get it because I think it's my face and I'm also very – Serious. I can be very serious and um, I want to say assertive yes. and truthful. Yes. I really believe in Brene Brown, clear as kind. Mm-hmm. I'm not historically defined as nice. You know, that's just not my brand. Okay. So I know that. And so yeah. I want to tell my people like, hey, if you're unsure about my reaction, please feel free to come talk to me. But in general, it's probably I'm just thinking through what you've said. So I really want people to know that. I want – to have the self-awareness to know that this is kind of, I think you can get on board with this. We get so excited about ideas yeah. and not everyone can get an idea right away. They need time for buy-in. We need to give them time to process it. It's so hard for me to let people do that. I know, but you know, I think when we think about change leadership and change Uh, management, we have to be willing to meet the people where they're at. Absolutely. And just know not everyone can receive information the same way we do. Mm -hmm. So I want to be really self-aware about that. And I think if I'm going to give one more thing I'm going to be self-aware about, it's going to be that, I, I, this is a big one for me. Listen, listen podcast ready? listeners. Oh, I just realized I really haven't used a podcast voice other than the intro on this entire show. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Sometimes people, I'll use I terms. Mm. Sometimes people won't like me because I remind them of something they don't like Ooh. or someone they don't like. Yeah. So growing up in counseling, uh, my godmother would always ask me if something happened, they'd be like, who do they remind you of? If I really didn't like somebody. And it Mm. traditionally was like my mom or my sister, who I have great relationships with now and we fixed it. But mom, actually, my mom, my mom is listening to this episode probably right now. Hey, mom. Hey, shout out. mom. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I could start crying. This is the last episode. Okay, but anyway, back to this comment, back to this comment. But just know that most of the time and you guys have heard this. It's really not about you. It's about the other person. Mm -hmm. So if someone doesn't like you. It could be you just rub them the wrong way because you remind them of someone else or that you have something they want and they can't get it yet. Yes. Like people might be jealous of your positivity, but you've been through a lot to get there and they don't know that. Self-awareness is a journey. It comes with time, maturity, and growth. Get the feedback. Do my homework assignment. My last homework assignment I'll ever give you guys is to go text 10 people to see if their self-awareness lines up with your self-awareness of yourself. Are you going to do that today, Carissa? Well, you're already doing it. I, don't do it. You're, you're doing it. So many people. You don't need to. Carissa, so then this is the last time we're going to do this. What uh-huh. um, What do you want to say to the listeners? Because you're in that pre-vet journey with them. Yeah. Like, you're in the thick of it. So what, what do you want to tell them? So I will say, I know everybody talks about comparing yourself. And a big part of self-awareness is knowing where you're at and where you want to go. Mm. Um, but also knowing who you are and what you can accomplish. Amen. And everybody's goals are different and you don't need to have the same as everybody else. I definitely went through that journey of like, I don't have enough clinical hours, like panic, like I need to get them all because that was the thing that I was most worried about. But now that I'm here and I have a job in a clinic, it's not what I'm worried about anymore. I'm worried about building these habits and having these memories and building these goals and everything that I'm good at before vet school so I can go find my people in vet school and have a good time, you know? I really do. Krista, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for being my intern this semester. We've gotten a lot of great things done. Yes. I'm really excited because you had a very clear insight into the pre-vet journey as a pre-vet. We've had, I've had pre-vet interns and I've had communications interns, but you really are plugged in to what's going on. So I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you for everything. Loved every minute of it. It's been, it's been a ride. Well, I'm Alex Avellino. We won't talk to you soon. Oh. This is this is Alex Avellino signing off of the Prevet podcast. Good luck to all the Prevets. Like I always try to say, 
You're going to get to vet school. It's just when and where. I'm Alex Avellino, and have a great week. Ugh. <laughs> Is that this? I'm... Have a great life. That's it. I'm Alex Avellino. Have a great life. Hi, this is Carissa, the UFCVM communications intern and pre-vet student. Today, I'm joining Alex and we're talking about self-awareness. It's one of those topics that's very difficult because you're never really sure if you're quite self-aware. It matters for the people who are around you, the people you talk to. Nah, this isn't going to work. I was digging it. No. Did you hate it? I kind of hated it. Okay. So do you want to record it on your own and send? Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, I'll come up with one. I had like a few lines, but it just didn't come out. I was feeling it, but okay. <laughs> you're fine.